see you again. It's good to see you again, too. I've only seen you once since your marriage. Where do you and Lyman hide out? And how is that author husband of yours, anyway? Well, it's hmm? your fault you haven't seen us. Been invited three times, you know. And couldn't get away. Besides, why do you live way out in the wilderness? Hazel, you're not ill. Or are you? No, Dr. Russell. It isn't I. Bob, not Dr. Russell to you, my dear. It's easier to call you Dr. Russell on a call like this. What can I do for you, Hazel? Here. Want a smoke? Have a cigarette. Thanks. There, now. I came to talk to you about Lyman. Yes? Is he ill, Hazel? It's worse than that. I I don't know what it is, but it's something dreadful. Terrible, I know. You uh, tell me the best you can. Well, at first, when we moved out in the country, he seemed so happy. He was busy writing a new novel. And he had you there with him? Yes. I thought that should make him happy. He'd made me rush the marriage so. Married two months before you planned to be, weren't you? Yes. But then, several months after we'd been out in the country, Lyman began to act very strange. Very strange. What do you mean? Well, at first I thought it was fear of something. I I don't know what. And then he began to sit in the library. All night long. Writing, you mean? Some, perhaps. But when he'd come upstairs early in the morning, he'd look like someone who had undergone a terrible struggle, an ordeal. His face would be white and chalky. His eyes would jerk and his lips tremble. How long has this been going on? For a month now. Oh, it's terrible. Something's driving him mad. Whatever it is, it'll kill him. Hazel, I don't know what to say. I can't say anything right offhand. But you know, my dear, writers... Well, anyway, Lyman has always been rather a peculiar chap. Normal, of course. Normal as any of He's not normal now. He's changed. He's, he's not the same. Oh, you've got to do something. Can you get him to come and see me? No. That's the trouble. I can't. He won't leave the house for a day. I've begged him to get out, but he won't. Tell him you were coming to see me? Oh, mercy, no. Just in town shopping. And you want me to come to him? Is that it? Exactly. Without his knowing, I'm making a professional call. Yes. I want you to come for the weekend and while there, see if you can do anything for him. I'm not a psychiatrist, honey. I may advise pills when he needs a change of air. Oh, I know you. You'll do the right thing. When can you come? Well, want me this weekend? Tomorrow? Indeed, I do. I think I can get away this weekend. I will. I'll be there. Oh, fine. I feel better already. About Lyman, I mean. 
I know you can help him if anyone can. Uh, don't put too much faith in a doddering old surgeon, my dear. Oh, you're the best physician in the world, because I have faith in you. I'll be expecting you for dinner tomorrow. Hazel, this has been a splendid dinner. I've really eaten more than I ought. Oh, it's nice to see a man relish a meal. <laughs> Lyman rarely eats. Yeah. I was going to tell you, Bob, that I have no appetite. But it isn't true. Well, Lyman, you know it is. Why, night after night, he leaves the table scarcely touching his plate. It isn't true, I tell you. <laughs> well, perhaps Lyman is more sensible than I am. Now, I know too hearty a meal isn't good for me, particularly at night. I don't recommend it to my patients, but like all who preach, I don't practice my own teachings. <laughs> like the shoemaker's children who go without shoes? <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> well, if you finish your coffee, shall we go to the drawing room? Fine. Now, Lyman, how about telling me about your new novel? What's the theme? I haven't been writing lately. But he has to soon. He's promised his publishers that it'd be ready in a month. Don't remind me what I have to do. I'll have it ready. I'm sure you will. With Hazel here for inspiration, it ought to go fast. Uh, shall we go to the drawing room, then? Yes. Yeah. This way, Bob. Oh, beautiful here. <laughs> beautiful, then. Hazel, this is a lovely home you have out here in the country. I'm glad you like it. Quiet and peaceful, too. Ought to be a writer's paradise. Oh, here, Bob. Sit in this chair. I'm sure you'll find it comfortable. Oh, thank you. Uh, where are you going to sit, Lyman? If you'll excuse me, I think I'll go to the library. I have some work to do. Don't let me annoy you, Lyman, or keep you from work. But I thought you'd like to visit with Bob. I tell you, I have work to do. All right. Of course we'll excuse you. Yes, I have work to do. Will you join us later? Perhaps. No, no, don't wait for me. Getting late, I'm sure Bob will want to retire soon. Oh, but it's early yet, Lyman. All the same, don't wait for me. Well, what do you think? I don't know what to think. He does act strange, doesn't he? Yes. He isn't the same. No, he isn't. Changed. I'm so awfully worried. Notice how he glances everywhere and looks nowhere. I did. What can be the truth? Seems to be listening for something. Waiting for something. Yes, that's it. Of course, Lyman's never been very loquacious. No, that's right. He dislikes small talk. There's something almost rude about his taciturnity this evening. Oh, I know. Oh, Bob, as a doctor, not as a friend, what would you say is the matter? My dear, I can't answer you yet. Is it I? Is he tired of me? No, no, I don't think so. But I must know... Notice how white and drawn his face is? He's under some strain, all right. What do you propose to do? As soon as you go upstairs to bed, I'm going to the library and sit with him. Oh, but he won't let you. I'm accustomed to giving orders, not taking them. I know, but you don't He'll know how... let me stay. Did you notice how he kept looking towards the library and yet tried to hide it from us? Why, yes. Now that you mention it, I do. I have a feeling that whatever it is that's bothering Lyman... The library has something to do with it. I'll do my best tonight to find out what it is. Who is it? It's I, Bob. What do you want? Let me in, won't you? Sorry, I, I'm busy. Why lock the door, Lyman? Never mind. Go away. Lyman, I'll call one of the servants to open it for me. I'll rouse the whole house. You can't come in. All right, all right. Well? Come on, let a fellow in. You came here to snoop, I know it. Hazel brought you here to watch me. And you admit that there is something wrong, Lyman. I admit nothing. Uh, what time is it? Chimes just struck as I came down the hall. Let's see. 11.45. Then you must go. Get out of here. I don't understand. The door. I must lock the door. Come on, Lyman. Tell me what it is that's bothering you. Go. Leave me alone. No, I'm here to stay. I have a gun here, Dr. Russell. But you won't use it. Not on me. She'll be coming in a moment. She'll try to get out of this room. Rattle the doorknob. Try to get out of this library to kill my wife. I confess I don't know what you're talking about. Who will come, Lyman? You'll hear her in a minute. Moving out of those bookshelves. Moving towards me. Towards the door. Who do you mean? At first, you'll smell the perfume she always wore. Lyman, who are you talking about? 
Shirley Gray. The ghost of Shirley Gray. Shirley Gray? The ghost of Shirley Gray. She lives in this room. And at night, midnight, she tries to get out and kill Hazel. Oh, now come, Lyman. You've been working too hard. Your mind is weary. Your imagination is working overtime. Better go up and get some sleep. I knew this would be the way. I knew what you'd say. You think I'm out of my mind. You think I'm crazy. Well, I'm not. You doctors are fools. Can't see. Only measles. Smallpox. You only can see something that bats you in the face. It's only because I can see that I'm asking you to go upstairs and get some rest. No one can go on sleepless for weeks and remain sane. I'm sane, all right. More than you are. Listen. The clock. It's midnight. She'll be here in a moment. Listen. Listen, do you hear? Listen, if you dare. Do you hear her? I hear nothing, Lyman. She's coming nearer. I can almost see her tonight. She's dressed in a soft, flowing gown. She's coming closer towards me. Nearer. Nearer. She's coming nearer. Shirley, I didn't kill you. I, I, I didn't mean to kill you. Lyman, what on earth is the matter? Dr. Russell, don't grab my arm. Let me go. Let me go, I tell you. Let me go. Can't you see? She's moving towards the door. She wants to get out. No. No, you can't get out of here. I'll stop you. No. No. You can't get out that door. Get back. Back into the shells. I didn't mean to kill you, Shirley. Get back into the shells. Back. Back. I'm pushing her back. I'm winning. Winning. Back. Back into the shells. Back. Back. There. There. Lyman. Lyman, what is it? It's all over now. I won. She didn't get out. She's gone back. Now I can go upstairs and sleep. Sleep. I've won the battle for another night. Now I can sleep. <laughs> <laughs> who is Shirley who comes out of the bookcase at midnight? Is it someone Lyman killed? <laughs> the hermit will tell you before the night is done. <laughs> there are people in most countries who would like to live in the Republic of the United States or the Dominion of Canada where that good Olga Cole is sold. The citizens of our free countries are the envy of many people elsewhere because of the personal freedom which we have enjoyed. Why, then, doesn't every country adopt a form of free government? One answer is that, unfortunately, there are people and parties in many nations who are so greedy for power that they will sacrifice the freedom of their fellow countrymen to obtain power for themselves. History, even recent history, is replete with such instances. That is why the citizens of the Republic of the United States and the Dominion of Canada must be careful to recognize at its very beginning any movement to steal or limit their freedom. That is not always easy. The man who would enslave a free people doesn't begin by saying, Now I'm going to be your dictator. Instead, he probably will claim that he is a devoted supporter of personal freedom. But all the while he will support policies that weaken and undermine personal freedom. Such a man will deny any totalitarian aim. But free citizens must not be deceived by such denials. Apparently, it is a cardinal principle of every sincere totalitarian that he is justified in lying, if such lies will advance his plans. In these times, no public figure and no party or organization supporting such a person can be accepted without careful consideration. Every public figure and organization must be carefully scrutinized. And if their real aims are to limit or to destroy our freedom as individuals, they must be opposed and defeated. Now the hermit again. <laughs> the next morning, Dr. Russell talks to Lyman about the mysterious Shirley. Is the doctor talking to a murderer, eh? <laughs> Listen, 
<laughs> Lyman, I want to hear the story. In this clear, clean daylight, I want you to tell me your story. It's nothing I can tell you. I'm your friend, Hazel's friend. I can't see your lives ruined, see your whole future shattered by some strange thing that holds you that, if it were brought out into daylight, would vanish. You think it would? I'm sure it would. It's with me as much in the day as it is at night. I found out since last night that Shirley Gray was a character in your last novel. Now, certainly, Lyman, you aren't going to sit there and tell me that you believe a character out of a storybook can return to haunt you. Yes, yes, she does. It's absurd. Besides, from what I know of ghosts, doors wouldn't bother them. They'd walk right through them. Not Shirley. She isn't strong enough yet. She hasn't been dead long enough. And how should she kill Hazel? How do you know she wants to kill her? For revenge. I killed Shirley when she was still young, lovely. She didn't want to die. But how do you know she wants to kill Hazel? Because night after night, she's come to me. Guided my hand while I write. It's written, I'll take your wife from you, just as you snatched my lover. Lyman, listen to me. Characters from storybooks, I don't care how real they are to you, were never flesh and blood. They can't inhabit a spirit world. But Shirley Gray was flesh and blood. I took her out of life and put her in a book. You... You mean you used some real girl as a type for your story? Yes, I did. Tell me about it, Lyman. Perhaps I'll be able to aid you. It was several months before I was married. You remember I went up to that lake in the north to write? I remember. It was while I was there that I met... Shirley Gray. She was the most strikingly beautiful girl that I'd ever seen. Max, this is Mr. Clinton. Mr. Lyman Clinton. How do you do, Mr. Clinton? Shirley tells me you're an author. She's frightfully keen on your stories. But I'm ashamed to say I don't believe I've ever read any of your work. No, don't apologize, please. I'm the one who should do that. I'm afraid I write for money, not fame. Oh, it isn't true. We've had a grand time talking to from early French beginnings of the novel to modern. From Zola to John de Pepper. Oh, it's nice of you to entertain, Shirley, Mr. Clinton. I can only come out weekends. It gets pretty lonely here at the lake with only your folks for company. The pleasure's been mine, I assure you. Come on. We're wasting a glorious day, men, for swimming. I'll race you to the second sandbar, Shirley. <laughs> right. Want to bet? <laughs> what does it say? Whatever you say. <laughs> and so I spent days at the lake with her. Walking through the woods, talking, and falling in love with her. But this Max, who was he? The boy she loved was engaged to. Yes? Go on, Lyman. In Shirley's company, I could feel myself groping for new thoughts. Beginning to live more than I ever had before. She had a free and full imagination. Yes? She wasn't muddled by life as most people are. She possessed a spiritual insight. Clear. Alive. I understand. And one night, I told her how I felt about her. But Hazel, you were engaged to Hazel at the time. I'd forgotten about Hazel. She belonged in another world. She had no existence in this one. And so you told this Shirley? Yes. We'd climbed one of the high sand dunes that afternoon. Had returned. It was dusk. Shadows had begun to settle on the water. Stars were beginning to fill the sky. And we'd paused to watch their reflection in the room. You will be returning home soon, Lyman. And so will I. I shall never leave this spot. Nor you. Not in mine, perhaps. But in actuality. This lake, the beauty of it all, will be something to remember on cold winter nights. It's no use to disguise things from you, Shirley. You know I'm in love with you. I know that, Lyman. I'll never let you leave me. Never. I think you will. You understand me. And yet, you don't. Meaning? That you've read many things into me that don't exist at all. And have omitted one thing. The main thing. Which is? That I love Max. Love him very much. No place for me? Don't beg. I hate it. With Max, life is easy, unconfused. We're happy on a simple plane. We'll romp through life together and fight together. But not with too much effort. The easy way? Perhaps. But why take the difficulty? I like life. It's fun. It may be drab and hard someday. 
but not now. I haven't misunderstood you, Shirley. Quite the contrary. And I love you. Please, Lyman. Let's not talk anymore. Look at the water. See the boat way off in the distance? Covered with a thousand lights. Going somewhere. Let's just sit here and watch. That night was the last time I saw Shirley Gray alive. Yes, what happened to her? She left the lake the next day. Two days after, I returned home. And asked Hazel to hasten your marriage? Yes, because I wanted to forget this girl as soon as I could. I understand. But I couldn't forget her. I couldn't. She was with me constantly. So I began to write a story about her. That drove me wild. Yet you finished the book? Published it, in fact? Yes, I finished it. But do you know what I did? I think I know. I couldn't bear to think of Shirley living without me. So I killed her in the story. Then the very day that I killed her in the book, she was killed in life. What? Yes, killed. In an automobile. Instantly. That had nothing to do with your story. You weren't to blame. I was. I was. I fought so hard. Wanted it so much. I brought it about. I killed her. She wasn't ready to die. She won't accept death. Now she comes back to haunt me for retribution. Tell me, doctor, what am I going to do? Help me if you can. Help me, please. I will, Lyman. Tonight we shall go to the library together. And I will help you. I have a plan. I killed her. I killed her. How do you do, young man? You're Max Pierce, aren't you? Yes, sir, I am. I'm Dr. Russell. Oh, yes, Dr. Russell. I'm glad to meet you. But there's nothing you can do for me. I was in an automobile accident. Smashed up. Always have to walk with crutches. I know what I'm going to ask of you will seem very strange and personal. But I have a very good reason. Will you hear me? Well, yes. What is it? You were engaged to Shirley Gray, weren't you? Yes, I was. And uh, loved her? We were to have been married. I don't understand you. You will in a moment. And Shirley Gray died? Yes. And I had to live on. I don't want to. If you're able... Your doctor told me I might take you with me tonight to help save another man's sanity. We have to drive in the country. I'll tell you the story on the way. This is all strange to me. Now, don't be afraid. It's all right. Will you come? Yes, I'll come. To my car, then. I'll tell you the story as we drive to our destination. That's all there is to tell right now. It doesn't seem possible. I'm sane and considered to be a level-headed man. I've never believed in ghosts. Never. Nor I. But I'm compelled to believe this time. But why doesn't she come to me? Perhaps she will. Tonight. Here we are. It's 11.30. We'll find him in the library waiting. It's I. Yes? Come in. Who's this? Who have you brought with you? Max Pierce. Do you remember him? Why have you brought him here? Oh, please, Mr. Clinton. I want to help you. And I want to see Shirley. Perhaps he can talk to her. You've made a mess of things. Seeing Max will craze her. She'll kill all of us. No, I think it will give her peace. She wants revenge, not peace. But you need help. You can't go on this way. Sit down, both of you. Be quiet and listen. Listen. Do you hear that rustling sound? It's the wind in the water. She brings the sound with her. Listen. She's coming. Nearer. Nearer. I can see her tonight. Do you see her? Why? Why, yes. Yes, I do see her. Shirley, my darling. Shirley, speak to me. Max. Max, you've come to me. Oh, yes, Shirley, I'm here. My darling, I love you. Do you want to come with me now? 
forever? I do, yes. Surely I do. But your revenge upon me... I shall have my revenge. You shall go on living... Suffering for killing others. Surely. Don't be afraid to die. Death will be lovely when we are together. What have I done? I forgive you, Lyman Clinton. I leave you in peace. Come to me, Max. Follow me. Yes, Shirley. I'll follow you. I'll follow you. I'll follow you. Lyman to ponder and suffer the rest of his life. <laughs> Turn on your lights. Turn them on. <laughs> I'll be back. Pleasant dreams. <laughs> Characters, places, and occurrences mentioned in the Hermit's Cave are fictitious, and similarity to persons, places, or occurrences is purely accidental. The Mummers in the Little Theater of the Air. what happened to Jan van Dirk, for it was long before my time. But I've heard my grandfather tell of it, as did his father before him. It is a story that's been handed down through the generations of our family, and it is believed. You see, this young Hollander, Jan van Dirk, was a relative of mine. When he was a young fellow, he went to Paris to attend the university. He came to France during the time of the French Revolution, and he suffered intensely because of it. The howling crowds, the bloody execution stabbed at the very soul of one as sensitive as Jan van Dirk. He had one friend in this city in the throes of violence, Father Perichon, who liked the boy and often invited him to his small room. One afternoon, Jan came to him. Sit down, my boy. You look pale and hungry. I am hungry, Father. But I cannot eat. What I see on the streets, it turns me inside out. It is sad for one so young to see only this baser side of man. You need sunlight and only small shadows at this time in your life. Father Perichon, all of this horror, these scenes of cruelty, they weaken my faith in my fellow man. Why do you not return to your own country, Jan? As soon as I finish studying, I shall go. That is why I work such long hours, day and night, to finish the work, so that I may get away and try to forget. Time will help you, my boy. 
The warmth and beauty of your own land will blot out the plaster of a grave. You will marry, and your own life will make you forget the Paris you are witnessing today. I often wonder about the marrying part, I mean. You see, Father, I admire beauty so much. I know. Since I can remember, I've dreamed of only one woman for me. She is so beautiful, this girl I dream about. I don't think I can ever find her in real life. It is the beauty of soul that counts you. Oh, I know this girl I dream of as a soul of beauty, Father. <laughs> <laughs> Come, my boy. Let us eat of the little I have to offer. Outside of the visits with Father Perichon, Jan was a recluse, spending most of his time in the libraries, always surrounded with people, yet always alone, an escape from the realities of the present. One night he stayed in the library late, while there a storm arose. But it was closing time, and so Jan was forced to step out into the storm to make his way to his lodgings in the old part of Paris. gleamed and the thunder rattled loudly through the narrow streets. He crossed the Place de la Greve, the square where the public executions were performed. Just as he was passing the permanent guillotine which had been built there, a bright flash of lightning bathed the square in its cold blue radiance. The dreadful instrument of death loomed before him in all its stark ghastliness. Oh, how terrible. Jan shrank back in horror. His heart sickened within him, and he turned shudderingly away. Just then, there was a lull in the storm. Complete silence seemed to fall over the whole city. Then he heard a sound. He turned back, and there on the bottom step of the guillotine sat a woman, crying bitterly. I beg your pardon. Can I do anything for you? May I not help you? No one can help me now. You've lost someone through the guillotine. Today I lost everyone. They made me come and watch. As one by one they died. I wanted to close my eyes, but I could not. I understand. Horror kept your eyes open. But why stay here now? Why not leave this place? I have not the thing. I can still see them marching up the steps, the heavy knife being raised, the whistling thud as it fell, each time taking another of my loved ones from me. The blood of my father, my mother, and my two brothers mingled on that platform today. Have you no place to go? No. I have no friends left. They, too, have gone. You can't stay here. Come with me. I cannot accept your offer. I want to be your friend. I promise that no harm shall come to you. Here, let me help you out. I am very weak. You're shivering from the storm. You need warm food and dry clothing. Have we far to go? Not far. Across the Point Neuf. How strange it is tonight. All of a sudden, the storm has ended. And Paris is as silent as a tomb. Here, we turn this way. You are very kind. You need a friend. And so do I. How careful, these streets are very narrow. Do not touch the walls. They're covered with mold. Soon we'll reach the stairway leading to my apartment. Can you walk a bit farther? Oui. For you are fairly lifting me along. Here. This is my place. I'll carry you up the stairs. Oh, no. Of course. You're very light. And you're very cold. You should not have stayed out in the rain. I'll put you down until I find my key. Oh, yes, here it is. In a moment, we shall have warmth, light, and food. Yeah, stand by the door until I light the lamp. in, please. Now, sit down over here, and I will light a fire. 
Over here. What is wrong? Why do you stare? Sit here. I... I will have a fire going in no time. Then I will fix you coffee. I do not know why you are so kind to me. You are alone and lost. And so am I. Draw up closer to the fire now. Why do you still stare at me so strangely? May I tell you that you are very beautiful. All my life I've dreamed of someone just like you. I feel as if I had known you for a long, long time. You're safe now. You need fear no longer. It may be dangerous for you to harbor me. I am an aristocrat. I'm supposed to be an enemy of the revolution. You may find yourself in prison for giving me shelter. I'm not a Frenchman. They won't put me in prison. But I am an aristocrat. Yes, I know. I could tell. Not only from your beauty, but the black velvet band you wear about your throat. It has a diamond brooch of rare and costly design. It is all I have left. Will you tell me your name? Marie. And I am Jan van Dirk. Marie, I'll not let them find you. If they do, they will put me away where you will never see me again. Listen to me. I am earnest and sincere. All of my life I've been searching for you, Marie. Will you marry me? Oh, no. As the wife of a Netherlander, they can't touch you. You only pity me. I love you. I want you to marry me, Marie. It is true. I do feel that we met a long time ago. And so do I. I've dreamed of you. I've spoken with you. I've looked into your eyes before. But it is all impossible. Say my name, Marie. Jan. Jan. It is not impossible. I want to marry you because I love you. Perhaps you will not want me to be your wife when I tell you what happened to me today. I don't want to hear it. Our lives began when I found you in the Place de la Grève. I'm going out to get a priest, and we'll be married tonight, now. But the clergy has been forbidden to practice the rites of religion. Those who have not left Paris are in hiding. Oh, but I have great news to tell you. My only friend in this city is Father Perichon. Some time ago, he confided in me, told me that he is a priest. I will go and find him now. Marie. Yeah. You consent. We. Oui. For I love you. Yes, these two. One who had suffered untold horrors that day. And one revolted by the tragedies all about him. Met on a dark night. Met and found that they believed they had known each other during some other hour. Met and fell in love on sight. Jan looked into Marie's soft brown eyes. Gazed on the pale face. And knew that she was the girl of his dreams. With her consent to marry him, Jan rushed out into the dark night, now silent, foreboding as if the black skies were mourning for the dead. Finally, he arrived at the door of Father Perichon. He knocked. There was no answer. He tried again. Then he saw a wisp of light through the darkened door. Father Perichon, it is I, Jan. Step inside, my boy, quickly. Father... Father, I want you to come quickly. I found her. Found who, my lad? The girl of my dreams. I found her tonight. I want you to come and marry us now. Father, don't ask me any more questions. Come with me now and marry her. It's over. We're married. You belong to me now. We. Oui. For as long as he permit me to stay. He? Whom do you mean? Death. His shadow is always hovering over me. Why do you keep speaking of death? You're not going to die. We have years and years of life and happiness ahead of us. I wish it were so. Oh, how I wish it. Marie, come to the window with me. Take one last look at this view of Paris in the nighttime. For I'm going to take you out of this city of death and terror... Out into the country where we can live in happiness and peace. If it could only be so. I'm going to make it so. Tomorrow morning I'm going out into the country and find a little villa. Away from the blood and the hate. Out into the sunshine, Marie. It will purify us. If you could do that, Jan, perhaps. No. 
It would make no difference. The angel of death is forever with me. You must not talk so. I will find the villa. Marie smiled wistfully. Somehow it gave Jan the hope that she would someday forget all the horrors and sorrow which now held her in their grip. They sat at the window looking out over the sleeping city. They sat silent till the gray of dawn came into the sky. Until a rosy haze was over the east. It was then that Marie's fears came back twofold. She was alarmed, quickly agitated. Jan, if you are going into the country, go now. Go now. I will wait until the sun comes up. No, it will be too late. Too late, I tell you. Go now at once. You really wish it? What do you fear? You know, they will find Never. me. Never. And they cannot harm you. For you are Madame Jan van Dirk, a Netherlander. Oh, Jan. All right, my darling. I will go now. For the sooner I go, the sooner we will be away from all of this. We. Oui. You will be here when I return. You promise? I promise. Then I will start at once. By nightfall of this day, we will be away from here, you and me. Starting a new life in the world of peace. Marie, you and I in the world of peace. Jan left. He walked out into the country. He had no trouble finding a charming place. A little house set in a lovely garden the whole property surrounded by a high wall. Jan knew that here Marie would forget and be happy again. He rushed back to Paris as fast as he could and up to their little apartment. Marie! Marie! Threw open the door. Yes, she had kept her word. She was there waiting for him. Exhausted from the tragedies of the day before, she was lying across the bed, head hanging over the edge, one arm thrown over her face. Marie! Marie, I found it. I found the most beautiful place you ever saw. A place far from this city of unhappiness. A place that will be heaven for us both. Wait until you see it. Wait till we... Marie? Marie? She doesn't move. She's not breathing. Her hand is cold. No pulse. No pulse. Marie! She's dead. She's dead. <laughs> Help! Help! She's dead! She's dead! Marie! She's dead! Help! <laughs> they have found her while Jan has been away. They have killed her. Who has done this thing? Will Jan find out, eh? The hermit will tell you before the night is done. <laughs> and now, the hermit again. <laughs> and now, he who tells us the strangest stories ever heard goes on, tells us of what befalls Jan van Dyck. After he finds Marie lies dead. <laughs> Horrified and frantic, the young boy runs out of the apartment, down the stairs, babbling to himself, crying out in grief and terror, calling for help. And then an officer stopped him. Here, here, what is the matter with you? She's dead. She's dead. I went to the country. I came home and found her dead. Who is dead and where? My wife. She's up in our apartment. Come. Come, I will show you. You are not a Frenchman? No. My wife. Someone has killed her. Get hold of yourself. Death is a common thing these days. But to Marie, they had no right to do this to Marie. We will investigate. Over here on the bed. I found her here. Mm. She is dead, all right. You say you left her alive and then found her like this when you come back from the country. Yes. Are you sure you did not kill her? No. No, I loved her. I loved her more than anything in the world. Let me get a good look at her. What is it, officer? What is the matter? How long have you known this woman? I met her last night, but I've known her forever. I met her last night. We were married a few hours later. You were married last night? Yes. Not a week ago, not two days ago, but last night. Yes, yes. Sit down in this chair. You are half crazed. Sit down and let me talk. Yes. Now, listen. Listen carefully. 
I saw this woman yesterday in his sunset. I know who she is. She's the one I love. She's gone forever. Yes, I was stationed near the Place de la Greffe. You saw her as I did, weeping. I will tell the story if you will listen. Down the street near sunset came the howling mob. Crying for blood, intent on the kill. And down the street came the tomb, carrying its victims. Aristocrats whose time had come. The family of La Tarin and the crowds following them. The tumble drew near the square. The crowd cried out in fury. Then the cart stopped. Do not fear, Philippe. My son, have your eyes upward. Look at the sky and believe in God. We have armed no one. We have done no wrong. We have never spilled blood. We have never hated. No speeches, your son is gone. The guilty. Take us to the guilty. Mama, your eyes in the future, Marie. Look into the arms of the setting sun. Get it done with. I am ready. One by one, the family of Monsieur Lafarin walked up to the guillotine. First Madame, then the boys. Then, monsieur. And then the daughter. She stood there. Her head held high. Her eyes on the sun now almost gone. The crowd was silent for a minute. She seemed to frighten them. There was a pause. And then... trying to make me believe. I am telling you the truth. I stood at the foot of the scaffold yesterday when this woman in your rooms was guilty. No. She was alive when I left her early this morning when I went to the country. Late last night we were married. I can prove it. Look, let me show you. You see this black band around her throat? If I remove it, see. See. <laughs> if I did not hold the red, it would roll to the floor. Now do you believe do you believe? No! No! <laughs> A fit of hysteria overcame Jan. It was the beginning of an hysteria that dragged him into madness. He spent the rest of his days in an asylum. The authorities never believed Jan's story. They said he had dragged a corpse into his room and in his madness believed that she was a living person. But to the day he died, Jan insisted that his story was the truth. And Father Perichon, he wrote in his journals, he too said the girl had been alive on the night after the storm. He said the date of her marriage. But it didn't tally with the hour and date of her execution. So no one believed. But as time goes on, the story has been told and retold in our family. I've often... Wondered if it were not true after all. Of course, Jan was a relative of mine. And he went insane. So you may think I, too, am in touch with madness. 
But it is the strangest story I have ever known. in the hermit's cave are fictitious and similarity to persons, places, or occurrences is purely accidental. The Mummers in the Little Theater of the Air. have been deeply altered. I have learned the results of the blackness of terror, the hideousness of sin, and the horror of madness. On Wednesday last, about 10 p.m., a telegram was delivered to me. Who on earth can be sending me a wire? Who else but your father? But Papa always calls. Well, before you open it, we're not going to Blue Acres this weekend. We haven't had one weekend to ourselves since we were married. Paul, it is Papa. I knew it. No, you don't understand. Here. Your father's seriously ill. Suggest you come at once. Dr. Lorry. Papa. Papa. Oh, now take it easy, Marlene. He's never been ill a day in his life. Your father's getting along in years, darling. You can't expect him not to have some bad days. But Dr. Lorry says seriously ill. And he's usually terribly conservative. We must start at once. understand me. I love my husband, Paul, very much. But up until the time I married, I had never left my father's side. We'd been inseparable. Ever since that dreadful morning, when as a little girl of eight years, my papa had taken me on his lap. And after kissing me tenderly and brushing the curls back from my forehead, he had said, Little doll, your papa has something very sad to tell you. But you must be very brave, my darling. Your mother has left us. She has written this note to inform us. To Terence and Marlene. Life here at Blue Acres has grown intolerable for me. You're a little child, Marlene. And therefore I cannot explain some things to you. But Terence will know why I'm leaving my little girl, try to think kindly of your mother. 
I would take you with me if I could, but that is impossible just now. Your father is a wealthy man, and he can give you fine things. I know at Blue Acres you will grow up to be a lady of whom I shall always be proud, and a daughter whom I will love forever. Do not cry, my little doll. Had your mother loved you, she would never have left you. From this day forward, there'll be no mention of her name in this house. To us, she is dead. It was some years later that I learned that my beautiful mother had left Papa and me and had run away with Philip Cork, a chap the townspeople said was a worthless dauber in paint. Nothing was ever heard of my mother or him after they left the Acres. Nor did my father, Terence Lane, ever mention her name. He devoted his life to me. I had private tutors that came to Blue Acres to instruct me. The very best. Papa imported a master of the piano to teach me. We remained aloof from the world. The only woman in the household beside myself was Mrs. Eaton. Father always did the cleaning of the house. For Blue Acres is filled with priceless treasures. And when I would laugh at him dusting, he would always remark, Can't let her clumsy fingers touch this vase. It's worth a thousand dollars if it's worth a penny. The years moved on, and I lived in a world of my father's creation. Until this last summer when I was 21 years old. One glorious summer night when the moon made golden patterns on the terraced lawns of Blue Acres. And the waters of the colored fountains centered in the ground shot a million rainbow lights into the night. When the French doors of the music room were opened wide to let the cool night air enter in. I sat at the piano playing the works of one of my favorite composers, Debussy. not fond of Debussy, and as soon as I began playing, he got up from his chair and went to his study. But the haunting melancholy of Debussy suited me. It was a background to my dreaming, and the somehow lonely feeling of my heart that was growing stronger as the years wore on, with only Papa for my companion. I went on playing. Suddenly, I was aware of the presence of another in the room. I felt it strongly even before I turned around. Oh, please go on. It's beautiful. Suited to a night like this. Please. I'm sorry, but I don't Oh, don't, don't believe... be sorry. I'm the one who owes you an apology for my intrusion. I'm Paul Wilde. I'm spending my vacation at the Truesdales who live down the road a ways. Oh, yes. They told me there was a princess living at Blue Acres. But they didn't do you justice, young lady. No princess was ever quite so fair or lovely as you. Please, Mr. Wilde. The Tuesdales also added that a dragon named Terence Lane guards the Princess Marlene with his life. That was very unjust. Really? Well, then, if you're not zealously guarded, how about taking a stroll with me? The night is wonderful. And if you're good... I'll reach up and pick you a necklace of stars to wear. I'm sorry, Mr. Wilde. You won't go? It's late. And Papa would object? No. Well, then, with your kind permission, I'll call tomorrow afternoon to gain his consent for a date tomorrow night. Do I have your permission? Well, yes. Fine. Then do something for me now, will you? If I can. Play something for me as I walk away. Shall we have something light and joyous this time? Something more in tune with the happiness in store for you and me. I'll be listening for our theme song. Paul, Paul Wilde. Only those deeply in love can understand what I mean when I say it was adoration on sight. I knew that from that second until eternity, there would be none other for me than Paul. 
And true to his word, he was at Blue Acres the next afternoon, asking father's consent for an evening with me. I didn't hear their conversation, but I did hear from Papa later. My dear, I'm an old man, wise in the ways of the world. I've spent my entire life protecting you from the vulgar of this world, the worthless. Had I protected your mother more carefully, there never would have been the scandal in this house caused by her treacherous act. But Papa... I have already called into the city. This Paul Wilde is nothing but a simple clerk with poor wages. Is there never to be anyone for me? Of course, when the time comes. But this is not the time. I had never disobeyed my father, but I did so that night. I sent Paul a note, and we met at midnight in the gardens of the lake. My Marley. Say it again, Paul. It sounds so wonderful. I've never had anyone but Papa speak my name with love. My Marlene, I have a lifetime of love to give you. A heart bursting with love for you. Do you love me, my darling? Oh, yes, Pa. Say it. I love you. Oh, I love you. And now say this. I love you enough to leave Blue Acres and marry you, Pa. I love you enough to leave. Oh, Pa, I can't. I can't do that to Papa. Must you give up your life to him? No, but to leave him as Mother did. Then will you let me go out of your life? No. No. There were other surreptitious meetings. There were arguments, persuasions, protestations. But in the end, love won out. Paul and I ran away and were married. I will never forget the following day when Paul and I returned to Faith's father. What is done cannot be undone. Papa, you forgive me. Yes, I forgive you. Oh, Papa. Paul, isn't he wonderful? You are the love of my life. And if Paul realizes this, he will not keep you absent from me for any long periods of time. Of course not, Papa. Blue Acres will continue to be our home. But I hadn't reckoned with Paul when I made the statement. He would not quit work and live at Blue Acres off Papa's bounty, as he called it. So for the time being, we'd been spending weekends at Blue Acres. At this moment, I felt a little resentful that Paul had taken me away from Papa. We arrived at Blue Acres and Mrs. Eaton opened the door to us, just as dawn was breaking over Blue Acres. Oh, at last you've arrived. Come in. Papa, your father's a very sick man. What is it, Mrs. Eaton? I think, Miss Marlene, you should let Dr. Laurie explain. Oh, here. I'll take the luggage upstairs. I'll go to father. You'll find him in his study. Doctor had a bed set up in there where it's easier for me to care for him. Besides, he seems more content there. Hasn't Dr. Laurie gotten a nurse for Papa? We tried it, but he wouldn't have one. We'd better knock on the door. Doctor's in there with him now. Come in. Papa, I ran across the room to my father's bed. I looked down at him, and then in dismay at Dr. Laurie. For my father's face was a horrible sight, twisted and pulled out of shape. And his eyes, his burning eyes, they were staring at me wildly. I reached out for his hand and cried out to him, Papa! I... I... What is it, Dr. Laurie? Stroke. I... Oh, Papa, don't worry. Dr. Loy will get you well again. Can you hear my voice? I'm not quite sure this morning, but I think so. He does know who you are. Uh, come outside with me, Marlene. I want to talk to you. I'm going in the drawing room, Papa, to talk to Dr. Loy. I'll be right back, and then I won't leave. I won't leave until you're well again. Come in the drawing room, Doctor. I should never have left him. Fiddlesticks. You did the right thing. But my marriage has brought this on. He loved me so, and I love him. He's been lost with me, gone. Marlene, I, um... Dr. Laurie, his eyes... Yes, my dear. 
I was just about to talk to you of this. What is it? I wish I knew. Your father is suffering from some terrible fear that I'm inclined to think is nothing to do with his fear of dying. Has he said anything about it? He can't speak. Only the guttural sound you heard. He can't write. He can't lift his hands. Oh, how dreadful. What that fear is, I don't know. I've watched with him nights, and it appears that whatever causes his wild fear is worse then. Poor Papa. As soon as office hours are over this evening, I'll drive out here to Blue Acres. Perhaps between the two of us, we'll be able to discover what causes his distress and be able to help him. It filled my heart with sorrow to see my father suffering such pain and discomfort. And the look in his eyes, the mad, wild look, was almost more than I could bear. At last night came. I rejoiced when I heard Mrs. Eaton usher Dr. Laurie in. He and I sat by Father's bed while the heavy minutes ticked past. There seemed to be no change in his condition. But as night wore on and it was fast reaching midnight, there was a change in his eyes. The fear in them was so marked that I trembled from it. Dr. Laurie said... Do you see? His eyes. Yes. It's as if he sees something we don't see. Yes. It was so. His eyes seemed to be riveted on the door to his study. And it was then that I thought I heard a low moan. What was that? don't know. It didn't come from Father. No, but look at him now. Now Father's eyes were trained in closer to his bed. <laughs> he was struggling, attempting to lift his hands. <laughs> it was very plain to me, and I cried out. <laughs> Doctor, there's some unseen thing standing over Papa's bed. That is the way I diagnose it. There is. Something unseen to us, but clearly seen by your father. <laughs> and look... The bedclothes are moving, but he's not touching them. What is it? Dr. Lloyd, what is it? <laughs> An unseen spirit, eh? Witnessed only by the dying. What does Lawrence Terrence Lane see? Hmm? What causes him to fear so mightily? The hermit will tell you before the night is done. <laughs> and now the hermit will continue. <laughs> Only a few minutes have passed, but Marlene. Her anxiety to aid her father in his terrible fear only makes matters more difficult. Now it appears that the dying man wishes his beloved daughter out of the room, too. <laughs> and so Paul, the husband of Marlene, with his arms about her, leads her from the room, guides her into the music room where she sinks into a chair, sobbing softly. Listen. <laughs> Darling, if you get overwrought, ill, you won't be able to help your father. Oh, Paul, it, it's so dreadful. I tell you, Papa sees things there in his room. Some vision that frightens him. I saw the bedclothes move and Papa wasn't touching them. Please, dear, try to control your nerves. Shall I have Mrs. Eaton make you some tea? It'll help soothe you. I'll be right back, darling. Only take a second. kitchen. I sat trying to get a hold of myself. It was only a few minutes after he'd left the room. Once again, I was aware of the same sound I had heard in Father's room. The sound that had made his eyes turn mad with the terror of it. Oh, 
Was I, too, losing my mind? What was the answer to this strange phenomenon? A sound that to my ears was exactly like that of a woman moaning. At first it was close to me in the music room. And then it grew fainter, but still distinct. And though it's difficult to believe, there was a second when I felt as if something had brushed past my chair, had touched my shoulder. I cried out for Paul. Paul! Paul! What is it? I'm right here. Paul, listen. Do you hear a strange sound? What sort of a sound? A sound like a woman moaning. No. I heard it distinctly. You listen. Hey, you drink this tea and forget about such things. Please, Paul, quiet. Now, do you hear? By George. You do hear it. Some unusual sound. Where is it coming from? I don't know. There it is again. Yeah. So it seems to be coming from these walls of the music room. That's it. Or from out on the terrace. Oh, it's nearer than that. Here. In this wall behind the piano. Yes. <laughs> Why are you feeling the walls? This panel here. Look. It's... Why, the panel that opens. I've lived here all my life, and I never knew of it before. And in a room in here. And you can hear the moaning from here much closer. Marlene, get the candle from the piano. I'm going to look around in here. Yes. Here, Paul. Yeah, this passage in here must lead to another room in the house. I'm coming with you. And the moaning we heard was from someone in the adjoining room from here. Paul, we... Here, look. What is it? This enormous chair. Listen. Quick, there's someone inside this chair. I believe you're right. Hurry, they'll smother to death. Yeah, it's locked. Locked? Someone's been pushed into this chest, and it's been locked against them. Hurry, can't you break it open? I'm going to try. Now the lock is giving now. One skeleton, Paul. Two. Two. I'm going to take this chest into Terence Lane's room. When I question him and show him what we've found in his secret hiding place, no doubt we'll have the answer to our tragedy and our riddle. When confronted with the chest and the skeletons of human beings found in it, when asked questions by Dr. Lorry that Papa could answer by a nod of his head, we found the solution to the mystery of Blue Acre. Yes, the skeletons were those of Philip Court and my mother. My father had killed them before they ever got away from the house the night mother intended to leave him. Dr. Lorry filled in many blank spaces in the life of my mother and father. Your father was an insanely jealous man, Marlene. He would allow her no friends. He even went to the city alone and bought her gowns for her. He would allow no one to look upon her. He hated me because I attended her at your birth. Oh. I was surprised when he allowed you to get away from him and marry Paul. But I figure that out now. What do you mean, Doctor? I found a large quantity of arsenic in his desk. Great heaven. I'm sure it was his intention to do away with you, Paul. Then, once again, he could have Marlene to himself. Take me away, Paul. next morning. Terence Lane, my father, is still living. Mrs. Eaton cares for him. I haven't been out since that horrible night when the moaning of my mother's spirit led me to her grave. But we will go out this weekend if he's still living. Paul says I can never be happy unless I forgive him. Besides, the eyes of my father show madness in the evening after darkness gathers. And so we know he is tortured enough. Each night he must see the spirit of my mother standing over his bed, accusing him of his crime of double murder. Terence 
slain lies suffering for his guilt, unable to speak to those who stand beside him. And in the night time, a vision of a woman appears before him. The vision of one whom he murdered because of his insane jealousy. Yes. Terence Lane has learned during these last hours the blackness, the awful blackness of terror. Turn on your light. Turn them on. <laughs> I'll be back. Pleasant dreams. <laughs> Places and occurrences mentioned in the Hermit's Cave are fictitious, and similarity to persons, places, or occurrences is purely accidental. The Mummers in the Little Theater of the Air. insane, it's because of the great calamity, the great shock that he's just had. I understand, Mr. Judson. I hope that you do, Miss Dawson, for upon your understanding of the case, will his recovery largely rest? Yes, sir. You've brought your credentials with you? Yes, sir. May I see them? Oh, they're right here in my purse. Just a minute, I'll find them. Yes, here, Mr. Judson. Mm-hmm. Yes, this is right. Miss Marion Dawson, registered nurse. And a letter of recommendation from Dr. Simmons. Yes, sir. Yes, I think you'll do very nicely. You look very capable and professional. Thank you, sir. Did Dr. Simmons explain anything about the case to you? Well, not very much, Mr. Judson. 
He only said that your brother was suffering from shock and that I That's all right. I'll explain the case to you. Yes, sir. Before I take you up to his room... Oh, I'm sorry. I haven't been very thoughtful. Won't you remove your hat and coat? Thank you. Here, let me help you. Ah. Well, you look even more professional. There's something about a white uniform that does give a person prestige. I came dressed to go on duty immediately. Dr. Simmons said that you'd want me to. You did quite right. Now, sit down, won't you? Thank you. Now, Miss Dawson, it's my only blood relation living that you heard calling for help from upstairs. My brother, whose life I value more than mine. Yes, sir. Last night, we buried his wife. Oh. He'd only been married to her a month. How tragic. Well, death is not always tragedy, but this death happened to be. For Lenore was not only young, but beautiful. My brother and I were traveling when we met her six weeks ago. Oh? A young girl, without family, but a charming girl, nevertheless. Arlen fell desperately in love with her. In two weeks, they were married. We returned to our country estate here. A week later, she was taken ill. Last night, we buried her. It's awful, isn't it? Well, no wonder your poor brother's mind is deranged. You have not heard all the tragedy yet. She suffered from a strange malady. Because of it, my brother was not allowed to see her from the hour she was taken ill. I see. I could not have my brother's life endangered. Naturally not. We allowed no one to see her. Dr. Simmons attended her. When she died, we buried her without ceremony and immediately. I didn't allow even a servant to come in contact with some strange disease which might sweep us all to death. But you... Yes, yes, I cared for her. The hours of my life may be counted right now. Oh. As well as those of Dr. Simmons. But that doesn't matter. It's my brother Arnold with whom I'm concerned. That's why I've called you in to care for him. Yes, sir. And this is the point that you must understand. My brother Arnold doesn't realize that Lenore is dead and buried. That's not unusual, sir. Many people are like that about death. They won't accept it or believe it. I've had to lock him in his room, bolt down the windows, to keep him from rushing out to find her. Perhaps if he'd seen her dead, sir, well, he forget, might... she died of some strange malady. That was impossible. Yes, yes, of course. The worst part of it is that he keeps thinking he hears her calling to him. Claims that he hears her voice. Oh. That's why he wants to get out of his room and go to her. That's why you'll have to watch over him, carefully. Don't allow him out of your sight. Humor him, but guard him carefully. Remember, my brother's life and sanity may depend upon the good care you give him. I'll do my best, Mr. Judge. I'm sure you will. You realize that I love my brother. You'll be well paid for your services on this assignment, Miss Dawson. All I ask is that you carry out my orders explicitly. Don't let him out of his room or out of your sight. Now I'll take you up to him. If you'll just come along this way. Open the door. Open the door, Bruce. Open this door. It will be your duty to get him to quiet down. Keep him from pounding on this door. Yes, sir. I presume that Dr. Simmons suggested that you give him sedatives. I'll get him quiet, sir. Open the door. If you don't open it this minute, I'll smash the windows. I'll jump to the ground. Let me out. I'll unlock the door now. I'm going to unlock the door now, Arnold. Get away from the door. Let me out. I've got to go to the door. Now, step back, Arnold. Bruce, where is she? She's been calling to me. Why did you lock that door? Let me go to her. Go lie down on your bed, Arnold. No, never. Don't you understand? Lenore has been calling for me. She needs me. Come now, lie down. Won't you lie down and rest, sir? Who is she? Well, this is Miss Dawson, Arnold. She's come to care for you till you're well again. I'm not ill. It isn't I, it's Lenore. And you won't let me go to her. Bruce, why are you doing this? Unlock the door and let me go to her. There, now, it's all right. Everything's all right. Miss Dawson will care for you. You'll get a good rest. And when you wake up, you'll feel a lot better. Your brother's right. I'll leave you now. 
It's eight o'clock. I'll have your dinner served in here immediately. If you need me for anything, I'll be down in the library until near 11 o'clock. Then I'll retire. Yes, sir. My room is the fourth one down on the right. Call for me if you need me during the night. I will, Mr. Judson. Wait a minute. Don't go, Bruce. Tell me, Wellington, oh, no, Lorius. What is it that's wrong? Why can't I see her? Why have you locked me in here? I've tried to tell you, Arnold. You won't believe me. Perhaps Miss Dawson can explain after I leave. Ring this buzzer if you need to get out of the room. You understand, Miss Dawson? I get away. Get away from the door, Arnold. What? He's locking the door again. He's locking us in. He knows what's best. Now, come lie on your bed. No. I'm going to give you something so that you can rest. What's wrong with Lenore? Lie down on your bed and I'll tell you. She's ill. And they won't let me see her. Here. I want you to take some of these tablets. I won't take any medicine. I'll get a glass of water. I tell you, I won't take anything that will make me sleep. Lenore is calling to me. She needs me. Now, take these, please. They won't make you sleep. They'll just calm your nerves. Take them and and I'll tell you about Lenore. Have you seen her? What is it that's wrong? Take these tablets first. All right. There. That's it. Are you here in the house to take care of her? What's wrong? Lie down now. There, that's better. You promised to tell me. Close your eyes. I'm going to turn off the light so that you can rest. Answer me. Don't you understand? Your wife was very ill. She suffered from a disease that was contagious. Your brother couldn't let you see her. But now she's out of her pain. You see... No, she's not dead. I know she's not dead. It's hard to believe, I know. She's not dead, I know that. Listen. You hear that? You hear that? No, sir. I hear nothing. You must hear it. It's Lenore. She's calling to me. All day she's called to me. All last night, all the hours of the night she's called to me. She's calling now. Can't you hear her? She's still in this house. She's not dead. She's in this house and she's calling to me. Calling to me. Right here beside your bed. What's happened? You've been asleep. Asleep? How long? It's nearly midnight. You've been sleeping since I first came into the room. You gave me medicine. You forced me to sleep. You needed the rest. Where's my brother? He's retired, sir. The whole house is quiet. If you'd like me to get you something to eat, no, I'll... But I've got to get out of here. What's that? Listen. What was that? It sounded like someone at the door. It is. Open the door. It may be Lenore. I don't hear her calling, but it may be her. It can't be her. But I'll see who it is. Who's there? Unlock the door. I have to ring for your brother if I want the door unlocked. I have no key. Who's there? Who's outside the door? Is it you, Lenore? Why don't you answer? I guess we must have been mistaken. There's no one outside the door. Someone knocked at the door. I think we must have been mistaken. Listen. There is someone outside. What? They're tapping on the door again. It does sound like it. But when I called, there was no one there. Look. Look. Yes. Yes, I am. Doesn't it seem to you as if the door was slowly opening? Yes, it is. It's like it was opening all by itself. But the door is locked. Well, that may be, but that door is opening all by itself. How can it be? Oh. Look. Look. 
standing in the doorway. It's Lenore. Oh, great heaven. Lenore, you're not dead. You're here. They told me you were dead. Lenore, she's leaving again. Where are you going? Wait, wait. She's vanished. Oh. She just vanished, but, but now look. She's standing at the head of the stairs. She's waiting for me to follow her. Lenore, I'm coming. I see you. Stop! Oh, Mr. Justin, help! Come here, come here quickly! He's gotten out of the room! Oh, Mr. Justin, please, please come quickly! Oh, heaven. What is it, Miss Dawson? Well, what is it? Oh, Mr. Justin, he's gone down the stairs. What? Are you sure, sir, that, that Lenore is dead? Of course I'm sure. What are you talking about? I don't know, sir. But a woman dressed all in white just stood in the doorway of your brother's room. She moved down the hall and now he's gone to follow her. He said it was Lenore. Oh, hurry. Hurry, stop him. Don't let him get away. It can't be Lenore. She's dead. Dead. Hurry, we've got to get Arnold back to his room. And who could be standing in the doorway? He said it was Lenore. Nonsense. Arnold, wait for us, wait. Wait. I don't see him now. Where has he gone? He turned down that side road, sir. Just now. He's liable to get out on the highway and be killed. We've got to stop him. This way. He went this way. Yeah. I see him now. Arnold, stop where you are. We're coming. Lenore. Lenore. You must come back to the house, Arnold. She disappeared. You didn't see anyone, Arnold? Yes, I did. I saw Lenore. As for the nurse, she knows. Lenore stood in the doorway of my room. She beckoned me to follow her all the way down the road. Now she's vanished here in the park somewhere. Don't you realize, Arnold, that Lenore is dead? She couldn't have stood in your doorway. She couldn't have beckoned you out of the house. She's dead. She wouldn't speak to me. She just waved for me to follow her. And now she's gone. We must get my brother back to the house, Miss Dawson. Yes, sir. Now, come, Arnold. We're going home now. We'll take you home now, Arnold. You and I must have been mistaken. We didn't see anyone. No. We were not mistaken. Look. Look. Up ahead of us. (gasps) Lenore. There she is again. Great heaven. I see you. Wait for me. I'm coming. Stop him. Stop him. We've got to stop him. We can never catch him this time. He's running so fast. Oh, he mustn't go that way. No. No. Arnold. Arnold, wait for us. Wait. Look, Mr. Jensen. 
Look where he's going. I see him. He can't go that way. No. Arnold, stop. You can't go there. No. We've got to stop him. He can't go there. We must stop him. Oh, wait, let go of me. Let go of me. You can't stop me now. I'll not let you go in that vault. Let go of my arm, Bruce. You can't stop me. Lenore went in there. I'm trying to save you for your own good. For the sake of the sanity of your mind. Your wife lies in her coffin in that vault. You couldn't have seen her. She didn't beckon you to come here. It's just a trick of your mind. I'm going into this vault. You can't go inside. She died of a contagious disease. You may get it too, Arnold. Nothing can stop me now. I'm going inside. Oh. Oh. Lenore. Where are you, Lenore? Come back out there. You'll only find her lying in there dead. We'd better follow him, sir. He's likely to faint when he sees her. Arnold, come out here. No. 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 Oh. Oh. You see, she is dead. What did I tell you? Now come away. Oh, but look. She's on the floor of the vault. Oh. Come away from here. I found her here on the floor of the vault. She's dead. She's dead now. But she wasn't dead when you brought her here. No. My brother knows that. You know that, Bruce Judson. What do you mean? You know what I mean. You buried her alive. Oh! Now you're insane. Insane, am I? You know I found you out. Because you find her body on the floor, you think I buried her alive? Why, the coffin tipped over, that's all. You buried her alive. She got out of the coffin. But she couldn't get out of the vault. Only her spirit could do that. I heard her voice before she really died down in here, calling me. She called to me. But you locked me in my room. And then her spirit came to me tonight to tell me what had happened. All of Noah. Lenore! Oh. oh, what a terrible thing! You did that to your brother and that woman! <laughs> what if I did? What if I did do it? <laughs> She's dead now, isn't she? Forever. She fell in love with Arnold, not me. Now she's dead. Forever. Sure, I planned it, plotted it. It worked out. The medicine I gave her made her sleep the sleep of death. And we buried her alive. <laughs> we buried her alive. <laughs> buried her alive. <laughs> Such a heinous crime will live in a world of mad darkness from now on. The compensation for his crime. <laughs> Turn on your light. Turn them on. <laughs> Pleasant dreams. <laughs> Occurrences mentioned in the Hermit's Cave are fictitious, and similarity to persons, places, or occurrences is purely accidental. The Mummers in the Little Theater of the Air. Now the 
hermit. if you please. What's that? Yes, Mr. Burton. Well, Millie, you're dressed to go out. My breakfast hasn't been served. That's right, Mr. Burton. I'm leaving right now, and I'd like my wages, if you please. Well, this is preposterous. Oh, it's something bad, all right. Well, you can't go without giving me more notice than this. I'm sorry, but I can't stay. Well, what's it all about? This house, Mr. Burton. It's this house. It's Truly haunted. Nonsense. It's just because we've only been in the house for a few days. It's strange to you yet. But don't get over being strange. It gets worse every night. Oh, ridiculous. Well, you can say all you want to, Mr. Burton. But I'm leaving. I'll work for you in the city. I've been faithful to you for a good many years. And I'll go right on being faithful if you'll move back to the city again. Millie, I can't run my life to suit those who work for me. I purchased this house in the country in order that I might have peace and quiet for my work. Mm, there's a little peace here. Every night, the sound. Last night. Last night, I... Oh, I don't want to talk about it. Please, Mr. Burton, I've got to be leaving this morning. How are you going to get into town? I took the liberty of calling one of the stores, and the owner's sending his son out with a car. Oh, all right, Millie. As soon as you give me my wages, I'll wait outside. I'm afraid to stay inside any longer. Why, of all the absurd... If you value your life, you'll get out, too. my shoulder. Oh, ridiculous. Page is turning. Pages of my ledger turning. Just as if a hand moved the pages. Wind couldn't cause it. There isn't any wind in here. Utter nonsense. Millie's got me all upset. Now, my test tubes. My experiment. The test tubes knocked to the floor. I'm not dreaming this. This is too real. I need Karma. He'll solve this. Hello. I want to put in a long distance call. I'd like to speak to Lyman Karma in New Carden. Yes. Yes, you've got it right. Lyman Carmer in New Carton. The telephone number is... How much farther do we have to drive into the wilds, young man? We're almost there now. Life of me, I can't figure why Jim wants to hide himself away miles from civilization. Well, this new man ain't been out there but a few days. A few days too many, if you ask me. I drove out here yesterday. I picked up a woman who'd been working out there. I wanted to go back to the city. Not Millie. Seems like that was the name she gave. Well, what's up? I couldn't rightly tell you, mister. Just couldn't tell you. Jim seemed to be 
strangely urgent about something last night. Mm, look, mister. You can see the lights of the house now. See you, buddy. Ten right away through the trees. Oh, yes. Yeah. What sort of a place is it? Well, it's quite a place, mister. Really something in its day. Old house, hmm? Yes, sir. I guess no one's lived in it for years. Old man Chimler knows it. He's lived in town as long as I can remember. Yeah, this is the drive leading up to the house. Lined with trees on both sides. House never gets no real daylight into it. Yeah, here we are, sir. Now get your bag. Oh, never mind. I can take it. You young men? Oh, thank you, mister. It's more than it's worth. That's all right. Anything I can do for you, just call the general store and ask for Mark. Thanks. I'll do that. Lyman. Jim. Hello, Jim. I began to think you didn't make the train. Yeah, it was 40 minutes late. Come on in. Nice of you to come. You old recluse. The idea of picking a spot no man ever heard of. Bring your things into the sitting room. We'll go upstairs later. All right. Well, this is nice. Uh huh. Sit down. Thanks. Yes, Millie got it fixed up pretty well before she went back to the city. My laboratory is right off this room. Everything handy. You had dinner, Lyman? Yes, Jim. On the train. Good. I'm not much at fixing meals. The, uh,. Young man, Mark, from the general store, said that uh, Millie had left you. What's the idea? I'll tell you all about it. That's why I called you. Well, it's nice here, Jim, but I can't see why you chose a place so far away from everywhere. Oh, I like it here. Well, that's reason enough, I guess. Millie coming back to take care of you? No. No, I'm afraid not. Lyman, Millie left because she was certain that that this house is haunted. Oh, oh, oh Jim. <laughs> I called you last night because I remember a story you once told. A story of a haunted house. You told it as if you gave credence to the tale. Is that so? I remember well. That's why I wanted you here. Well, Jim, you don't think by any chance that this house is haunted, do you? I'm not so sure but what I do. Oh, absurd. You think it impossible? Well, naturally. You didn't talk that way when you were telling us that evening of a place off the coast you knew that was haunted. That was a fireside tale. Quite different from reality. Lyman, it's only a short time until midnight. Will you come into the laboratory with me? Will you sit in there with me for a little while and see if the same things that happened last night occur again? Of course. If the same things do occur again, I shall be convinced that Millie was right. I shall be quite sure that... Something does happen. Does haunt the house. Nearly midnight, Jim. Did you check the door into the laboratory to see if it's closed tightly? I checked it. You're convinced it's securely fastened? Yes. Night. Yes. This was the hour last night. What are we to watch for? The door first. The door into this laboratory. Listen. It sounded as if someone has his hand on the doorknob. Before. Well, there's no wind tonight. No, last night. Iman, do you feel the presence of someone in this room? Someone besides us? No. I don't. I do. <laughs> what is it? Once again, it was as if something brushed past me. Touched my shoulder. You 
see? Pages of my ledger are turning. As if a hand is on them. Jim, I... I can't believe my eyes. It's incredible. Now, look. On the workbench. See? Something is moving those test tubes. I'm going to stop this before all my experimental work is ruined. What are you going to do? I'm going to walk over there, put my hands on the rack. Lyman. Something touched my hand. Something that felt like sharp nails digging into the flesh. Oh, it's your nerves, Burton. Lyman, there's something in this room. Something that moves about in here. Some unseen thing that enters the door and moves in this room. Don't let your imagination run away with you, Jim. There is a thing in the house beyond scientific explanation. You know it. It's something vital and alive. A thing of power and locomotion. And it's up to us to find out what it is. Well, we might as well look through this room. No use overlooking anything. Seems silly, doesn't it? We're not going to find anybody in these rooms. Didn't you say that Millie heard things upstairs? So she said. She complained the very first night we were here that someone entered her room. She didn't see anyone? No. She didn't see any more than we did just a while ago downstairs. Now that the incident of downstairs is past, it seems to me that it never happened. Perhaps it was your power of suggestion that made us both think we saw movement. Well, nothing out of the ordinary in this room. No. Well, what do you say we forget it and get some sleep, hmm? All right. We're not going to discover anything tonight, I guess. Did you talk to the man who sold you the house, Jim? Jim? Yes. Sure, he brought me out here after I'd chanced upon the place. We went all through it together. Of course, he didn't say why the house had stood unoccupied for a long time. Yes, he did. Said that after his wife died, he wanted to live in town. But he was getting too old to keep up a place like this. Uh-huh. Said that up to this time, he couldn't find anyone who could afford to buy it. Oh, well. We'll go downstairs and get your things and bring them up to your room. Simon, what was that? Something downstairs. It came from the laboratory. I know it did. It's the only place where there's so much glass. Don't get upset, Jim. Great heavens, look. Well, of all things. Everything in the room smashed. Equipment that's taken me months to build. Everything ruined. Jim, some human has been in here. Someone who's trying to stop your experiment by destroying your equipment. Wipe out your work. Oh, ruined. It'll take months to arrive at this point in my experiment again. Someone has been hiding downstairs here, Jim. Now, we've got to find out where and who it is. a human being who hides in the house, intent upon destroying all that Jim Burton creates in his laboratory? Or is it an unseen force, as Jim said earlier in the evening? An unseen force with power and locomotion that lives in the old house. Eh? The hermit will tell you before the night is done. <laughs> Lyman Karma sat in the laboratory. Just a few minutes ago, the clock struck midnight. Right now, Burton is busily engaged, building up step by step the experiment which has been ruined the night before. Lyman Karma sits watching him. <laughs> Jim, don't you think you ought to knock off for the night? You work steadily all day. Well, there's so much time lost that I have to make up, Lyman. Well, it's certain we aren't going to have any visitor tonight. There's nothing left for them to destroy now. Tomorrow I'll go into town and inquire around. Think I should go to see old man Chimlin. Ask him to tell me something about the place. Well, maybe he can put us on the right track. Mm-hmm. 
I would have gone today, but I wanted to make sure. I wanted to see if we'd have the same experience of last night. You, uh, going to work much longer? At least an hour. It's way past midnight. Guess I'll go upstairs. Okay. If you want anything, call me. All right, Lyman. Thanks a lot for staying over. It's a great help. Yes, if we can find out what it is or who it is that's causing this trouble. We'll find out. Good night. Good night. Let's see. Next step is to unite the two chemicals. Perform step B. Where's that ledger? Yes. And the next step I performed was... Oh, wait. Pages in the ledger. Page five, six. A page is missing from here. Every step I'd worked out and put down is torn out of this book. Oh. Oh, what is it? What is it that dogs my trail and won't let me do this work? Step by step, I'll have to work it all over again. Is that you, Lyman? No. No, no, it isn't. Just as before, I feel the presence of some person in this room. As if they were standing over me. Look. What do you want? What is it you... Something around my neck. Something choking me. is burned by the stuff he was working with. Hello. Oh, for heaven's sake, hurry. Hello, operator. Send a doctor to the old, old Chimlin place right away. Hurry. There's been a terrible accident. Man's face is almost burned away. Well, doctor? I'm afraid it's quite hopeless. If he lives, his sight will be gone. His face horribly scarred. Poor Jim. We'd only gotten out of this place last night. Did you call Asa Chimlin as I asked you to do? Yes, he should be here any minute. I'll wait then. Sit down, Doctor. After the story you told me about the experience you've had, I think it's up to Chimlin to tell his story. You sound as if it was something very mysterious. Something that Jim should have been told before he bought this place from Chimlin. If it had been told, it would have saved him the agonies he's going through right now. Mr. Karma, what I know has given me in professional confidence. What others in the town might have told you would have been gossip. And no one tells gossip about Asa Chimlin. How so, Doctor? Well, he's the owner of many mortgages, many notes. A man of wealth and power in our community. I see. Oh, there's a car turning in the drive, Mr. Karma. It must be Chimlin. I'll go up to Mr. Burton again. Call me if Chimlin refuses to speak. Well, thank you. Hello, sir. Oh, hello, Mark. Where's Mr. Chimlin? Oh, he didn't come, sir. He called at our house and got me to drive out and bring you this note. Oh, come in. Why? Oh, I, I reckon I better not, sir. Well, why not? I reckon I'd just as leave stay outside of this house, if you don't mind. Well, oh, come on in just a moment while I read this note. Nothing can harm you in the daytime. Well, all right. Just till you read the note. Come in here. Sit down while I read the note. Yes. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, yeah. Mart, what 
made you say you'd rather not come inside this house? Oh, I can't say, sir. Really, I can't. Mr. Chimlin would get even with my dad if I said any more. You see, he about owns our store. I wouldn't tell Chimlin. Come now. Uh, well, sir, you see the Chimlins, their daughter, she wasn't quite right, and she died out here. And Mrs. Chimlin, she hanged herself. Folks have always been scared of this house because of that. I see. Why did Mrs. Chimlin hang herself? I don't rightly know. Well, perhaps the doctor can tell us. Hello, Mark. Hello, Doc. Chimlin didn't come. Sent this note saying he would refund Mr. Burton's money and take the house back again. Says nothing more. Uh-huh. But Mart here has volunteered to tell me that there were two deaths in this old house. One, a hanging. That's right. Mrs. Chimlin? Yes. And the girl? Her case was hopeless. Eighteen, she had a mind of a child of four. They took her everywhere, but to no avail. Time after time, Mrs. Chimlin pleaded with me to put the girl to sleep, to end her misery. I couldn't do that. She hated me for it. Her hate grew until her mind was unsettled. One day, she took it upon herself to end the girl's life. Then, realizing what she'd done... She hanged herself in the room Mr. Burton has been using for his laboratory. If Mr. Chimmon knew we told us, Doc... Oh, that's all right, Mart. If there is any truth in the fact that an unseen force lives in this house, and you'll see how hard it is for me to believe that, then why did it seek vengeance on Mr. Burton? I have never believed in supernatural force any more than you. But remember, I've seen it at work in this house. And as for seeking vengeance on Jim... Doctor, he was working on an experiment to prolong life. A discovery which might have added untold years to the life of a human being. And this is something that the spirit of the woman who hanged herself did not want. That's why it destroyed the experiments. And that's why it destroyed Jim Burton. He died just before I came downstairs. force was the spirit of a woman who took her own life, a woman who could not rest in her grave, a woman who returned to destroy anything that might prolong life. Yes. She killed Jim Burton by the power of supernatural force. Turn on your lights. Turn them on. <laughs> I'll be back. Pleasant dreams. <laughs> Characters, places, and occurrences mentioned in the Hermit's Cave are fictitious, and similarity to persons, places, or occurrences is purely accidental. The Mummers, in the Little Theater of the Air. Yesterday, we weren't so alarmed. When he didn't come to the office this morning, why then we concluded something must be wrong. He's here in the house. We'll find out in a minute, Benson. Yeah. Oh, it's 
dark in this hallway, Mr. Lamont. There must be a light switch here somewhere. Oh, yes, here it is. Oh, there, that's better. He hasn't been sleeping here at his house for over a year. No, but they said at the club that he wasn't there yesterday. Hadn't slept in his room there last night. In that case, he may be here. That's what I'm afraid of. Maybe he had a stroke or something and wasn't able to get to a phone. We look upstairs first. Yes, I think we'd better. Ah, here's the stairway. It's queer, isn't it? If he came here in the evening, wouldn't he have left some lights on? That's what I was thinking. Ah. Ah, it's gloomy in this house. No wonder he shut it all up and went to live at the club after his wife died. Mr. Davison has always been a peculiar man. I haven't been his attorney as long as I have without realizing that. Mm. Do you know which bedroom is his? Yes, I think this one. At least we'll try this room first. Yeah. Is it locked? No, it just seems to stick. Must be the door is swell. Let me try it, Mr. Lamont. Oh, I'm getting it now. Here it comes. Gee whiz. What's the matter, Benson? I don't know, but when you opened the door, it was as if something grabbed a hold of my hand. What? Well, I know it sounds queer, but it was as if an icicle touched well, it's me. It's just the cold air rushing out of this room. It's as black as night in here. Curtains and drapes are heavily drawn. Now, if I can find a light in here. Oh, here it is, Mr. Lamont. Uh, not in here. No, not here. Maybe this isn't his room. Well, if he's going to stay in the house, he'd sleep in here. This room hasn't been touched for a long time, has it? Well, I guess not. Mr. Lamont, isn't it queer that this room should be so cold? Well, no, there's nothing strange about that. A room that's all closed up gets damp and cold. I have a feeling that it's going to start snowing in here any minute. This cold air oh, seems to freeze your very blood. Mr. Benson, I, I don't think your employer stayed in this house night before last. I don't think anyone's been in this house for a long time. Well, then, where is he? I don't know. We look in the other rooms up here. Huh. Turn off his light. Shall we close the door? Yes, leave everything just as we found it. He finds out that we've been snooping around up here. He may not like it. He's very peculiar. I know, but certainly he'd want us to hunt for him if he thought we were worried. If we thought he was lying up here dead. He doesn't like people prying into his affairs. Uh, that's true. Yeah, we'll look in this upstairs library. If he's not in there, well then, means he's not here in the house. Yes. But... Huh? What was that? Sounded like a moan. Uh, yes, it did. Uh, uh, Mr. Davison, uh, uh, where are you? Uh, Mr. Davison? Mr. Davison, where are you? Oh, he's not here in the library. No, it sounded as if it came from downstairs. Yes, I guess it did. Hurry, let's get down there. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, Mr. Davison, uh, where are you? He's not here in the living room. No, but we heard a moan from somewhere. Sounded like it. Mr. Lamont, look. Look, do you see... See what I'm pointing at? Where? That book on the table. It moved. It it moved all by itself. What? It did. I saw it. I, I saw it. It moved from one side of the table to the other. Nonsense. That's impossible. My eyes aren't playing me tricks that badly. I saw it move. Come over here. Look. Uh, you see where it's been lying? Imprint in the dust. Yes. Now it's over here. Wait a minute. This is getting a little too deep for me. Oh. Benson, what's the matter now? I felt that touch on my hand again. I did. Hey, there is something queer going on in here. Look. Look over there at the window. You see that? Yes. Yeah. It's like someone was touching those drapes and making them move. Yes. Mr. Lamont, let's get out of here. Let's get out. Hurry. Right. They couldn't see me. They couldn't hear my voice. Isn't there anyone who can hear me speak? Oh, if you know how badly I needed help, how hard I tried to make them hear me. You people who are of the world and know it. You who can step to the mirror, look at it, and see your face and body reflected there. Oh, how thankful you should be. Just a few moments ago, I managed to propel myself to the mirror in the hall. I looked into it. I stood directly in front of it. There was nothing there. I have no face, no body, no arms, no hands. And yet, and yet a sound came from whatever it is that I am. Like a moan. 
My lawyer, Mr. Lamont, and my bookkeeper, Mr. Benson, came rushing down the stairs. I could see them. But great heaven, they couldn't see me. I called out, Help me! Help me! But they went out the door, slammed it shut, left me here alone. Oh, doomed to what? Isn't there anyone who can tell me what's happened to me? Two days ago, yes, I can still reckon days, I left the office and went to the club. It was about an hour before dinner. I sat reading the paper. Suddenly all the letters began to jump and dance before my eyes. I distinctly heard something whispering in my ears. Go to your house. Go to your house. I threw down the paper. No one seemed to be watching me. I was so frightened I felt I must be ill. But I couldn't tell anyone in the club. There was a buzzing in my ears. And I could hear that voice saying, Go to your house. Go to your house. I walked out the door down the street. Some power seemed to be forcing me to go. I walked fast. I approached my house. I haven't lived in it since my wife died. I looked up at it. It seemed to be weaving back and forth. Black clouds hung over it. I walked up the steps. I reached the outside door. Mechanically, I took the key from my pocket, inserted it in the lock, opened the door. I stood inside. Now, why was I here? Why had I come to the house? I didn't know. I walked into the living room. Suddenly, I felt a great rush of cold wind. It engulfed me, whirled round me, seemed to be wrapping itself about me. Help! Help! What is it? Help! Help! My body is freezing. My blood has turned to ice. Help! 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 I can't move! I can't move! seemed to be bathed in a purple twilight. It was then that I realized that I no longer had a physical body. I seemed to see everything in the room but myself. Look down at your hand and arm. Realize what it would mean to have the feeling of it, but not be able to see it. Can you imagine such torture? I can make things move, but I can't see the hand that moves them. Oh... Horrible, terrible calamity that has befallen me. How long am I going to go on like this? What sort of a world am I living in? In the purple shadows between this and the next? Someone have mercy on me. Help me. Great heaven, someone help me. Mr. Benson. Yes, Mr. Lamont. Before we go into the next room to talk to Mr. Davison's niece, I... I think there are a few things we should settle between us. Yes, sir. Yesterday ended a year since the disappearance of Mr. Davison. There's no doubt about it. He's dead. He must be, sir. He was kidnapped, which I'm inclined to think happened. Kidnappers must have gotten frightened and killed him. There were no ransom notes received? No, because they became frightened after they killed him. But his body... Don't know what they did with it. It's possible that though we dragged the river, it's still there. We've gone all over that before. That isn't what I want to talk to you about. It's... It's his house. Yes. Police have been through it dozens of times since the day last year when you and I went through it. I know they have. If they saw or heard anything peculiar, they failed to mention it. As far as you and I are concerned. I've never mentioned what happened to a soul. Nor I. Been so long now, I... I wonder if it could have been true... I often think the same thing. According to Mr. Davison's will, the house and part of his estate is to be deeded to his niece, Loretta Hathaway. She and her husband are in the next room. I think it best, Mr. Benson, that we never tell her what occurred to us that day. I agree. 
She and her husband are not wealthy. Money in the house would be very welcome to them. We shouldn't spoil it for him. No. All right. We'll go inside now and read the will to them. Mr. Hathaway will take over Mr. Davidson's business. Think you'll find him a nice man to work for. Come. Let's go inside. Yes. Dan, you think you're going to like it here in this house? It almost seems to be too grand for us. I know it. Weren't you surprised to find out that Uncle Jim had willed us so much? Business? Half his money in this house? Well, rather. But then, of course, there was no one else for him to leave it to. I know. Dan, have you ever thought he might have committed suicide? No. I never thought that. Mother said he wasn't always as peculiar as he was during his last years. What do you mean? Well, I remember her saying that it was after he built this house and he and Aunt Mary moved into it that he began to change. You know, there's something about this place that would make anybody change. Now, what do you mean? What I mean, Loretta, is that why it's so blame cold in here. The house has been shut up for over three years, Dan. I know, but it's warm outside. This house is like an ice box, and we've had the windows open all day. It'll get thawed out in a few days. Mm, I hope so. I suppose we'd better retire. You take charge of the office tomorrow, don't you? Yes. Poor Uncle Jim. I still keep thinking that he may have committed suicide. I've often wondered if they went through his desk and things to see if he left any notes. Oh, yes, they've gone through his things dozens of times. Dan. Yes? It was three years ago that Aunt Mary died, wasn't it? Oh, about that. She took an overdose of sleeping powder by mistake. And six months after that, Mother died. Then Uncle Jim disappeared. A lot of tragedy in one family in a few years, isn't it? I wouldn't dwell on that, Loretta. What are you doing? I just thought I'd go through this desk to see if I could find anything that no one else has discovered. I wouldn't look through those things tonight. Let's go upstairs. I will in a minute. Dan. Dan, come here. What is it? Look at this. Look at this writing. Well, what is it? That's what I'm asking you. Just purple marks on a piece of paper. I know, but what peculiar marks. Like they were made with a fingernail and written in some foreign language. What do you suppose it is? I haven't any idea. It's probably been there for ages. If it had any significance, the police would have used it. I know, but it's lying right here on top of all these papers. As if it had been dropped here just recently. Dan, feel of that paper. It's ice cold. Yes, it's like everything else in this house. Oh, come on. You can rummage through that desk tomorrow. I'm going upstairs. Do you realize it's nearly midnight? Dan! Dan! Heaven sakes, what is it? Look! Look! See that window blind? Look at it. Why, why, it's moving. Yes. Look. Look at it. It's moving up and down all by itself. Oh, oh I, I see what it is, Loretta. There's something the matter with the roller. You've seen that happen to window curtains before. They fly way up to the top or way down to the bottom of the window when the roller's broken. But, Dan, it, it was just as if some unseen hand moved that window curtain. That's what it was like. Some unseen hand moved that curtain. Davison is still trying to make himself known to the people in his house. The hermit will tell you before the night is done. <laughs> now, the hermit again. <laughs> Midnight in the house. Loretta and Dan are sleeping, but not... Well, listen. <laughs> No, I am not sleeping. I never sleep. You know that I've been wandering in this, my house, for over a year. Living in hideous torture. Oh, I've tried to make someone understand, but it's useless. They only grow frightened, as Loretta did earlier this evening. But she didn't get frightened enough, no. I'll tell you why, what I've discovered in these long, endless hours that I've spent here. There's something strange about this place. Something horrible. You hear the wind? It's beginning again. 
About midnight every night it springs up. There's a queer purple glow over everything. And the cold sears me all through again. Penetrating to my very marrow. I know. I have no form that you can see. Or I can see. But I can feel pain just the same. Such pain as you never dreamed of in your normal world. Loretta and Dan will suffer the same transformation as I have if they don't get out of this house. I've been convinced for a long time now that it must have been true that my wife Mary realized there was something wrong in this house. That's why she took the sleeping parties that night. She took her own life through fear. But why didn't she warn me so that I could die? For as it is now, I may go on suffering like this for ages and centuries. There may be thousands of houses all over the world that are under a spell like this one is. There must be other people living in this strange world like I am. Here it comes again. This wind that lives in this world of purple shadows. I've got to warn Loretta and Dan. I've got to get them out of the house. I must propel myself up the stairs and open the door to their room. I'm climbing the stairs now. I can see in the night. I can see everything but myself. I think my hand is touching the banister. Now, I'm at the top of the stairs. I must open the door to the room. Oh, that wind. It's making me suffer such pain. I must warn them. in this room. And where's the wind coming from? Loretta, get out. Get out of this house. It's going to be too late. There is a strange light in here. Turn up the night lamp. It doesn't seem to make any difference. The light is getting stronger and stronger. And the wind is freezing me, freezing my blood. Loretta, I feel it too. Let's get out of this room. Help. I can't move. I can't move. Loretta, I can't move either. I, I'm powerless. Help. Someone help us. Help. I can feel my whole body changing. Loretta, what's happening to us? Dan, help me. I, I reached out for you and knocked over the lamp. Loretta, I can't see my hand anymore. I can't see my arms or my legs. Look. Standing in this room. It, it, it's Uncle Jim. Jim Davison. Yes. You see me now. For your change, the same as I am. What's happened to us? We've entered a strange world. It's this house, it's under some horrible spell. I've been in these shadows since the day I disappeared. Uncle Jim, is there nothing we can do? Nothing? There's our only hope, see? You knocked over that lamp, Dan. This room will soon be all afire. Yes. Let it burn. It may burn down the house and give us the freedom of death. It's our only hope, our only salvation. Death, give us freedom. Let us get out of this torture. Have mercy. Save us. Have mercy.
What's the news, Mr. Lamont? Did they find the bodies? They've gone through the charred wreck of that house for hours. There's no trace of a body there. Well, you think they got out before the house burned? Then where are they? Benson, I don't think they got out. But they didn't find their bodies, Mr. Lamont. They didn't find them. But no one will ever hear of them again. What do you mean? It's difficult to explain to anyone but you. Because you and I know there was something strange about that place. Yes. I was with the firemen when we went through the wreckage. It was their bedroom. There was nothing there. But Benson, as we were going through it, smoke, of course, was smoldering there. But a huge purple flame sprung up and seemed to lose itself in the atmosphere. It startled me. I stepped back. Firemen thought I'd found something. Of course, I, I couldn't explain to them. I don't know that I can explain to you. But it was as if, well, as if something registered in my mind. And a voice said to me, you'll never find their bodies. They're gone. Gone forever. Places and occurrences mentioned in the Hermit's Cave are fictitious, and similarity to persons, places, or occurrences is purely accidental. The Mummers in the Little Theater of the Air. Gas? Couldn't be, Charles. Denon filled up at the last stop. What is it, Denon? For heaven's sake, man, how do I know? Well, that's that. Ooh, I hope we don't get stranded in this forsaken territory. Well, that'd be something, wouldn't it? We haven't passed a house in the last three hours. Well, I might as well get out and see what I can do. You want me to take a look at it, Denton? No. I'll tinker with it a while. You and Nan sit down on the side of the road. I might be able to find the trouble for you, Dad. Charles was only trying to help, Denton. Never mind, I say. I'm have a thing going in a moment. Do as I say. Sit along the road. I'm going to work. Come on, Charles. Let's do as he says. Just as you say, Denton. 
Here's a nice place to sit, Charles. We can look right down into a valley from here. Oh, it is nice, isn't it? See? You can look all over the valley. I wonder what they call this place. I wouldn't know. Oh, look. We're not so far from civilization as I thought. A town at the lower end of the valley. Yes. Now, that's still a long way away. You see? The road takes a roundabout way along the rim of the valley. Uh Uh-huh. Say, uh, I bet that's where I'm going to work. Do you think so? I'll just bet you that's where the job is that Denton got for me. Way out? Away from everything? Oh, I don't know. Looks like a nice little town. I'll make out all right. I hate to have you leaving us, Charles. I'll be terribly lonesome. Oh, I'll get back to the city occasionally. You must be sure to do that. Sure I will. Man, Denton can't hear us talking from here, can he? No. I have a feeling that he managed this job for me way out here because he didn't want me living with you two anymore. Oh, no, Charles. Why should he object to my own brother living with us? You've got me there. I can't figure it out. When I first came to stay with you, Denton talked of getting me work close by. I know he did. Man, there's something strange about it. I don't know exactly what you mean, Charles. Yes, you do. Ever since Denton came back from that road trip, he's acted strange. Now that you mention it, I think I have noticed something different about Denton. He was jolly and friendly enough to me when I first arrived. And now, all of a sudden, he's changed. Maybe we're imagining it all. Doesn't seem that he'd be jealous of his wife's own brother, does it? No. Denton's not like that. But he has been for the last ten days. Morose... Sullen, sitting most of the time staring at me. Maybe he feels I've been paying more attention to you than to him. Maybe that's it. It's only natural that I'd be solicitous of my own brother, whom I haven't seen for so many years. Uh, We won't talk about it anymore. All I hope is that he isn't ill, that you aren't going to have trouble with me so far away. You said we mustn't worry about it. We won't. No. I do wish he'd get the car started. He wouldn't let me help him. Fairly pushed me away. Denton's frightfully independent. But I wish he'd hurry. Nervous? I think we're going to have a storm. We should be getting out of these hills and down into town quickly. Say, the sky is getting black and gloomy. Look over to the west. The clouds are piling up fast. Something of a wind coming up, too. Denton just stands there looking at the car as if he didn't know what he was doing. Maybe he doesn't. Well, let's go back over. Maybe you'll let me help him now. All right. I want your step. There are jagged pieces of rock here. That wind's getting stronger every minute. It sure is. Looks like we might be getting a tornado. How are you making out, Denton? What? Located the trouble? We should hurry, Denton. There's a terrific storm coming up fast. Can't make the car go if it doesn't want to. Look at the sky, Denton. We're in for a real storm. Wow. There goes my hat. No use chasing it now. Please, hurry. Get the car started. All right. All right, get inside. Maybe it'll go now. Let's hurry. I'm like mad to get out of these hills and into the village before the storm breaks. I know these roads. I'll get you out all right. Denton, don't be so cross. Jump on every word Charles says. Then don't give me orders. down the hill. Wow. That was a peal of thunder. Denton. Denton, we can't drive on, is it? No. No, we can't. What are we going to do, Dan? Can we sit in the car and be safe? We aren't going to sit here. We're going to make for shelter. But where? There's a house sitting up there on the rock. It's so dark, I can't see it. There's a house up there. I got caught in a storm the last time I was through here. 
Climbed up to that house and stayed until it blew over. Well, can we get up there all right? We can make it. We'll have to. Get out of the car. We've got to start right away. Hurry. Climb out. Give me your hand, Dad. It's in the middle of the afternoon and black as night. Oh, well, we've got to climb fast. And I'll take hold of hands and start up the rock. We've got to get to that house. We've got to get there. Give me your hand, Nan. Let's go. Hurry. Come on. door, Denton. We don't have to knock. We walk right in. What? Hurry. Get inside. Boy, what a relief. I I thought for a few minutes we might not make it. I'll bolt this door so the wind won't rip it open. Who owns this place? Doesn't anyone live here? There was no one living in it when I stopped on my way through here last time. Must belong to someone. It's completely furnished. Whoever owns it hasn't been here for a long time, then. Everything's covered with dust and cobwebs. I can see them even in this pale light. It's so dark in here. Can't you find a lamp or something, Denton? I'll get a light. There's one in this room off the hall. Come on, Charles, let's follow him. I don't like standing in this dark hall. I found a lamp. I'll have it lighted in a moment. Oh, it... So damp and cold in here. Ooh. There. Huh. Light makes it better, doesn't it? Some. Maybe. I don't like the looks of this place. At least we're out of the storm, Nan. You stopped here on your last trip through, Denton? And there was no one living here then? That's what I said, wasn't it? But it's completely furnished. Surely someone lives here now. Maybe they do. They aren't here now. It's almost like a dungeon in the room. Windows are built so high. Something like a fort. But it's Grand Denton knew of this place. It shelter out of the storm. The wind couldn't blow this building over. Denton? What? What are you staring at? What? You heard what I said. What are you staring out into the hall for? Say, Dan, are you all right? Don't clench your hands that way. What do you see? Did I say I saw anything? What's the matter with you? Don't keep asking me questions. I've got you out of the storm. Isn't that enough? Now leave me alone. Where are you going? Where are you going, Denton? Stop him, Charles. Don't you think we all have to sit in here? When the storm blows over, we can drive on. What's wrong with him? He's moving like a person in a trance. Get him to come back in this room. Are you ill, Denton? Is there something we can do? Stay right where you are. Both of you. What is it? I'm going into that... that room across the hall. But why... Why don't we all stay together? It's dark in here. I don't like it. I want you to stay near me. I said I'm going into that room across the hall. And I'm going alone. Your brother Charles will take care of you. You prefer his company, don't you? Is that what's wrong with you? Why do you act this way toward my brother? You might as well make up your minds. Both of you. That we'll stay in this house until morning. I'm going into this room to sleep. Denton! It's no use. He is ill. He's got it in for me. Come on. Let's go back where the lamp is. Listen. You hear what he's doing? Barricading the door. What does all this mean? Oh, Charles. Let's get back to where the lamp is. It's as if he's lost his mind. Sit down. It's 
been coming on him for some time. Ever since he made that last trip through here. We know that. What shall we do? Why did he go into that room and leave us? As soon as we get into town, we'll persuade him to see a doctor. Let's make the best of it now. If he wants to leave us and sleep, let him. Oh. It's tough on you, Nan. I'm sorry I brought you all this trouble. Denham's never been this way before. There's something dreadfully wrong. <laughs> What was that? Oh, is that Denton laughing? No, it can't be. He's never laughed like that in his life. Oh, it's coming from the room Denton went into. That's for sure. He's going mad. Oh, Charles. Come on. He'll have to let us in. Denton? Denton, what is it? Let us in. Dan, let us in. Locked? Bolted and barricaded. Denton, please let us in. <laughs> it is coming from in there. But it's not Denton. It can't be. Oh, what are we going to do? What shall we do? <laughs> Everything's all right now, Nan. He's quieted down. He answered you the last time you went over to the room? Yes. He said, I'm all right. Go away. Oh. I think he's going to sleep now. We might as well do the same. I can't sleep in this horrible house. Yes, you can. It'll only be a few hours before morning. But what if Denton refuses to come out of that room in the morning? He'll be better in the morning. The storm's passed over, too. Everything will seem different in the morning. Leave the lamp burning. I'm scared. Sure. I'll set it on the mantel. It won't bother our eyes, but it will shed some light. Yes, that will be all right. You think Danton will sleep? I think he's asleep now. I'd break the door down, Nan, if I thought it would do any good. But I think it's best to let him get over this spell by himself. I'll never believe it was he laughing. Who could it have been but Denton? Oh, now, don't worry anymore. Try to get some sleep. If he calls out, I'll wake you up. It seems like a nightmare, doesn't it? It will in the morning. Everything will be different then. Go to sleep now. You need the rest. Before the night is done. 
Now, back to the hermit. Terror-stricken Charles and Nan stand in the middle of the room in this strange house on Lost Man's Bluff, wondering who tried to kill Charles. Listen. <laughs> you mean you think it was... I know it was Denton. Oh, that's ridiculous. Denton trying to kill me. I know it was he. With his hands reaching out for your throat. Oh, no. And when I screamed, he ran back into that room and closed the door. Charles, where are you going? I'm going to get him out of that room before something really happens. You mustn't go near him. I've got to. No, you stay here. Never. I'm going with you. I'm going to make him let me in there. He may try to kill you again. I don't think he will. You stay behind me. Benton? Benton! Benton! The door's unlocked. Benton? Stay back, man. I'm going to light a match. Huh? Are you heaven? Denton. What is it? Get back. Don't look. Why are you closing the door? What is it, Charles? What did you see? No. Denton's... Something's happened to him. Something's happened to Denton. What is it, Charles? Tell me quick. What is it? Denton's... Hanged himself. <gasps> Keep hold of yourself, Nan. We've got to get out of here. Down into town and get the authorities here. Denton. Oh, Denton, save yourself. Let's hope the car runs. We've got to get into town. <laughs> the laughter again. Look. Look. Up at the top of the stairs. What, what is it? In this faint light, it... It looks like the figure of a man. Yes, but you can see right through him. (laughs) He's disappeared. Standing there at the head of the stairs, pointing at us. Then vanished. That same laughter. Charles, you're not going up there. We're going to get out of this place right away and get help. Quick, hurry, we must get help. But I tell you, it's urgent. You've got to go up there right now. Go up to that house on Lost Man's Bluff before daybreak? Right now. Oh, no, not me. But my husband is dead in that house. Would never enter the door of that house at night. No, sir. Neither would anyone else in this town. Denton is dead. He ain't the first one to die up there. What do you mean? Ain't never heard of the house on Lost Man's Bluff? No. We don't live around here. Oh, well, that explains that. What did you mean when you said that Denton was not the first man to die there? Five years ago, a fellow that owned that house killed his brother, then hanged himself. What? That's right. But hanging didn't seem to take him out of this world. Now, I ain't the only one that's been there, passed there at night and... Heard his wild laughter. Uh, It's fit to make the hair stand right up on a man's spine. Uh, Other folks try to live in that house. But you know what happens to them when they go in a certain room in that house? The room Denton tried to sleep in? The desire to kill enters in them. And the laughter of him that belongs to the other world drives them mad. They can't get away from it. They return to the place. Charles. That's what happened to Denton. He said he'd been in that house before. They try to kill. If there's anyone near to kill, and then they take their own lives. It's happened to three other people. One man got back to town and told his experience. But he went back up there a few weeks later and took his life. Hanged himself. Oh, no, sir. You'll have to wait till morning. Won't get nobody to go up there in the night. To that house on Lost Man's Bluff.
And the wild laughter from the house on Lost Man's Bluff continues to pierce the night. Don't ever go near it after sundown. No. Turn on your lights. Turn them on. <laughs> I'll be back. Pleasant dream. <laughs> Characters, places, and occurrences mentioned in the Hermit's Cave are fictitious, and similarity to persons, places, or occurrences is purely accidental. The Mummers in the Little Theater of the Air. Now, it's time for the Hermit. This is a coincidence. I was just going to call you. Were you? Yes. Raymond just called me about 20 minutes ago. He did? Yeah. Well, this is more of a coincidence than you thought, because I came up to talk about Ray. Well, what do you know about that? I just had to talk with someone. And of course, Dave, you were the logical person. He's your closest friend. You introduced us a year ago. Which should give me the right to be best man at your wedding, don't you think? If there is any wedding. Hmm? Oh, Dave, there's something terribly wrong with Raymond these last three weeks. He isn't the same person. Why, haven't I told you before? When he gets one of these painting streaks of his, he isn't like other people. He always goes out to his studio cottage and refuses to see any of his friends. I know those moods, but this is different. In what way? I don't know where to begin to tell you. I've been so upset. It's so... so baffling. It all started three weeks ago. Monday night, Ray and I were having dinner at Meadow Lane Inn. You know that place about four miles from his cottage? Oh, sure. Well... We'd driven out to the cottage in the afternoon. Ray was going to pick up some canvases he had out there. The housekeeper... Mrs. Orion, you mean? Yes. Well, she and her husband hadn't expected Ray to call that day, and they were house cleaning. Mm Mm-hmm. So I didn't go into the living room. I stood in the hallway, and I heard Ray tell Mrs. Orion to burn that big oil painting he made of his wife just a few months before she died. You heard him tell her to burn it? Yes. He said it upset him so every time he came out and looked at it. He didn't mention it when we got in the car and drove to the inn. Then, while we were eating, he scarcely spoke to me. So while we were having our coffee, I decided to break the fire. I overheard what you said to your housekeeper while we were at the cottage. I wasn't supposed to, I know. What are you referring to, Vi? About burning that lovely painting. Oh, I I see. You weren't going to do it because of me, because you thought it might annoy me? No. Then why destroy it, Ray? I think it's best. Marion belongs to a dead past. You can't kill memory. No, that's true. Ray, I don't know how to say this exactly, but perhaps you shouldn't marry me in August. Maybe you aren't ready to marry anyone yet. After all, it'll only be three years this month. I know how much you mourned, how much you loved her. Why, let's not talk about it anymore. Our plans are all made. Believe me, it's best for you to forget all that you heard me say to Mrs. Orion. Please, let's not mention it again. Naturally, I said nothing more. But from that night, Raymond seemed to change. Evenings when we've gone out, he's silent, almost morose. He doesn't seem to be aware that I'm in his presence. Then, Monday of this week, he called to say he was going out to the cottage. But he didn't say when he would see me again. 
He didn't invite me to drive out there. It was almost as if he was saying goodbye for good. Hmm. That's strange. You say he just called you? Yes. Did he have anything to say about, well, about him and me? No, he didn't, Vi. But he was very upset. He asked me how busy I was. And then he said, Dave, you've got to come out here no matter how busy you are. I want you to come out and stay the rest of the week. What can be the matter? I don't know. Didn't like Ray, I'll admit. Are you going out? Uh-huh. Tomorrow. Told him I had some work that I couldn't leave until tomorrow afternoon. Oh. I'll tell you what. Tomorrow's Friday. You can drive out Saturday afternoon. Oh, but Dave, if he doesn't want me oh, to be... Oh, nonsense. You come out. I won't tell him. We'll rig up a surprise party. Whatever is eating him, he'll get it off his chest Friday night. By the time you get there, he'll be straightened around. I hope so. Will you come? Yes, if you think it's all right. I don't have to tell you how much I think of Ray. I'll do anything to help him. And although it would break my heart if he decides it's best for him not to marry me, I'll respect his wishes. Forget that angle. He loved Marion very much, didn't he? None of us saw anything of her or Ray while she lived, but I suppose he did. You know it. He never left her side. He allowed her to stay in the cottage while he painted. They were inseparable companions for seven years. You can't forget anything like that in three. No. Why did I have to meet him? Why did I have to fall in love with him? Why you're creating unnecessary mountains. Now, I don't know what's wrong, but I know it isn't anything to fret about. So stop worrying and come out Saturday afternoon ready to have a good time. You'll see. Everything will be straightened out. Well, Mrs. Orion, it's nice to see you again. I'm glad to see you, Mr. Street. Now, where is this guy who dragged me away from a busy office on Friday afternoon? Hmm? He's up in the studio. He said to tell you when you came to come right up there. Fine. I thought when he called me yesterday that he might be ill. Oh, no, Mr. Street. It's not any physical illness he's got. It's something mental. Sir... Well, just exactly what do you mean? I, I can't say any more. I shouldn't have said what I had. But if you're his friend, Mr. Street, you'll urge him to get away from the cottage this weekend. Well, how... Now, please don't ask me any questions, Mr. Street. I can't say another thing. And don't mention to him what I have said. No. No, of course not. Just remember, Mr. Putnam isn't himself, not at all. And he needs you. He needs your help and friendship. He has both, Mrs. Orion. You know how I feel about him. At times, it seems like he's my son. I've taken care of him ever since his parents died all these years since. I know how you feel. And yet, I'm just his housekeeper. I have to remember that. Now, uh, shall I take you up to the studio? No, thanks. I'll burst in and surprise him. See you later, Mrs. Orion. Believe me, I'm looking forward to one of your good dinners. Gosh, I thought from the urgency of your invitation that you wanted me to come out and pose for a painting. <laughs> I've often wondered why you never saw anything worthwhile in this mug of mine. <laughs> yeah, what's wrong, Ray? Just no go? There's nothing wrong. I invited you down because you haven't visited me for a long time. That's all. Okay, Ray. Been doing some work? No. It's a doggone shame that you came into so much money you don't have to paint for a livelihood. You've done some mighty fine things. Now, listen, you can't walk the floor this way and still insist there's nothing wrong. Well, why keep it all to yourself? Why not get it off your chest? You invited me down here for a purpose. Look, we've been friends for years. I'm the logical person for you to confide in. Now, come on, stop walking this room like a lion in a cage. Listen to me. Is it Vi? Have you found you don't care for her? No. Is it something about your health? No. Well, then, it can't be anything very serious. If you're my friend, don't ask me any more questions. If you want to know why I invited you down here, it's because I don't want to be alone. I want you here. Your wish is granted. Now, what do you say we have a stroll around the grounds and then urge Mrs. Orion to serve dinner early, hmm? Come start. Dave, we can't leave the studio. You've got to eat here with me. We'll sleep here tonight. You see, I've had Mrs. Orion bring two cots in here. You've got to stay right here in this room with me. Hmm? Now, wait. Don't ask me why. 
just give in to this whim of mine or whatever you want to call it. You have me baffled, I'll admit. Maybe someday I can explain. If I ever do, then remember this episode is between you and me. Never to be mentioned to anyone else. Now let's settle down. Twelve o'clock. Guess I'll roll up in my bunk, Ray. You ought to do the same. Go ahead if you're sleeping. I am. Wish I could persuade you to have a game of golf with me in the morning. I will in a few days. Well, what's wrong with tomorrow? You heard what I said. I'm not leaving the studio until Sunday morning. So that's that. Well, I'll be talking to you in the morning. Seems a doggone shame to sleep on an old cot like this when this house is filled with good beds. You're turned out to be a heck of a host. Good night. Good night. <laughs> Dave. 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 Mm. Did you hear me? Hmm? Someone laughing. Someone laughing as if they were right outside the windows of the studio. No one can get in these windows. They're all locked. Hey, what is this? As if anyone would put up a fireman's ladder to try to climb in this third floor studio. You don't know what you're talking about. Well, I hope you do. Maybe you're expecting someone to drop in through the skylight. Listen. Did you hear me? Well, sure, someone at the door. Well, get on my robe before you let them in. What? No one here. You heard the knocking on the door, but you see there's no one here. Mrs. Orion was right. What she told me is true. She came back last year at the same time and the year before. She won't rest in her grave. Mrs. Orion was right. She does come back. Now, this business has to be cleared up once and for all. Here, Mrs. Orion, you sit here in this chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Street. Eat? Supposing you sit here. Sure. Hate to get you two good folks out of your beds at one o'clock in the morning, but... I want this crazy business cleared up. My wife and I don't mind, Mr. Street. Oh, we don't mind at all. Anything we can do to help Mr. Putnam. There's nothing anyone can do. I want the whole of this story. Now, Mrs. Orion, Ray tells me that for the past two years since Miriam died, that you people think she has walked about in this house each year on the eve of the night she died. Oh, yes, Mr. Street. Pete and I heard the walking up in the studio. We heard something, all right. Got up to investigate, but we didn't see anybody. Of course you didn't. You know that there's no possibility of such a thing being true. Mrs. Orion, just this afternoon you told me how much you thought of Ray. Well, if that's so, why in thunder would you tell him such yarns? He made me tell him. I didn't want to. I tried to convince myself there wasn't anything to it. But we did hear walking up in the studio, and we heard her laughing just like she used to do. Mr. Putnam, he made me listen on the night last year and the year before and report to him. Ray, what made you think Miriam's spirit would come back to haunt this house? Because she said she would, just before she died. Well, of all that... Now, come on. Suppose you tell me the whole of this wild tale, hmm? You might as well know it all, Mrs. Orion. Well, that's what I say. I was a coward. I stayed away from the cottage last year and the year before at this time. These days are the anniversary of her death. I was afraid of a threat. I... Well, go on, Ray. No one but Pete and Mrs. Orion knew what Marion was like. She was insane, Dave. But I never let anyone know it. I never let her out of my sight. What I'm saying is true, isn't it, Mrs. Orion? Oh, the poor boy put up with more than anyone will ever know. She used to stand here in the studio when I'd be painting. And laugh. Just as she did tonight. Creep up behind me as I worked. <laughs> Miriam, you frighten me. Sure. You're always afraid of me. Afraid that I will kill you. Miriam, where'd you get that knife? Out of the kitchen. Mrs. Orion never saw me take it. <laughs> Give it to me, Mary. I'm going to kill you with it. Just like I'm going to slash your picture to threads right now. Miriam, don't. 
Let him wait. <laughs> Your horrible old pictures. No one wants to buy them. None of them are any good. <laughs> None of them are any good. Why don't you paint me? You paint everything and everybody but me. You don't paint me because you want to spite me. I know it. I had intended to paint her for a long time. I tried to, but she wouldn't sit for me. And when she did, it was always to annoy me. She'd sit and grimace, laugh. I should have put her in an institution, but I couldn't bear the thought of that. She was beautiful, frail. I was afraid of the treatment they might give her. So I kept her near me all the time. Mrs. Orion and Pete were frightened, but they stayed on for my sake. Finally, I decided to paint Miriam even though she wouldn't sit for me. This seemed to mollify her somewhat. Oh, she was much easier to handle those last few months. Almost friendly-like. That was because she was growing weaker, though we didn't know it. You see, I had never called in a doctor for fear he would judge her insane. And then that last night, as Mrs. Orion and I stood by her bed, she raised up, looked at me wildly. I'll come back every year at this same time. Do you understand what I say? I'll come back every year until I have my revenge. We heard what she said, Mr. Street. But I told Mr. Putnam not to worry over it, none. She was always saying crazy things. I did forget it for a little time after she was gone. But two years ago, and then last year, as the time of the anniversary of her death drew near, her threat bothered me. I wouldn't come near the studio. Pete and Mrs. Orion watched for me. They heard her. And then this year I realized that I couldn't marry Vi until I was sure in my own mind. Until I'd stayed here myself. And then tonight. Tonight I did hear her laugh. It was as distinct as if she were alive. So there's only one thing to do. Tomorrow at midnight if I hear a knock at this door. Even though I see no one I'll use my revolver. I'll fire at her unseen spirit standing at the door of this studio. sandwiches and coffee, Rain. Want to join me in a snack? No. Well, I'm going to have coffee, or I may fall asleep on you. Stays piping hot in this thermos jug. Good cup of coffee is just what you need. No, nothing. Uh, you know, it's a strange thing to me how you can be taken in by all this nonsense. You aren't going to hear anything tonight or any night. You forget that I did last night. Oh, you listened so hard last night you had to hear anything your mind created. Didn't you hear someone knock? You had me believing almost anything. I feel so darn silly. As if we were playing a game of cops and robbers. You sitting here with that gun. Both of us waiting for a spirit to make an appearance. Here I was planning on having a swell weekend. I told Vi to come out today, but with things as they are, I decided it was best to call her and tell her not to come. Better have some of this coffee. Dave. Yeah. Look at that rocking chair. The one Miriam always sat in. It's moving. See it? Rocking back and forth. Well, what's funny about that? 
I've seen chairs rock by themselves lots of times. Uh, uh, wind catches them. Mary, I'm sitting in that chair. I see her. She's sitting in the rocker. Oh, get a hold of yourself. There isn't anyone there. <laughs> Stop that laughing. <laughs> I'll end that insane laughter of yours forever. Wait. <laughs> You're the one who's insane. There's no one sitting in that chair. Oh, you frightened the wits out of the Orient. They're coming up the stairs. <laughs> Coming, I'll let you in. Get away from me. You can't touch me. Why, it's all his imagination. Fire the rocker. I thought she was sitting in it. Mr. Putnam, what's the matter? What's wrong? She's got her hands around my throat. There ain't anyone in here but us, Mr. Putnam. Her hands around my throat. Stop. Stop. I, I'll confess. I, I poisoned you. I had to kill you. But you might have harmed innocent people. It was best to kill you. Oh, that. But oh, stop. Mr. Stray, do Let me breathe. Ray. Ray, there's no one in this room. <laughs> Miriam Mar- didn't return. Ray. What's the matter with him? Call a doctor, Mrs. Orrin. I'm afraid he's dying. Get a doctor here immediately. Why, it's a terrible thing. There's really nothing any of us can say to comfort you. He. He poisoned Miriam. Yes, he told us just before he died. You don't think she really did come back to carry out her threat of revenge? I saw no one. I think Ray died of a guilty conscience. But of course, it's true that there were finger marks on his throat, as if someone had choked him. And that is the part that is hard to figure out. Places and occurrences mentioned in the Hermit's Cave are fictitious, and similarity to persons, places, or occurrences is purely accidental. The Mummers in the Little Theater of the Air. Don 
forest is, that's for sure. Had her name stitched in it. Beautiful a piece of sable as a poor newspaper reporter ever looked upon. Yeah, and her other clothing was there, too. Underneath the coat. Well, read it aloud, Clara. It is believed that the beautiful Dawn Forestier has been murdered. This morning, several hours after Dr. Forestier reported his wife missing, Sexton Rolf Griggs of Green Cedar Cemetery found a bundle of clothing inside the cemetery gates which has been identified as belonging to Mrs. Forestier. Oh, golly. In the berry ground. <sighs> Readers of the Gazette will recall the dramatic circumstances which have surrounded Dawn Forestier since early this year. She was discovered one morning in the spring, wandering in the park near Lawnview Hospital by Dr. John Forestier. Sure, I remember. Read all about it. She was a victim of am, um, um, amnesia. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that means you can't remember who you are or where you came from or anything. That tells all about it here in the Gazette. The doctor took her to the hospital. Yeah. And he named her Dawn. Uh-huh. And, and fell in love with her and married her. They never discovered who she was. Uh, it says here, It was thought at the time the beautiful woman who later became the bride of Dr. Forrestier might have attended a masked ball or came from the stage. But no such person was ever reported missing. Sure. Don't you recall it, Clara? She was dressed in an old-fashioned gown that was torn all to tatters. Yeah. And now she's disappeared again, as mysterious-like as she came. Oh, gee, ain't it awful? You know, Clara, I kind of got it figured out. I'll bet she was the mall of some gangster who spirited her away and murdered her. Gee. Murdered. Probably cut into a hundred... Gentlemen of the press, I have called you here to my home to tell you that you need not continue your search for Mrs. Forestier. What do you mean, Doctor? Well, not to continue the search. Well, what's the dope, Dr. Forestier? Have you located her? I think perhaps we have. Well, where, where is she, Doctor? Where did you find her? Uh, please. Uh, what are you going to do? Please, gentlemen. Where... If you will kindly allow me to do the talking, or rather... If you will permit Mrs. Forestier to speak. Then she is here in the house? No. My... My wife will speak to you through a letter she left behind for me. I only discovered it this evening. For you see, she had placed it in a volume of verse from which I often read to her. Oddly enough, I had thought I would never want to open the sonnets from the Portuguese again. It was against my will that I turned to it this evening. Perhaps guided by dawn. Who knows? Who can say? It was here I found her letter to me. Oh, well, what is in the letter, Dr. Forrester? I'm about to read it to you. There will be a few passages I will omit. They are personal messages meant only for my eyes. But here is the story of the disappearance of dawn. My darling John, this is going to be the most difficult and tragic hour of my life. For in this letter, I must say farewell to you, my devoted husband. The story I have to tell you, John, will be so strange and terrible that at first you won't believe it. But as you remember me, as you recall the circumstances of our meeting, how you found me dazed and wandering in the park one spring morning... How oh, we've never known who I was or where I came from. Then you will give more credence to my story. You named me Dawn because you found me at sunrise. Boris, dear, because you love me. We met in the dawn, my darling. But I must creep away from you in the darkness of the night. Oh, John, how I've loved you. And yet how disturbed I've been since I've lived here with you. I've tried to keep it from you. But your analytical mind and keen eyes have often noted my condition. You've repeatedly said... What is it, Dawn? What's wrong? Why, nothing, darling. Why? You know, dear, I often think it must have been during the night time that you were mistreated or abused by someone or something which brought about your amnesia. Why, John? 
Because it's always in the nighttime that you appear nervous, disturbed. Oh, John, you're imagining things. It was not you, John, who was imagining things. It was I. At least at first I thought it was a product of my imagination. It happened for the first time a few days after we returned from our honeymoon and had come here to live. You had left my room. I had turned off the light by my bed, prepared to sleep. First, I thought I must be dreaming. From a distance, I heard a singing wind. Like the opening strains of a melody played on an organ. Something quickened within me. I seemed to know the melody. I thought to myself, everything is going to come back to me. I shall know who I was before I became Dawn Forest here. I listened intently. And then as I was listening, my outer bedroom door seemed to light up. Yes, that's it, to light up. I sat up in bed. A street light shining through my window made the... the thing that materialized against my door. Very discernible. I could see that it was something phosphorescent. It glowed and shimmered in the half-light. Then I could see that it was taking a shape and form. The form of a human being. For many seconds I looked upon it too frightened to speak. Finally I got out the words... What are you? There was no answer. When I spoke, it disappeared. In the morning, I was convinced I'd dreamed it all. But the next night, the same thing occurred again. Once more, I was aroused from a half-sleep by the music of the wind. The second time, the glowing figure seemed to be closer. I spoke again. Who are you? This time, the figure didn't vanish so quickly after I'd spoken. It lingered a few seconds and then faded away like a picture on a screen. This materialization occurred for seven consecutive nights. It was then, John, that I asked a favor of you. Remember? John? Yes, darling? Would you think it too bold of me if I asked if we might go away for the weekend? No, darling. I wish we could... I've noticed how nervous you've been the last few days. I'm sorry, dear. I don't know what it is. Don't let it distress you, Dawn. You're not entirely well, you know. Maybe some time before your nerves stop playing tricks on you. You're so helpful to me, John. I wish I might grant your request to go away for the weekend. But my work at present makes it impossible. Oh, it's all right, dear. It was only a suggestion. I'm really all right. So long as I have you. You had said it would be a long time before my nerves stopped playing me tricks. Oh, this was something to cling to. It was silly of me to get upset. No human figure really materialized in my room. It was my nerves playing me tricks. But the visitation didn't stop, John. Hearing the singing wind, having that glowing, shimmering thing appear in my room was continuous. And... Then came the thing that struck terror in my heart. This night I had fallen asleep. Again, the music of the wind aroused me. I opened my eyes, and then I gasped in fright. <gasps> For this time, the glowing figure was standing beside my bed, so near me I could reach out and touch it. Then something terrible happened. I found I, I couldn't breathe. It, 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 it was as if something was cutting off my breathing. I, I struggled for air. And while I struggled, the thing near me began to make a strange sound. <sighs> Oh, wait. 
that I screamed. <laughs> Darling, what is it? What in the world is it? Dawn, look at me. Tell me, what was it? A nightmare? John. John. From then on, events transpired rapidly. You made an appointment for me with Dr. Bland, the eminent psychiatrist. Oh, I know, darling, you were upset because I refused to go to him. But I knew by then that it was no use. The thing was growing bolder all the time. Many nights it stood over me in my room, and without touching me, was yet able to take the breath from me and command it to enter its own body. As it did this, night after night, it became stronger, and I became weaker. You will recall vividly what occurred two weeks ago tonight. We were invited to the Westin for dinner, and we accepted an hour before we were to leave, I sat at my dressing table, putting the last finishing touches to my makeup. It was only dusk outside. Never had the thing appeared, but in the nighttime, I was brushing my hair when I heard the melody of the wind. The figure stood right behind me, and John... I could see what it was. In the mirror, I could see what the thing was. <laughs> ah, and what can be the thing? That haunts and torments the beautiful Dean Forrester here. Eh? The hermit who knows all the weird and terrible happenings on the earth. The hermit will tell you all before the night is done, yes. <laughs> and now, the hermit. <laughs> And now, Dr. Forrestier continues to read to a group of newsmen the letter his wife, Dawn Forrestier, left for him before her strange disappearance. Listen to Dawn Forrestier's story of the mystery of the thing. <laughs> this, John, is going to be the difficult part to make you believe that as the thing stood behind me at the dressing table, I could tell what it was. We didn't go to the Westings for dinner. Instead, you put me to bed. I shouldn't have allowed you to accept, darling. You haven't been up to par for days. I'm going to call Ralph in to see you tomorrow. You don't look well, darling. Don't call anyone in, dear. It'll, it'll do no good. Nonsense, honey. There are very few things that medical science can't cure these days. And believe me, darling... I'm going to have you well again. Your doctor friend came. He gave me medicine to take. Oh, I knew it was no use, no use at all. And yet I would do anything to humor you. For the thing that I now recognized was getting so strong that it was always near me. As I grew weaker, it grew stronger. And I wondered that you couldn't hear it breathing in my room. <sighs> Now it had a power over me. A strong, compelling power. It was the master. I, almost a slave. Night before last, it exerted its will for the first time. It compelled me to rise from my bed. It was so strong now, it could actually make sound. Come with me. As I rose from the bed, its phosphorescent glow seemed to envelop me. We moved toward the door, and it opened without the touch of a hand. We seemed to glide down the stairs, out of doors, 
The wind that touched my face was like the refrain I'd heard over and over again. We moved along the street, I and the thing. With great speed, we covered the streets and were soon on the outskirts of the city. I could see now the place which was our destination. Then I mastered all the willpower left to me, for I understood clearly all the dark things I'd not known before. But, but John, there was you. I couldn't go to this place where the thing was taking me. I couldn't enter there without somehow leaving word for you. I, I struggled. I, I fought with my adversary. <laughs> I broke away. Somehow I got breath and strength enough to return home and to my bed. And now comes the end of my story and my farewell to you. Here, gentlemen, I, I will omit a page. It is personal. But what happened to Dawn? Where is she? Since this morning, when the sex in that green cedar burial ground found my wife's clothing... Permission has been granted by the state for me to check up on the material found in this letter. I've almost finished reading to you. I'm refraining from reading the last pages till we have made a visit to the cemetery. If you men of the press will get in your cars and follow me, we may be able to complete and verify the information given to me by Don Forestier. Hello, Dr. Forestier. The men have nearly completed digging. Thank you, Sexton. What goes on, Dr. Forestier? As you can see, these men are engaged in opening up a grave. Oh, I want to open the grave. Can you come to the casket, Doctor? Very well, Sexton. If you'll please open the box. Yes, sir. Can you lift the casket out, boys? Right. <laughs> now, gentlemen, after the box is opened... I will read the remainder of my wife's letter. Open it, please, Sexton. Great, you are great heaven. Sure. Dr. Forrest, dear. Great Scott. Why have you opened this grave? Sexton, will you reach in and procure the diamond ring that lies in the coffin? Yes. Here it is, sir. This is my wife's ring, gentlemen. How did it get in this coffin? Here are the last pages of my wife's letter to me. Now comes the end of my story. And my farewell to you. John, I knew from the moment I saw the thing in the mirror of my dressing table. I knew from then on who and what it was. The first night I was strong enough to break away from it as it drew me to the gates of Green Cedar Cemetery. And I've spent my last day writing this letter to you. For tonight... The thing will appear again. And this time, I must follow it. I must follow it to the grave, John. Into the grave. I know how it will be. The thing, the protoplasm that has appeared before me so many nights and has grown in features and strength, will absorb me until I'm no longer a living person. And I must follow it. First, I will hear the music of the wind. Then the thing will appear, and I will be dissolved into it. John, my darling, in case you don't believe my story, open the grave near which you will find my discarded clothing. For I'm wearing the ring you gave me, my love. I'm wearing it as I return to the grave. For you see, John, the thing that I saw in the mirror... That which has gained power over me is I, John. It is my own ghost come to claim me to return to the grave from which I broke away. It is awful, Clara. Could anyone believe such a terrible thing could happen on this earth? Hmm. It's almost too horrible to talk about. Yeah. There, when they opened that grave, lay a decayed skeleton. Oh. Wearing the same satin gown that Dawn Forestier was wearing when she was found wandering in the park by Dr. Forestier. 
And there was Dawn's ring inside the casket. Yeah. It says here in the Gazette that the inscription on the tombstone over that grave read, Lila Manton. And Lila Manton was a famous actress 85 years ago. She died one night very suddenly, just as she was to appear on the stage. Her cue to appear on stage was an organ playing. The music was written by the man Lila Manton was going to marry that night after the theater play was over. And the name of the man was David Forrestier. He was a relative of Dr. John Forrestier. But she died that night. The marriage never took place. What do you think it means, Clara? Does it mean that Lila Manton returned from the spirit world to live out her life that was ended so suddenly? Sure, I think so. But her ghost body made her come back to the grave. Well, that's how I got it figured out. absorbed a new vision and shape and made her return to her grave. Yeah, turn on your light. Turn them on. <laughs> I'll be back. Pleasant dreams. <laughs> All characters, places, and occurrences mentioned in the hermit's cave are fictitious and similarity to persons, places, or occurrences is purely accidental. The Mummers in the Little Theater of the Air. Now, the Hermit. all the racket about. Well, stop crying and tell me what it is. There was someone in my room. Oh, you've been dreaming. No, no. I woke up and heard, heard my door creaking open. I could feel it. There was someone standing in my room. And then I heard them run down the stairs after I called out. Hubert, you've got to go downstairs and look. Well, of course I'll look, but you don't think there's going to be anyone in the house after all your screaming, do you? Oh, Hubert, wait a minute. I'm going with you. You better stay right in bed, Cora. No, I'm afraid. Oh, you said you heard someone go downstairs. I know, but I won't stay here alone. All right, come on. I think you just had a nightmare. Oh, no. That's a nice way to wake a guy up out of a sound sleep. 
All the screaming. Oh, you'd have screamed, too. Oh, not much. I tried to nab whoever it was. Look, careful, Hubert. The burglar may have a gun. I can't find the light switch here in the living room. I'll get it. What? Look. The rug is kicked up. Someone was in here. And look. The things on the table have all been disturbed. Yeah. Hubert, where are you going? Well, to look through the house. Oh, wait for me. room window. I see it. Well, by George. It came in through the dining room window. Well, it should have been locked. I thought it was. I haven't had these windows open for ages, not since I've been home. Well, I'll be... Where are you going? Why, to phone the police. There sure has been someone in this house. <laughs> Looks like they used this window for entrance and escape, all right. Uh, Hal, find any footprints outside the window? No, not a darn one. Hmm. Well, maybe they didn't use the window. Well, there's a cement drive outside this window. It's possible they could have stepped on the cement both entering and leaving. We'll take fingerprints of the window. Now, let's see, uh, a few questions. You were the only one who heard the noise, Mrs. Armour? Yes. I heard the door to my bedroom open slowly. Then close, and then someone running downstairs. And the first thing you heard? My wife screaming. How far is your room from hers? Just across the hall. Are you a sound sleeper, Mr. Armour? Well, I guess so. I rarely wake up during the night. And you, Mrs. Armour? I don't sleep so well. You see, I've been ill and in the hospital. I'm not well at all. There, now, Cora, everything's all right. My wife had a nervous breakdown recently, officer. Oh, I see. Well, just a few more questions, and then we'll let you go back to bed. Uh, any valuables in the house? No valuables, exactly. I usually have quite a bit of money on me. Why is that? I don't bank anymore. Cash my salary checks, and what I don't put into bonds, I use to pay bills. How about tonight? All the money's safe in my room. How do you know, Hubert? Well, silly, I looked when you yelled burglar. Who knows that you carry a good sum of money around with you, Armour? Oh, I don't know. Some of the boys around the office, I guess. I may have mentioned it in the bar. Hmm. You got those fingerprints, Hal? All set. No, we won't disturb you any more tonight. Obviously, there's no one here now. They didn't get anything this time, and they may not disturb you again. Oh, I hope not. It was awful. My nerves can't stand it. Go back and get a good night's rest. That is, what's left of it. You won't have any visitors again tonight. Good morning, Mrs. Armour. Remember me? Oh, yes. You're one of the policemen who was here last night. Mind if I come in? I'd like to ask you a few questions. Oh, no, come in. I was just out in the kitchen finishing up the breakfast dishes. Well, then we'll go out there. I can talk to you while you work. Uh, did you sleep after we left? Well, yes, sir, I did. And you know... This morning, I can't remember much of what happened last night. That's all? But I don't remember things well at all. Not since I've been sick. Lots of times, things are foggy with me. How long were you in the hospital, Mrs. Armour? Let's see. It was... Well, it was a long time, over a month, I guess. What brought on your illness, Mrs. Armour? Well, sir, I don't know exactly. Were you unhappy? Yes, sir, I was. What about? Well, Hubert got so he didn't pay any attention to me. That's so? Stayed out a lot nights? Yes, he did. He was never home. But since I've been in the hospital, he's been wonderful to me. Kind and good and home every night. Oh, came to his senses, didn't he? Yes, sir. There's been a great change in Hubert. That's good. Yes. I feel like I can get well now. Of course, the burglar coming has upset me. Coming into my room like that and standing there in the darkness. Hubert says if it wasn't for that window being open in the dining room, we might just think of it as a bad dream I had. Well, Mrs. Armour, we're going to keep an eye on the house. And we want you to help us. All right. 
What do you want me to do? If you see any strange persons hanging around here in the daytime or night, you call the 4th Street Station and report it. Now, uh, here's the telephone number. Or anything strange that happens, you remember and tell us. Oh, sure, I will. The best I can. You know, it might be a good thing, Mrs. Armour, if you wrote things down in a notebook, as long as you can't recall things very well. Oh, what should I write down? Oh, anything odd that happens. And uh, what's more, Mrs. Armour, you keep this notebook a secret, just between you and me. Think you could do this? Why, sure, I guess so. Not even tell your husband? I could keep it from him. Good. Now, let's see. Suppose you keep these notes under the mattress of your bed. Only you and I will know that they're there. Write down anything you want to and keep it for me. There was a peddler at the door this afternoon. He had funny eyes. I thought he might be the burglar come back again. Didn't let him in. He went to Mrs. Joyce's next door. She didn't let him in either. Hubert read to me tonight about a burglary on the south side of town. This burglar got in through a window, too, the basement window. He took money and silverware. We haven't got any good silverware. It's... Fifteen minutes to twelve, midnight. I just woke up, and I'm scared. Awful scared. I'm writing in this notebook because I've sort of got accustomed to doing it. And it steadies my nerves a little. I've been writing in it for a couple of weeks now. But the policeman called Hal hasn't been around to see it. Maybe it's because I haven't called or had anything to tell him. But I'm scared tonight. It was at supper that Hubert said... You aren't frightened of burglars anymore, are you, Cora? Sometimes I'm afraid of him coming back again. Oh, fiddlesticks. There won't be any more disturbance after all this time has passed. Oh, I hope you're right. Of course I am. Well, anyhow, I have to go out tonight. You... Oh, Hubert. Now, don't cloud up and cry, baby. No one's going to hurt you. What's more, we'll see that all the windows are locked and the doors. Why do you have to go out, Hubert? A buyer. The boss asked me to see him tonight. I'm afraid. Terribly afraid. Now, listen. There's nothing to be afraid of. Before I go, I'll see that you're safely tucked in your bed. Well, you were complaining before supper about being tired. So you can take a little sleeping pill and go to bed early. Then I'll lock all the doors and you'll be as safe as a bug in a rug. What's more, I'm going to be home early. I told the boss I couldn't leave my wife for too long a time. So Hubert got me all fixed up. And after taking the pill, I did fall asleep. But a little while ago, something must have woke me up. It's exactly 12, and Hubert isn't home yet. I know because I just called out and he didn't answer me. It must have been about 10 or 15 minutes ago that I woke up and heard something outside my room. Footsteps. There would be one step, and then a long pause, and then another. For a minute, I was so scared I couldn't even breathe. Somehow, I just seemed to know that whoever was coming down the hall was coming to my room, and for me. For a few seconds, I couldn't move, just sort of paralyzed with fear. And then I got brave enough to reach out and turn on my bed lamp. The 
person must have been real close to my room when the light went on. There was one more step. And then they stopped. Officer Hell, as true as I'm writing, they stopped right outside my door. I heard a board creak. Then all was very, very still. For almost years, it seemed. And then I heard, very quietly as if someone was tiptoeing, footsteps leaving my room. The light. The light has frightened them away. Oh, I'm so certain that it was someone coming for me, but what am I going to do? I'm too truly afraid to go downstairs and phone for the police. I'm going to call out to Hubert again. Hubert? Hubert? No. Hubert isn't home yet. Or perhaps... Perhaps whoever has come into this house has done something to Hubert. Hubert! door. I know it. Someone just moved outside my door. I'm going to hide this notebook under the mattress like you told me to do, and then I shall scream out the window for help. the notebook under the mattress. She goes to the window, opens it, and is ready to scream for help. The door to her bedroom opens, and she calls out in terror. She sees a man standing there with a gun in his hand. One pleading cry, and then... No! <laughs> Cora Arbor has been shot, murdered. Will the police be able to find her assassin? Eh? The hermit will tell you before the night is done. <laughs> we hear a key turn in the door. The door unlocks. Swings open. And closes. Then the light switch is clicked on. Hubert Armour stands in the hallway of his home. He steps over to the mirror hanging on the wall. He looks himself over carefully, brushes his hair with his hands. Now he looks at the stairs leading up to Cora's room. He pauses for a few seconds. Then he walks into the living room, turns on the lamp beside his chair, sits down. From his pocket, takes the early morning edition of the paper. He scans it, hmm. dropping the paper all around his chair. Now he rises, turns off the lamp, walks into the hall. He calls Cora's knee. Cora! Cora, are you awake? Naturally, there's no answer. For Cora lies murdered in her bedroom. A large red stain soaking the carpet on the floor. The blood is dripping slowly. Slowly a crimson pool is collecting there. Hubert calls again. Cora! Cora, I'm home. 
And now he looks about him into the darkened room leading off from the hallway. Now there's a startled look of apprehension, fear on his face as he begins to mount the stairs. Hmm. Cora, are you away? Hubert pauses outside the door, just as the murderer did only a little time before. He listens. And now his hand reaches out for the doorknob. Cora! Cora! She's dead. Blood! She's dead! Dead! Operator, get me police headquarters, please. Hello, police headquarters. This is Hubert Armour, 97864 Crawford Street. Cup at once. Hurry, it's my wife. She'd been murdered. All right, Armour. Suppose you tell your story over again, just as you told it before. And you left the house when? At 7.30, officer. And where did you go then? I went directly to the office where I was to meet Mrs. Davis. Was she there when you arrived? Oh, yes, sir. She was waiting in her car outside the office building. And this was uh, approximately at what time? Well, I think it must have been about 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock. Mrs. Davis would be able to verify this? Oh, yes, of course, officer. Well, why are you grilling me so carefully? That isn't going to help us find out who killed my wife. Go on with your story. Well, I... Suggested to Mrs. Davis that we drop into the Greenbrier Club to discuss her insurance policy, and she agreed. Yes? Go on. So we left her car standing near the office, and she got into mine, and we drove to the Greenbrier Club. The doorman took care of your car? Oh, yes, sir, and he'll remember that. Well, you can check all of this that I'm telling you. We will. Go on. Well, there isn't any more to tell. We sat there and talked, had a bite to eat. What time did you leave the club? Well, a little after ten, I think. Then what did you do? Well, I took Mrs. Davis over to her car. Then? I drove straight home, put the car in the garage. What time did you get home, Mr. Armour? I didn't look at my watch, but it must have been a little after eleven. But you didn't call us about the murder of your wife until twenty minutes after midnight. Why was that? I didn't know my wife was murdered, officer. I called out to her when I came home, but she seemed to be sleeping. She'd taken a sleeping pill before I left tonight, so naturally I thought she was still asleep. So what did you do then? I went into the living room with a paper, sat there and read a while. All the while until I, I went upstairs and discovered my wife's murder. I don't, I don't know what time it was I called you. We know. And we know other things, Hubert Armour. We know at what time your wife was murdered. She told us. What, what do you mean, she told you? She told us just as much as if she were alive now. But I don't understand what you're driving at. No? And when your wife told us at what time she was murdered... She also told us who murdered her. Who? Who did it? You were very clever, Hubert Armour, from the very start, when you planned this crime. When you called us here to hunt for a burglar who was no one but yourself. That's a lie. You built this thing up slowly. Tonight you carefully accounted for the, your time up to the 11 o'clock. The remainder of your alibi was weak. It might have been strong enough if Cora Armour had not left us a notebook on crime. Uh, uh, what? I asked her to keep a notebook. To tell me all the strange things that happened in this house. She did. She kept it faithfully. Midnight tonight, you, according to her own writing, were not home. She called out to you, but you didn't answer. But you were here. You came in. You crept to the door of her room. You lost your nerve. You came back at midnight. Shot her. Left the house to dispose of the gun. Returned. Sat down on your chair and looked at the paper. Then went upstairs to look in her room. And to report her murder. Yes, Armour, you had it all planned very carefully. But you didn't reckon with Cora Armour's notebook. There's someone outside my door. I know it. Someone just moved outside my door. I'm going to hide this notebook under the mattress like you told me to do. And then I shall scream out the window for help. You heard the scream, didn't you, Hubert Armour? You heard it? No, no, I didn't. You heard the scream, all right. She made it when you opened the door, when you lifted the gun to fire on she her. She didn't scream. She just called out, don't please. Oh. I admit it, I killed her. She was a stone around my neck, nagging, never well. I hated her. I wanted freedom. She wasn't well because she feared you, Hubert. She feared you all the while. It was fear that sent her down to a sanitarium. In her heart, Cora Armour feared death at your hands. And yet, without her notebook, you might have gone free of the crime of murdering her. Thus 
did a notebook kept by a woman right up until the second of her death. Bring a murderer to justice. A notebook which spoke as strongly as if Cora had returned from the spirit world to point her finger at the guilty one. Yes. Turn on your lights. Turn them on. I'll be back. Pleasant dreams. <laughs> Characters, places, and occurrences mentioned in the Hermit's Cave are fictitious, and similarity to persons, places, and occurrences is purely accidental. The Mummers in the Little Theater of the Air. You gotta wait. I can't go a step farther. Gotta keep going. Oh, this heat. This desert heat. I can't go on. Listen, Taylor. If we keep going, we're bound to strike civilization before long. Don't be such a devil, Dan. I gotta rest. All right. For a few minutes, then. Desert. Desert. I hate it. Walking for hours. Sun beating down. Uh, stop it, Taylor. You can't go on that way. If you do, you'll go loco. Come on. Let me have a drink of water. Uh, we should wait till the sun goes down. Do us more good, then. You are the devil. Holding out on water. My tongue's like a bale of cotton. All right. You think I'm a devil? Hold out and out. There isn't any more water. No more water? I drained the last one we took that drink four or five hours ago. I don't believe it. Let me have a bottle. Hey. No water. No more water. No more water. Now, well, listen. Don't do no good to get panicky. Only they make your thirst worse. Crying out like that. Just another day would bring us into a settlement. Lost. Our bones will bleach white here on the desert. Sit back and rest. It's getting cooler now. Dan, look. Look over there, atop that rise of sand. I'm looking. Do you see her standing there? I see the dead stump of a tree. So do you. I see her. A beautiful woman. The breeze blow on her dress. So cool, like. And Dan, she's waving to us, beckoning us to come on. Taylor, where are you going? Come back here. Wait, I'm coming. I see you. Don't go away. I'll get up. Just wait, that's all. Wait. Follow me. I'll take you to our cabin. Cabin? Water. There's a well near the cabin. Follow me. Dan, she's real. She's telling us to follow her. Dan, hurry. Follow me. 
Follow me to the cabin. All the water that you want to drink. Follow me. Dan. Dan! Taylor. Taylor, you've got to get a hold of yourself. I talked to her. There was a woman here. It was no dead tree. She said to follow her. That way. East, she said, to the cabin and water. Dan, you got to believe. you got to try it. Help me up, Dan. Oh, Taylor, you're seeing things. No, you got to try. She was here, and she said to follow her. I can't believe you saw anyone. It's worth trying, isn't it, Dan? I talked to her. She said to walk this way. Come on. Oh, it's getting too dark to see, Taylor. We ought to... Oh, you're going to try. Well... Come on. Where's the woman now? She went ahead. I saw her move this way. Hello? Hello? See? No one answers. You didn't see any woman. We've got to keep walking this way, Dan. Oh, it's crazy. Cabin. Water. The woman said this way. There wasn't any woman. You've gone off here, not Taylor. If you don't stop this crazy stuff, I'm going to leave here in the morning. Strike out for myself. Hey, look. <sighs> look. Do you see? Why, all that's good. A light. I told you. Cabin water, just as a woman said. You must have seen a woman, Taylor. I didn't believe. Come on, Dan, hurry. We've struck real luck. Luck and water. Hello? Hello? We're coming. Hello? No one answers. It ain't a light in a cabin, Taylor. It's a star we see. No. It ain't no star. It's a light in a cabin. Too big for a star. It is pretty big, Taylor. You're right. I can see the shack now. Sure. Come on. The cabin door is open. They've heard us. The woman is waiting for Hooray. us. Hooray. Water. Water. <laughs> Take it easy, partner. Don't drink too fast or too much at first. That's enough, Taylor, for now. Where's your outfit, stranger? Lost it three days ago. You ain't packing any guns? No, we haven't any. Then you're welcome to stay the night. It was mighty nice of your wife to tell us we were welcome here. What's that, stranger? Your wife, or the woman that told us to follow her here to the cabin and water I don't say what you mean. Uh, funny thing. I could drink forever, but it don't seem to quench my thirst. Let me take the cup now. Both of you better take it easy. Like you said, too much ain't good all of a sudden. Strangers, what are you doing here in the desert? A storm overtook us four or five days ago. We didn't even have time to unpack the animals. And when the storm was over, horses, outfit, everything gone. I see what was this about you seeing a woman who directed you here to my cabin? Uh, Taylor here, he thought he saw a woman waving to him. A woman who said there was a cabin and a well of water near. But I figured all the time he was seeing things. Sort of a reflected image on the desert sands. Yeah. Folks drifting into insanity are always seeing things on the desert. Sure. I know it. Now, how far away from the... Nearest settlement. The nearest settlement is about 35 miles due east of here. Not as far as I thought. We can start out in the morning. Sure. I'll give you directions. Fine, partner. Fine. You live here all alone? Yep. My name is Fred Hulk. Right? Well, uh, glad to meet you. I'm Dan Torrance. My partner, Taylor Wiley. You're welcome for the night. I'll rustle up some grub. And after eating... I'll tell you a desert story that'll put you as seeing a woman on the desert in the small class as stories go. Yes. I'll tell you a real desert story, if you wouldn't listen. This story will tell you what horrible things a desert can do to folks. It was about three years ago that me and my partner got together all our possessions. We sold them for all the profit we could get. Then bought stuff to start out on a prospecting trip. For a while, we didn't strike enough gold to make expenses. 
Then one morning, Ab and me made a walloping strike and hightailed it to town with our samples. About, yeah. Me and Ed just come from the assaying office. That's what. Go on. What's the news? We struck it, boys. We struck it rich. Do you hear that? More cross and air have struck it. I'll say we struck it. No more grubbing for us. We're in the money, boys. We're in. <laughs> First thing I did was to send back to the settlement for my girl to come out to me. Ab helped me get ready for her. We built this here cabin. Of course, it's no mansion, but it's a sight better than most desert shanties. Well, Lila came out, and we was married in Altoro, and then came back here to the cabin. Lila, she brought things along to pretty up the place. Curtains and such. We was real happy Ab, Lila, and me. And the gold was still coming in. Night times, Lila and me would make plans as to how we were going to the big cities and... and live like king and queen. Then one morning, I... I comes into the cabin. Lila was sitting in that chair where you are sitting now, stranger. And Ab was standing there by the table... I could sense right away that something was up. I says, supper on, Lila? No. Time for grub, ain't it? Maybe so. Go on, Lila. Tell him. Tell me what? Lila don't want to stay here with you anymore, Fred. I reckon Lila's able to talk for herself, Ab. What's this Ab is telling me, Lila? Ab's got it right, Fred. I hate it out here. And you won't give up and say we got enough to move on. Well, now... Let me do the talking. I can't stand it here in the desert. Not any longer. I'll go crazy if I have to be here another day. But I thought... Go on, tell him all of it, Lila. It ain't only the desert you don't like. It's him. Lila's in love with me. Is this true? Lila, tell me. Is it the truth what I was saying? Yes. Where have you, desert rat? I'll break every bone in your body. I'll take it easy. You won't touch me so long as I got the draw on you. Fight like a man, you yellow lividge cook. Put down that gun and fight like a man. Yes, don't listen to him. Don't you lay a hand on Ab, Fred. I ain't afraid to fight him. There's my gun on the table. Now, come on ahead. Yep. Yeah. Oh, you... Still fight this rat with one arm. Did you... No, Fred! No, no! No, no! I give up! No! Ab. Ab, speak to me. You killed him. You killed Ab. You, you can't kill a skunk like him. He's not breathing. Look. His head's all smashed from hitting the table. Ab, Ab, speak to me. Let me see him. Dead, dead. You killed him, man, Fred Holcroft. Ab, Ab. You're to blame for this, Lily. You're to blame for it all. A no good woman. You tried to kill me. For all your sins, you'll pay. You'll start peeing right now. Well, did I tell the sheriff about you being a murderer? You ain't going to tell the sheriff and nobody else what's happened in this cabin. You're going to do just what I tell you to do. And no more. <laughs> Three men 
on the desert in an old cabin. Two listen intently as an old man tells them a strange story of murder. The woman who beckoned them to the cabin that night. Where is she? He? The hermit will tell you before the night is done. <laughs> Now, the hermit again. <laughs> Fred Holcroft continues to narrate his strange desert story to the two men who were led to his cabin by a woman. Listen. <laughs> Dead that night. What do you mean, we? Lila and me. The woman who had betrayed me. I made her handle the shovel. I can remember as well as if it were today. She was sobbing and carrying on. But I kept her shoveling. <laughs> Keep shoveling. Cover up the man you love. Make him a good deep grave. Don't look to me for mercy. Keep digging. You love me once, Jim. You've got to have mercy. I don't feel like I let you have no mercy for me. I hope he can still feel things while he's there in the sand. Yeah. I hope the sand chokes him. Burns out his eyes. Get up on your feet. He's very deep enough now. And you listen to what I'm telling you. If anybody comes this way, we don't know what happened to have you. You hear? We don't know nothing. I can tell by the look in your eyes that you figure I was mighty cruel to Lila. But you got to remember, she had played me dirt. And what's more, she had tried to murder me to save that skunk of a man. I couldn't forget that. I didn't forget it. Every hour, I made her suffer for her sins. I made her work the mine with me. Made her stand out in the blinding storms. In the heat of the sun, till her skin was burned black and her eyes all puffed and faded out. Till the beauty was gone forever. Well, as for me, I was sorting away the gold. Burying it right underneath his cabin floor. Fighting my time. And waiting till I had enough gold to buy whatever I wanted from this life. Then, Lila... She took down with a fever. One night when the moon was riding high, and the sky bright as daylight on the desert sands, she got up from her bed. I tried to stop her. Don't touch me. I'm going away. You're sick, Lila. You can't leave the cabin. I'm going to Ab. To Ab, is it? Ain't you suffered enough for your sins? You still got to mention his name? Let go of me, Fred. I got to find out. Go then. And never come back to this cabin. Never come back. I stood at the door of this cabin watching her staggered away in the moonlight night. I never searched for her body. Her bones are bleached white by now from the sun. As for me, well, I always figured on moving on. But the sun and the desert, the scorching sands and the wild winds blowing, all of it sort of got into my blood. And I've stayed on here, hoarding my gold. But one of these days, I'll be pulling out for the city and the lights, the music, all the rich things money can buy. I don't understand it. 
Why are you telling all this to us, two strangers? How do you know we won't report you as a murderer? I don't likely know why I'm talking. Unless it's that the loneliness in the desert is got me. You let the woman wander off into the desert to die? I told you just as it happened. Don't you understand, stranger? That woman didn't die. It was her we saw tonight. Her that beckoned us into this cabin. She never died at all. Taylor, you never saw any woman. You saw the dead stump of a tree. You thought it was someone moving. She talked to me, I tell you. Is it? <laughs> Don't you know? It's her. Look. Look out the window. Lila. That's the woman who beckoned to Dan and me. She's standing out there at the window. No. She died, I told you. I never died, Fred. Never died. I've come for you. Don't let her in this cabin. Look. She walked right through the door. It can't be her. Look closely, Fred. I've come to finish up what I should have done years ago. Stop it! Don't let it do that again. I've got it now, Fred. This time I'll do more than wing you. Uh, uh, she, she got me. Got me. Grab him, Taylor. Look at the blood. Help her. I, I'm dying. I... Uh... He's done for. And the woman. She's disappeared through that door just like she came in. She's gone. And you and I, Taylor, we're going to be accused of this murder. We're telling the story straight, mister. You've got to go out there and get his body. And you've got to believe it. Just as we told you. The woman killed him and vanished. We're not guilty. Sit down, stranger. Take it easy. What did you say the old guy's name was? Fred Holcroft, he told us. Old Fred, eh? Who struck it rich or thought he did? That's him. He's lying there in the cabin now with a bullet through his heart. <laughs> I guess you two were really touched by the sun. You gotta go out to the cabin with us and see for yourself. Listen, stranger. You ain't gonna get anybody in Autora to go out to that desert shack to look for the body of Fred Holcroft. What do you mean? We mean there ain't no sense in looking for the body of him that's been dead for 20 years. I don't get it. Fred Holcroft's been dead for 19 or 20 years. I went out there at the time, recollected well. I was in the party that went out there, too. Sure. Found his body and that of his wife's, both stretched out on the floor of the cabin. Died of the fever, I reckon. Why, there ain't any cabin out there anymore. Blowed away long ago by the wind. Yes, sirree. You two have really been seeing things. But you ain't the first ones that have come out of the desert are telling about seeing a woman standing out there in the sands uh, beckoning them to the cabin in a water hole. Just a few months ago, a guy comes in here babbling about a woman who led him to a water hole. But ain't none of them ever been so touched before that they saw the old man or the cabin or had a vision of a murder. Did anyone ever find old Hall across gold? Nope, nor his partner neither. Some folks reckon he left Fred and his wife there to die and took the gold for himself. Listen, then. It may be we saw a vision. But you come out there with us to the spot where the cabin did stand. Maybe we can prove to you that the story we heard last night was true. Here's where we stopped. But you can see there ain't any cabin. You said the gold was buried underneath the cabin floor. That would be about here. All right, for the heck of it, let's start digging. Come on. Gold. By cracky gold. Just as we told you. Just as he told it to us. Visions, huh? Visions on a desert. But it was more than our being touched by the sun. We saw spirits of the dead. We saw them and heard them. And we've found the gold that brought about evil and murder. alone, but rather a ghostly vision of the past, 
spirits that cannot rest in their graves of sand. Ghostly visions returning to earth to walk the desert on moonlight nights. To speak to the living. To relate over and over the stories of their sin and murder. Yes. Turn on your lights. Turn them on. <laughs> I'll be back. Pleasant dreams. <laughs> Characters, places, and occurrences mentioned in the Hermit's Cave are fictitious, and similarity to persons, places, or occurrences is purely accidental. The Mummers in the Little Theater of the Air. What time it was, Vera? Come on, I have a nice warm supper ready for you. Well, I'll lock the laboratory door and be right with you. Oh, I wish you wouldn't work so hard, Hale. Uh, you mustn't worry about me. The research scientist has to work hard. I've barely seen you these past few weeks. You've never worked this hard before. And I've never done anything like this before. Here, let me seat you. Uh, thank you. What are you doing, Hale? Vera... Have you been in my laboratory? I, well, I only went in the other day to clean up. I didn't notice that you had cleaned up. Looked the same to me. You came back before I had a chance to do any cleaning. But uh, being somewhat of a chemist yourself, you studied my notes, eh? Well, they were there on the desk. I couldn't help but read them. Hmm. Hale, you must stop it. Stop this experiment immediately. What I'm doing is nothing more than other men have done before me. The creation of the elements the body needs to live on and on. Yes. Possibly the chemical and operative procedure for the recreation of a dead person. Recreate a dead person? Well, that's impossible. Why is it? Why is anything impossible if you know the cause and effect and the properties that make it up? Hale, drop it, please. Don't go ahead with this thing. If you succeed, you'll control a thing that was never meant to be controlled. Yes. I shall control death. And the world will bow to you, flock to you at first. And then they'll grow to hate you and despise you for what you've done. They'll seek you out and kill you. Because if death was not to be, someone else would have changed it aeons ago. Hale, you must stop this experiment before you get to... Coming. Why, Court Mander. Hello, Nada. I came as soon as I received your message from Mr. Browson. Come in. Oh, I'm glad to see you, Court. You know, I've tried for almost a week to get in touch with you. Uh, in here. I've tried equally hard to make contact with you. You're a celebrity now. Oh, you don't do so badly in that laboratory yourself. Won't you sit down? Well, thanks. I can only stay a few minutes. Hale Browson is rather exacting since he's perfected his experiment. Oh, let's not talk about him. I seem to be afraid of his very name. Bringing dead people back to life. Doing miracles. I'm his assistant. You're not afraid of me? Someone I've known all my life, grew up with. <laughs> Don't be silly. Of course I'm not afraid of you. Well, Nada Arling, the actress. I never believed it would be like this. You doubted my sincerity or my ability? No, I never doubted either. But that night, six years ago, when you went away, why, well, 
That's the way I've always pictured you. I've never forgotten that night, Cor. Nor I. I wish we could have had this meeting when I first arrived. Then you're leaving? I must, Cor. But why? Is it always going to be like this? I said six years ago, if I ever married, it would be you. But I can't turn back now. I have contracts. Doesn't the I... fact that something inside both of us is slipping away mean anything to you? Our youth is slipping away. And that's the only thing I have. Our relative proportions and understandings are what I oh, meant. That's not true. Because I'm Nada Arling and your assistant to Hale Browson, the new creator. Even that can't change. Me. I don't like my position, Nada. That of waiting for me or as a research scientist? Both. But I'm afraid of the latter. I'm surprised. Mr. Browson's discovery has made him the most important person in the world. And you're basking in every glory that's his. That may mean a great deal to you. But to me, it's something horrible. I only accepted the position as Browson's assistant for one reason. You accepted him? It was the other way around. No. He told me what to expect. But I was willing to chance it then. Now I know I was wrong. Already it has begun to show itself. We're going to work the other way. The other way? To work against creation? Yes. Hale Browson gave his discovery to the world, thinking its greatness would overshadow any evil that might give rise to. And instead, its evils have overshadowed its greatness and has gone beyond control. Of course. What you contemplate is murder. There's no alternative, Nada. Oh, what of the good you've done? Good? You haven't seen some of those old people we treat continually. We give them life when their souls cry out to die. That's what we're doing. And everyone calls it good. You've changed, Court. I didn't know. I'm sorry, Nada. I shouldn't have come here. You know how I feel about you. I'm entering another world. And you are the only thing that remains between me and... Well, I can stop now. Leave Browson. You and I could go where no one knows us. Oh, that'd be running away, Court. Something that never solved anything. I know what to expect as I am now. I'm realizing an ambition. And I, I can't give it all up in a moment. No. I guess you couldn't. I should have known. Where does your tour take you? My boat leaves for South America at six tomorrow morning. Coors. Yes, Nina. I want you to promise me something. All right. That you'll forget Hale Browson and what you plan to do. Will you promise? I... All right. Yes, I promise. I hope you mean that. Oh, I do. I do mean it. Are you going to board your boat tomorrow morning? No, later this evening. They're giving me a reception, and when I leave there, I'm going directly to the boat. I see. Leaving so soon? Yes, sir. Uh, I have to be getting back. Are you going to tell Mr. Browson tonight? Tonight? Why, uh, that's what I'm going to do now. I'll probably see you with the boat later. Well, why such an abrupt departure? I wanted to... Strangely, yet. Good evening, Mr. Browson. Court. What on earth brings you here at this hour of the night? I wasn't expecting you until morning. I had to talk to you. Hmm. Come on in. Must be rather important to bring you away from Miss Arling... Sit down. Thank you. I'm quite upset about something. I I am. What's on your mind, Court? Do you mind if we close that door? I certainly not. I'll close it. There. Now, what's troubling you? Hale, have you told Mrs. Browson what we intend doing? No, I haven't. Naturally, I haven't told anyone. Good. Hale, before we start allowing them to die when they should, I'm going to kill Nada Arling... And bring her back to life. But why? Why should you want to kill her? You're going to marry the girl. That's what I had hoped. But it's all changed now. And why have you come to me? You know almost as much about the procedures yes, as I. Yes, that's true. But I don't know what chemicals not to use in order that her brain will remember only to a certain point and not beyond. She won't marry you? No. Her career is more important to her than I am. You know, this is murder. But I'll bring her back to life. And in so doing, you intend creating her mind so it will forget its former fame? That's what I came to see you about. Hmm. So far, our creations have been with everything but the mind. That we've been unable to change. When we brought people back to life, their memory patterns remained the same. 
Now, I know you've been carrying on further research along this line. Court? I have. My first experiment was tonight. What was the result? Just a moment and I'll show you. Come with me to my laboratory. Who was it? Oh, a derelict who had died. No, um, just a moment before you enter. The experiment wasn't entirely successful. I brought the subject to life easily enough, but his brain... Well, you shall see. What, what was that? Wait until I snap on the light. Well, in a cage. <laughs> Looks all right. Doesn't seem to be anything wrong with him. Don't go too near that cage. He may look all right, Court, but I assure you he isn't. Look at his eyes. Yes, they have a wild, starry cast to them. And it's gibberish. What does that sound like to you? It's almost like... like an animal. Yes. He wasn't insane before he died. No. He died of a heart attack. Well, then how did he become like this? I reconstructed his brain exactly as it was. But the brain must manufacture something of its own that I don't know about. The only way I have of keeping him in that cage is to charge the bars with enough electricity to kill an ordinary man. It only stuns him. Well, for heaven's sake. What you see behind those bars is not a recreated human being, but a prehistoric man of gigantic strength. I wish we had another place to work. That thing gets on my nerves, jabbering and growling. I can't let Barry know about this. We'll just have to stick it out, Court. Oh, uh, this formula of yours. Yes? We've been over it a thousand times, and still the answer's the same. Now, oh, shut up. Court, please. Don't do that again. If he should break loose with the outer door locked, we wouldn't have a chance. Well, why don't we kill it? With what? Well, we could use a gun. Wouldn't have to go near it to kill it that way. Vera would hear. And besides, I couldn't do a thing like that. I'm not so sure I couldn't. Well, we'll find a more humane way than that. <laughs> and it's getting late. Time for me to go on. I told Nate I'd meet her at the dock. Nada. Nada. Cole, I thought you'd wait on the ship. No, it's, it's best this way. I was rather hurt the way you left me this evening. I'm sorry, Nada. Well, come. Sit in the car a few moments. It's warmer in here. All right. Oh. I'm so glad you came down. So glad I was able to see you again before I left. Nothing could have kept me away. This will be a long trip. Yes. It will be. Of course. Is there something wrong? Hmm? No, no, no. Is there something troubling you? No. I just touched your hands. They're like ice. It's oh, just, uh, just chilly down here, that's all. <laughs> I, I was half afraid of you a moment ago. When I looked in your eyes, they seemed to be staring at me, oddly. I want to remember you in case I... Yes? In case I don't see you again. Oh, we'll see each other again, Court. I'm sure of that. So am I. You know, I've waited ever since we got in the car for you to tell me about Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown? Your break with him. You made it, didn't you? Break? Oh, yes. Yes, I told him just what I was going to do. Oh, such a weight lifted from my mind. Now I can leave without being afraid for you. Yes, that's right. That's all past now. When I come back from this tour, it'll be to the young scientist I knew six years ago. Remember that. Remember that. Good. You look so strange. Remember the past, Nada. Good. What are you doing? Come on, what... Nada, don't struggle, please. Just breathe deep. This poison is sure. I'll wake you soon. Oh, Nada, wherever you are, hear me. Believe me. You're the only life I have. I'll bring you back. But you must remember only the past. You must remember things as they were before. You must remember only... Nada, darling, slumps over dead. 
Will court man to succeed in making her remember only the past? What will happen when he brings her back to life? And the medieval monster in Hale Browson's laboratory. What about him, eh? The hermit will tell you before the night is done. <laughs> now the hermit again. <laughs> Court Manda has brought Nada Arley to Hale Browson's laboratory. Mr. Browson is making preparations for the final operation on Nada Arley's brain. Listen. <laughs> Have those clamps ready. Court, place your fingers here while I put these clamps. Too much. Tear apart. I'm holding it. Will those creases smooth out when I let go? Yes, when I inject these chemicals. There. Clamps are in place. Now for the injections of this fluid. I'm ready for that now. Gently, gently. Now release your fingers slowly. Slowly. This growling frightened me. Uh, these clamps slipped when you moved. I have to put them back on again. Yeah. You cause anything more like that to happen, I'll take the shotgun and blow your head off. Hold your hand steady. Expose the tissues too long, it will die again. We'll have everything to do all over again. Here, I have it down again. Steady, steady. Now forget him. Now, just a second. We'll be ready for the solution. aren't coming back. Hurry, hand me that piece of her skull that we cut away. Here it is, in this case. Ah, you bored all the holes in it so we could fasten it down in place? Yes, they're ready. Now help me again. We must replace it exactly as it was cut away. I marked it. Good. Ah, yes. I see the marks. <laughs> Turn it just slightly. There. Hold it in place while I fasten it. <laughs> That monster grabbed his cage and the electric shock made him scream. The lights! Court, they're dimming! Court, he's holding onto the cage and shocking the current! I can't see the work! I stopped this surgery, our work is useless! Do something quickly! Oh, the lights have gone out now. Must have caused the fuse to blow. We haven't any time to waste. Do something, man! That. That thing. Is he free? No, he's still in this cage. He's uh. on the floor. Electricity must have stunned him. Look over there. There's a candle. Light it quickly. Yes, I see it. Quick, bring uh, it here. We must finish this operation. My fingers are growing numb holding this tissue in place. If we can finish before that thing in the cage comes too. Can you see by this candle? Oh, I must. Hurry. I think I hear him stirring in his cage. Can you see if he is? No, there isn't enough light to see that far. With the cage intact. I didn't have time to look. There. I have one clamp in place on the skull. I'll have another in a moment. What was that? I didn't hear anything. Here, hold the candle closer. Nada's coming, too. I can see her breathing. I must hurry. We still have to bandage her head. Oh, I can't seem to get this other clamp through the hole in the skull. Her breath is coming faster and louder now. I can hear it. Watch where you're holding the candle. I can hear her breathe, Hale. Once I get this fastened, the rest will be easy. She's breathing so loudly, I... Hey, Hale, behind you! What? The man! He's out of his cage! He's coming toward us! He'll kill us! Wait! We're your friends! Wait! We're going to help you! See? Come! Come, follow me! Hale, Nada! She's going to be all right for a moment. We must get him back to the cage. Now, that's it! Come along! Court, he's watching you and Nada. He's motioning for you to get away from Nada. Watch out, Hale! He's reaching for you! He's crushing my arm! Court! Quick, there's a hypodermic needle on the table! Get it! Yes, I have it! He's watching me now. Look! Look what I have here! This will make you feel better. Come just a little closer. Get him with that needle! His fingers are crushing my arm! Oh, now, just a little closer. I won't hurt you. Let go of me! Let go! 
isn't finished. Use the hypodermic for her, Kurt. Hurry before she stands up. See? She's sitting up now. Later, lie down, lie down. Oh, get back, you. He doesn't want you to go near her. Man. Later. Speaking. Man from the past. We are going back, you and I. And we will take Court Mander and Hale Browson with us. Court! Man from the past. Bring Mr. Browson here. Court! Do something! Help me! Court Mander. Try to move. I... I can't. I... I can't move! No. You want to. But I now control your will. <laughs> Make him let me go. He's killing me. What talk to her? I didn't bring her here. Have her make this inhuman monster. Let me go. Hail, Browson. You must die. No, no, you can't do this to me. It's murder. You have murdered many. But it was different. It was the only way. Man from the past, you must hurry. I'm not much longer for this earth. Fingers. They're crushing my head. My head. Man from the past, you would be dead. You're not for this world. They brought you back against your will. Court Mander, you spoke of shooting this man. Where is the gun? In the gun rack. On the wall there. Get it. Bring it here. Point the gun at that poor mixed up soul of yesterday with the body of today. No. No. Now, so that he may have peace and rest. Pull the trigger. No. Pull the trigger, no. I say. No. I haven't much more time. Court Mander, you and Hale Browson have been violating the eternal law. Man is born to die, and die he must. Your soul will never rest in this world, but it will never come back. There is one more shot in the gun court. Yes, Nader. Hand the gun to me. Yes, Nader. I... I must lie down on the table here. Stand in front of me. Yes. I am here. This is the... End of the world you created. Now we may all rest in our grave. Hale, Clark, what has happened? Hale, Clark, open the door, please. Hale, what is it? What is it, Hale? <laughs> All 
characters, places, and occurrences mentioned in the hermit's cave are fictitious, and similarity to persons, places, or occurrences is purely accidental. The Mummers in the Little Theater of the Air. Talk civilly, you misconstrue my verse. Hmm? <laughs> Stop it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Draw up your chair closer to the fire. Ghosts, oh, my dear. Think on the pleasant things. You'll forget all about the storm outside. Think on pleasant things. As if I ever could. Oh. After all that has happened in this house in the last three days. I'm thankful for the thunder that drowns out your words. Who is there in this house to hear us? Who is left here but Carter, who's in on your horrible schemes? My dear, I thought you'd learn to appreciate my experiments before this. Appreciate the terrible things you and Carter were doing? Carter's a very clever assistant and servant, my dear who desires life more than... Carter is a fiend. And so are you. Oh, it must be ten o'clock. Thank heaven. Why are you thankful for the hour of the night? Hmm? There will be no visitors tonight. No one will be stopping at this house of murder tonight. Are you sure no one will visit us? Hmm? Then there is someone coming. No man knows what the next hour may bring. Rambo? Do not get upset, my dear. Cardo will do the honors. Come in. Yes, Cardo? A gentleman and a lady wait outside in the hall, Professor Santos. So? They find themselves confused by the storm. Confused? You mean deliberately... Oh, sir, please. Cato, what you wish to convey to me is that the gentleman and lady have lost their way. Oh, Ramon, please send them on their way. Send away specimens? <laughs> but, my dear, the way you talk, one would think that specimens were easy to get. Huh, Cato? And hmm? these two are good ones. <laughs> then why are you waiting? Show the strangers the kindness of our shelter and hospitality. Oh, no, Ramon. Oh, Cardo. Show the strangers into the library, Cardo. Yes, Professor Thomas. The professor desires that you enter the library. This way, please. Yeah, this is certainly nice of you. Come, Bella. Step inside, please. Good evening, sir. My wife and I... Now, now make no apologies. Cardo, you will prepare a room for the visitors? At once. Ah. Won't you sit down? Thank you. Here, Bella, you take this chair. Thank you. Mm, you'll pardon me if I do not rise from my chair. You'll perceive that I walk with a cane and even then with some difficulty. Please don't go to any bother because of us. As soon as the storm is over, if you could tell us the way to the next village, we'll be on our way. It isn't necessary to prepare a room for us. No, we'll be on our way. Surely not in a storm like this. It's strange country to us, and 
Then we saw the road was closed, and we took the right fork, as we thought the sign said. It brought us right here to your door. The road didn't seem to go any further. Now, if you'll just direct us, oh, we... Oh, but, but, but I, I wouldn't hear of you stepping out again. But, Bellerin, I hate to be a bother. Not at all, not at all. Now, are you getting dry, Mr... Uh, uh, yes, thank you. My name is uh, Richard Cannon, my wife, Bella. Delighted, Mrs. Canton, yes, delighted. Canton. Canton. That was the name, my dear Canton. May I present my wife, Rosa? I am Professor Roman Santos. How do you do? How do you do, Mrs. Santos? How do you do? Now that introductions are over, may I say that you're welcome here? Thank you. Yes, indeed. One hardly expects to find a lovely estate like this, hidden away from everything. A refuge for tourists who've lost their way. Have you come a long ways? Indeed we have. Nearly 500 miles from home. Oh, really? We're really quite upset, too. Our only daughter, Lisa, was married a month ago. She and her husband, Charles, went for a tour of this country for their honeymoon. They persuaded Richard and I to meet them at Minwell. That's the next village. Yes, yes. Uh, Minwell is the next village. But we haven't heard from them. Uh, I don't understand. Well, what my wife was trying to say is that we planned to meet Lisa and Charles at Minwell. This morning we wired them to let us know if they were waiting in Minwell. We received no answer to our wire. Well, maybe we didn't wait at our hotel long enough to receive an answer. Well, we hope that's what it oh, is. No doubt that is what happened. I, I shouldn't worry. You'll have a good night's rest here, and I wouldn't worry about tomorrow. Now, don't worry at all. I was anxious to get to Minwell tonight. You know how mothers are. Ever since we left home, I've had a strange presentiment that, that something was going to happen to Lisa and Charles. Oh, now, Mother, I'm sure Professor... Uh, Santos? Uh, Professor Santos wouldn't mm -hmm. mind if we use his phone to call the hotel in Minwell. Oh, certainly not. Uh, thank you. Now, if you'll just show me where... However, the that will be impossible tonight. But I... Uh, the storm has broken down our outside wires, and I'm afraid my servant, Carter, will not be able to locate the trouble before morning. Oh. Oh, but it will soon be morning. You'll soon be in Minwell. You'll soon find that your daughter and your new son are waiting for you quite unharmed. Of course, Mother. You're unduly alarmed. I can't help being anxious. You know how it is if you have children... I am pleased to say we have no children. Oh? Uh, you are a professor of uh, philosophy, perhaps? Medicine. Well, surely you don't practice. There are so few houses about. You seem to be shut off from the rest of the world. I devote my time to science. Well, I should have known from all these books. Professor Santos' experiment with the human heart. The human body. What? Oh. <laughs> oh, sir, my dear, you speak very bluntly tonight. It, uh, it's quite true. I, I hope someday to find a certain answer to an ageless problem. You mean that you expect to discover a way to make the heart beat on forever? Exactly. Quite right. Mm. You rang, Professor Santos? Yes, Cardo. Will you show Mr. and Mrs. Canton to their rooms? I'm sure they're very weary. Oh, we're a lot of bother. No, not at all. Carter will serve you tea, hot milk, anything you desire. But I would suggest you don't eat too heavily, as you... as you might not sleep too well. However, just make your wishes known. Oh, don't get up from your chair, Professor. I will show my guest to the door. Ah, look out the window. Storm is gone. There's a moon pushing its way through the clouds. Richard, uh, we could drive on tonight. Ach, nonsense. In the morning I can show you the beauty of my estate. And now, uh, good night. Good night, sir. And may your dreams be pleasant ones. Good night. Cardo, take good care of our guests. Take very good care of them. You know who those people are. You know who those two are. Quiet. My hearing is good, Rosa. The mother and the father. Yes. What are you going to do? I'm very fortunate, don't you think? You're insane. Yes, very fortunate. <laughs> a stroke of luck. You're mad. And you are a coward. 
Furthermore, stop dabbling in my affairs. Stop. Don't come near me. The mortar, the father, out of the way. There be no searching for the other two. Mad. You grow more mad each hour. <laughs> what is it Carter would say? It is easy to convince a wise man, but to reason with a fool is a difficult undertaking. Cato, I was just speaking your name. Cato, what would you say if I were to tell you that the mother and father of the young lady, Lisa, were guests in our household? Hmm? I would say, Professor Santos, it is too late to pull the rein when the horse has gained the brink of the precipice. Oh, <laughs> good, well spoken. The time for stopping the leak is past when the vessel is in the midst of the stream. Superb, exactly. <laughs> Nothing should deter us from such wisdom. Nothing. Certainly not my good wife, Osa. Uh, what, what are you going to do with me? Do not worry, my dear. Cado, you will escort Rosa to the laboratory. To the laboratory? No. Your knife may be of assistance. Rosa, you will follow Cado at once. At once to the laboratory and await me there. What's the matter, Bella? Why are you poking around everywhere? Richard, I have a strange feeling about this place. Somehow I... I don't like it here. You don't like it here? A beautiful room like this? The man and his wife. There's something wrong there. And, and, and that cardo gives me the creep. The professor and his wife are cultured people, Bella. Oh, your nerves are getting the better of you. I'm worried about Lisa and Charles. They'll be worried about us because we aren't in Linwell tonight. Oh, they'll have sense enough to know we'd stop along the way in such a storm as we've had tonight. Oh, try and sleep, Bella. We'll be on our way first thing in the morning. Everything is going to be all right. Don't worry, Bella. We'll try and sleep. Oh... I talked in my sleep. Oh, someone called me. Father, it was Lisa. It was Lisa calling to oh, me. Oh, fella, you've been dreaming. Now go back to sleep. It'll soon be morning. I'm sure now that I heard Lisa calling to me. Oh, Bella, you were dreaming. Well, perhaps I was. Perhaps I was dreaming. Oh, I, I'm sorry I woke you up. Oh, please, let's try and get some sleep before morning. All right, dear. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Father. There. Again. Father, don't go back to sleep. No. No. Get out of that bed quickly. Awaken Father. Lisa. Get out of the bed quickly. Father. Father. Huh? Get up quick. No. What is it now? Father, hurry. What in the world? Do as I say, quick. No, don't turn on the light. Get out of there. Oh, well, yeah, all right. Here. Hide behind this curtain. Here. Mother, what is this all about? It's so loud. Why on earth are we standing behind this curtain in the middle of the night? I can't tell you. I don't know myself yet. Shh. Mother, I tell you. Be still. with his cane. Suppose it is he walking down the hall. Why are we hiding behind this curtain? I can't tell you yet. Oh, 
Take the light and hold it higher, Carjo. Oh, they are sleeping. <laughs> Very peacefully. We will make quick work of this. Now over to the other side of the bed, Carjo. will be my patient. When I give you the word, make quick work with a knife. Very. All right. Now. <laughs> Professor Santos. There's no one in this bed. But we saw their forms under the bed door. Yes. With our own eyes we saw them. Only a second ago. Now there is no one here. This is impossible. No one in this bed. We've slashed the pillows with our knives. They've escaped, but how? I saw them in this bed. What's happening? Don't stop to dress. We've got to get out of here. They came to this room to kill us. Yes. How did you know that they were coming? Lisa called to me. That scream, it was Lisa. She's in this house. Oh, but she couldn't be. We've got to follow those two. Find her. But how could Lisa be here? Somehow she crept to this room. She warned me to get out of bed and then she vanished. Hurry, something terrible has happened to her. Which way shall we go? Didn't you hear him say they were going to the laboratory? Where? Everything's quiet now. Look, here's a stairway. It must lead to the laboratory. Oh, Lisa and Charles. What have they done to them? Up the stairs. Hurry. I, I don't hear anything in the house now. What have they done to Lisa? Why, I see a light. Yes. No need to be quiet now. We've got to have this out. Convenient. You decided to pay a visit to my laboratory. Where's our daughter? Perhaps this is the best way after all. I said, where is our daughter? Your daughter? You told me this evening she was in Minwell. She's here somewhere. Yes. She came to our room. Nonsense. I heard her whisper to me and then she vanished. Well, well. Now we have prestidigitation to add to our entertainment, huh? Where is Lisa? Where is Charles? My dear man... We know that you came to our room to try and kill us. We're not afraid of you or your cardo. That is interesting. We heard Lisa scream. What have you done with her? My dear guest, the screaming came from my wife, Rosa, who now sits over there in that chair, bound and gagged. I assure you, you will hear no more screaming tonight. We're not going to be put off. Lisa and Charles are in this house. Father, look. Look. Lisa's purse. That's Lisa's purse lying there on that table. Yes. My girl, what have you done with her? That's her purse. She's in this house. I heard her whisper to me. What have you done with her? Carter, we've had enough of this hysterical scene. We shall end this course examination now. At your orders, Professor Santos. Now listen to me, you two sniffling nobodies. I told you earlier this evening that I am a scientist. Of course, I went further... She told you that I experimented with a human body. That's very true. 
Now I shall experiment with you. All right. It would have been easier had you allowed us to creep into your room and end your lives painlessly, quickly. But no. You in your clever wisdom thought to outwit us by making us believe that there were two forms lying in the bed. <laughs> Are you prepared, Cardo? Yes, Professor. But now you walk right into our laboratory. Very convenient. <laughs> Very convenient. You let go of her. Cardo, take care of the gentleman. Do you? you. something not of this world. Father, don't let them leave us. But the professor's wife. Release her. Yes. Lisa, Charles. <laughs> Father, we must follow Lisa and Charles. No. Don't you understand? Don't you understand? But what do you mean? Those two. They're not really alive. Your daughter Lisa and the boy. Not alive. They are dead. They've been dead for two days. My husband, he used them for experiments. Human experiments. What are you saying? They were dead. I saw them die. Santos forced me to witness. They came back tonight to save you. Lisa! Their spirits? Yes. Their spirits, walking about as though they were alive came back and saved you from a similar fate. How horrible. I saw them earlier tonight, walking on the stairs. I screamed with the horror of it. Oh, then it was you who screamed, not Lisa. Yes, it was I, screaming at the horror of two dead souls taking shape, coming back for revenge. in the hermit's cave are fictitious, and similarity to persons, places, or occurrences is purely accidental. The Carter Coal Company and the dealers of Olga Coal present The Mummers, 
in the little theater of the air. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I saw a movie the other night that applied both to Olga Kuhl and to you. It had to do with the American shipbuilding program. One of the workers looked right out at the audience from the screen and explained that these new vessels aren't being built only in the shipyards, but everywhere in the country. The parts and materials come from practically every state in the Union. He went on to say that nowadays the coal mines aren't just digging coal, they're digging ships. In other words, coal is a basic war material which explains why you might not always be able to get as much of that good auger coal as you've been accustomed to as quickly as you've been accustomed to getting it. But I know you'll be patient and I know you'll cooperate when you realize the reason for any delays or shortages that may occur. The reason is that coal is helping to win the war. Besides, auger coal is so good that it's worth waiting for. Remember, when you have auger, you have one of the smokeless coals, which means that it's clean burning. You can have a comfortable home with less furnace tending than usual because this coal holds its fire so long. And you find it possible to keep fuel bills down because of Alga's extra heat content. I'll tell you at the end of the program how to find your Alga, spelled O-L-G-A, dealer, and he'll tell you the rest of the story. And now, suppose we let the hermit tell his. stories. And murders, too. <laughs> the hermit knows of them all. Turn out your lights. Turn them out. Huh? Have you heard the story of the Crimson Hand? Huh? <laughs> then listen while the hermit tells you the story. <laughs> Temple Hunter, imagine you turning up in Paris at a time like this. What do you mean? Great Scott, man. Everyone who has two coins to rub together is leaving. You're still here, Max? Actually, I haven't two coins. Add to that the fact that I'm a broken-down journalist, and you know why I'm sticking around. Then there are two of us. Temp, you're a sight for sore eyes. Don't think I'm not glad to see you. How's Margaret? Swell. We're anxious to find a place to live. Margaret wants to do some painting, and I've got a story that wants to be written. Say... How would you like to live in state for a few months? I haven't sold this story yet. Now listen, old man. I know of a place on Rue Loire you can rent for a song. Yeah? You remember hearing about Leela and Paul Perron? No. Well, sure you do. I've written a dozen articles about them. You don't remember. Well, Leela took her jewels and sables and her fabulously wealthy husband and sailed for America about a month ago. I give her credit. She could see the handwriting on the wall. Well, they've gone for good. So? So their house is for rent. I saw the agent just yesterday at lunch. He said everyone was moving out of Paris. No one wanted to move in. So there you are. Wait till I get my hat. I'll take you over to meet him. In 15 minutes, you'll have the keys to number five, Rue Loire. Something strange about this old house, Temple. The silence is heavy and mysterious. It's as if the hours are waiting behind closed doors, ready to come out and strike doom. Margaret was speaking of the old house we rented at number five, Rue Loire. We rented it four months before tragedy struck the city. Four months before the arrogant Nazis marched down the boulevards of the most light-hearted city in the world. Paris. Margaret and I had dreamed of coming here years before when we were students at Barclay. We had hoarded pennies to come here where I might do some writing and Margaret would paint. And now we were settled in the old-fashioned house of a rich couple who had gone to America. It was filled with treasures. Library of priceless first editions. Rich, heavily embroidered draperies and tapestries. Oriental rugs and dark mahogany panels. I told Margaret it was a lavish display of wealth that made the place seem ominous. Nonsense, Temple. It's not the ostentatious display that gets me down. The atmosphere of every room. 
It's so dark and foreboding. If we could afford to have servants so that you could hear people moving around, it wouldn't seem so strange to you. Maybe not. Oh, I should never have allowed Max to talk me into running it. It's too lavish for us. You said it. We've been here two weeks, and I haven't put a brush to the canvas. My typewriter's gathering dust. And if you don't take me to some gay place for dinner right now, I shall be seized with a desire to throw one of these cloisonne vases at you. Put on your best bib and tucker. Here we go. Remember the place Max told me about just off the Rue Washington where they sell the best spaghetti the side of heaven? So we took to hunting out cheerful places to eat. Places where there was lots of light and laughter and smart conversation. Our house, which we had rented for a song, wasn't turning out successfully. Margaret was right. There was an atmosphere over every room in the house. A feeling that persisted during all hours of the day, as well as making you sleep fitfully at night. It had me mumbling over and over to myself. Coming events cast their shadows before. Coming events cast their shadows before. We had lived at number five Rue Loire for about ten days before the first weird thing occurred. It was raining that night. A steady downpour. We had a late dinner and returned by cab to our new address. Wait, Temple. I want to put my hat under my coat before I step off in this cloudburst. Walk from the cab to the house will turn me into a drenched rat. Well, sit here in the cab. Madame Brown must have left an umbrella in the stand. I'll bring it out. Never mind. I'm ready for the dash. Here goes. All right. Got the key right here. Any old port in the storm. Yes, even this museum should be welcome on a night like this. No, I'll light the log in the library. That should be the most comfortable room on a night like this. Are you sure the roof doesn't leak in this house? I can feel the rain falling on me right now. Margie, you should be the writer in this family. Your imagination works overtime. You know it's as damp as a tomb in here. Oh, wait five minutes. This fire will make the room as warm as toast. Draw up your chair. If you don't mind, I think I'll sit right in the fire. No. Isn't this cozy? Mm, better. Give me the right smile, and any minute I'll go fix you a cup of hot chocolate. Oh, that would taste good. At your service, milady. You're in a happier mood tonight, Temple. Oh, I feel better. You know, I think I'll be up early tomorrow morning and start my story. I'm through wasting time. I'll be back in a minute with hot chocolate. What is it? Look, behind those draperies at the window. What do you think you saw? Someone picking you? Look! Okay. Oh, well, if there was anyone at the window to go now, I would have heard you scream all over Paris. I didn't see anyone looking in at the window. I saw a hand. Margaret. I did. It reached right around the draperies. I saw the fingers. They were bright red, covered with blood. Well, what's got into you? You know, such a thing is impossible. If you saw a hand, there would be a person. There's no one behind here. Now, uh, you see? I don't care what you say or how impossible it seems. I saw a hand, a hand red with blood. I'm not going to allow you to let your imagination run away with you this way. I'm going back to the pantry and fix the hot chocolate, just as I intended to do. Temple, don't you dare leave me. I don't want any hot chocolate. I want to get out of this house. Oh, honey, you know that's impossible. I paid three months' rent here. We, we can't afford to move on. You can stay. I'm leaving. Now, wait a minute. You've allowed your nerves to get the better of you. Temple, look at this book on the table. Yes, I see it. But you're not looking closely. See? There's a crimson stain on this book. Just as if the hand had touched it. The... That's not a fresh stain, Martin. What does it matter? I picked up this book before. I know the stain was never on it until tonight. Nonsense. Stop calling everything I say nonsense. You know that I'm observing. And I say the stain was never on this book until tonight. All right, all right. Let's forget about it now and go to bed. If it'll calm your fears any, in the morning I'll call the police and have them look around the house. Please, Margaret, don't sit there staring wildly. Nothing is going to harm us. It's just the atmosphere of this house and your imagination. You finally let her get you down. 
Come on, dear. We'll get out of this room. The hours of the night inched along. I knew Margaret was not sleeping. Neither was I. Outside, the rain was still coming down. It made a mournful sound against the window panes. I was ashamed to find that I, too, was allowing my imagination to get the better of me. I could actually believe that the rain was a million fingers tapping on the panes. And then I heard another sound. Or did I? Of course not. It was fancy running wild again. What was it? Sounds like someone is tapping on the door. What did you say, Temple? Oh, was I talking out loud? Yes. I know what you said. Someone is tapping on the door. Gosh, for a minute I did think that. But it's just the rain against the windows. No, it isn't, Temple. Listen. There's someone tapping on the door to our room. Who's out there? I say, who's out there? Oh, listen, this is foolish. Just darn foolishness. We know very well there's no one outside this door. You're not sure. Neither am I. Temple. Great Scott. Do you see? Something is coming right through the door. Look at it. Flying around the room. Do you see? It's a hand. A human hand. Flying around in our room. <laughs> Flying in space in the bedroom of Margaret and Temple Hunter is a human hand attached to nothing. How and who will explain this strange phenomenon to the two frightened people? This weird psychomancy. Eh? <laughs> the hermit will tell you before the night is done. <laughs> We needn't give the hermit a hand. He seems to have one in tonight's story. But I can give you a helping hand in the job of heating your home. The most important thing is good coal. And one way to be sure of that is to place your orders well in advance and ask for Aug coal. Aug is worth waiting for, even though your dealer may not always be able to give you the usual overnight delivery service. He may not even have the exact size of Aug that you've been using. But most furnaces or room heaters can use either of several sizes with complete satisfaction. So may I suggest that if your dealer doesn't happen to have the exact size of auger coal you've been using, you take another size, it's all the same good coal of the smokeless type. No matter what the size, you get the benefit of the same extra high heat content, which can mean an adequate heating job with less coal. The same long burning quality that can enable you to cut down on furnace tending. And the same ready response to the dampers, which can mean a more evenly heated home without waste of coal. One more suggestion. Keep your furnace or room heater clean so you don't waste coal. Incidentally, if you burn auger coal, chances are your heating system can stay cleaner. I'll tell you at the end of the program how to find your auger dealer. That name is spelled O-L-G-A. Now, suppose we let the hermit get back to the matter in hand. It is the next night, and in the library, where the night before, Margaret first saw the vision of the Crimson Hand, sit three people, Temple, Margaret, and their friend the journalist, Max Harrison. Listen. <laughs> so that's the story, Max. You can see why we didn't call in the police. Yeah. If it were anyone but you two telling me the story, I'd think you'd take me to the opium pipe. After such an experience, it's enough to drive anyone to it. All day I've been trying to convince myself it was an hallucination. But it wasn't. Max has got to take you to that agent, get our money back, so we can move out of here. It's going to be difficult to make him believe a story like this. I don't care if it is. We're leaving here as soon as we can get back. Sure, don't stay because of me. You come over to my place tonight. There's just one thing I want you to do... After all, I am a journalist, and if there's anything to your story, I'd like to see it repeated. It probably never will happen again. Temp, you're not trying to pull my leg, are you? I don't blame you for asking that question, but the answer is no. Well, after you saw the hand flying around in your room, what then? It just seemed to disappear. We got up and dressed, called a cab, and went out for breakfast. We spent the rest of the day hunting for you. 
We haven't been near the house until we came in just now with you. Mm. And this is the book you spoke of, Margaret? Yes. Mm. This is one of Paul Perron's favorite philosophers. Kind of strange he didn't take the book with him. Max, tell me something about the couple who lived here. Oh, they were colorful. I thought you'd remember some of the things I'd written about them, but you didn't. Leela Perron was one of the most beautiful women I've gazed upon. Soft brown hair, light brown eyes, very unusual almond shape, ivory skin, a lithe, slender body. Oh, you can't describe her. She was just different. Her mind, her thoughts... And Paul? Well, he was the type you'd cast in the cinema as the super successful businessman because of his steel gray hair and smile. But he is the intellectual artist, kind and warm, like old wine. And very wealthy. Yes, very wealthy and older than Leela. But I've never known a couple so much in love as these two. I was here in this house the night before they left for America, in this very room, sitting in a chair Temple is in now. Paul sat where Margaret is sitting. And Leela on a stool at his feet. And this book you speak of, Paul had it in his hands. Leela was looking up at him. Oh, it is so hard, Paul, for you to leave the things you love. You mean my books, my treasures? Oui. They are things I love. But their degree compared to you is slight. Ah, oh, you will love America, Paul. It is new and shining. How do you know? You have not been there since a little girl. Oui. But Max, he tells us. All that Paris tells us. But Paris, every day she grows more like an old woman whose body decays with the years. Soon we will see her bones. And I am afraid. Leela, afraid? Never has she been afraid of anything. Only growing old and being swallowed up by time. Our friends, they are gone. And, and time, it is heavy here now. Oh, Paul, you are so good to take me to America. Look, in my handbag are the tickets. I will sleep with them under my pillow tonight. They are tickets to freedom. Freedom from going old in a dying Paris. 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 It will never die, Lina. You hear what Max tells us. The French, they play blind man's boss with the Nazis. He does not fight him. Paris will never die. Persons like us, we should be true to the Paris that has rocked us gently in its arms and fed our happiness. Oh, no, Paul. You must not talk like that. Put the old book down. Let us get out of this room. It is, it is stifling me. It is reaching out, trying to hold us here. Come, Max. Come, Paul. Let us go out and sing and be gay on our last night in Paris. Come quickly. Stop the ring. So we went out. And I said goodnight to them and goodbye in one of the bright cafes. They were happy and singing. Paul had forgotten that his heart was wrapped up in Paris. He was shouting, off to freedom. Then she, too, was afraid of this room. It stifled her. Yes, but she had seen no strange phenomenon as you have. She got away just in time, then. For there is something in this house. It was in this very room. Let's see. A little past midnight. Well, stay till one. If nothing occurs, we'll leave and forget it all. And call it a bad dream. It suits me. I'll sit here if either one of you will leave me. And if you'll go in to pack with me when it's time to leave. Yeah, of course. Max, do you feel something portentous about this house? No. It only seems strange not to have Leland Paul here. He was here many times when it was filled with people. Naturally, it would not affect... Naturally, it would... Margaret, what's the matter? Why did you stand up? I'm listening. I heard it again. Heard what? The tapping. Listen. You hear? Yes. Yes. Come on. Let's have a look around. It didn't sound as if it was this library door. It was distinct, but it was far away. Well, as you can see, there's no one out here. No. Stand still. Let's listen again. Well, I hear the tapping sound, but I can't locate where it comes from. But we'll keep looking. Where are you going first? To your room. That's where you say you saw the hand the second time. Where's the overhead lights? Oh, here. Here. 
Nothing in here. No. Tapping sound seems further away. Yes. Well, I'm going to locate what that is if it takes all night. We know what it is. It's a hand that does it. Let him discover for himself, Margaret. Let's see. This door leads to the kitchen and the servants' quarters. Mm-hmm. I'll get the light. Tapping is stronger out here. It is, Max. Temple, stay near me. Have you ever been down in the cellar? We've had no reason to go down there. We're going now. Come on. What's down here? Hundreds of boxes of treasures that Paul has had shipped here from all over the world. And one of the finest wine cellars in the world. But it'll be locked up, waiting for the master to return. I've been down here with Paul... The last time was to get a bottle of 100-year-old port. Wow. We've been living over something like that? Wish I could show you. Well, you see, this is a fine hiding place for a prowler who might want to play tricks on you to get you out of the house. Is that what you think it is, Max? I've got a hunch. Listen. My job. It's coming from down here. Sure it is. It's in this cellar. In this door? Yes. Where does the door lead? To the wine cellar. And the door's locked tight. Iron door, too. Yeah. We've got to get it open somehow. Set it. Look, I think I can break the lock with this. Well, we can try. Give it to me. Stand back, Margaret. <laughs> Making any headway? Yes, I think so. I think I can break the lock. What do you think is in there, Max? I haven't the slightest idea. But there's something behind that door making a sound. We should have gotten the police. And we're a scoop on a story? Nothing doing. I've got it. Okay. Here it goes. <gasps> Max, Margaret, stay back. What is it? What is it? A body. The body of a man. body of a man. Max identified it before we called the police. It was Paul Perron. We've had to piece together the story of how he got there. For up to now, Lila Perron has not been found. They are quite certain she never came to America. And Paul never went anywhere but down to the cellar where his old vines were. Someone had locked him in there and left him to die. For hours, he must have tried to make himself heard. For days, he must have tried to break open the door. His right hand was cut and covered with blood. Flesh was torn away. The bones of the wrist were broken. It seemed to be hanging to the arm by a thread. Margaret said... You don't think his wife... You don't think that she locked him in there to die? Max, you said they loved each other so much. I said that. I believed it. But she was afraid of growing old. And afraid of everything old. And Paul Perron was going down the hill and she wanted to climb. I'm afraid that's it, Temp. That's what all pairs believe, too. If it hadn't been for the fact that we saw a ghostly thing, a crimson hand floating in the upper rooms of the house, why then a few months later the horrible crime could have been blamed to the invaders of Paris and Leela would have gone free. But now when they find her, she will be arrested for the murder of Paul Perron, who died a horrible death in the cellar of his house and led us to his grave by a crimson hand. that she thought would be buried from sight forever. She did not reckon with a ghostly hand that led three people to the grave of her victim. Turn on your lights. Turn them on. 
You have just listened to the 368th story by the Hermit, made possible through the courtesy of the Carter Coal Company, producers of Alga Coal and your Alga dealer. Let him answer your questions on the fuel situation. If you are thinking of converting your furnace from your present type of fuel to coal, the Alga dealer can give you helpful advice. If you'll be patient on deliveries, it will help a lot. Everybody realizes that we're in a war. Everybody wants to do his part to win. Be sure to order Alga Coal by name. That's the only way you can be sure of getting this particular coal mined from a single seam. No other coal is quite like Alga. And when delivery is made, look for the Alga Guarantee Seal on the delivery ticket. It's your final assurance of getting genuine Alga coal. If you can hear this program, you should find an Alga dealer near you. Leading coal dealers in towns and cities from Manitoba to Quebec, from Ontario to the Carolinas, supply their customers with Alga. In many cities, you can locate your Alga dealer by turning to the coal section of your classified telephone directory. There you will find the dealers listed under Alga, spelled O-L-G-A. In other cities, you can obtain the name of your Alga dealer by writing to the station to which you are listening. Remember, Alga is not only one of the smokeless coals, but also is given the famous Alga dustless treatment at the mine. It's the only coal which receives this patented treatment. Alga combines the maximum number of good qualities in one coal. And remember this, too. America combines so many good qualities in one nation that every American wants to buy war bonds and stamps to the limit of his ability. Every dollar put into war bonds and stamps gives a body blow to the Axis now and a helping hand to those boys of ours who are fighting for liberty the world over on land, at sea, and in the air. stories for you. Listen in next week for my hounds howling. (laughs) I'll tell you the story of seawater. I'll be back. Pleasant dreams. All characters, places, and occurrences mentioned in the Hermit's Cave are fictitious, and similarity to persons, places, or occurrences is purely accidental. This is Jack White speaking. theater of the air. if you're going to get to the store on time this morning. I'm hurrying. Oh, you know, Paul, I think I'm going to like this little town. Oh, I couldn't bear the thought of moving here when you first told me you had bought out the drugstore in a little jerkwater town. I think we'll be happy here, honey. Oh, imagine finding a dear little house like this, all furnished. Why, oh, it's nicer than anything we could get in the city. And the rent's so reasonable. How did you ever happen to locate it, Paul? Well, Mr. Rogers, a banker here in town, owns it. it belonged to some member of his family. They've gone away or something, so he rented it to me. Now, I've got to go, honey. All right. Will you be home for lunch? I'll call you on the phone if I can get away. Okay. Oh, listen, dear. You must be careful about leaving lights on in the house all night. When you came to our room after listening to the radio last night, you left three lights on in the living room. What? No, I didn't. Oh, yes, you did. Oh, but I tell you, I didn't, Margaret. Our neighbors in small towns might think it very strange if they saw lights burning at all hours of night. Besides, we can't burn up money right now, Paul. Just getting started in this new business and all. I don't know what you're talking about. I know I turned off the lights before I came to bed last night. I'm afraid you're getting absent-minded, honey. Because three lamps were burning when I got up this morning. Well, I won't argue with you. i got to go now. All right. Don't get too absent-minded, dear. You might mix the wrong prescriptions for people. What? Look. 
Oh, there goes the milkman right past the house. I told him to leave milk and cream every morning. He must have forgotten. Call him in, sir. All right, I will. Oh, let me see. What should I do first this morning? Oh, I love this little house. It's going to be grand living here. Oh, that must be the milkman. Good morning. Good morning, ma'am. Won't you come in? Uh, thank you, ma'am. I guess you forgot about me this morning. I want milk and cream every day. Uh, yes, ma'am. I didn't forget about you exactly. I thought maybe you would be moving out already, so I didn't stop. Moving out? Why, <laughs> well, we just moved in the day before yesterday. Uh, yes, ma'am, I know. But that's about as long as anybody stays in this house. I don't see what you mean. I just figured I wouldn't leave any milk for you because you might move away in a hurry and I might not get any pay. Oh, we aren't in the habit of moving out of places in the nighttime. I still don't see what you mean. And the last folks that moved in here about four months ago, they got out in the night and in a hurry, too. How strange. What for? Well, if you haven't found out yet, you soon will. Found out what? This house. There's something in it. Queer things go on here. Things that frighten folks half out of their wits. Yes? Well, what is it? What is it that's strange? Well, no one knows, ma'am. But they say the house is haunted. Oh, is it one of the superstitions of this little town? I don't know, ma'am. But most folks here in town know it's true. It, should I leave a quart of milk, ma'am? Uh, yes, and a pint of cream. Every morning, please. Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, here, I'll pay you for the week. Then you won't be afraid that I'll run off and you won't get your money. Here you are. Is this the right amount? That's right, ma'am. Oh, someone at the door. Pardon me. It's your next door neighbor, ma'am. I seen her coming across the backyard. Oh, thank you. None of my neighbors have called as yet. Uh, good morning. Good morning. You're Mrs. Liveston, aren't you? Yes, I am. Won't you come in? Oh, yes, although I can't stay long. Uh, I'll be going, ma'am. Oh, yes, and don't forget to stop every morning. Uh, no, ma'am. Uh, yes, ma'am, I, I will. Goodbye. Uh, goodbye, ma'am. Well, so you've moved in here to stay, have you? And your husband bought out the drugstore. Oh, it's too bad old Mr. Green had to die. He was such a good druggist, and I depended on him, so... Um, he fixed up the most marvelous remedy for my rheumatism. But, uh, and I always say these new doctors mean well, but they don't know the old-fashioned remedies the old men did. Oh, no, sir. Oh, won't you come in the living room and sit down? Uh, no, if you don't mind, I'll stay right here in the kitchen. Not that I'm afraid in this house in the daytime, mind you, but... Well, I like to be right near a door where I can get out in a hurry. Uh... <laughs> Uh, Mrs. Dutton, will you please tell me what this mystery is all about? The milkman was trying to tell me something about him, but... Uh, he... Now, that's just what I thought. I said to my man last night, I said, like as not, Seth Rogers, he's the banker who owns this house. Oh, yeah. I said, I'll bet you dollars to donuts he didn't tell you folks a thing about it. Now, isn't that the limit? Oh, what is it? Tell me all about it. Well, there are no two ways about it. This house is haunted. Huh? You don't mean to tell me that a, a lovely new house like this is branded with any old-fashioned oh, belief like true. this? enough, all right. Sometimes I actually get so frightened right next door to it that I've threatened to move out of the neighborhood. I said only last week that if I heard any more stories about it, I'd have to get out. Oh, for goodness sake, tell me what it is. I don't want to live in ignorance of what's wrong with my own oh, house. Yes, that's what it is. Oh, it's a tragic story. A very tragic story. Yes? Yeah? Well, tell me. Well, this house was built for Mr. Rogers' daughter. He gave it to her for a wedding present. Oh, I remember as well as if it were yesterday. She was such a beautiful girl. And her husband. Oh, my, but he was handsome. They lived here in this house? Yes, but only for four weeks, mind you. Just four weeks in this lovely little house. How long ago was it? Just three years ago last October. Oh. My, it was a terrible thing. Oh, what happened to them? Well, as I say, they'd only been married four weeks when one day he went out hunting. How oh, well I remember that day. I was the first one over here when I heard about the accident. To him, you mean? Yes. Oh, my. To think that a couple so much in love should come to such a tragic end. Well, as I say, I was the first one over here. I even got here before Mr. Rogers came to tell his daughter about it. I had to break the news to her. Something had happened to her husband, you mean? Some other hunter shot him accidentally. Killed him outright. Oh. 
Oh, how terrible. Terrible is no word for it. And wait, you haven't heard the worst part of the story. Two weeks afterwards, that poor girl, that lovely bride, who was a bride no more, killed herself. Oh, no. Yes, she did. Threw herself in the river. Drowned. Oh, what a tragic thing. Oh, her poor little body. They never recovered it, though they dragged the river for days and days. Well, it's a terrible thing, Mrs. Dutton, but I don't see what it has to do with this house being haunted. Oh, wait, I'm coming to that. You see, for six months after they died, it was closed up tight. Mr. Rogers never came near it. I came over and sorted out her clothes and personal things for him. He wouldn't step inside. Then I guess he decided to rent it. It was all furnished and everything. Oh, it's so nice even now. Four different families have tried to live in it since then. But they all moved away in a hurry. They claim they heard things walking at night. In this house? Yes, walking all over it. Ah, tragedy struck it too soon. And the ghost of those young people come back to walk on the earth they were forced to leave. Have you ever heard them walking? No, and I don't want to. I heard nothing last night. But you will. You mark my words. <laughs> oh, oh, great heavens. What is that? Sounded like something in the living room. I'll go see. Something certainly did fall. What? Why, look. There's this beautiful vase that's set on the mantel. Oh, what a shame. It's broken in a thousand pieces. Not a car going by on the street to jar it. Not a thing. Oh, I tell you, they're beginning to walk in the daytime. Let me out of here. Let me out of here. They haunt the house in the daytime now. Oh, let me out of here. Paul. Paul, wake up. Yes. Turn on the lights. What? what is it? What do you say? Wake up. Turn on the light. Right there beside you. What's the matter? Listen. There's someone walking up in the attic. I don't hear anything. Wake up and listen, you will. You hear it? Uh, I hear a noise. Someone walking, I tell you. I can hear it plain as day. Oh, turn on the light. Yeah. Now do you feel better when you can see? I don't think I hear it now. Well, I suppose whatever it was knew we turned on the lights and scampered away. <laughs> Honey, I'm ashamed of you. You let that neighbor of yours get you all upset. Oh, no, I haven't. I'm certain I heard someone walking upstairs. Well, it's stopped now. What do you say we go back to sleep? Well, let's sleep with the light on. No, nonsense. Go on back to sleep and forget it. All right. I'll try. May I uh, turn off the light then? Yes, go ahead. There. Now you calm your fears. Go back to sleep. Oh, I know you think it sounded silly. Of course I do. You can't scare me. There are such things as ghosts, you know. Where? In books? In life. Ah, you're silly. Paul. Listen, Paul. There it is again. Don't you hear it? I do hear a noise. It's someone walking right up over our heads. Paul, you've got to go up in the attic and see what it is. Oh, all right, all right, I will. Just to satisfy you. But I know it isn't anything. Just the wind rattling something up there. Wind doesn't make the sound of footsteps. Oh, hurry, Paul. You want it to get me? I want you to find out what it is. Well, where's my robe? I'm beginning to see why people moved out of this house. How could they stay here with this strange walking over them? You uh, want to come with me? No, I'll stay here. What's that? Oh, it's Paul walking up the attic stairs. Oh, I've got myself in a nice state of nerves. Now, if that's Paul, it, it sounds exactly like the walking before he went up there. <laughs> what was that? Paul! Paul, come here! Paul, come here, quick! What's happening? Margaret, that was down in the kitchen. Oh, I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm coming. Oh, what is it? Oh, look. Look what's happened here. My heavens. Oh, what in the world? Every dish in the cupboard is smashed on the floor. Oh, of all things. All these lovely dishes broken. What, well, what could cause it? By golly, if this isn't the limit. Well, what could cause it, Paul? Was there someone up in the attic? No. No, no, there wasn't. 
But, Margaret. Yes? I don't want to get you frightened. No, now. tell me. What did you see? Well, it wasn't exactly what I saw. Well, in a way, it was, too. There was something, wasn't there? As I was climbing the stairs to the attic, I don't know what it was, but I had the queerest sensation, as if something brushed my shoulder. I could feel it, almost see it. It was as if I were blind and yet could sense someone or something trying to move stealthily past me. Oh, Paul. Oh, dear. The house is haunted there. I don't know. But if it is, and something did pass me on the stairs, it came down here in the kitchen and threw all these dishes on the floor. <laughs> Let's get out. I'm going to talk to Mr. Rogers in the morning. I can't believe it yet, but there certainly is something going I on here. I know it. I know it. I heard them walking long before you did. And the vase on the mantel this morning, it broke too. Well, keep calm, honey. We'll find out what it is. Right now, if you can find a cup that isn't broken, I'll have a gallon of black coffee. <laughs> What can the trouble in the house Paul and Margaret have rented be, eh? Who is moving about in their house in the dark of night? The hermit will tell you before the night is done. <laughs> and now, the hermit again. <laughs> it is the next morning, and we find Paul in the office of Mr. Rogers. Listen. <laughs> yeah, it's all right, Mr. Livestone. You're welcome to move out. I'll refund your month's rent. I don't want to do that, Mr. Rogers. You stayed a night longer than anyone else who's rented the house. I don't blame you for going. You haven't ever stayed there, have you? No. I presume you know the story of my daughter and my son-in-law. Yes, I do. I don't want to bring it all up for you again. It's all right. It's with me all the time. What I started to say was, I can't bring myself to go in the house. I built it for my little girl. I couldn't go into it, ever. What I'd like to ask you is, do you take any stock in the story about the house being haunted? I don't know. All I've heard is from the people who've rented it. They say so. But you don't believe it, do you? I don't know. There might be some truth in it. Yet you've never investigated? Oh, I think you understand I can't visit that house. But maybe if you came and stayed in it, we could clear the matter up. Won't you come over to the house and stay with my wife and me tonight? Well, I... Please. Uh... We'll feel a lot better. We want to live in the house if possible. Well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll try and forget my sorrow. I'll go there to the house tonight and stay with you. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. If there is anything, we'll find it. But I don't want the house all torn to pieces. Oh, no, sir. We won't do that. I hate to lose the property... But if it's true that there is something wrong, I may have to burn the house down. That would be a shame. My wife likes the house. We'd like to stay there. Well, I'll be over tonight. Maybe we can straighten it out forever. Good evening. Oh, Mrs. Dutton, come right in. I suppose you're surprised to see me. I didn't think myself that I'd ever come into this house at night. Well, now you're here, won't you take off your things and sit down? I just wore this shawl. I'll keep it over my shoulders. Isn't that Mr. Rogers' car out in front? Yes, it is. I don't think of that. I never expected he'd come to this house. Never. Is there something wrong? Something more than usual, I mean? Well, not... Not exactly. It must be something very strange that would bring him to this house. He never set foot inside it since the death of his daughter, you know. So I understand. But he very kindly consented to do so after my husband went and talked to him. What about? Well, we like the house very well, and we'd like to stay here if we can. Has anything else happened since the day I was over? We did hear some strange sounds. I knew it. I knew it. Then you've gone right on living here. How can you do it? Why, I'm sure I... Where's Mr. Rogers gone? Oh, he and Paul are looking through the house. They've gone down the basement now, I think. Searching? What for? For oh, nothing definite. What could they find? Things that haunt houses that couldn't be seen. Well, you know how much better anyone feels after they've searched all through a house which frightens them. Oh, oh my heavens. Look. Look. Where? What do you mean? Oh, can't you see? Look at that chair. What? Look at it. Why, it's rocking. Oh, of course it's rocking. All by itself. Oh, they, they must have jarred it while they were down in the basement. Well, no. It's spirits rocking that chair. I know it. Whatever is in this house that haunts this place, it's after someone. 
Oh, it wants something. I know it. Oh, it's rocking again. Oh, by its tail. Oh, help! Help! What is it? Yes, what, what's happened? Oh, Mr. Rogers, it's you. Oh, I'm glad you've come. But now you may stop whatever it is in this house. What is it, Mrs. Dutton? See that chair there? It started to rock all by itself. Did it, Margaret? Well, yes, it did. I thought perhaps it was because you jarred the floor while you were down in the basement. Oh, it was spirits. I know it. Oh, my nerves. My nerves are all unstrung. I've got to go home. Right now. Right now. Well, she really was frightened, wasn't she? Of course, if it did really move of its own accord, it would frighten anyone. I can't make it out. We haven't seen a thing. Oh, it isn't that there's anything in the house that hurt you, Mr. Rogers. It's only this constant moving of things in the house. And... In the nighttime, someone or something moving in the attic. We haven't seen anything either. I don't think we shall. I shall have to admit I'm still at a loss to account for it, though. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'll retire to my room for the night. But I promise you I shall stay awake. And if there is anything, we'll find it. Well, I can hear it tonight, all right, Margaret. Was that the sound you heard? Yes, that's it. Should we call Mr. Rogers? No, let him hear it for himself. Then we'll be certain it isn't a product of our own minds. How could it be a product of our own minds? There's certainly something moving about in the attic. Someone, something walking. You're right, it is. Oh. Oh, yes? It's Mr. Rogers. Just a minute. I think I heard what you've been referring to. The sound of something moving in the attic. Yes, Mr. Rogers, we just heard it, too. Shall we go up there? Yes, I guess we better. I can't make it out. I'm going to. All right. Will your robe be warm enough? Yes, I'm all right. Then let's go right away. Oh, wait. There aren't any lights in the attic. I'll take a flashlight. Why, the attic was wired for electricity. I guess the bulbs have been taken out then. Because I couldn't get any light the other night when I went up there. Listen. I hear it again. Do you? It sounds as if... Whatever it is, was moving faster, walking more rapidly. Are we all ready now? Yes, I am. Of course, we won't see a thing. All these weird things happen and we never see a thing. Here are the stairs. Watch out now. Don't fall anyone. Oh, I, I hate to admit it. I'm so scared my heart is pounding like a trip hammer. I know. I went cold all over when I heard the sound of walking while I was in my room. The light should turn on right here. Guess they don't work. We can see pretty well with this flashlight. Yeah, you see, not a thing. Totally deserted. We can't peer into the corners very well. Wait, I'll stand up in this chair. Maybe the light bulb has come loose. Maybe I can fix it. I can almost reach it. Here, I'll give you a boost. Now I've got it. Yes, it is loose. There. Now turn on the switch. Yes. Oh, there. That's fine. Now we can see there. But there isn't anything to see. Isn't it the queerest thing? Did you feel anything pass you on the stairs this time, Paul? No. Did you, Mr. Rogers? Pass me on the stairs? No. Well, neither did I. And if there is anything in this house, it should still be right here in this attic. Do you mind if we tear things to pieces up here and search thoroughly, Mr. Rogers? I don't know what there is to search for, but go right ahead. I hate to disturb my girl's things that were left here in the attic. But we might as well, I guess. I just thought it might be an animal or a bat or something living up here. We may find it. Well, that wouldn't account for the dishes breaking, Paul, or the chair rocking. This is just a pile of bedding, isn't it? Yes, I guess so. Oh, look. Look at this big trunk. What's in it, Mr. Rogers? Oh, that... that trunk, why, it was one my wife and I first took to Europe with us. My little girl used it for her trousseau, I guess. Oh, I think it's locked. Uh, maybe I can open it. Uh, stuck, I guess. Rusty. Oh, oh, there. It's opening. Paul. Paul. I'm here. Paul. Oh, Paul. Margaret. Margaret, what is it? Don't look. Don't look at the body. What? What? Great heavens. What is it? It's a body, Mr. Rogers. A woman's body. What? Let me look at it. Great heavens. It, it's the body of my daughter. The body of my daughter. Margaret is 
much better, Mr. Rogers. I'm glad to hear she's getting along all right. It was a terrible shock for her. And for you, Mr. Rogers. Yes, it was. So much I can't even think or reason it out. You know how it happened? Yes, we found the bottle of poison in the bottom of the trunk. She crawled away in there and died. Believe me, my, my heart aches for you. But at least now I can give my little girl a decent burial. Mr. Livestone, I'm convinced there was something that moved about in the house. Aren't you? Yes, I am. Either the spirit of my daughter walked in that house, or that of her husband trying to tell us that the body of my little girl was there. We haven't heard or seen anything strange for the last three nights. No, and you won't. The spirits will rest easy now. They'll rest easy. set free. It will walk no more. <laughs> Turn on your lights. Turn them on. <laughs> I'll be back. Pleasant dreams. <laughs> Characters, places, and occurrences mentioned in the Hermit's Cave are fictitious, and similarity to persons, places, or occurrences is purely accidental. The Mamas in the Little Theater of the Air. This is a story of love that has no end, of the deep, dark shadows of sorrow, of dreams that span the bridge of time. It's my story and Loray's. I am David Runzel, just an ordinary guy with hopes like yours and dreams like yours. I was one in a foxhole with thousands of boys, and in the nighttime when the enemy was pouring all they had on us, I did what a lot of fellows did. I put my mind on other things, but not so my pal Jim Green. The giving is all we got tonight, Dave. Yeah. That was a funny feeling a guy gets out here, never knowing just what minute the end is going to come, and yet always so close you can down near taste it. Yeah. It's a funny thing, though. It never seems to get you like it does me. You know why, Jim? <laughs> Got some secret system? Maybe. Well, give. Let another guy in on it. You got a girl back home, Jim? <laughs> hey, girl. Man, I've got dozens. I've got just one. <laughs> I figure there's more safety in numbers. You've got just one. How do you know she'll be yours when you get back? I know, Jim. There was never anyone for Loray but me. And there was never anyone for me but Loray. You got more faith than I have, Dave. There's still a lot of fellas on the home front making hay while the sun shines. So they tell me. I never worry about Loray. She's always with me. Always. Jack! <laughs> Christopher, that was a close one. Yeah. I hate all of this. Why do we have to be out here? Our bodies targets for death. Quiet, Jim. Think about something else. You're a fool, Dave. You don't have any more chance than I have. But I have. I've got faith. You know what, Jim? It always seems that Marie is right beside me. Sometimes walking in front of me, shielding me from enemy fire. <laughs> That's rot. You don't have to believe me, but I know it's true. I can feel her presence tonight more than ever. 
I know she's here beside me. You expect me to believe in such a thing? As if a person a million miles away could protect you in this foxhole. What's more, it's getting hotter around here. We're in for it tonight. Dave, Jim. Dave. I'm afraid, Dave. Let LaRae protect you as she does me. Down this spot it is. We gotta move out of here. Jim, don't be a fool. It ain't safe here, I tell you. There's zero in on us. Jim, come back. Jim. Oh, Jim, I told you to stay by me. The ray would have protected you. Jim! Oh, you may not believe my story any more than Jim, who lost his life that night. But I knew my darling LeRae was constantly by my side. No matter how terrible the battle, she was protecting me. When I was in the front line, she was my shield and my protector. When we moved along the roadways and our planes above spotted us, I had no fear. For LeRae was near me. Since childhood, we'd been pals living on nearby farms. Somehow, even as kids, we seemed to sense that there was a strong bond between us that no amount of kidding from the other kids could harm. <laughs> They're all laughing because you're walking home with me, Dave. As if I care. They'll bother you all day tomorrow in school. Let them just try. Dave? Yeah? Are you planning to marry me when we grow up? Well, I guess I am. I'm planning to marry you, too. Can't nobody bother us. Only Pa. He says it's silly for a little girl to have a sweetheart. You are my sweetheart, aren't you, Dave? Well, I guess so. You're the only one I like in all the world. More than your uncle and aunt that you live with? Sure, they ain't like real folks to me. You are. I'll always belong to you, Dave. Always. <laughs> And that's the way it was, right up through the years. We always belonged together. Maybe it was because I didn't have any real folks. I was an orphan. And the folks that adopted me let me call them aunt and uncle. They were good to me. Uncle Henry planned to let me run the farm when I got through my course down at agricultural college. And someday, the farm would be mine. And Lorraine and I, we planned to be married just as soon as I finished my school course and began to run the farm. And then, how long came the war, and I had to go. And the evening before I left, Lorraine and I walked to our favorite place for meeting, in the woods, just beyond the clearing of Uncle Henry's place. We had a favorite old log there where we could peer through the clearing and see the house and hills beyond. And a patch of sky to the west, where the sun dipped down from sight and sent colored streamers out into the sky. And here, when night came, we could look up above the treetops and see the stars and watch the old moon come riding forth into a purple field. Our trysting place was like a seat in a cathedral. Everything good and clean in life was close to us there at our meeting place in the woods. It was here that we said goodbye. You don't want me to come into town and go to the station, Dave? Don't you think it's better to say goodbye here? We'll never say goodbye, Dave. Never. No matter where you go. I'm always going to be with you. Sure. I kind of feel like that, too. And, Dave, when you come back, the very hour that you return to me, I'll know it. I won't come down to the station. I'll be waiting here in the woods, here on the old log. This is where you'll find me. Oh, Lorraine. Dave. You'll be brave? Yes. I'm going now. Don't turn and look. I'm walking away, but I'm not really leaving at all. I'll be with you always. Oh, don't turn and look. Before you know it, I'll be back. I'll return and be sitting beside you, here on the log at our old trysting place. And so it was that all during the long days of war, I never felt that I was really away from Loray at all, or that she was absent from me. Why, there were times when it was as if I could reach out just a little and find her beside me. 
In fact, there were times that I could actually hear her voice. I recall the first time I heard it. It was a bad hour. The enemy was giving us everything they had from the sky. Fellas I knew and liked were dropping all around me. Their cries struck terror in my heart. of all the hellfire and dying, the pain and the terror. Just as clear as a bird call on a silent night, I heard Lorraine's voice for the first time. I'm not here, my darling. I'm here, baby. Here beside you. It was so clear, that voice of hers, that I expected to look and see her standing near me. You can scoff if you like. You can shrug your shoulders and pass my whole story over lightly if you wish. But I know LeRae was there beside me as the battle raged all around. And then it was over. The war was over. And finally the day came for leaving the battle-torn old world, getting on a ship and starting homeward. There was shouting and rejoicing. There was singing and laughter. There was hope about to be fulfilled. There was home just beyond the horizon. We were at sea. Then we were in the harbor. Then on shore. And then soon discharge. I'd made up my mind I'd return without a word to anyone. Yes, I'd fool Lorray. She said she'd know the very hour that I'd be returning. I wouldn't have to tell her, she said. The very hour that you returned to me. I'll know it. I won't come down to the station. I'll be waiting here in the woods. Here on the old log. This is where you'll find me. Yeah. We'd see how good she was. We'd test that second sight of hers, that intuition. All the while on the train that carried me towards home, I kept chuckling to myself. We'll see. Just see if she will be waiting on the old log when I come walking into the woods. My heart was pounding with the excitement of my returning, of the surprise in store for Lorraine. Oh, it seemed as though the long train trip would never end. But finally, we pulled into the station. There was a little bunch of town folks around the old depot. I didn't want to see anybody. I waited until the train was almost ready to leave, and then I jumped off on the opposite side. I took to the fields that led out to the road to where our farm stood. It was autumn. Already there'd been a frost, and the old maples in the woods were dressed in scarlet, brilliant red. Under my feet, the dry leaves made soft music. Only a little way further to go, and our log would be in sight. And then, there it was before me. I stopped dead still. I couldn't move. For there she was. There was Lorraine, seated on the log just as she promised. The setting sun made her all golden. Her fair hair was touched with it, and sparks of light danced upon it. She was looking right at me. Now she was standing, her arms stretched out to me. Oh, Dave. Dave. Oh, you knew. Yes, Dave. You knew I was coming. Yes, my darling. Just as you said you would know. Yes. Oh, darling, Lorraine, you've never been absent from me. Not for an instant. No, Dave. You followed me wherever I went. Yes. There were times when I actually heard your voice. Of course. What did you say to me? Do you remember what you said? Yes. Tell me. I remember. I said, do not fear, my darling. I'm here, Dave. Here beside you. Yes. That's what I heard you say. We will never be separated, Dave. Never. Of course we won't. Not now. I'm home safe and we'll never be parted again. Never let anyone tell you differently. Never let them say that we are parted. 
What do you mean? We're together. We can't be parted, not ever again. Dave. Oh, my darling. More beautiful than ever. But you're so cold. Night is coming. It's chilly here in the woods. I must get you home. <laughs> Try and catch me. Try and catch well, me, Dave. Well, hey, hey. You can't run away from me like this. Wait, I'll catch you. I'm a pretty fair runner these days. <laughs> Don't you know I've been in training? Hey, you can't hide from me. Well, what do you know? You've pulled one on me. I, I can't see you anywhere. Lorraine, where are you? Say, you can't run out on me like this. I'll find you. Huh. Well, what do you know? Got out of my sight. Okay, honey, you win. If you can hear me, I'm going up to the house to clean up a bit. See Uncle Henry and Aunt Martha. But I'll be over to your house on the stroke of seven. Do you hear me? At seven. And tomorrow we get the license to be married. Loray, can you hear me? The license to be married. feeling to see oh, you two. Oh, don't he look wonderful, Henry. Taller than ever and filled out, too. Oh, we're glad to have you back, David. Glad you made it safe and sound. Oh, I tell you, there wasn't a chance of me not making it. You know something, Aunt Martha? All through the terrible business, I felt that Lorraine was beside me, protecting me from death. Oh, David. And the most wonderful part about it all, even though I never let any of you know I was coming home today, Lorraine had a feeling about it. She was waiting in the woods for me just now at our old log where we always used to meet. What did you say, Dave? Lorraine was waiting in the woods for me. I just left her. She sensed that I was coming home today, and just like we planned before I went away, she was waiting for me in the woods. My boy. Henry. Henry, you got her. Didn't you get our letters, Dave? Well, sure, I got some, but mail hasn't caught up with me now for a long time. David. Oh, Dave. What's wrong? <gasps> What is it? Well, David, it's like this. She couldn't have met you in the woods, David. Lorraine couldn't have been in the woods just now. But she was. I just saw her. No, David, no. Lorraine died, my boy. She passed away just a little while after you went overseas. We wrote you. We finally wrote you about her death. David finds that the person close to his heart, who he has just met at the old trysting place in the woods, is of this world no more. She's a dream and a vision that is ended in death. What will happen to David's life now? Eh? The hermit will tell you before the night is done. <laughs> now the hermit again. Now, David Runzel goes on relating the story of his life to the hermit. Listen. <laughs> you ask, what happens to my life now? You think that I believe that death has separated Lorraine and me? Never. As we reckon time on this earth, my Lorraine was asleep in death at the time she appeared to me on the battlefield. She was not of this world when, in returning home, I met her in the woods at our old and destined meeting place. Uncle Henry and Aunt Martha have taken a place in town. They've left me the farm as they promised, and I'm working it. I've been here three months now. Last evening, Aunt Martha came out to see me. I... Brought you a pie and some cookies, Davy. Thanks, Aunt Martha. Oh, your Uncle Henry and I worry about you, my boy. Oh, you must not do that. But we can't have you here all alone. I'm not alone. Davy, 
You need somebody to keep house for you. You should find a nice girl. Court her and, and marry Aunt her. Aunt Martha, never. Oh, it ain't right. It's a sinful, terrible thing, you thinking that a dead girl is beside you all the time. Oh, stop, Aunt Martha. You can't talk this way to me. I got her, David. The living can't bow down to the dead. Lorraine is not dead. I saw her lowered into her grave. You must say no more. It's the way I want it. There's no one in all the world, here on this earth or after, that I want but Lorraine. Oh, David. It's the war. It's touched your mind. No, Aunt Martha. There's no use trying to explain. There's a bond between Lorraine and me that is stronger than life, deeper than earth, and beyond all time and reckoning. Sometimes I wonder. I puzzle over the why of it all. Why am I left on earth alone? Why, if Lorraine had to pass beyond, I could not have met her there. But such was not the way it was planned. And I'm not alone. Often as night gathers, when the stars light the sky, when the wind is soft and blows a fragrance in the windows, I hear the door open softly. Lorraine? Yes, David. I am here. I can feel your presence, but I cannot see you. I cannot always return to your sight, but I am ever present. Yes, I know. I will always be near you. Oh, why can't I too die that we may be together? That I cannot answer. There will be an hour, a time for meeting. You will never appear to me again like you did in the woods when I came home? No, my darling. Not until the final hour. Until my death, you mean? We do not call it death. We who love, for love is stronger than death, my darling. Love is of the spirit, and the spirit never dies. And so it is I know. The love I bear for Lorraine and the love she bears for me knows no boundary nor no ending. Do you scoff? Do you shake your head in disbelief? Do you believe, as does Aunt Martha, that my mind is addled by the horrors of war? Do you believe it untrue that my Lorraine, because of death, hath left me? Uh, what matter what you say or what you think? I tell you, she is with me always. During the soft early hours of dawn, when the sun rides the summit, when dusk falls and the shadows lengthen to bring the night, when the wind sings, when the pines mourn, she is near me. This is my story of love that never ends. David Rudzo, a boy who believes in a love stronger than life or death. This is a story he told me, a story without end. Turn on your lights. Turn them on. <laughs> I'll be back. Pleasant dreams. <laughs> Characters, places, and occurrences mentioned in the Hermit's Cave are fictitious, and similarity to persons, places, and occurrences is purely accidental. The Mummers in the Little Theater of the Air. Now the Hermit is ready.
ready to help you spend an entertaining half hour. <laughs> Ghost stories. Weird stories. And murders, too. <laughs> the hermit knows of them all. Turn out your lights. Turn them out. You heard the story of Vampire's Desire, hmm? Then listen while the hermit tells you the story. <laughs> Forbidding looking place, Mr. Winton. It is at that. We can't go any farther in this downpour. We shall most likely have to stay in this doorway, then. The house looks untenanted. Does it that? However, there may be someone in. There's no one living in this tomb of a place, Mr. Winton. I think you're right, John. I wonder where we are. I haven't had the slightest idea where we are since the beginning of the storm and we lost our way. Hmm. I think you're right about the place being untended. Try the door. Maybe we can break in. Anything to get out of this storm. Try the door. Uh, yes, sir. Oh, it's opening. Oh, good. Well? Good evening. We've lost our way. Been caught in this storm. We're drenched to the skin. More fools you for being out on a night like this. It's a very agreeable song. May we come in and get dried out? You're not welcome. Well, surely you're not going to turn us away on a night like this. I don't care what kind of a night it is. You're not welcome. Well, all right, may we come in, whether we're welcome or not. No. Good night. She's slamming the door in your face. Yeah. Kindly yeah. soul. When the old woman tried to slam the door, I stuck my foot in the way, and she hasn't tried to close it anymore. Well, good. Let's take a chance on going in, then, whether we're welcome or not. All right, sir. Now, which way, Mr. Winton? Who can tell in this pitch darkness? <laughs> Listen. The old woman. Yeah. Mr. Winton, we're in the house of a mad woman. It isn't a very pleasant sound, is it? Doesn't seem to be a light in the whole place. What shall we do? We'll go to the right. Feel along the wall for a light switch or a door. All right. Come along, then. Follow me. Ah. Here's a door. Come along, John. Stay close by me. Yes, sir. <laughs> oh, good Lord, sir. Is she going to keep that up all night? Well, if she is, I wish she'd tell what the joke is so we can laugh with her. Find the light switch? Uh, no. There doesn't seem to be one. All right, then. We'll continue in the dark. You go to the left, I'll go to the right. Maybe we can find something to sit on. Uh, yes, sir. Ah. Hmm? What's this? I found something. What is it? Well, it might be a bookcase built into the wall. All right. There may be at least something in it that we can sit on. Even books would be better than the cold floor. Yes, sir. Although I can't feel anything yet. I keep talking, John, so I can find my way over to you. Yes, sir. Why don't you strike a match? Fine chance either of us have of doing that. They'll be soaking wet. Where are you? Right here, sir. You're almost up to me. Oh. Now, where's the bookcase? Right here. Let me have your hand. Oh. Ah, yes. Now, let's feel all through it. Maybe something of use in it. You never can tell. What was that? Sounds like someone at the door. Well, what are you doing? <laughs> Trying to light a match. Any luck? <laughs> no, sir. Just like you said, they're sopping wet. Quiet now. Let's listen. Huh. You must have been imagining things. I've been imagining things ever since we first heard that old woman laugh like that. It fairly makes my hair stand on end. There it is again, sir. A rustling near the door. Who is that? Who's there? Stay away from that bookcase. Stay away. Who is it? Who are you? Stay away from that bookcase. We wouldn't be near the blessed bookcase if he'd be gracious enough to conduct us to a room with some furniture in it so that we might rest and get dry. Stay away from the bookcase. He's leaving, sir. Well, this is a fine how-do-you-do, isn't it? Oh, I've had about enough, sir. 
I'd sooner we were on our way. Oh, nonsense. However, we'll leave the bookcase alone if that's what we're asked to do. <laughs> He's still here about? Yes, I heard him. Say, you playing some game with us? If so, we're not in the mood for it. No answer. No. Oh, there she is again. Yes. That's enough. That's enough. What are you going to do, sir? This is some fool game they're playing with us. I'm going to find out about it and put a stop to it. There's a man and woman living in this house. There must be some furniture in at least one of the rooms. Some heat, sir. I'm chilled to the bone. Yes, yeah, some heat. There isn't, and there's something going on here that we should investigate and put a stop to. Come along, John. All right, sir, if you say so. Where to first? We'll start right where we are. Search the whole house. From this floor up to the roof. Is nothing. Mr. Winton, look. Where? Down to the end of this hall. There's the old man who was talking to us in the room downstairs, telling us to keep away from the bookcase. I think you're right. Carrying a shaded lantern. Yes, sir. John, we'll follow him. Yes. He'll lead us somewhere. We can't wander in this house all night in the dark. At any rate, he has a light. I don't think he's noticed us. We'll have to get close to him before he turns that corner down to the end of the hall. Yes, He's almost at the corner. There, he turned. Hurry. He might duck into some room close by and we'll lose him. Easy now. While I peek around the corner. You see him, sir? Yes. Going into the first room on the left. <laughs> Quiet. The air is stale and musty here. Yes. <coughs> Never mind about that just now. That makes me gasp for breath. Here's the room he went into. Quiet now while I have a look. Is he in there, sir? Strange. I'm sure he went in there. He might be hiding behind the door waiting to pounce on us. Old man like that couldn't do much pouncing. He might be armed. <coughs> oh, take that chance. The <coughs> air is stale and musty here, isn't it? I can hardly get my breath. The foul, fetid air coming from that room the old man went into. Well, if he can stand it, we can. All right, sir. <laughs> but be careful. Yeah. He's not in here. If he is, he's turned out the lantern. Hello. Hello. There's no one in here. Huh? The door, John. The door just slammed shut. <laughs> oh, there's no door here. I ran right into a blank wall. This is where the door was? Right here, yes. John, we're trapped. Uh, Some devilman underfoot in this house. We're right in the middle of it. In a room with no way out. <coughs> and no air. No air. Now, don't start whimpering. We're in it and we'll have to see what we can do to get out. But what could they want of us? How should I know? What shall we do? Just sit and wait? No, we'll start looking for a way out of this room right now. If we only had a light... Maybe we can find some other way out of this room. We can try. You go to your right, I'll go to the left. We follow the wall around till we meet. All right. And tap the wall as you go along. Listen for hollow spots. No. Oh. Now what? I stumbled over something on the floor, sir. Well, what is it? I don't know. I shall have to feel. Oh. What is it, John? A body, sir. Are you sure? Yes, sir. It's the body of a man. Where is it? No, don't touch it, sir. Don't touch it. Why not? I did. And a part of it crumbled to bits. Good heaven. Yes, sir. It crumbled yeah. under my touch. Where, where is it? Right at my feet. I'm afraid to move another step. We'll see what this is. Yes. <clears throat> You're right. I just touched it and part of the clothing crumbled away. Yeah. And John, I, I felt bones. Oh, sir. That's what's going to happen to us. If we don't get out of this place, I just know it is. You know, that fellow must have been dead for years. The clothing just crumbled away in my fingers. Yes. John, we must get out of this place as quickly as possible. We're in great danger, I'm sure of it. In danger of our lives. We've got to find a way out of this room before we suffocate. Why don't we try to find the place where the door was, sir? Oh, yes. Back to the door, John. We haven't time to look for any other exit. 
We'll have to find out how to open the door we came in. It's over this way, sir. Right along this wall. Who's that? There's the hideous cackle of the old woman again. Never mind about that cackle. We've only a few minutes to find a way out of here. When that door closed, it hermetically sealed this room. If we don't get out, we'll suffocate. What shall I do, sir? Feel along the floor while I search along the walls here. Feel for any loose boards or any part of the floor that might move. Yes, sir. Have you found anything yet? No, sir. Keep working. For heaven's sake, keep working. I can't do any more, sir. I'm through. Keep searching, John. Keep searching. There must be a secret spring somewhere in here that'll open this door. Did you find anything yet, John? John, answer me. John. He's done for. Don't let go, man. Keep on. Hang on. We're not done for yet. Suffocating in a hermetically sealed room. Where is the old man with the lantern? King? The hermit will tell you before the night is done. <laughs> and his man John are trapped in a hermetically sealed room in a house of mystery. Yes, John has lapsed into unconsciousness. But just as Winton is about to drop off, something happens. Listen. <laughs> John. John, we've made it. I've found the hidden spring just in time. You, sir. Yes. Now, come on. Put yourself together. Where are we? I don't know. But at least we're out of that death trap. How did we do it, sir? Just before I went under, I... I happened on that hidden spring that works the door. What about the old man with the lantern? And the cackling old woman? And the crumbling body of the man? We're going to see about those things immediately. I'm going to get to the bottom of this thing. Come yes. on. And get suffocated all over again? I don't think we will. Besides, I know where the release for the door is now. Come along. Be careful. Take an extra long step when you enter the room. I think we tripped some kind of mechanism when we first entered. Yes, sir. Old man with a lantern went into this room and disappeared. But where can he have got to? If he stayed in the room, he must have suffocated. He didn't stay in the room. I'm positive of that. Keep your ears open. Listen for any hollow sound. One, sir. Yes, I heard it. Listen. Don't you hear someone talking? No, sir. Put your ear to the wall. Listen. You hear it now? Yes, sir. Two people talking. Yes. I knew that old man couldn't have vanished into thin air. There's another door hidden here somewhere, and we're going to find it. Feel for anything movable around the wainscoting. I'll work up the sides here. Can you hear what they're saying? No, they're too far away to catch any of the words. However, from his tone, I'd say he was threatening her. Ah. You found it, sir? Yes, yeah, this little bud on the decoration here. Look, sir, a flight of stairs. Yes, and leading down. Come on. Oh, haven't we had enough for one night, sir, without sticking our noses in any further? We've gone this far and had an attempt made on our lives. We're going to clear up this business before we leave. No telling what might be down there, sir. That's what I'm going to find out. Well, you coming with me or shall I go alone? Oh, no, sir, I'm coming. Uh, you can hear them talking a 
little more clearly now. Close enough to make out their conversation. Now, there are two more up there with Gregory. Yes. <laughs> Man, we saw with a lantern. He's talking about us, John. Yes, sir. He thinks we're dead upstairs with that body we found. If you do not continue to obey me, that's what will happen to you. Oh, no. No. <laughs> cringe. Cringe. That's what I want you to do. Come on, John. We'll see what we can do about this. When I'm gone, you think all the money will be yours. Uh, I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, yes, you do. <laughs> yes, you do. There's a turn in the passage just ahead. I can see a light shining. Quietly now. We'll be able to see into the room in a moment or so. Tomorrow, you'll bring me another young animal to feed upon. Yes, Brother Garnet. It's her brother that's talking. Yes. Easy now while I look around the corner. What in heaven's name? What do you see, sir? Come here. Great heavens. A coffin. Yes, a coffin. With a huge lighted candle. And at each corner. And look in the coffin. A man. The one we heard talking. When you get back to your cottage each morning... You wonder where you've been the night before, don't you? Huh? <laughs> there you are, John. But his lips don't move. No, but that's where the voice is coming from. You don't know that I have you under my power? <laughs> what shall we do, sir? We'll dash in there and let matters take their course. Are you ready? Yes, sir. Come on, then. Lydia, the candle is quick. Out with them. Stop. Stop. John, quickly, that cover over there. Slam it on the coffin. The lady. Look at her. Look at the change that's coming over. Oh, oh, oh where am I? A, a, a coffin. You two. Where am I? You should know better than us. But I... But I... I don't. Are you sure? Oh, yes. Yes. Oh, please believe me. Why, I... I begin to understand now. I think I do, too. It's been this all the time. While I thought it was just a terrible nightmare. Would you like to make yourself clear? The coffin. Tell me. Who's in it? Who's in the coffin? You mean to say that you don't know? Oh, no, I swear I don't. Well, you called him brother just a few moments ago. Brother? Your own brother Garnet is in that coffin. No. No, how can that be? We, we buried my brother Garnet over eight years ago. Oh, I see. Yes. And you are... I'm Lydia Crampton. Miss Crampton... I would advise you to start at the beginning so that we might unravel this maze. Oh, I... will try. But... Oh, but not here, please. Yes, here. If my deductions are correct, it would be better for everyone concerned to get the truth right here and now. All right. There's very little I can tell you that I know definitely. Brother Garnet died about eight years ago. I... Oh, I hate to say it, but he was horrible... He was a devil. As soon as father died and he came into the money, he started making my life miserable. Why? I never could find out why. Then Garnet died and was buried. And with him was buried the secret of father's will. I know that the estate was supposed to pass on to me after Garnet's death, but I can't find any sign of the will. Well, what have you done? I have a small income from my mother. I've been living in a little cottage not far from here. Now comes the part that's like a terrible dream. But I'm beginning to see it now. I'm positive that I'm right when I say that Garnet somehow was able to exercise his will upon me after death. What makes you say that? What I've been thinking were horrible nightmares. I now see were actual occurrences. He made me come here every night to wait upon him. 
He told me that Gregory, his butler, had placed him here in this coffin and had buried a dummy in his place. Then he killed Gregory. The body in the room upstairs? Yes. When he had me under his spell, I used to pass through that room and laugh at the remains of Gregory. Call him lazy for always sleeping on the floor. To think that I would do a thing like that. Go ahead, Miss Crampton. He made me bring him a young animal every day or two. What was that for? He fed upon them. Ah, I thought so. He feeds upon the blood of animals. Yes. He sucked the blood from them. And when he had fed, he had the strength to get out of his coffin for a while. This is horrible. Stop her. Oh, quiet, John. Then that's how we saw him in the hall upstairs. Go ahead, Miss Crampton. That is about all. He used to taunt me by the hour, telling me I'd never come into my inheritance. I see. When we slammed the lid on the coffin, we broke his spell over you. Yes, you must have done. Tell me, Miss Crampton, where in this room are we in connection with the rest of the house? I don't know. It must be on the ground floor, I suppose. That's what I was thinking. I have an idea. What is it, sir? Hear that? Another hollow spot. Exactly. Now, what's this point right here? Yes, sir. We'll press it and... Uh, it's opening! What? Why, it's the bookcase in the front room. Look at this in the back of the bookcase. A small secret compartment. Yeah. <clears throat> bookcase. Hey, the dead body is talking. Talking even with the coffin lid on. All right, John. We're ready to put a stop to us talking. Here, Miss Crampton, a package from the compartment in the back of the bookcase. I think you'll find it's your father's will. Father's will? Yes. Now, John, take those candles out of the candlesticks. Yes. Hand the candles to Miss Crampton. Now, hand me one candlestick and use the other as a hammer. But what are we going to do, sir? We're going to put an end to Gardner Crampton. But how, sir? What are we going to do with the candlestick? I'll show you. I'll use the ornamental pointed end of this candlestick as a spear. You use your candlestick as a hammer. We'll drive this one through the heart of that monster in the coffin. No, no. But that would be murder. Will not. He only lives during the night. Go on, strike. <coughs> we'll release his soul so that he'll never trouble anyone on earth again. Faster, John. I'm working as fast as I can, sir. When Miss Crampton told me he was feeding on young animals. Sucking the blood? Yes. I knew then that we had a vampire to deal with. What are you doing? For heaven's sakes, what are you doing? We're ridding the face of the earth of a vampire. <laughs> It's done. We've driven the point of this candlestick through the coffin and through the heart of Garnet Crampton, who's long been dead, but whose soul has been held in bondage by the result of his evil practices in life. Put an end to the vampire's desire. Yes. Released his soul so it could never again return to the earth. Turn on your lights. Turn them on. <laughs> I'll be back. Pleasant dream. <laughs> Characters, places, and occurrences mentioned in the Hermit's Cave are fictitious, and similarity to persons, places, or occurrences is purely accidental.
workshop under the direction of Irving Reese presents Edgar Allan Poe's The Telltale Heart. Come in. Yes, Wilson? The patient in 19 is frightfully nervous, Dr. Boyfriend. He'll be all right after the storm breaks. Yes, Doctor. You'll learn after you've been at this asylum for a while. But most of the incurably insane are rather susceptible to atmospheric disturbances. Yes, I suppose so. The mental condition of some makes them more sensitive than others. Noises bother them. Sometimes they grow quite violent. The man in 19 is especially affected. His mental affliction was caused by an imagined keen sense of hearing. That's rather odd. You mean that he heard things that other people didn't hear? Yes. Did you ever stop to think how many little noises are part of our daily lives? No, sir. I don't believe I ever have. Well, don't. Or someday you're apt to occupy the room next to number 19. Get on your nerves after a while. It becomes a habit to listen to these little noises and make up little stories and songs in their rhythm. Stories and songs? Surely. I see you're smiling. You think I'm joking. Well, you've ridden on a railroad train, haven't you? Why, of course. Didn't you ever listen to the wheels? Clickety-clack, 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 over and over again. And finally, they begin to talk. And they say, going away, going away, going away. Well, yes, I guess they do. The same thing happens with all the other little noises. They begin to talk to you. Ordinary people don't hear them. But to the sensitive ones, these noises talk the live long day and night. I'm glad that I'm normal. Uh, but what is normal? It's so hard to tell. There's no dividing line to cling to. You and I have our idiosyncrasies. Who can say whether they should be classed as sane or insane? In the case of these little noises, my nerves are set on edge by the sound of someone drumming with their fingers on the arm of a chair. And I could cheerfully murder the person who sits behind me at a concert and keeps time to the music with his foot on the back of my seat. Those noises don't bother me very much. But I have spent a good many sleepless nights listening to the sound of water falling in the basin from a leaky tap. And I've been driven into a frenzy by the sound of an ancient clock that t- ticked off beat. Now, if these very apparent, very loud sounds bother you and me, can you imagine what they would do to a super-sensitive man? They would probably drive him to murder. You're right. And the man in number 19 is a murderer. You're joking, Dr. Wilfred. Indeed, I'm not. The man in number 19 is one of the chief characters in a very famous murder case that delighted the newspaper several years ago. It was a particularly brutal affair. And as far as the police could learn, there was no motive. The victim was an old man, harmless enough, if you overlook the childish habits that go with old age. He and our patient in 19 lived alone in an old house not far from here. The old man had a little money. Then the motive must have been robbery. No. No, the motive wasn't robbery. Our patient made no move to run away or to hide the money. Although he did hide the corpse. And the police found it? No. No, the police didn't even suspect there was one. Until our patient confessed. Why did he do that? To ease his conscience? Conscience? I should say not. (laughs) He was overjoyed because the old man was dead. And why did he tell? He was betrayed. Betrayed? Yes. By one of our little noises. Our little noises that sometimes talk. What kind of noise? The sound of a beating heart. His own heart? No. The heart of a dead man. The man he had killed and buried under the floor. That's madness. Hallucination. Perhaps. Some would call it that. Sometimes I wonder myself what happened in the world he lived in. It was a night much like this when it happened. A heavenly, impressive night. Wet with rain and the echoes of crashing thunder. The old man sat before the fireplace, dozing. The young man tried to read. But an insistent voice beat an undeniable rhythm in the world of sound and the mind's fury. Driving me mad. 
Why won't he die? Why won't he die? Die, 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 die. If I but dared, if I but dared. It's his eye, it's his eye. Pale blue eyes, cold as steel. Cold as ice, cold as death. is the best time of all. Bones are weary, and sleep is the anodyne that makes them seem young again. I don't see how you can sleep at night. You nap the whole day long. Uh, sometimes I'm not really napping. Just close my eyes and think. Think? Think about what? Oh, about lots of things. About old things, old times, and old loves. One of the penalties of living so long is that one becomes a desert island surrounded by youth and loneliness. One could remedy that by dying. Dying? Yes. Strange that you should say that. I've had a premonition for several days that I was going to die. You mean you're not feeling well? I never felt better. But it seems as if death was standing at my shoulder, and if I turned suddenly, I should meet him face to face. At night, I have strange dreams. Dreams? Yes. I dreamed I heard steps coming up the stairs, slowly, cautiously. Oh, it was so vivid that I even heard that third stair creak. It has for years, you know. Yes, I know. What else did you dream? I thought that someone turned the knob of the door. And then, inch by inch, the door was pushed open. Fear gripped my heart and bound my limbs. I could neither move nor cry out. I died a thousand deaths in those minutes. You must have eaten something that disagreed with you. Did you wake up then? No. The minutes passed and there was no further movement from my midnight visitor. I knew I must have been dreaming. And yet it all seemed so real. Of course you were dreaming. The thief would have to pass me to go up those stairs. 
And I certainly would have heard him. Yes, you would have heard him. It was only a dream, of course. The strange thing about it is that I've dreamed that same dream twice. Twice? Yes, last night and the night before last. That is strange. Very strange. Perhaps tonight, if you took a sleeping powder. No, no. I must not sleep too soundly. If I should dream that dream again, I must be able to awake. If I don't wake, I shall die. Nonsense. You're taking the whole thing too seriously. Uh, perhaps. Uh, um, well, I'm off to bed. And good night. Good night. Voice 
of the creek in the stack. Because a murderer stepped on me, voice of the years in the wall. The young man and death are at the old man's door. Why did you scream, voice of the knob on the door? Because I was touched by a murderer's hand, voice on the rain on the roof. The young man opens the door slowly, so slowly. Why did you groan, voice of the hinge on the door? To warn the old man that a murderer enters, voice of a damp in the floor. The young man moves slowly towards the bed. His hands are outstretched. The old man still sleeps. Our voices cannot wake him. Death will wake him. Watch him to eternal sleep. Wake him to wake no more. Wake him to wake. <laughs> Over, voice of the raindrops on the cold. Over, voice of the years in the walls. Over, voice of the shutter in the wind. The old man is dead. The old man is dead. 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 What can I do for you, gentlemen? We're sorry to disturb you. We're from the police. The neighbors asked us to investigate. Police? Well, what is it they want investigated? They reported to us shortly after midnight. They were awakened by a scream. A scream? What kind of a scream? They said it sounded as if someone were being murdered. Murdered? Are you joking? I'm only telling you what they said. They believe that the scream came from this house. Why, that's impossible. There's no one here except myself. And I'm sure that I didn't scream. Oh, wait a minute, though. I did have a bad dream. Perhaps I cried out before I wakened. Perhaps. You say that you live here all alone? Yes. The neighbors told us that the house was occupied by two people. One of them an old man. Oh. I guess they must have met my uncle. He used to live here with me. Where is he now? His health wasn't very good. I sent him away to the country for the summer. How long ago was that? About two days ago. Uh, yes, last Wednesday it was, I believe. I see. Do you mind if we look around? Well, it's not that we suspect you of any wrongdoing, but it's customary to make an inspection. Certainly come right in. Thanks. Since my nosy neighbors believe me guilty of some foul crime, I shall be glad to have you establish my innocence. Right this way, please. Right. I mind the step there. The house isn't very large, so it won't take much of your time. Now, uh... This is the living room. I see. Those steps lead up to the upper part of the house, and that door over there opens on a passage that goes to the kitchen and the basement. Hmm. Right. Suppose uh, that we sit here by the fire and have a glass of wine while your men look the place over. That sounds like an excellent idea. Russell, you take this floor. Adams can take the one above. Right. Yes, sir. Now, uh, will you have one of these cigars, officer? I can recommend them very highly. Hmm. Yeah, thank you. My uncle was very fond of them, but he had to give up smoking. Why was that? He had some trouble breathing. Oh, don't strike that match there, please. Why not? I wasn't going to mar the furniture. Uh, it isn't that. But my uncle used to always scratch matches in that identical place. It makes a rasping noise that sets my nerves on edge. Sometimes I thought I'd go crazy hearing that sound. Why didn't you tell him not to do it? I don't know. I don't know why, but little noises have always bothered me. That clock there, for instance. 
I'm going to let it run down. Then it will never annoy me again. And I shall be free of one more torment. It seems a shame to let such a fine timepiece stand idle. It's very old, isn't it? Yes, it's a family heirloom. My uncle was very fond of it. That's his picture up there on the wall. Hmm? Oh. Fine-looking old gentleman. I suppose so. It flatters him a bit. The artist didn't paint his subject truly. Is that so? Yes. Your wine off, sir. Oh, thank you. Your health. And yours. Listen. Do you hear anything? I hear Adams moving about upstairs. No. Something in this room. Oh, you must have sharper ears than I have. Probably only my imagination. As I was saying, the artist who painted that portrait was very kind to my uncle. He didn't catch the cold blue of his eyes. And one of them had a peculiar cast in it and was covered with a film. Indeed? Yes. My blood ran cold every time he looked at me. I hated that eye. Well, I suppose such an affliction would bother one after a time. You say your uncle will be away all summer. Yes. And then again, he may be where I sent him for a long, long time. We can have some more wine. It'll warm you up a bit. It's rather chilly. Chilly? <laughs> Why, I'm warm as toast. Are you? Perhaps I've uh, caught a bit of a cold. Have some anyway. Yes, uh, yes, thank you. Everything all right downstairs, sir? Right. Nothing suspicious? No bodies lying around? No blood stains on the kitchen floor? <laughs> what a disappointment that'll be to my dear neighbors. Uh, let's see, you're Russell, aren't you? Yes, sir. Oh. Well, uh, Russell, have a glass of wine with us. Detecting crimes must be rather dry work. Oh, thank you very much. Not at all. Here, pour it yourself. I believe the other bloodhound is finished, too, and is coming down the stairs. Yes, and from the sound of his footsteps, I'm afraid his report is going to be just as disappointing. Well, Adams? Nothing disturbed upstairs, sir. I must apologize to all you gentlemen for having wasted your time. I don't call it a waste of time when we've discovered what excellent wine you keep in your decanter. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you feel that way about it. And you've all been so agreeable that I'm going to make you a promise. If I ever do commit a murder, I shall be arrested by no other policeman. Well, well, well. <laughs> well we'll be very happy to oblige. <laughs> if you'll just send us notice in time, eh? <laughs> Come, Adams, there's something left in that decanter. Help yourself. Oh, thank you, sir. It's all right. You won't know this place, gentlemen, if you ever come again. I'm going to completely rebuild it. But why? The house is old. It's full of little noises. You probably noticed how that third stair creaks when you step on it. Yes, but that could be fixed easily. Perhaps, but the noise might return. No, the entire stairway must be rebuilt. The whole house must be rebuilt to get rid of the little noises. Like the one you hear now. What one? I don't hear anything. You don't hear that steady beating sound? Like a watch, wrapped in cotton. That dull, rhythmic, sickening sound? No. No, I hear nothing at all. I can hear it. That's why the house must be torn down and built again. It must have all new hardware. The knob on that door upstairs makes a grating sound. And the hinge rasps when the door is slowly opened. Seems like a lot of needless expense when they could be silenced with a little oil. Yes, but they would be the same hinge and lock. And sooner or late, they would rasp and grate again. But more important than all those noises is the one that's in this room. That beating sound that's growing louder and louder as we sit here. Can't you hear it? Can't you feel it? If it isn't stopped, I'll go mad! Really, sir, I think you've had too much wine. Or perhaps you're ill. I think you should go to bed. Yes, uh, come. Do... I'll help you up the stairs and you can lie down. No. The stairs will creak. And that lock will grate. That hinge will rasp. And that noise, that deadly beating noise will follow me to beat itself into my dream. But my dear sir, there is no noise such as you describe. You can't hear it? No. Can you, Adam? No, sir. How about you, Russell? I can't hear a thing, sir. There. Now, you see? You're laughing at me. You're torturing me. You're making me believe that you don't hear it so that I'll confess. Confess? Confess what? What that sound is. 
And from where it comes. My dear young man, you're working yourself into a frenzy. I think we better leave you to yourself. No, no, don't leave me here alone. Don't leave me alone with that. What are you talking about? You can hear it as well as I can. You've all heard it from the minute you entered this house. You're mocking me. You've been laughing at my terror. All the time you've been sitting here, you've heard it and jolted. Waiting for me to break down. What kind of men are you to sit there and torture a man like this? My dear sir, we have... You know that I was the only one you locked on that door. You looked for blood in my hands when I opened it. I saw you. And I saw how disappointed you were when you saw that they were spotless. Well, see here, we I didn't... threw you off the scent for a moment as we stood at the door talking. You thought for a moment that you were wrong. And then, then from within the house, you heard the sound that convinced you that you were right. What sound are you talking about? The same sound that we hear now. The same sound that's growing louder every minute. I saw the smile of triumph that crossed your face when your ear first detected it. I saw the smirk that rested on the faces of your men. And then you asked if you might come in. Not because you suspected me. Oh, no. But because it was customary in such cases. You wanted to see just how cool you could be. You wanted to see how much I would suffer. You stayed here with me and sent your men to search the house. To pretend to search the house. Because you knew where it was. They played their parts well. They made all the little noises. The little noises set my shattered nerves on edge. The creak of the stairs, the grate of the lock, the wrath of the hinge. But you, you stayed here with me to listen to that loudest noise of all. The torture me. Torture? What are you getting at? That beating. That accursed beating. It goes louder, louder, louder. If you were stone deaf, you could hear it. For it shrieked murder, murder, murder. Oh, you're mad. Of course I'm mad. Get me away from here. Take me anywhere you like. Do anything you please with me. Hang me. Cut off my head. Kill me. If you have any mercy at all, stop that sound of that heart. We don't know what you're talking about. I hear villains dissemble no more. I admit the deed. I killed the old man. Tear up those planks under that chair. There you'll find his body. Take it away. Take it away. And stop the beating of that hideous heart. <laughs> <laughs> Wilson is the story of our patient in number 19. A murderer betrayed by the beating of his own heart, which he alone could hear. You see, he thought it was the beating of the heart of the dead man whom he'd buried under the floor. Did they find the body of the old man? Yes, he showed them exactly where it was hidden. Helped them take up the planks, frantic, laughing, crying, babbling incoherently. At the trial, he seemed eager to confess his guilt, seeming to believe that confession would still the horrible sound that still beat in his ears. They judged him insane, which he was, and committed him to our asylum, though I believe that death would have been more merciful. He goes on living in perpetual torment, plagued by the little noises, and all the while in his rotting brain beats the hideous rhythm of that long, stilled heart. The Columbia Workshop has presented The Telltale Heart, Edgar Allan Poe's famous story, which was dramatized for radio by Charles Taswell. A special musical score was composed and conducted by Bernard Herman. Irving Reese directed. The Telltale Heart effect, which you heard, was an actual hu- human heartbeat amplified more than 10 billion times. The workshop is always interested in receiving your suggestions, comments, and criticisms of its work. If you have a favorite story which you would like to have broadcast and which you think would lend itself to unusual radio treatment, write a note to the director of the Columbia Workshop, Columbia Network, New York City. Tune in next week for another workshop presentation. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. and produced by Alonzo Dean Cole.
Now let us join old Nancy, witch of Salem, and Satan, her wise black cat. <laughs> I'm an 11 year old I be today. Yes, sir. I'm an 11 year old. We'll say them. Here, all these folks be gathered to hear one of our pretty little bedtime stories. And tonight, we're gonna tell them one that's become famous all over the world. You're right, Satan. A woman named Mary Shelley once lit this yarn of ours in a book. But she, nor no one else, never knows the true facts of the case. But me. <laughs> Thou shalt them light. Setting in the spooky shadows is the way to hear our perky tales. Now, go up to the fire and gaze into them, girls. Gaze into them deep, and soon you'll be with us in Switzerland. Soon you'll hear our young of Frankenstein. <laughs> Frankenstein. <laughs> I'm coming, I'm coming. Don't break the door down. Who is it? I, Professor Waldman. Oh, just a minute. Oh, good evening, Madame Maurice. Good evening. Hm. Raining cats and dogs. Step inside so I can close this door. Yes, Madame Maurice. Oh, you're letting that wet umbrella drip all over my clean floor. Oh, I'm oh sorry. you men of science. But I suppose I should be used to such carelessness after keeping house for Victor Frankenstein. Oh, he's a very young scientist, Madame Maurice. Just wait until he reaches my age. Mm, he makes shut. <laughs> uh, where is our Victor? In his laboratory? Is he ever anywhere else? doesn't even come out for his meals anymore. What is he doing in there, Professor, that he's so mysterious about? I don't know any more than you do. Our Victor is a genius, and genius shares its secrets with no one. Professor Waldman, I'm worried about that boy. In the last six months, he's changed terribly. Changed? Yes. He thinks of nothing but this work of his. You know how much he loves his fiancée, Elizabeth. Yet three times he's postponed their marriage because it wasn't finished. And I'm afraid of whatever he's doing. I feel it is unholy. Madame Maurice. Unholy, I tell you. He forbids me to enter that laboratory of his. But he can't close up my ears. At night, I hear frightful sounds from there. The cries of animals in pain. And then from him who has always been so kind. He changed shouts of pride. And I've seen the same brutish-looking men bring in this house. Hideous things from the slaughterhouses and the... The morgue. Last week, the public executioner was here. He brought the body of that robber who was beheaded in the square. There is no need for you to worry. However disgusting the tools he employs, you may be sure the object of Victor's work is to benefit mankind. Mm -hmm. I hope you're right, but he's coming from the laboratory. Here, mark the door behind him. And the carry takes one would think that room was filled with gold. Good evening, Victor. Oh, Professor Walton. I'm so glad you received my message. You came at once. Oh, uh, Madam Morris. Get your hat and cloak. I must send you to your sister's. In this awful storm? Oh, is, is that a storm? Is there a storm? Well, then you must call a cab. I'm sorry, but Professor Waldman and I must have the house alone. This is the night for which I've worked so long. The night on which I'll finish the crowning achievement of the ages. Victor, you are trembling with excitement. What have you done? Tomorrow all Switzerland shall know. My name shall ring throughout the world. And you shall know first, dear Madam Morris. But tonight you must go. You must go now. You mean your work is ended? Yes. There will be no more dead bodies coming through that door. No more horrors from the no, no, house. No, no, that's over. That's over now. Now go. Go, go, I'm go, going, go. I'm going. Even though I catch my death of cold in this awful storm, it'll be worth it. Go, go, go. Please go. Victor, what have you discovered? Victor, she's out of hearing. She wouldn't understand. She's gone. What is it? Come and see. Come into the laboratory. Professor Waldman, from the cute presence of death, I have wrested the secret of life. Life? Yes. I, Victor Frankenstein, have created man! Look at him 
there. Bit by bit, I fashioned it. His organs, his limbs, his brain, his external flesh. A beautiful sleeping yeah, child. But sleeping only until I give him life. And now the time has come. That's why I sent for you, old teacher. You pointed out the path. I know nothing of yes, this. Yes, you sent me to the ancients for forgotten knowledge. Through them I learned of magic and the hidden truths of nature. But I have gone beyond the ancients. In a moment I shall make a man. I shall be a star. You bless me. Why? The race of whom this giant will be Father Frankenstein will be God's name. Stop! No, for I am greater than your lord. You're mad! <laughs> but this puny human tribe which he created, they must have delicate food, long hours of rest. They're weak, decadent, scourged with sickness, a prey to heat and cold. Compared to this child of Frankenstein's great genius, men are flies living out a summer day. Look at him there. He's too tall. A mountain of strength. Immune to weather, illness, and fatigue. With a brain that will grasp in a single hour all that man must take a year to learn. This machine will give him life. I pull the lever. What? No, don't! <laughs> in a moment he will breathe. And I shall have improved on nature. I shall have improved on God. The giant's flesh goes warm. There's pulsation in his veins. Soon he'll rise and walk. Great God! No, great Frankenstein! The, the beautiful contours of his body are changing. Yeah. What? His flesh is shriveling like a mummy. He's becoming ugly. Misshapen! You are creating a horror machine! I'll turn it off! Too late, he breathes! Voice! He lives! May God forgive you, Frankenstein! You've made a monster! I can't go back into that house. I can't look at him again. You must. You should not have fled from him an hour ago. You are responsible for him. You are his creator. <laughs> You're right. I am the great God Frankenstein. But how could he have changed so as I gave him life? I planned a thing of beauty. It produced a loathsome horror. Man cannot usurp the prerogatives of God. Let us go in. All right. Oh, why should I scare him? His frightfulness may be only that of an exterior that I, in some way, marred. I gave him a brain capable of the most lofty thoughts, the noblest actions. Why, it's going to be all right. In the body of a fiend may be the nature of an angel. I... I planned this nature so. Victor! The laboratory door is open. He has burst the lock. The giant strength. He's gone! Mr. Wallman, what is that lying in the shadows? It's Madame Maurice. She didn't go to assist it. She saw him. She faded a flight. Victor, she is dead. No, no! Her throat has been crushed by giant hands. The monster killed her. <laughs> no. I... I, the great God, right in Well, my boy, how does it feel to be on your feet again? Not bad after a year in bed, I'll wager. A year has passed since that awful night. Ah, oh, here now. I forbid you to speak of that just yet. Oh, I'm quite strong now. And we must talk, Professor. This is the first opportunity I've had to be with you alone. Careful, Victor. Elizabeth is in the next room, and your mother. They don't know. No one knows but you and me. They think your ravings of the monster are simply figments of delirium. And you have been quite mad, you know. Yes. Mercifully mad. Till a week ago, the darkness lifted from my brain to... Let me remember... And to fear. What other crimes is the thing I made committed since you brought me here? Where is he? You must tell me. You have nothing to fear, Victor. The monster is dead. Dead? Yes. You're not lying to me. You're not lying just to ease my mind. No. During the week after his disappearance, he was seen in several villages. And the superstitious farmers took him for a demon from another world. At last he was fired upon and wounded. A trail of his blood was traced to the edge of a mountain chasm a thousand feet in depth. We shall never hear of him again. He's really dead. Oh, <laughs> oh! I feel as though the weight of time itself were lifted from my shoulders. I'm free again. My nightmare is over. There's nothing more to fear. Mr. Darling. Oh, Elizabeth. Come in, my dear. I hope you'll forgive my intrusion. I heard Victor's voice, and it sounded so different, so happy. I simply had to come in and see you. Oh, I am happy, dear. 
I shall be happy forevermore. You will be even happier if left with Elizabeth alone. Oh, I know, young lover. Oh, really, Professor? <laughs> I'll see you later. Elizabeth, dear sweetheart. Oh, how good it is to see you yourself again. You've been so ill, so close to death. But now I have returned to life and to you forever. You mean until you go away again? Back to your studies, your experiments? No, my studies are over. My experiments are ended. I shall never enter a laboratory again. There will be no more postponements of our wedding. Then I shall have you all my home. For always. Always. Oh, my dear. You don't know how happy that will make you. I've been so jealous of the science which kept you from me. It seemed to keep you from even the start. I have come back to you. Oh, God. Elizabeth? Oh, your mother is calling me. I must tell her. Perhaps we can be married right away. Tomorrow, if possible. How I love you. How I love you. Elizabeth! Uh, coming, Mother Frankenstein. Oh, I'm so happy. And I. Uh, happy. Happy. Happy! There's nothing now to fear. You're There's wrong. nothing. You! Alive! Yes, I. The monster you created. And Satan, these folks has got to wait till next time to hear the finish of this pretty yarn. Then we'll tell them some true facts about this Frankenstein and his monster that'll make their hair curl. <laughs> Written and produced by Alonzo Dean Cole. And now let us join old Nancy and her black cat, Satan. <laughs> Hannah and two year old I be today. Yes, sir. Hannah and two year old. Well, Satan, if these folks will just douse out them lights and make it nice and dark, we'll finish telling them that pretty story we begun last time they were here. We already told them how that scientist fella discovered the secret of life and made a monstrous, ugly giant whose first act was to strangle our old lady. Then he disappeared, 
and the fellow who made him thought he'd been killed. I'm killed. <laughs> a year later, he hear the giant's awful voice of calling him. Now draw up to the fire and gaze into the embers. Gaze into them deep and hear the rest of our yarn about Frankenstein. <laughs> Frankenstein! <laughs> I'll follow to this desolate place as you bade me. What do you want of me? To show you my home, Frankenstein. This barren cave up on the mountainside, exposed to the winds and howling beach. Here I, the monster you created, live, whilst you reside in comfort. I want to show you my solitude, whilst you are planning marriage. I thought you dead. You made me too strong. The fall you had had killed me could not destroy my body. I simply disappeared from man because man has shut me out. Even you cannot bear to look at my repulsive being. Even you, my maker. You, my god. God. The great god, Frankenstein. <laughs> yes, when you made me, so you called yourself. How did you learn that I was your creator? Upon that night when I first knew life, you fled from the horror you'd given breath from me. I was naked, it was cold. I wrapped a cloak of yours about me. There were papers in his pockets. When I learned to read, I found those papers were your notes of my creation. A pretty tale they told of how you made me from the refuse of the slaughterhouse and mog. I'm partly man and partly beast. You owe me recompense for the awful life with which I'm dead. That is why I summoned you tonight, that you may pay your debt. What do you wish? A companion. Companion? Yes, Frankenstein. Oh, I hate you, yet I love you, for you're all I have. Take pity on the thing you made, for I am lonely with a hunger that no man can ever know. You want me for your companion? No, you no more than other men can bear to look upon my frightfulness. Give me a creature as loathsome as myself, one who will not turn for me to hide his eyes in horror. You mean, create another monster? Yes, for everything upon this earth excepting me, there is a mate of my breed. I am Adam Frankenstein. Make me an Eve. A female? Yes. No. Yes, you planned marriage. Why not I? No, no, no. Why, you might loose upon the world a race of monsters. A race that would destroy mankind. I swear we'll do no harm, Frankenstein. I bet. Never. I presume no more upon the powers of heaven. I experiment no longer with the mysteries of God. You will not create for me a mate? No, a thousand times. Yet you yourself will take one? Beware, you made me strong. I can crush you like a cat. I'm not afraid of you. Only of life secrets I have already probed too deep. I will not do the thing you ask. Then die! Right! No! I swear you now, at the hour of your greatest happiness, I will strike. Strike to your heart, Frankenstein. Wait and fear, for I'll be with you on your wedding night. On your wedding night! How can you be so sad tonight when all our dreams have just come true? Oh, I'm not sad, dear. Well, how could I be when at last you are my wife? Victor, you're keeping something from oh, me. Oh, no, no. You are. Professor Waldron has been acting strangely, too. And the grounds outside are filled with strange men who look as though they were policemen standing guard. You have nothing to fear, my darling. No enemy who would harm you on our wedding night? Oh, of course not, darling. Why... <laughs> What could I be afraid of on our wedding night? Victor, Victor, Frank. Oh, yes, yes. I'll let you in, Professor Walman. Victor, Victor, come with me. Uh, well, excuse me, Elizabeth. I must speak to your husband alone. What is all this mystery? It's what? nothing, dear. Now, you stay here. I I'll explain everything when I return. Hurry, Victor. Yes, yes. Excuse me, dear. But, Victor, stop. Close the door tightly. See the must monster. Not you see the monster? Police have him surrounded. Let's go in. Come on. Oh, wait. He's cunning. I can't leave Elizabeth in that room alone. It is you he threatened to strike, not her. And we have him in a net. He cannot get away. And leave me to him. At last, let me destroy the awful thing my hands have made. <laughs> Elizabeth, quick! Back to that room! Oh, God! God, keep her safe! The door is locked! You little burst it open! Oh, oh, no. Elizabeth! She's lying crumpled on the floor! That open window! The monster! Straight to your heart, Frankenstein! Straight to your heart! <laughs> Elizabeth... <laughs> He's dead. 
Oh, Frankenstein, you sucked me down. You fiend of hell. Stand up from those rocks where I can see you. Oh, you may aim at my breast that pistol which you carry very well. I have you now. Not yet. Uh, you forget how fast I move. Let me go. Oh, did you think to destroy me with weapons such as this? Oh. I, whom you made superior to the beauty race of men, oh. I throw your pistol into yonder cavern. Ah, and I release you unhurt and unharmed. <laughs> Somewhere, yes. sometime with another weapon, I shall bring you death. Tonight you will kill the woman I love best in all the world. On her broken body, I have sworn to live for your destruction. I told you I'd strike you to the heart. You thought I made your heart a flesh. Your body, there was a better way. I turned your happiness to misery. Oh, God, great Lord of all, destroy this monster. You are my God. You, my Lord of all. Listen, my father. As you denied me the comradeship of one frightful as myself, now you are denied a mate. As you condemn me to a life of solitude and sorrow, now you are condemned. You sworn to live for my destruction, you have said. Your hate will make you follow me across the world. Through the sun scorched desert and the icy plain, you know heat and cold and thirst and hunger, to which I, your creature, am immune. How well you made me, great God Frankenstein. You'll follow me across the world. I always just ahead. You always just behind. Until your body, racked by age and sorrow, we will reach the end. Now I go, and you will follow. I will follow to your death, to the death of both. For you and I, henceforth, are one. Oh, cast away. Three points to it. Uh, cast away here in the Arctic Circle. Aye, sir. Take this glass. It's a man on a floating block of ice. Probably mm. broke away from the mainland, sir. Uh, dead. A white man. A thousand miles from humankind. Some explorer, probably, like ourselves. Yes, who's lost his party. He may be a companion of that strange giant we saw in the distance a week ago. If we can get him, sir. We'll try. Man the longboat. All hands up. Man the longboat. Cast away. Cast away. It's a strange story you tell, Mr. Frankenstein. You've pursued this man for 40 years. Not a man. A monstrous fiend. Over mountain and desert, ocean and plain. In the bells of Africa, here to the Arctic Circle, I have followed. I always just behind. He always just ahead. For 40 years, I have known no home, no friend. Only solitude, misery, and an empty dream of vengeance. Now I'm dying. I can pursue no longer. There, there, man. Five days on that ice floor didn't do you any good. But our ship's doctor will soon have you on your feet and as good as new. And what you need now is lots of rest. So I'll leave you until morning. Good night, Mr. Frankenstein. Good night, Captain. Rest. Lots of rest. Yes, my father. You. I crept aboard the ship when darkness fell. I expected you. For we have reached the end. Yes, a god as miserable as is Adam. An Adam is sorrowful as is God. Sorrowful because your vengeance is over. No, Frankenstein. At the end, there is no longer heart for vengeance. All things cease. All things begin again. You're dying. The son cannot survive the parent. Let me lift you in my arms. Carry me to the deck. Gently, tenderly, I bear you. For you're all I've had to love. All I've had to hate, Frankenstein. Forgive me at the end. I forgive. And forgiveness beg. Beneath these icy waters, let there be one grave for both. You and I, create or uncreated. My presumption and your misery. We're at the rail. The waters wait below. Let us find peace together. Now. The end. The end. They 
<laughs> and then was the true facts about the stem of Frankenstein. Come see us next week, and Satan and me will have another yarn to spin you. <laughs> Oblers lights out everybody. It is later than you think. This is Arch Obler bringing you another in our series of stories of the unusual. And once again, we caution you. These lights out stories are definitely not for the timid soul. So we tell you calmly and very sincerely, if you frighten easily, turn off your radio now. Uh, it is a nice day. <laughs> Yes, I agree with you, Mr. Sparrow. It's as nice a day as I, too, have ever seen. <laughs> I remember a day like this when I was about 12. Mother took me into London to see the King's Palace. Yes, that was Edward. And I had on a green suit and I... <laughs> but that wouldn't interest you now, would it, Mr. Sparrow? Funny. I never went back. Less than a hundred miles away, and I... Morning, never... Mr. Eh? Jeffrey. Uh, oh, oh, good morning, Mr. Elkins. Well, Mr. Jeffrey. Oh, kind of late in the season to be planting now, ain't it? Oh, I, I wouldn't exactly say that, Mr. Elkington. Not for what I'm planting. Now, what would that be, might I be asking? A tree, my friend. Ah. Oh. A nice, strong catapa tree. My son sent it to me all the way from Exeter. You don't say catalpa tree. Well, now. I say, could I be giving you a hand with that shovel, Mr. Jeffrey? No, 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 thank you kindly. I like to dig in the soil, and the exercise does me good. Thank you kindly. Oh, well, then I'll be off on my business, Mr. Jeffrey. Good, good morning to good you. Good morning, Mr. Erkington. Good morning. <laughs> but it is a good morning. Yeah. <sighs> The rain certainly softened you up, didn't they, Mr. Crown? Nice and soft. Nice and soft. <coughs> Going to dig you a nice deep hole, Mr. Catalpa. Ah. Nice deep hole. So that your roots will have a good firm start in life. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Well... That's not the way to act, Mr. Crown, throwing big boulders in the way of my shovel. Mm. <coughs> Mighty big stone, too, from the sound of it. <coughs> Dig you up, Mr. Boulder. If 
It takes me a week. Yes, indeed. Phew. Big stone, all right. Keep after it, that's all. Buried all these years in the corner of my garden, and I never knew about you, now, did I? There. There, that's showing results. Hmm. Yeah. Like an oblong. That's queer. Big flat oblong stone in my garden. Dig you up. That's what I'll do. Dig you up. Yes, indeed. Oh, Mrs. Gracie. Mrs. Gracie. What is it? Mrs. Gracie, come out here. You've got to come out. All right, all right. Now, what in creation is it, Mr. Jeffrey? Mrs. Gracie, look, look. Land sakes alive. What kind of a hole for a tree is that? <laughs> Don't see why in the world... You... Look, I tell you. Is... Is it a coffin? Coffin? That size and out of stone? Then what would a coffin be doing in my garden? I never heard of anyone being buried here. It's much too big. Mrs. But... Gracie, I got it. What? Roman. The Romans left it here. Romans? Don't you understand? The Romans. The Romans invaded and lived in Britain over 1,500 years ago. They left it here. Nobody like that lived around here. And don't you tell me anything different, Mr. Jeff. But I am telling you, a Roman sarcophagus. Now, Mr. Jeff. Oh, never mind. Mr. Robinson, run over and get Mr. Robinson here. Tell him to bring a couple of men. We've got to dig this thing up. We've got to dig it up? Mr. Jeffrey, it's the sun that struck your head. Now, don't stand there lecturing me. Mr. Robinson, hurry, get him. No, no, I won't. What? Not to dig it up, I won't. To bury it deeper, yes, but not to dig it up. This is... Coffin or one of them heathen, whatever you call it, it makes no difference. If it's been buried here all these years, then I say cover it over and let it be. There's some things best left deep under the ground. All right, all right, men. Are you ready with the ropes? Uh, ready, Mr. Robinson. Yes, right you are. How about you, Joe? All ready, Mr. Robinson. Good. Now, when I give the signal, one, two, three, you on that side of the rope pull, while you on the other side work on the block and tackle. One... Two and up on three. Have you got it? Yeah, we have it. Oh, Mr. Robinson, you will be careful. I, I mean not to damage. Now, I mean, look here, please. friend Jeffrey. I've been in the building and excavating trade and constable of this township for 20 years. Yes, I know. And all that time, I've given only one thing, and that's satisfaction. Yes, sir. Now, as for this little stone container... Little uh, Judas Priest, man, is ten foot by three, and heaven knows how heavy. Well, true as that may be to my way of thinking, it's still a small job. If you're worried about my damaging it, you're free to call in one oh, of my no. competitors. No, 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 Mr. Robinson. I want you to handle the matter. Oh, yes, yes. Indeed. All right, then stay clear and I'll give the order. Hey, now, wait, wait. If you please, Mr. Robinson, wait. Eh? Yeah. That housekeeper of mine, Mrs. Gracie, hmm? she wouldn't want to miss the doings, and I don't know where she's gone off to. If, if now, you don't Mr. Wait... Jeffrey, I'm a busy man, so if you'll just stand aside. Uh, no, please. All right, men. Already. Now, don't pull until I get the signal. Now, we one, two... Three, up with in, up, easy there, Joe. Bring those ropes over the left. Up with in, up with in. Steady there, not too fast, you fool. Sam, the ship is ready to put on red. Easy now, Joe. No, 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 don't, don't, don't swing it too high. Not too high. Are you deaf? Not too high, or is it... No, no, put it back in the ground. Put it back in the ground, I tell you. Mrs. Gracie, what in the way? Get out of the way. Put it back in the ground. In the ground, it was, and in the ground it belongs. Mr. Jeffrey, I'm Get out of the way. Jeffrey, get that woman out of the way. In the ground. Mrs. Gracie, are you crazy? Get your woman and get away. My men can't hold this. The tackle is slipping. Look out. Look out. Get on those rails, fools. Oh, yeah. Get on those ropes. Lift, lift. Hurry now. Hurry. Get over here. Mother in heaven. It fell right on top of her. Coffin fell right on top of her. Oh, Mrs. Grace. Ah, it's a cruel thing, Mr. Jeffrey. Cruel indeed. Yes. Cruel and yet not cruel. For the ways of the divine providence are beyond our poor mortal understanding. 
Yes, I shall say that very thing over her grave when we bury the poor woman. As you wish, Reverend. Ah, what a day this has been. More excitement in just a few hours in this village than we've had in a dozen years. I wonder now whether... Oh, almost nine. Well, I'd better be getting back to the church. Have to get everything ready for the service tomorrow. Uh, did you speak to Mr. Carboy about the coffin? Yes. That's good. We'll pay the good lady proper respect, we will. Well, I'll be on my way. Good night, Reverend. Oh, uh, uh, one thing more, Mr. Jeffrey. Yes? Uh, I didn't want to speak of it uh, in all the excitement before, but I feel I really should. Yes, Reverend? I know you were in quite an emotional state of mind, but do you feel it was quite the proper and respectable thing to do? I mean, having that Roman antique brought right here into the house, when it, uh, inanimate thing though it be, was the direct cause of poor Mrs. Grace's death. I wanted the sarcophagus in here, Reverend. Wanted it? But what possible use could that great stone sepulchre be to you? Oh, I realize it has certain intrinsic value. After the funeral, we'll get in touch with the proper museum authorities in London and have them take care of it. But don't you see, it wasn't quite respectful of the dead, bringing the very thing in here that had caused the tragedy. Not respectful at all, Mr. Jeffrey. It was what I wanted. Good night, Reverend. Uh, but, Mr. Jeffrey, I... Uh, oh. Uh, good night. Uh, good night. Disrespectful. <laughs> no fault of Mr. Coffin that she ran under it. Call in the proper authorities. I'm proper authority in Roman things myself, I am. read the whole Gibbon's decline and fall of the Roman Empire, didn't I? I certainly did. Here you are, Mr. Coffin. Just when I made them put you. And I did make them, didn't I? Ran right under you, she did. Superstitious old fool. No fault of yours, Mr. Coffin. Yes, you're a big one. Let me see. Uh, about ten feet long on this side and... and four this way. Uh, it's a discovery that ought to make history that it ought. Wait for experts, should I? What would the experts do? Cart you off to one of those museums and there I'd be. Uh, the man that found you with nothing but a hole in my garden and in your grave in the cemetery to show what had happened. No. Oh, I'd be my own expert, Mr. Corbett. I'd open you up myself right now. And I'll take the blame or credit and no mistake about it. Yeah, they had that iron bar. Mm. Mr. Robinson will wonder where his crowbar went. No wonder, Mr. Corbett. But we'll give it back to him in the morning. Yes, indeed. Yes. Yes. I had opened enough to look inside now, haven't I? Experts. I'll show them. I can't see. Matches. There now. If you don't mind now, Mr. Coffin... I'll bend over to see what you've got inside. <sighs> Copy. Got the call. Are you there? Are you there? Uh, uh, Reverend, uh, this is uh, Mr. Jeffrey. Yes, 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 Jeffrey. No, 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 no. Uh, listen to me. That room is copious. I just opened it. Inside of it, there's something, a woman, and yet, yet it isn't. I, I mean, all oh, Reverend, come over quickly. You see, whatever it is, I don't think it's dead. But my dear Mr. Jeffrey, you must listen to me. I'm a person of understanding, of judgment. I say leave it alone. Don't go near the thing until they get here. Now, I phoned Dr. Thompson at the British uh, Museum. He's an expert, expert, a qualified expert. Expert. There you go, experting again. 
Now, now, now. Now, you shove on that side, and I'll pull on with this. Yes. There, there. Now, that ought to fetch the lid off. Well, it's all against my better judgment. All right. All right. Off with it. She goes. Another shove. No, open it. We've got it open. Reverend. Look. Look at her head. What? What? What in Satan's name is it? Lion's head. That's it, a lion's head. And that's the body of a woman. And alive. She is alive. Don't be a fool. It's a heathen idol. Stone. No, no. It's living skin. I'll touch it. I'll prove it. Oh. It is stone. A blasphemous heathen thing. We'll cover it up, and in the morning I'll have it bedded again. No, no, no. No, you won't. It's mine. Found it on my property. Oh, heaven forgive you. The blood of your poor housekeeper still staining it. Staining it? What are you talking about? Mrs. Grace's blood. See, it's still on it. But... But the outside of the coffin fell on her. This part was closed. But it is blood. Fresh blood. Oh, it can't be, Alfie. <sighs> Mr. Jeffrey. Reverend. That woman. A minute ago, I felt cold stone... And now it's warm. Constable, constable, can't you walk any faster? Oh, it'll wait, Reverend. Whatever it is, it'll wait. But I tell you, he acted like a madman. Practically threw me out of the house bodily because I persisted... Now, wait a minute, Reverend. Begging your pardon, wait a minute. Me, I don't know a thing about this. I'm sleeping as peaceful as a sheep in the fields when you wake me up. Will you represent the law in this community? But begging your pardon, I don't know that there's any representing to do. If you get what I mean. But I told yes, you... Yes, sir, you told me that the coffin that killed poor Mrs. Gracie... He opened it, I tell you. And since when is that against the law? Oh, keep walking, man, keep walking. Begging your pardon, Reverend, I know when I'm walking. Now, now, now here's the house. Now go in there, go in there and see for yourself. And that's just what I'm going to do, sir. You'll see, you'll see. I demand that you remove the heathen idol by force and have it bedded in the ground where it belongs. I demand that you... Hold it, sir. Well, it's me, Mr. Jeffrey. I didn't send for you. I brought him here. Oh, it's you, is it? And now, Mr. Jeffrey, I feel it my duty. Uh, begging community... your pardon, Reverend. As long as you got me out of bed, let me do the talking, mm -hmm. if Very you well, don't well, mind, well, sir. Well. <clears throat> now, Mr. Jeffrey, I'd like a bit of an explanation. Mm -hmm. Explanation, my grandmother. Constable. Constable, he slammed the door in our faces. Well, that he did, but but what of it? He's broke no law that I know of. Then come, come and see for yourself. Eh, at the window. What? Uh, Glory be. I see the thing now. It, it, it can't be alive. I don't know, I don't know. Stone, and yet, yet it was warm to the touch. It better not be alive. Why, why do you say that? Because, look for yourself. Mr. Jeffrey, he's cutting into her with that bit of iron. Oh, it was good of you to come in and help me, Mr. Elton. Oh, uh, I'm right glad to be of service, I am. I'm glad to be of service. But this is devilish hard rock. Yes, yes, it is. But we've got to break the statue open, Mr. Elkington. We've got to. If you say so. Oh, the fool, the constable, and the reverend, they'll be back soon with some new ideas about getting into the house now, won't they? I, I suppose so. But they won't stop me. They won't. I've a chance to do something before I die. I'll make a big discovery, I tell you. They, they won't stop me. We'll have the statue cut open before they get here now, won't we, Mr. We'll Arthur? try, I will yes, try. Yes, 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 yes. Cut it open and know the secret. Something that keeps that stone warm as if it were place. Uh, that'll be a wonderful discovery now, won't it? Ah, oh, that it will. Uh, yeah, faster, Mr. Stilkington, faster. I'll try, I'll try. Crikey, this stone is so hard. Uh, they mustn't stop us. No, 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 no. Faster, Mr. Elkington. Oh. Uh, Elkington. Why have you stopped? It's my fingers cramped. I can't open my hand. Chisel, give it to me. All right, all right. Got to keep working. Got to. I know the secret in you, Lionhead. That's the name I've got to give her, Elkington, Lionhead. The power that's kept the stone in you warm all these centuries. 
I've got to know that lion head. And I will know it. Have to keep work, Chase. Have to keep work. Now, Reverend. Reverend, you can drive a man too far. I tell you... No, the Constable, is... now we'll tell you. Uh, uh, For 24 uh. hours, you've been telling the people of this community that the law won't permit you to do this and the law won't permit you to do that. Well, it won't. But we tell you we won't stand by and permit one of our citizens to indulge in heathen madness and not do something about it. Am I right, gentlemen? Absolutely right. But, but what can I do? He's in his own home. He's not committing any public nuisance. We've gone over that a hundred times. The fact remains you've got to go in there and stop him. You've got to. You've got to. You've got The hardest stone in the world. They made you up, huh? Yes. Mr. Jeffrey, I'm asking you, please stop cutting into it. Secret please. of the warmth. Before any of the others know about it. Or they stop. Me. Hark! What's that? Not to keep working. That, that sound, Mr. Jeffrey, what is it? I can't talk to you, Mr. Ruggie. It's important to work. But, uh, Mr. Jeffrey, the chisel, why did you drop it? My hand. Like an electric current running through the chisel. Oh, no. No, no, just... Just a weariness in my muscles. Pick up the chisel. Yes... Go on. I, I, yes. I, I think I'm going now, no, Mr. No, Jeffrey. No, no, no. You stay where you are. I, I'd you stay go. here until you stay there. If I lock the door for you, they will come in. And I won't let them in before I learn the secret, you hear me? That sound, Mr. Jeffrey, it's like something uh, burning. Do you hear? It's been getting louder and louder. Well, stop. I've got to find the secret of that warmth. Fifteen centuries of warmth. Mr. Uh, Jeffrey, it's the constable. I don't care. I don't care. Open up. Open up, Mr. Jeffrey. Uh, you, you won't stop me, you meddling fool. Open up, Mr. Uh, Jeffrey, in the name of the law. Uh, We've got a warrant uh, this time, good and proper. Warrant? No, oh, no, no. Oh, Mr. Warrant. Jeffrey, you ought to really... No, 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 no. I, I, I'm almost finished. Go away. Go away. We've got Professor Thompson from the museum. Mr. Jeffrey, I'll warn you. No, no, Open no. up or we'll break yeah. down the door. Mr. Jeffrey, I no, beg of you, no, please. No, 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 they won't stop me. But I'm almost through. I tell you, I'm frightened, almost I am. Almost broken through to the middle of my statue. Oh, no. I'll find out oh. a secret and no one else. There. My chisel breaking through. It's, it's, it's hollow. Breaking through. Uh, in a second, I know. In a second, I know. Help! Somebody help! Mr. Jeffrey, what Mr. The Jeffrey? Way. He's on fire! He's on fire! All right, all right, men, quiet down. There's nothing more we can do. Mr. Jeffrey is dead. Such a horrible way to die. It was the lantern. Set him afire, I guess. No, 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 it wasn't that. Hey, what say, Mr. Elfington? I saw it all. A flame came out of the statue. You're dead, man. No, I swear it's the truth. I saw it. Professor Thompson, you, you tell him. What did you see as you came through the door? There was a flame from it. You but, don't really mean But that. how can that be? Flame from a statue? And the Romans went down to Egypt. Professor, tell us, what is it? What is this statue? The lioness-headed goddess Sekhmet. Well? And they worshipped her as the goddess of fire.
report sharply to the Czechoslovakian government regarding alleged frontier violations. This morning in Canton, China, Japanese farmers killed 600 and injured nearly 1,000 men, women, and children. This afternoon, the British steamer Great End was bombed and sunk in Valencia Harbor. Tonight, as millions of Americans prepare to celebrate Memorial Day, a day consecrated to the memory of our fallen heroes, the Columbia Workshop presents Bury the Dead. Hey, Sergeant, they stink. Let's bury them in a hurry. What do you think you smell like, Gabby? You've been lying out dead in the hot sun for two days. A lily of the valley? Keep digging. Hey, this is deep enough. What are we supposed to do? Dig right down to hell and deliver him over face hands? A man's entitled to six feet of dirt over his face. we got to show respect for the dead. Keep digging. They stink. Bury them. That's a fine way to talk in the presence of death. Ah, come on. Let's put them away. What's the difference? They'll just be turned up anyway the next time the artillery wakes up. All right, all right. Let's such a hurry to put them in. Put them in neat there. File them away alphabetically, boys. You may want to refer to them later. Yeah, this one's just a kid. Bury him, he stinks. Come on. Let's file a dirt in on him. Okay, boys. Shovel it in. Hey, wait a minute. I heard a groan. I heard a groan. Shut up, soldier. Stop it. I heard a groan. What about it? Can you have a war without groans? Keep quiet. Coming from down there in the grave. Hold it. Somebody down there groaned. Oh, my God. He's alive. Why the hell don't they get these things straight? Pull him out. There. He came from there. Another one. I heard it. Another one standing up. Standing up in his grave. All of them. All six of them standing up. Standing up in their grave. What do you want? Don't bury it. Hey, let's get out of here. There we are. Now show the place man no more. Don't bury it. We don't want to be buried. Carry on, man. Carry on, I said. Captain! Captain! Where the hell is the captain? Hey, I'm getting, I'm getting out. Don't go away. Stay with us. We want to hear the sound of men talking. Don't be afraid of us. We're not really different from you. We're dead. That's all. That's all. Are you afraid of six dead men? You who've lived with the dead, with so many dead, and eaten your bread by their side when there was no time to bury them, and you were hungry? Are we different from you? An ounce of soul lead in our hearts, and none in yours. A small difference between us. Tomorrow or the next day, the lead will be yours, too. Talk is our equal. That's the kid. Say something to us. Forget the grave as we would forget it. I'm not drunk, Captain. No, not crazy either. They just got up all together and looked at us. Look. Look for yourself, Captain. You see? I see. I was expecting it to happen someday. So many men each day. It's too bad it had to happen in my company. Gentlemen, at ease. I'm only telling the generals what I saw. You're not making this up, Captain? No, General. Have you any proof, Captain? The four men in the burial detail and the sergeant, sir. In time of war, Captain, men see strange things. Ghosts, for instance. They weren't ghosts. They were men killed two days standing in their graves and looking at me. Captain, you're becoming tried. I'm sorry, sir. It was a trying sight. I saw them. What are the generals going to do about it? Don't stand there croaking. What are the generals going to do about it? Have them examined by a doctor. If they're alive, send them to a hospital. If they're dead, bury them. It's very simple. <laughs> Well, 
Doctor? Yes, sir. In your report here, you say that each of these six men is dead. Yes, sir. And I don't see what all this fuss is about, Captain. They're dead. Bury them. I'm afraid, sir, that that can't be done. They're standing in their graves. They refuse to be buried. Do we have to go into that again? We have the doctor's report. They're dead. Aren't they, Doctor? Yes, sir. Then they aren't standing in their graves refusing to be buried, are they? Yes, sir. Doctor, would you know a dead man if you saw one? The symptoms are easily recognized, sir. We have witness certificates from a registered surgeon that these men are dead. Bury them. Don't waste no more time on it. You hear me, Captain? Yes, sir. I'm afraid, sir, that I must refuse to bury these men. That's insubordination, I'm sir. sorry, sir. It's not within the line of my military duties to bury men against their will. If the general will only think for a moment, he'll see that this is impossible. <clears throat> the uh, captain's right. It might get back to Congress. God only knows what they'd make of it. What are we going to do then? Uh, <clears throat> Captain, uh, what do you suggest? Stop the war. Yeah. Captain! Okay, hurry it up, Bart. That's the story, Chief. Say this a rifle barrel to help me. Listen, I've been running the newspaper longer than you've been shaving, and I never heard anything like it before. You. Something's happening. Somebody's waking up. It didn't happen. Listen, I got it straight. Those guys just stood up in the grave and said, You can't bury us. To help me, it's true. Get me McCready at the War Department. It's an awfully funny story. It's the story of the year, the story of the century, the biggest story of all time. Men getting up with bullets in their hearts and refusing to be buried. Who do they think they are? They... Hello, McCready. This is Henson of the New York. Yeah. Listen, McCready, I got the story about the six guys who refused to be... Yeah. Okay, McCready, if that's the way the government feels about it... Yeah. Uh... Well, what does he say? No. Holy... But people got a right to know! In time of war, people have a right to know nothing. Gentlemen, I have been asked by the generals to talk to you. To talk to you not as your your former captain, but as a friend. To talk to you man to man. My work is not this this soldiering. I I'm a philosopher, I'm a scientist. My uniform is a pair of eyeglasses, my usual weapons, test tubes, and books. At a time like this, perhaps we need philosophy, need science. First I must say that your general has ordered you to lie down. We used to have a general. No more. They sold us. What do you mean, sold you? Sold us for 25 yards of bloody mud. A life for four yards of bloody mud. We had to take that hill. General's orders, your soldiers, you understand? We understand now. The real estate operations of generals are always carried on at boom prices. A life for four yards of bloody mud. Gold is cheaper. And rare jewels, pearls, and rubies. I fell in the first yard. I caught on the wire. Hung there while the machine gun stitched me through the middle. I was there at the end and thought I had life in my hands for another day. But a shell came. My life dripped into the mud. Ask the general how he'd like to be dead at 20. 20, General! 20! Other men are dead. Two men. Men must die for their country's sake. If not you, then others. This has always been... Men died for Pharaoh and Caesar in Rome 2,000 years ago and more. And went into the earth with their wounds. Why not you? Men. Even the men who died for Pharaoh and Caesar and Rome must in the end, before all hope is gone, discover that a man can die happy and be contentedly buried only when he dies for himself or for a cause that is his own and not Pharaoh's or Caesar's or Rome's. I... I see, gentlemen. Got any suggestions, Captain? Only one thing left to do now, General. Get their women. <laughs> what good will their women do? The women will fight the General's battle for them in the best possible way, through their emotions. It's the General's best bet. Women, of course! Gad, you've got it there, Captain. Get out their women. Get them in a hurry. We'll have those boys underground in a jiffy. Women! My Gad, I never thought of it. Send out the call for women. Ladies, 
You are all gold star mothers, wives, and sweethearts. You want to win this war. I know it. Now, here's your chance to do your part, a glorious part. You're fighting for your homes, your children, your sisters' lives, your country's honor. You are fighting for religion, for love, for all decent human life. Wars can be fought and won only when the dead are buried and forgotten. How can we forget the dead who refuse to be buried? We must forget them. There's no room in this world for dead men. They will lead only to the bitterest unhappiness for you, for them, for everybody. Go, ladies. Do your duty. Your country waits upon you. Did it hurt much? John. How's the kid, Beth? Oh, he's fine. He talks now. He weighs 28 pounds. He'll be a big boy. Did it hurt much, John? How's the phone? Is it going all right, Beth? It's going. The rye was heavy this year. Did it hurt much, John? What color do you have? Blonde. Like you. What are you going to do, John? I would like to see the kids and the farm. They say you're dead, John. I'm dead, all right. Then how is it? I don't know. Maybe there's too many of us under the ground now. Maybe the earth can't stand it no more. you got to change crops sometime. What are you doing here, Beth? They asked me to get you to let yourself be buried. What do you think? You're dead, John. Well? What's the good? I don't know. Only there's something in me, dead or no dead, that won't let me be buried. You were a queer man, John. I never did understand what you were about. But what's the good? Beth, I never talked so that I could get you to understand what I wanted while I... Well, before. Maybe now. There's a couple of things, Beth, that I ain't had enough of. Easy things. Things like the fuzz of green over a field in spring where you planted wheat and it started to come out overnight. Things like taking a cold drink of water out of the well after you boiled in the sun all afternoon and feeling the water go down and down into you, cooling you off all through from the inside out. Things like seeing a blonde kid, all busy and serious, playing with a dog on the shady side of a house. There ain't nothing like that down here in the grave, Beth. Everything has its place, John. Dead men have their... My place is on the earth, Beth. My business is with the top of the earth, not the underside. There was a trap that yanked me down. I'm not smart, Beth, and I'm easy trapped. But I can tell now. I got some stories to tell farmers before I'm to. I'm going to tell them. We could bury you home, John, near the creek. It's cool there and quiet. And there's always a breeze in the trees. Uh, later, Beth, when I had my fill of looking, smelling and talking, a man should be able to walk into his grave, not be dragged into it. All I feel, and the kid, with you walking around like, like that, I won't bother you. I won't even come near you. Well, even so, just know it. I can't help it. This is something bigger than you, bigger than me. It's something I ain't had nothing to do with starting. Out of the earth like, like a weed, a flower. Pay for it. You were a, a good husband, John. For the kid and me. Won't you let me down? Go home, Beth. Go home. Yes. Yeah. 
face. Um, you don't want to see it, Mom. My baby face. One. It's for you. You don't want to see it, Mom, I know. Didn't they tell you what happened to me? I asked the doctor. He said a piece of shell hit the side of your head, but even so... Don't ask to see it, Mom. Baby, listen to me. I'm your mother. Let them bury you. There's something peaceful and done about a grave. I was only 20, Mom. I hadn't done anything. I hadn't seen anything. I never even had a girl. I spent 20 years practicing to be a man. And then they killed me. Oh, being a kid's no good, Mom. You try to get over it as soon as you can. You don't really live while you're a kid. You mark time waiting. I waited, Mom. But then I got cheated. They made a speech and played a trumpet. Left me in a uniform and then they killed me. Oh, baby. Baby, there's no peace this way. Please, let them bury you. No, Mom. Then, want now, so as I can remember, let me see your face, my baby's face. Mom, the shell hit close to me. You don't want to look at a man when a shell hit close to him. Let me see your face, Jimmy. All right, Mom. Look. I'm Catherine Driscoll. Uh, I'm looking for my brother. He's dead. Are you my brother? No. I'm looking for my brother. My name is Catherine Driscoll. No. Are you my... I'm looking for my brother. My name is Catherine Driscoll. His name is... I'm Tom Driscoll. Hello. I don't know you. After 15 years and... What do you want, Catherine? You don't know me either, do you? No. It's funny, I coming here to talk to a dead man, to try to get him to do something because once long ago he was my brother. They talked me into it. I don't know how to begin. You'll be wasting your words, Catherine. They should have asked someone nearer to you. Someone who loved you. Only they couldn't find anybody. I was the nearest, they said. That's so. You were the nearest. And I, 15 years away. Poor Tom. It couldn't have been a sweet life you led those 15 years. It wasn't. You were poor, too. Sometimes I begged for meals. I wasn't lucky. And yet you want to go back. Is there no more sense in the dead, Tom, than in the living? Maybe not. Maybe there's no sense in either living or dying. But we can't believe that. You're dead. Your fight's over. The fight's never over. I got things to say to people now. To people who nurse big machines. The people who swing shovels. And the people whose babies die with big bellies and rotten bones. I got things to say to the people who leave their lives behind them and pick up guns to fight in somebody else's wars. Important things. Big things. Big enough to lift me out of the grave right back into the earth, into the middle of men. Just because I got the voice to say to them, if God could lift Jesus... Tom, have you lost religion, too? I got a religion. I got a religion that wants to take heaven out of the clouds and plant it right here on the earth, where some of us can get a slice of it. It isn't as pretty as heaven. There aren't any streets of gold and there aren't any angels. And we'd have to worry about sewerage and railroad schedules in it. And we don't guarantee everybody would be happy in it. But it would be right here, stuck in the mud of this earth. And there wouldn't be any entrance requirements like dying to get into it. Dead or alive, I see that. And it won't let me rest. I was the first one to get up in this black grave of ours because that idea wouldn't let me rest. 
I pulled the others with me. That's my job, pulling the others. They only know what they want. I know how they can get it. There's still the edge of arrogance on you. I got heavens in my two hands to give to men. There's reason for arrogance. I came to ask you to lie down and let them bury you. It seems foolish now, but... It's foolish, Catherine. I didn't get up from the dead to go back to the dead. I'm going to the living now. Fifteen years. It's a good thing your mother isn't alive. How can you say goodbye to a dead brother, Tom? Wish him an easy grave, Catherine. A green and pleasant grave to you, Tom, when finally, finally, green and pleasant. Well, say something. What do you want me to say, Martha? Something, anything, only talk. You give me the shiver standing there like that, looking like that. Even now, after this, there's nothing that we can talk to each other about. Oh, don't talk like that. You talk like that enough when you're alive. It's not my fault that you're dead. All right, Martha. What's the difference now? Well, I just wanted to let you know. Now I suppose you're going to come back and sit around and ruin my life altogether. No. I'm not going to come back. Then what are you... I... I couldn't expect... Explain it to you, Martha. No. Oh, no, you couldn't explain it to your wife. But you could explain it to that dirty bunch of loafers down at that old garage of yours. And you could explain it to those bums in the saloon on F Street. I guess I could. Things seemed to be clearer when I was talking to the boys when I worked over a job. And I managed to talk so people could get to understand what I meant down at the saloon on F Street. It was nice. Standing there on Saturday night, the beer in front of you, and a man or two that understood your own language next to you, talking, oh, about Babe Ruth, or the New Orleans system that Ford was putting out, or the chances of us getting into the war. Yes, you were happy those times, but you weren't happy in your own home. Oh, I know, even if you don't say it. Well, I wasn't happy either. Living in three rotten rooms that the sun didn't hit five times a year. Watching the roaches make picnics on the walls. Happy. I did my best. Eighteen fifty a week, your best. Eighteen fifty. Condensed milk. A two-dollar pair of shoes once a year. Five hundred dollars insurance. Chopped meat. Oh, how I hate chopped meat. Eighteen fifty. Being afraid of everything. Of the landlord, the gas company. Dead, stiff all the time and getting nothing out of life. Why shouldn't I have had a baby? Who says I shouldn't have had a baby? 1850? No baby. I would have liked a kid. Would you? You never said anything. It's good to have a kid. A kid, somebody to talk to. First, in the beginning, I, I thought we'd have a kid someday. A kid would have helped. Oh, no, it wouldn't. Kids don't help the poor. Nothing helps the poor. Oh, no, I'm too smart to have six dirty kids on 1850. Now, now it's worse. Your $20 a month. You hire yourself out to be killed and I get $20 a month. What's the war to me that I have to sit home alone at night with nobody to talk to? What's the war to you that you had to go off and get That's yourself... That's why I'm... Standing up now, Martha. Yeah. That's just like you. To wait until it's too late. There's plenty for live men to stand up for. All right. Stand up. It's about time you talk back. It's about time all you poor, miserable 1850 guys stood up for themselves and their wives and the kids they can't have. Tell them all to stand up. Tell them. Tell them. It didn't work. Now you've got to put it in. I knew it would work. Put it over the headlines. It didn't work. Put it in the headlines. 
They won't be buried. It didn't work. It didn't work. He it didn't on. work. They're still standing. Somebody do something. Sure, they're standing. From now on, they'll always stand. You can't bury soldiers anymore. They stink. Bury them. What'll happen to our war? We can't let anything happen to our war. The day of judgment is at hand. File them away in alphabetical order. Keep it quiet. My husband, my brother, my baby. We've got to put them down. Never, never, never. You can't put them down. Put one down and ten will spring up like weeds in an old garden. Use lead on them. Lead put them down once, then it'll do it again. Bury them. Bury the dead. The dead have arisen. Now let the living rise. Singing. Oh. Do something. Do something. Extra, they're still standing. Here you are. Do something. Well, this isn't 1918. This is today. See what happens tomorrow. Anything can happen now. Anything. Let me have a machine gun. Sergeant, machine gun. I'll show them. This is what they've needed. All right, all right. Get it over with. Hurry. But keep it quiet. I want a crew to man this gun. Are you... Come over here. And you, you know what to do. I'll give the command to fire. Not to me, you won't. This is over me. I won't touch that gun. None of us will. We didn't hire out to be no butcher of dead men. Do your own shopping. You'll be court-martialed. You'll be dead by tomorrow morning. Be careful, General. I may take a notion to come up like these guys. That's the smartest thing I've seen in this whole war, and I like it. What do you say, buddy? It's about time. I'll say it is. What? You will support an Oh, stop it. Stop it. Bad enough as it is. Let him alone. Do it yourself. All by myself? Yes, yes. Go ahead. Do it. Do it. Do it. All right. As soon as I get this gun to working. Never, never, never. Let me see your face, baby. Oh, you remember the glass of beer with a couple of bums on Saturday night. A green and pleasant grave. Did it hurt much, John? Four yards of bloody mud. I fell in the first yard. Never, never, never. Tell him all to stand up. Tell him. Tell him. General, look. They're coming out of the grave. They're coming toward us. Think of a threat! Fire! Fire, you bloody fool! the Columbia Workshop's production of the famous American war play, Bury the Dead, by Irwin Shaw. Bury the Dead was adapted for radio and directed by William N. Robeson. Next week, the workshop will present an experiment in native rhythms in its production of Trunga Man Fine Gar a radio play of British West Africa, written and directed by John Carlyle. In this production, native African drummers will present for the first time a demonstration of their talking drums, the most primitive form of wireless communication. Stronger man, fine girl, which means strong man, fine girl, will be heard next week at this same time, 7.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Saving Time. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Sealed Book. Once again, the keeper of the book has opened the ponderous door to the secret vault, wherein is kept the great sealed book in which is recorded all the secrets and mysteries of mankind through the ages. Here are tales of every kind, tales of murder, of madness, of dark deeds strange and terrible beyond all belief. Keeper of the book, 
I would know what tale we tell this time. Open the great book and let us read. Slowly, the great book opens. One by one, the keeper of the book turns the pages and stops. Ah, the strange story of a man who was down and out and was willing to do anything for money. A tale titled, Time on My Hands. Time on my hands, as it is written in the pages of the sealed book. Our story begins in one of the cells of the state penitentiary. Joe Martin, his face white and tense, is speaking to Father Dolan. Father Dolan, I, I'm not faking insanity. I'm not. Everything I've told him is true. Look, you can make him see why it can't be tonight, why it mustn't be tonight. Oh, even if it's only put off until tomorrow, that'll be all right. Then, then, then I'll know that what Mr. Benedict said won't come true. Listen, this is how it happened. It all started late one night last September. It was awful cold. They been getting darker and darker all afternoon. Then, just about midnight, the storm started. Can't sleep here in the park, Joe. Not with all this rain coming down. Yeah. Oh, it's really pouring now, isn't it? I still ain't raised the price of a flop. Uh, oh, I just about sell myself to the devil for the price of a bed. I, hey, hey, look. Eh? What's that you're picking up? Uh, it's a fountain pen, see? I can hock it. Maybe I can get the price of a uh, bed. It's only a two-bit pen. You couldn't get a cent for it. Well, I'm going to have a try. What can I lose? Okay, and I'm heading downtown. I'll see you later. Yeah, if I don't kill over first. Ooh. Coming down so hard, you can't see more than a couple of feet ahead. Oh, my feet are wet. I feel hot and cold. Hot and cold. Oh, oh here's Rand's pawn shop. Come on. Oh, no. Closed. No luck. Never no luck. Try Morris's place. Right along here somewhere, I... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, here it is. Oh, oh close to Why does this have to happen to me? Arnold's hawk shop has got to be open. I can't see his window. Coming down so hard, I... He's, he's got to be open. Nobody's lucking me that bad. Be open, be open, be open. Oh, closed. Oh, he's closed too. Now what? i got to keep walking or I'll, I'll kill over... No one in sight. I'm all alone. No friends, no place. No. What's that? Hawk shop? Never noticed this place before. I'm a... Must be a new one. Here, I, I gotta get in. I gotta get some dough for this pen. I gotta. Must be the boss up there in the back of the shop working on his books. Yeah. Uh, uh, good uh, evening. Co- oh, oh, good evening. Good evening. You're no no on the street, huh? Why, yes, I am. But I've been in this business quite a number of years. Quite a number. You, uh, have something you desire to pawn? Huh? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. This, this here fountain pen. May I see it, please? Oh, sure. It's a fine pen. Writes good, too. Hmm. I'm afraid I wouldn't be interested in that. Well, well look, mister, c- couldn't you let me have something on it? I'm sorry, but this pen is worthless. Yeah, just my luck. Uh, possibly... 
you have something else you can pawn. Something else? Me? Well, I got time on my hands. Time. Nothing to do with it. Nothing but starve and freeze. Ah, oh, then perhaps we can do business after all. Huh? In fact, I can make you a very handsome offer. If you're prepared to sell, say, five years of your life. Sell five years of my life? Look, how can you buy five years of my life? Oh, it's very simple. Our firm, shall I say, does it all the time. You merely sign an agreement and the five years are deducted from your lifespan. You mean I'd, I'd die five years sooner than I should? Yes, but then think how unhappy your years are. Well? Who are you, mister? Why do business under a dozen different names? Benedict is as good a name as any. Now, come. Are you willing to sell five years of your life? I'm prepared to offer you, shall we say, a thousand dollars a year. A thousand dollars a year? Yes. Five thousand dollars in all. Think of it. With that money, you can live as you've always wanted to live. Yeah, yeah, I know, but, but five years. What will they mean to you? Cold, hunger, wet feet. Yeah. Wet feet. <laughs> Sure would feel good to have a new pair of shoes on my feet. You got the money here, mister? Yes, I always pay in cash. Five thousand bucks, huh? Sure. Sure, why not? Why not, indeed. I'll have to look your record up in my files. Uh, what is your full name, please? Uh, Joseph Henry Martin. Let me see. Joseph Henry Martin. You... You mean you got my, my name in that file? Why, yes. We try to keep our records complete. Uh, you were born December the 22nd, 1912. Yeah. Your father's name was Richard. Your mother's name was Margaret. Yeah, you, you, you're right. Very well, Mr. Martin. Your record is satisfactory and we can do business. If you'll just sign this form, please. Yeah, mister. Oh, oh the, this line, huh? Yes, please. Your name in full and the date. Joseph Henry Martin, October 5th. There. What about the dough? Of course. If you will just feel in the right-hand pocket of your coat. Money! A handful of $500 bills! Please count them to make sure the sum is correct, Mr. Mark. Yeah, yeah, be glad. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It's all there. Five thousand bucks! It's been a pleasure to do business with you, Mr. Martin. Good night. Oh, five th huh? Oh, yeah, yeah, it's uh, mutual. Good night. Five thousand bucks? Ah, I'm rich! Oh, am I gonna have me a time? Come on, service, service. How about some service in this hotel? I want a room, see? No, 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 no. I want a suite. The best suite you got, Mac. With a bad. <laughs> Never mind how I look. Never mind. I got those, see? <laughs> Five hundred dollar bill. Now, how do I get that sweeter, don't I? Six suits, brother, that's what I said. I want six suits, tweed, like them in a window, only with more color in them, see? When a guy's got dough, he wears tweeds. <laughs> and I got dough, see? Any fur coat you like, baby, just name it. Go ahead, name it. That one? <laughs> okay, mister, wrap it up. Go on, you heard what the lady said. But one day, a little more than three months after Joe had come into his newfound wealth, he was shocked to learn that he was overdrawn at the bank. It seemed the $5,000 was gone. Even more, he owed a hotel bill of $400. Late that night, Joe skipped his hotel and took up residence at a cheap boarding house. One by one, his possessions began to go. What do you mean, only... F what? Ten bucks for these suits? Look, look, they're worth 60 anyway. Look, Mac, I paid a tail... Ten bucks, huh? Okay, let me have it. Only a dollar for my hat. One buck? But, well, I gotta have a bed tonight, so okay. Okay. 
Say, bud, can you help a fellow that's down and out, huh? Huh? Can you help me out with a, a little something, mister, huh? Just a little... Just... Hey, you louse. Didn't even look at me. Midnight ain't even got the price of a flop yet. Raining again. Always at rain. Four months ago, I had 5,000 bucks. Now I ain't got a dime. I ain't even got anything left to pour. Nothing. Not even a... Wait a minute. Yeah, yeah, sure I am. Why didn't I think of that before? Benedict's pawn shop. I'm still young. I got plenty of time left. I'm gonna see Benedict. <laughs> To continue the story, Time on My Hands, as it is written in the sealed book. Soaked to the skin, his shoes leaking, Joe Martin trudged through the rain toward Benedict's pawn shop. He peered anxiously ahead as he approached it. Just a little further and I'll be there. He's got to be open. He just got Yeah, yeah. There's a light in his window. He is open. Good evening. Oh, Mr. Benedict. Remember me? Certainly. You're Joseph Henry Mark. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Look, how'd you like to buy another five years of my life from me, huh? Uh, just a minute, please, while I get your record from the file. Uh, you can bet this time I ain't gonna waste my dough. Ah, here we are. Joseph Henry Mark. Yeah, yeah. Well, is it a deal for another five years, huh? Uh, yes, we can do business. Ah, good. Uh, however, Mr. Martin, I can only pay you $500 a year this time. $2,500 in all. Twenty-five hundred. Oh, but look, you, you gave me five thousand for the first five years. Yes, I know, but uh, we're rather heavily stocked just now. Twenty-five hundred. I don't know. I, I was kind of counting on, on, on buying a farm with a five thousand. Well, perhaps we can do business another time when conditions are more favorable. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let, let me think it over. Do so by all means. It's quite all right. The clothes are soaked. My feet are wet. Twenty-five hundred bucks, I could... All right. All right, it's a deal. If you'll just sign your name and the date on this form, as before. Okay. Joseph Henry Martin. Uh, what's the date? January the 18th. And put down the time, Joseph. Two minutes past two. Uh, two minutes past two. Uh, yeah. Fine. Hey. Hey, you can feel a dough in my pocket again. It, it's ten... 1525 2500 yeah. Look, uh, hey, maybe I'd better sell you another five years, huh? I, I could get a much better farm for 5000 you know. Sorry, but I'm afraid we're not interested in any further purchases. Why not? You have no more time to sell. No, no more? What do you mean? According to my records, with the sale you've just made, deducted from your lifespan, you have just two more hours to live. Two hours? Yes. 
You're now due to die at three minutes after four o'clock in exactly two hours. Nah, nah, that's a mistake. It must be. No, no, Mr. Martin. I have your record right here, and our records are never wrong. Then what did you let me sell you the five years for? My dear Mr. Martin, you asked me to buy them. Yeah, but what good is a 2500 not to take back your dough and give me back my five years? I regret to say that there are no exchanges. There's got to be one, you hear me? I'm warning you. You're going to give me back my five years, or aren't you? I should like to oblige, but it's against our policy. Oh, it is, is it? Maybe this will help you change your mind, huh? I should put down that knife if I were you, Mr. Martin. I'll put it down when I get back my five years or no sooner. Do I get him? I'm sorry to say no. No, I take that! What are you standing there smiling for? I stabbed you, you gotta fall! Fall, do you hear me? You... You're not even bleeding. No, Mr. Martin, I'm not even bleeding. You'd better pick up your money and go. Yeah, but look, look, don't you see? I... Look, give me a break, will you, mister? You have one hour and 58 minutes left now. I'm sorry, Mr. Martin. Oh, you can't let me die like this. You can't do it. You, you got to give me more time, please. Well, I think we could arrange for you to have more time if you care to sell your soul. Huh? S- sell my soul? It's of trifling value, of course, but my firm has a certain use for such things. My soul? I, I, I never thought very much about it. Never had any use for it myself, I guess. Few people do. It's superfluous at best. What What was that? Merely the clock striking the quarter hour. It's now a quarter past two. Quarter past two. All all, all right, I'll I'll sell. Where do I sign? Well, unfortunately, in this matter, your signature would not be binding. There's only one way I could be certain of getting my property when the time comes. What, what, What way is that? You'd have to, shall we say, remove some person from this life. You mean, you mean kill someone? Exactly. And in return, you shall have the balance of the victim's life. You may be fortunate enough to find someone who has 30 or 40 years to live. Just think, all that time would be yours. Yeah, yeah, but but to have to kill somebody... No, you don't have to. It's just a suggestion. Yeah, but if I don't... But I... Die in two hours. One hour and 47 minutes, to be exact. No. No, I couldn't kill no one. Even if it means I die tonight. I can't do it, you hear me? I'm getting out of here. One hour and three minutes to live. An hour and three minutes. I, I, I gotta get out of the storm. There's a bar room. I could use a drink. What do you have? Uh, uh, double whiskey. Keep them coming. Let me have another. Say, Pat, you already put away a bottle. Don't you think you had enough for one night? Look, look, you just keep setting them up. I'm paying for it, Ella. Okay, it's your funeral. Don't say that. All right, all right. I didn't mean nothing by it. Last time I'll, I'll ever hear a clock strike. Only three minutes. Three minutes. Did you say something? No, no. no. What's, oh, what's that? What's what? What's that? That, that, that clock ticking. Where is it? Clock? There ain't no clock ticking in here. There is. Listen, guy, you, you had a couple too many, I guess. Look, I, I can hear it, I tell you. It's ticking, t- ticking, ticking. Tell me, I've, I've, I've only got three minutes left. Look, fella, it's time you was going. I, I don't like the way you're talking. Yeah, yeah. I gotta get out of here. Gotta get away from that clock.
And now to continue the story, Time on My Hands, as it is written in the sealed book. His heart pounding in his ears, Joe ran out of the bar and down the street, terror clutching his heart. Try as he would, he couldn't rid himself of one thought. The clock had just struck four. The end was fast approaching. Breathless, he came to a stop. Looked around wildly. Three minutes to live. Three minutes. No, no. Must be only two now. I, I don't want to die. I, I want to live. I want to live. I've got to do it. I've got to. Time is going so fast. The street's empty. No, no, no. Here comes somebody. Uh, mister, mister, you got a match? Sure, yeah, sure. Hey, why are you looking at me like that? Oh, no, you're old, you're old. You, you must be over 70. Mm. Uh, yes, but... but you, Hi, you're no good to me. I want someone with lots of life, man. Lots of life for me to live. You're mad. You're mad. Wait a minute. Here comes somebody else. Somebody young. I can, I can tell by the way he was. Somebody with years to live yet. It's my last chance. Hey, uh, hey, mister. You call me? Yeah, you, uh, you, you got the time? Yeah, sure. Exactly two and a half minutes after four. Uh. Seems like 30 seconds left. 30, 30 seconds. Now, what are you doing with that knife? Oh, don't. Well, I... Don't! I've done it. I've, I've done what you said. I, I killed a man. I kill him, do you hear me? I, I kill a man. Yes, I know you have. I'm a murderer. But you're alive. And as you see, it's a quarter past four. Yeah. I'm alive. And his time. I'm sure you'll put it to excellent use. Yeah. Took his wallet so as to get his name. Proofed he I did it. His name is Frank R. Caldwell. Frank R. Caldwell. I'll look it up in the files. He's young. He wanted to live, too, but they killed him. Frank R. Caldwell. Here it is. How much? How much time I got to live? Now, let me see. Hmm. His file expires on August 20th. August 20th? What year? This year. Th this year? Yes. You received just seven months from him. Seven months? <sighs> no, you must be wrong. He, he was so young. I'm sorry, but seven months was all he had. No, no, he can't. You'll find our records are quite correct. So your card will be removed from our files no. at no. ten minutes after 11 p.m. on August 20th. No, no, no. Ah, August 20th. Oh, that's wonderful. So that's what you've done to me. August 20th. Oh, no. August 20th. August 20th. That's the man who stopped me. Oh, are you? Just a minute there. Yeah, that's the man, all right. He's the one that killed that poor boy. Yeah, come along, you. You're under arrest. Oh, it's 20th, he's there. Seven months. Just seven months. Don't you see, Father Dolan? He, he said I, I was going to die on August 20th. Oh, August 20th. So, so that's why it's got to be put off until tomorrow. Because today is the 20th, and if I go tonight, then he'll... he'll... 11 o'clock. 11 o'clock. No. Sorry, Father Dolan. This time is up. You ready, Joe? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sure, wouldn't I? I'm, I'm ready. It's time for me to go, isn't it? Just the time he said I'd go. And so ends the tale, Time on My Hands as it is written in the sealed book. As Joe was strapped into the electric chair, there was a look of terror in his eyes. It was not death that terrified him, but the thought of Mr. Benedict, 
Mr. Benedict, who would be waiting for him. Keeper of the book, before you close the great volume, show us the tale we tell next time. This one. Ah, yes. The tale of a man who committed the perfect murder, only to discover that every murder must be paid for. The tale is titled, Death Laughs Last. Be sure to be with us again next time when the sound of the great gong heralds another strange and exciting tale from The Sealed Book. The Sealed Book, produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is written by Bob Arthur and David Cogan. Autolite and its 98,000 dealers bring you Mr. Herbert Marshall in tonight's presentation of Suspense. Tonight, Autolite presents a new radio adaptation of one of the most famous suspense stories ever written, Mary Godwin Shelley's Frankenstein. Our star, Mr. Herbert Marshall. my fences if it's not the senator. How's it look for you, Senator? Uh, 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 going to cast your ballot tomorrow, Harlow? Why, Senator, I'd no more forget to vote than forget to winterize my car. And now's the time to do it. Get the oil and grease changed, put in antifreeze, inspect the battery cable. And check the spark plugs, too. Right, Johnny Plug Check. The spark plugs are the very heart of your car's ignition system. And when they're right, your chances of starting, even in coldest weather, are better than ever. Well, I'll visit my auto light spark plug dealer, Harlow. Do that, Senator, because he's the expert on cleaning and adjustment. And if replacements are needed, he'll recommend those world-famous ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs, either standard or resistor type. To quickly learn the location of your nearest Autolite spark plug dealer, phone Western Union by number and ask for operator 25. And remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite presents transcribed Frankenstein, starring Mr. Herbert Marshall and hoping once again to keep you in suspense. Oh, hello, Victor. Hello, Mary. The Reverend Inn? Out in the garden, as usual. Do you want me to call him? No, thanks. I'll go out. Well, all right. Tell him not to get too dirty. We're supposed to play croquet with the McDonald's at five. I'll tell him. When's Elizabeth coming home? Tomorrow or, or Tuesday, I think. You both have to come over for dinner. Love to Mary. See you later. Hi. <laughs> oh, you're just in time to give me a hand. Whew. Well, these Indian summers hot, too sticky. James, 
I got to talk to you. Well, of course. What? Anything wrong? You know, you haven't looked too good for the past month or so. Something on your mind? Yes. Oh, well, then. Well, let's go in the house. I'll get you a beer. We can talk. No, no, no. Not in the house. Do you mind if we walk? Oh, of course not. Oh, wait a moment. I, my pipe will be. There we are. get some rain. Hope so. I don't have to play croquet. That's not a game. James? Oh, look now, we're friends. You know you can speak to me. What's the matter? One of your patients die? You made a mistake, perhaps? No, nothing like that. Perhaps it's worse. I'm not sure. Has it anything to do with Elizabeth going away? In a way, yes. Oh. My favorite place. You know, Victor, I think of most of my sermons standing here looking across the valley. Lovely, isn't it? Got a match? Oh, thanks. Listen, I've been doing an experiment. It's very complicated. And I've almost finished. Well, that's wonderful. I think I'm a little afraid of it. I don't know. I've tried to think it out myself. I can't find the answer. Go on. You believe in God, don't you? Oh. I mean, because I don't go to church, you don't think that I don't believe, do you? I don't think that at all. You're a good man. I want you to promise me something. You've got to promise that you'll never breathe a word of what I'm about to tell you. You have my word. You swear? I don't usually break my word. Oh, I'm sorry. Look, I... I've made something. It's tremendous. It's impossible. But I think I've done it. And it goes against everything you believe, James. What? What have you done? I've made a... a thing. Why, oh, I don't understand. i put it together. Heart, brain, nerves, muscle, everything. I've done it. Now do you understand? A complete body... And you're upset because of that? You think that you've done something wrong? But oh, you're a surgeon. What you've done will help to save a life. If you've learned more about the human body, this experiment can't be wrong. It can only do good. Oh, I shouldn't worry. Last night, I made it move. I'm not certain, but I think I can give it life. Absolute life. Now do you see why I'm afraid? I've created a man. I, uh, I'd better call Mary. She'll be worried. All right, but... Uh, I, I won't say anything. I'm with Victor. Now, listen, dear. I'm afraid we'll have to put off the McDonald's. Yes, I know. Well, Mary, I, I have something very important to discuss with Victor. It can't wait. Yes, dear. No, no, don't wait supper. I'll have something over here. Yes, I will. Goodbye. You don't have to see this thing if you don't want to, James. Where is it? In my lab. I had an addition built on. I'm the only one who has a key. I uh, don't say I believe what you told me, but uh, how do you know you can make it live? I mean, is it anything more than galvanic action? You'll see. I lock it. I always do. Oh. Is that the addition over there? Yes. show you, I want to explain. This is what started it. It was mostly an accident. One of the kids brought in his dog. It had been run over, killed. He wouldn't believe it was dead. 
Expected me to bring it back. I gave it a shot in the heart. And then another with this stuff. A compound I've fooled with for a long time. Yes? The dog came back to life. Just for a moment. How do you know the dog was dead? No, it was. It had been for two hours. All that happened three years ago. You've been experimenting on things ever since? Yes. It's wrong. I don't know. No, it's wrong. You went to stay, James. What are you going to do? Try to bring it to life? I've got to. I've got to try. Then why did you come to me? I wanted to tell you. I had to tell someone you're my friend. I'm a minister. I preach and believe in the word of God. Do you want to see it? No. No, I don't, but... I must. It's not terrible to look at. I've done a pretty good job on it. But it isn't quite finished. I'm not quite done with the face. I don't care. I know better. Oh, well, listen to me, Victor. This this mustn't go on. You've got to stop it. Not yet. Not until I find out. Does Elizabeth know what you're doing? No. Why did you send her away? I didn't want her here when I made the last test. Because you're ashamed. You know it's wrong. You know what she'd think. I'm not ashamed. I think I'm a little frightened at the incredible greatness of what I've done. It's bigger than anything since the world began. If it moves, if you prove your point to me, will you will you stop then? Will you destroy it? The formulas, whatever papers you have, destroy all of it, will you? I don't know. Hand me that hypodermic, will you? No. All right. There. If I say I believe you, Victor, if... You don't have to be afraid of it. It couldn't hurt you, you know. There's only enough of this stuff to stimulate a small portion of its brain... I'm not afraid of it. I'm afraid for us all. I've never preached to you, Victor. It moved its left foot last night. Then the right. I'm going to try the arm now. Move the light over, please. Thanks. Watch carefully. It only takes a few seconds. Now. yesterday. The movement only lasts for a moment now. That's all. I, 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 I don't know what to say. I, I don't even think I understand what I've seen except that it's terrible. Because you don't understand or because of what it means? I'm afraid, if you like. I'm afraid for you, for what you've done. That thing lying there, you've You've got no right. I won't allow... Oh, what's that? What? Listen. Stethoscope. That's impossible. There wasn't enough... Auto 
Daylight is bringing you Mr. Herbert Marshall in Frankenstein. Tonight's presentation in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Well, oh, who's this Johnny Plugcheck who's always electioneering about spark plugs? Why, Senator, Johnny is a helpful hinter fighting old man winter. He's the blithe reminder to wise motorists that now's the time to visit your Autolite spark plug dealer to get ready for the cold driving days ahead. Change the oil and grease, put in antifreeze, inspect the battery cable. And check those important spark plugs, too. Because when your spark plugs are right, your chances of starting, even in coldest weather, are better than ever. And if my Autolite spark plug dealer finds my spark plugs need replacing, how long? Why, if they're worn out, he'll recommend a set of the world famous ignition engineered Autolite spark plug, Senator, like the amazing Autolite resistor spark plug. It's one of the greatest advancements in spark plugs for automotive use in the past 20 years. When you have a set installed in your car, you'll get double spark plug life, smoother engine performance, and quick starts, as compared to spark plugs without a built-in resistor. So, friends, visit your Autolite spark plug dealer soon. And remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Mr. Herbert Marshall in Elliot Lewis's production of Frankenstein, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. You've got to put an end to it. It's inhuman. Don't you see what you're doing? You can't give it a soul. No. You can't give it. How do you know what I can give it? I've given it life, haven't I? It sees. It breathes. Moves. Perhaps hears. Yes. Does it hear? Ha! Look. Did you see that? It blinked. The head jerked. It hears. It's aware of sound. Does it feel pain? Don't, Victor. It's not an animal. You formed it like a man. Give it the dignity of one. I won't let you do that to it. I've gone this far, James. Put down the scalpel. What are you going to prove by that? I think you must be mad. I don't interfere with your work, James. Why? There's someone at the door. Yes. I think I'd better strap it down on the table. Don't forget your promise, will you? I'm sorry I gave my word. I'm sorry you ever told me about this. I feel I'm as guilty as you are now. Well, whatever took you so long? Hello, James. Oh. Hello, Elizabeth. Darling, I tried to call from the station, but the line's out of order. Oh, I'm sorry, dear. Did you have a nice time? Lovely. Everybody sends their love. That's good. <laughs> what have you two been up to? How's Mary, James? Oh, very well, thank you. <laughs> what a fine pair of sober sides you are. What did you do, darling? Break one of my good dishes? I knew I shouldn't have left you alone. Well, what are we standing in the hall for? Let's go with the Elizabeth, uh, 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 I must be going. Mary will be wondering, particularly if the phone's out of order. It's raining very hard. No, no, I'll be all right. You take an umbrella. There's one in the kitchen. Are you going to tell her? No. If you won't unstrap it from the table, will you? Not yet. All right, I'll try to come back later. I want to think. About what? You've changed since you came to see me this afternoon. You really don't care what I think now, do you? I suppose not. Thanks anyway, James. Are you going to let it live? That's funny from you. Have I the right to kill it? You've already done something you had no right to do. 
Something that you don't even understand. The creation of man isn't your job, it isn't mine. Oh, I know your bright scientific mind's laughing Here's at me. Here's the umbrella, James. But I wish you'd wait until the storm blows over. No, I, I really must get back. Thank you, Elizabeth. I'll, I'll return it tomorrow. Uh, goodbye. Well, what's the matter with him? Have you been arguing religion again, Victor? No, dear. Look, I'm doing a little work in the lab. It's rather important. Do you mind? What is going on, Victor? There's something. No, dear, nothing at all. There isn't. I know there is. What's the matter? Nothing, dear, really. I, I've got to get back to work now. Sit down. Do you hear me? Come here and sit down. Come here. No, don't touch that. No, stop it. Stop it. Put it down. to call. 
call the police. No, go shoot her. I don't want that. It's just frightened, that's all. Oh, being a fool, Victor. Do you realize what it means? That thing roaming about the country? What about the children, everybody in the village? I'm going to get the police. No, please, James. Give me a chance to find it first. Then what? You do a few more experiments, give it speech, perhaps, and it happens again. It's mine. I made it. I'm not thinking of that now. It's Mary and your wife. We don't even know where it is. If it wants to kill, how do you know where it will start? All right. Just give me an hour. Let me try to find it before we call the police. If I do, I'll take it back and destroy it myself. Do you give me your word? Yes. All right. I'll go with you. Thanks, James. I'll get my rifle. Do you have a gun? Yes. But I'm not going to use it unless it... Yes, unless... That's why I'll take mine. Shan't be marked. It's getting dark. Where do you think it might have gone? It's hard to tell. It's afraid of thunder. It might be hiding in the barn. The old Hamilton place? Yeah. How are you going to capture it? Have you thought of that? I brought along a hypodermic. You're not afraid anymore, are you? No. That's strange, because I am. Not of what it might do to me, but because of the fact that I've seen it. I I know it exists. There's the barn. If it's in there, there's no way out the back way. It was boarded up, wasn't it? Yes. I'll go in. Wait out here, will you? No, I'm coming with you. No. If it's in there, if it tries to escape... Shoot it as it comes out. Oh, don't take the chance. It won't let you get near. I'm going to try. Thanks, James. I lied. I'm afraid. He was in here hiding, waiting for me. I'm afraid. I should have destroyed it. James was right. What's the matter with this flashlight? Too wet. Ah, that's better. What's that? In the corner. It's going to be all right. You'll hardly feel this. It won't hurt. I might have hit it. I don't know. It's gone. Yes, are you? Victor. Victor. Oh, Victor. He never recovered consciousness again. Outside, I looked for the thing I'd shot at. But there was no sign of it. I returned to the lab and burnt every paper, destroyed every single evidence of Victor Frankenstein's terrible experiment. But the result of that experiment has never been found. Nor have I been able yet to convince the authorities that such a thing ever existed. Presented by Autolite, tonight's star, Mr. Herbert Marshall. This is Harlow Wilcox speaking for Autolite, world's largest independent manufacturer of automotive electrical equipment. 
Autolite is proud to serve the greatest names in the industry. They are members of the Autolite family, as well as other 98,000 Autolite distributors and dealers in the United States and thousands more in Canada and throughout the world. Our family also includes the nearly 30,000 men and women in 28 great Autolite plants from coast to coast and Autolite plants in many foreign countries, as well as the 18,000 people who have invested a portion of their savings in Autolite. Every Autolite product is backed by constant research and precision built to the highest standards of quality and performance. So remember, from bumper to taillight, you're always right with Autolite. Next week, a story based on fact, terrifying in its truth. The dramatic report of a man returning home to find he now lives in a frightened city. Our star, Mr. Frank Lovejoy. The program will be heard on Suspense. Tonight's story was adapted for Suspense by Anthony Ellis. Suspense is transcribed and directed by Elliot Lewis. Music was written by Lucian Morlick and conducted... The Columbia Workshop presents Wake Up and Die, a psychological drama of married life written by John K. Lagerman and featuring Frank Lovejoy and Elsa Mae Gordon in the principal roles. Wake Up and Die is Mr. Lagerman's first radio script, although he has written extensively for other media. We now present Wake Up and Die. of torture known to mankind, the most common is self-inflicted. It's the mechanical annihilation of sleep, accomplished by an intricate device known as the alarm clock. Every weekday morning from as early as three and four to as late as nine and ten, approximately 15 million alarm clocks perform major operations on some 20 million Americans. The instruments are of many types. Some of them cut through sleep with the suave urgency of a knife-slicing cantaloupe. Oh, another day, another dollar. Other instruments call up a picture of a cheerful sadist, whistling gaily as he jabs pins in his victim. Head. Will that thing never run down? Where's my mule? Oh. Alarm clocks come in many guises, and various are their ways. But the great majority still employ the same old methods. Comparable in military tactics to the barrage of shrapnel. The instrument which we hear now is the repeater type. It rests on a dressing table in the bedroom of Mr. and Mrs. George Blossom. They're both somewhere in the early 30s. They have a fairly comfortable place here, in a spring mattress and all. The furniture is matched, painted to resemble the natural wood. The bureau seems to be given over to Mr. Blossom. One of the top drawers has a firm bite on the cuffs of his trousers. The alarm is still ringing, no more weekly now. A bowl of artificial nasturtiums has been arranged on the telephone stand near the window. The... Uh-huh, Mr. Blossom, through the blue monotone of his dream, has heard the alarm. His mouth opens, his lips move silently, his stirs... His quick, Margie, Margie, get off the track. Margie, quick, there it comes. It's fine. Look out, look out. Ah, Margie, poor little Margie, run down by the locomotive. 
finest, sweetest little wife a man ever had. What are you... What goes on anyway? Gee, I... <laughs> thought you were hit by an express train. It was the alarm, you sap. You're dreaming. Express train. I think you'd gone nuts or something. Waking me up with that kind of thought. Happened just a little too often lately to laugh at all. Voice goes through me like the sound she makes oh, filing her nails. A, a busy like sound. That. Your own mother told me once she used to worry about you as a child. Afraid you might take after the old man, I guess. Uh, well, you know what your boss McGuire told you the last time you were late. After all, you know, jobs don't grow. On and on and on and on she goes. And where she stops, just pull the covers over my head. So, now get that tune straight. The one I'm always going to write. And it won't do you any good to bury your head in the covers. I can take just so much and no more. Voice. Wrong edge of a musical You should have floor. known when you married me that you couldn't get by with it forever. Oh. Take my hand and skip with me, Margie. Margie. It's a good tune. I should have been a songwriter. Not tied down to the desk that way. None of your lip, Mr. McGuire. Hit tune. Million dollars. Worth a million. Nice fellow, though. Democratic. Wrote that song that goes, Margie. Da, 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 da. I'm always thinking of you, Ma. Gee, did I compose that, too? Oh, what a guy I am. Why, they were playing that on the Sandy Hook steamer. Da, 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 da. Yeah, that's it, all right. Moonlight excursion, rain or shine. Free show, free dance. Six bits a head, dollar a couple. An accompanied girl's free. Oh, that's some dance floor. Get in that stag line, boy, and look him over. Let him see you. Don't smile, you dope. Look bored. Oh, gee, that's some swell dance with that little one in the fluffy pink. Well, she might take on weight later on. That's Marge. Only I don't know it yet. Oh, boy, she's cute. Wonder what she's like. Wonder what's her name. Wonder if she let me cut in. I dance around this way. Oh, some baby. Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. Cut in now. Go on, go on. She ain't the Queen of Sheba. Pardon me, miss. May I? Oh, gee. Nice. Smooth. See, she's some girl. She's darker than that. Let's get away from this noise. Just out the door and up the stairways. Top deck. Get through this door and we're on deck. Look, we're almost back, we are. Oh, come on, Marge. One kiss won't hurt you. No, no. You know how I feel about you. No, no, Georgie. Somebody might see us. Well, what if they do? <laughs> Who cares? Look, straight up. Shooting star. Where? There. Oh. Georgie, you... You're so romantic, aren't you? <laughs> you got lipstick all over your face. Oh. <laughs> Oh, no, Marge, you mustn't laugh. Where are you? Listen, Marge, I love you. Marge, that's nothing to laugh about. Can you hear me? I want to marry you. Take care of me. Please don't laugh, Marge. This is important. Can't you hear me? We'll have a home, kids, and a way of life. Marge, where are you? We're going to stand for something, see? You and I, hand in hand, two against the world, Marge. Look at me, you little fool. Open your eyes and look at me. Margie, don't look at me like that. What's happened? She's not Margie. Where's Margie? She was young. She wore a fluffy pink dress. We were on a boat and we were in love and now she's gone. Margie's gone and now you're Margie. You! No, she can't do this to me. She can't change like this. She knew all the time and she let me go on. She all the time in that fluffy pink dress. She, she, she. Open your eyes, I tell you. Wake up. 
scare a person to death, shaking that way in your sleep, yelping, making faces like you're having a nightmare? Oh, sure. Sure, I'm getting up. There's uh, plenty of time, plenty of time. Don't worry your little head. See, I... I'm awake now. Oh, up on the elbows, man. You see, Margie? Oh, that's it, easy, man. Plenty of time. Hold it there. Two little seconds. Three little seconds. Each little second. Lousy day. Sour, vinegary light. Bad breath of day is blowing in the window. Everybody has a bad day today. Millions and millions of bad days today. Another yawn coming. Hold it, man. Need more strength. My wind's bad. Can't take it like I used to. The one time I swam a river on a dare. Time clown. Washington Monument with Mars. Postcards. Nation's capital. Wonderful experience. Educational. <laughs> Good old Margie. So sure of herself in sleep. Holding her mouth funny and stiff like when she's mad and she doesn't know what it's all about. But sure thing. Set of her mouth. Roses red, violets blue. Huh, Marge? Starved fever, feed cold. Right, Marge? <laughs> Good old Marge. Ain't she the one? Have to kid her along. I've outgrown her, I guess. I always know just what to expect and what she'll say. Georgie, this has gone far enough. Yes, there he is, asleep again. Snoring. Big, lazy lump. Well, I might as well sleep a while longer myself. Nothing I can do. Fine, ambitious guy I picked for a husband. Night he cut in on Sandy Hook excursion boat. All hot and damp and wilted. Had it all figured out, he did. Always knows what he wants before he feels like it. And me so tired, shop working all day, and no word from. Don't think his name, or you'll begin thinking about him. Wonder what he's doing now. If he remembers anything. He jilted me. Wasn't at the pier, so I went alone. Along comes Georgie. He'll do, he'll do. Cutting in and right away hot-footing it for the deck. Carrying hook, line, and sinker. Shooting star. Him and his shooting stars. Romantic. Like runs in a stocking. Him fussing around. Scared to death of me and hating me for it. And kissing me on a dare with himself. Good old Margie, yeah. But how about me? How about me, myself? Me, not you. Not just anybody, but me, me, Margie Anderson. That was so long ago. 2244 and a half East Bedford Street. Two-family house. Fine corner location. Just above all night delicatessen. Neon sign through the front window. Sure, sure. Just like moonlight, you said. Let's turn off the lights and let the moonlight in. Red moonlight coming in the window upside down from the street. I get it. You couldn't see me in that light. It was fine that way, wasn't it? You could talk to yourself that way. Make love to yourself. Me sitting there waiting, waiting, thinking you'll snap out of it, poor sap. <laughs> I can just hear oh, you. Oh, gee, honey, you're beautiful tonight. I don't mean that you're not always beautiful. I just mean that, <laughs> you know... Got a little surprise for you tonight, honey. I bet you can't get. I uh, just bet. Candy. The kind you like. Or flowers. Yeah, flowers. Those flowers are really something. I always figure it's not the cost, but the feeling that's behind a gift that counts. How about a little kiss? Proletarian orchids from the subway entrance. Thirty-five cents a bunch at the outside. Well, flowers are flowers, aren't they, Georgie? Even if they smell of the BMT. You can always kid yourself you're giving the little woman a break. It's the little things, I always say, that count with a woman. Now, you take my wife. And here you are, without all those little things. Here you lie, as God made you. Without your hair slick, without your two pants suit, without your comic strip smart talk, without all the little gestures, like picking your back teeth with your little finger, 
or your imitation of your pal Jeff Hadley's way of laughing through his snarl. <laughs> what a man. And this is my husband. This is my life. Well, for better or worse, Marge, as the justice of the peace just said, we're hitched, Margie. Gee, we're really married. Really married? That was ten years ago when it happened. I said to myself, now that we're married, things will be different. Then the months and the years began to march by. January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December, January, February, March. George is kind of slow on the uptake, but when we move into a place of our own, we'll be all set. October, November, December. We don't seem to be getting much of any place. Other than I guess it's it's really this depression. When prosperity comes again. May, June, July, August, September, October, November. It takes a long time for people to adjust themselves, I guess. Maybe by next year. Maybe tomorrow. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Before we're 30, something's sure to break for us. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Maybe, maybe if we had a child. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. I'm getting old, getting gray hair and wrinkles. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. If I could only look younger. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Tomorrow, 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 tomorrow. Too late. Too late. That's a woman for you. Always fussing around with her face and worrying about fat. I had a voice once. People said I looked like Joan Crawford. Said I should go into the movies. <laughs> what a laugh. I had brains, too. Could have learned shorthand. Waited around a while. Could have been a nurse. People needing me. Really needing me. Marge, Marge, darling, I need you. Instead, I got that. Sure, sure, you need me. Like you need a street address. Like you need a mirror to shave by. A tune you can whistle in the dark. Yeah, sure, you need me. And I'm sick and fed up with it. Good old Marge. I'm sick and fed up with it, I tell you. Your everlasting procrastination. Other men have jobs and have to get up. You think you're any better than they are? Who do you think you are, anyway? Yes, who do you think you are? Go on, go on, Marge, go on, go on. Who do I think I am, anyway? Who am I, anyway? I am I. With the pie in the sky, I am I till the day I die. I am... Who? Who? Well, who are you? Speak up, man. Tell the jury your name. Why, it's George Blossom. What have I done? Why am I here in court? Why does everybody look at me as though I'd committed a crime? You'll have a fair trial, my boy. And may God help you when the jury delivers its verdict. This is your attorney appointed by the court. Why, it's Marge. What are you doing here, Marge, dressed up like that? You're supposed to be home waiting for me to get back from the office. Why don't you answer me? Oh, come on, Marge. Take off those horn-rimmed glasses and tell these people who you are. Tell them that this is all a joke. This is no joke, as you will soon discover, George Blossom. This court is convened to discover who you are, or if you are anybody at all. I am your defense attorney. Your fate is in my hands. See that you show the proper respect for counsel. The defendant will now take the witness chair. Okay, Your Honor. There. But, Your Honor, can't you tell the jury not to look at me like that? Can't they just act natural? Gentlemen, you needn't stare at me. You know me. Can't you smile? Can't you give me any sign? You there, you're my boss, McGuire. I work for you. I see you every day. Well, maybe I'm late once in a while, but that's human, isn't it? And you, you're my dentist. We're all friends. It's true, I owe you a little money. And you there. That's Jeff Hadley, an old friend of mine, a real sidekick. 
Judge, you'd die if you could hear some of the scrapes we've been through together. We're both married now and settled down, but we're still buddies, though. See one another every week, play bridge for a tenth of a cent a point. The witnesses appeal to the jury is out of order and useless, too, since all the gentlemen in question are stone deaf. Counsel will now proceed with the examination of the witness. Who are you? Why, I... Who are you? I am George. I'm 32 years old. I am employed by... Who are you? Yes, who are you? Yes, yes, yes. Who? Is the witness? Who is he? 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 Who I'm an American. I was born in the city. My parents were Americans. I drink a little now and then, but I'm not what you call a tippler. I go to the movies once in a while. For relaxation, I play golf when I can. I sing a fair tenor. I swim a little. I'm a Protestant, although my grandmother on my mother's side was a Catholic. But I'm as good as the next fellow. I'm a citizen and a taxpayer. I voted the Republican ticket in 1936. You yourself, George. Margie, Margie, don't let him do it. Margie, Margie, Margie. Yes, yes, stop grabbing at me. Let you tear all the covers off? What is it? What's the matter? Oh, nothing. Nothing. I must have dropped off to sleep again. Getting up now, I can't stay in bed forever. Just two minutes. All right, all right, Marge. I'll be getting up now. I can be out of here in less than ten minutes. I, I just remember, Georgie. We're going to the Hadley's tonight. All right, Marge, we'll go. We'll go to the Hadley's. Sure, we'll go. We won't get into that old argument again. If I could only talk straight to her. If I could only say no, 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 no. We're fed up with the Hadleys just as the Hadleys are fed up with us. We're fed up to the teeth with this apartment, the city, the way of life, and each other. If I could only break it off. This job, this routine, this getting up to nothing, coming back to nothing. If we could only come out with it. But the lie has gone too far. We can't break it. It's our life together now. We both know it's a lie, but we can't say it. I used to plot ways of doing it. I'd suggest doing screwy things in the hope it would come out. Like getting drunk together. I can just hear myself telling Marge last week. Well, boys, it's Friday night. We've got two whole days to kill. Two whole days with no office hours. I suppose you and I act like a couple of young squirts, do we, huh? Suppose you put on that little, that low neck number, and I'll get into a boiled shirt and we'll have ourselves a time. Maybe spend a little money and get a little tight and act a little fool in front. What do you say, though? Oh, I don't know, George. Could we do it some other night? Where would we go, anyway, all by ourselves? Anywhere, everywhere. And why shouldn't we go by ourselves? The town's ours. If we feel like taking it. We deserve a little spree every once in a while. Don't oh, Georgie, so? you do get the craziest ideas. All of a sudden, you want to do something. Besides, I haven't got anything to wear. My one evening dress is way out of date. My hair isn't fixed. Oh, I'd look like the rest. Now, you'll look swell. I remember that dress. It's my favorite. Your hair looks fine. What's the matter? Besides, Georgie, there's the question of money. I really can't afford it. We haven't paid our laundry bill or the dry cleaning bill for a month. The rent's coming due. All right, all right. Forget it. Forget it. It was just one of my crazy ideas. All my ideas are crazy according to you. But George! Forget it, I said. I'm going out. I'll take a walk around the block or something. I'll see you later. And I'd go up. When I got back, she might be there. She might not. Sometimes after a fight... Stay out very late, seeing a movie over and over and over and over again. I guess it used to drive me nuts. When we made up, I'd go overboard on the soft side. Oh, gee, Margie, you're a sweet one. Oh, I guess I made things pretty tough for you at times, but I've got a terrible heel, Margie. Oh, none of that now, Georgie. Go on away. I don't feel like it now. But honest, I mean it, Margie. Where would I be without you? What would I have to live for? Nothing at all. I wouldn't want to go on without you. I know I don't deserve you, Mark. Oh, don't be silly, George. Cut it. Cut it. Something always got in our way. Attitudes got in our way. We could never think up any of our own. There were the attitudes we picked up from everywhere. The movies, feature sections of the newspapers, comedy programs, and the radio. 
childhood playing his popular song, Advertisement. The attitudes never really belong to us at all. If she ever came out with one idea of her own, I'd fall over backwards. She's still scared to death I may someday get an original idea and stick to it. Like staying right here and letting all this pass by. She don't have to worry. I only get those ideas and my sleep will be awake soon. I'll get up soon and I'll feed myself into the revolving day. She doesn't have to worry, but she is worrying, isn't she? She's worried about my being late, my losing my job, my saying the heck with a whole lying mess and starting over again. Well, I'm still lying here. She's overdue on her next line. She's gone back to sleep and forgotten her lines. I count ten, and if she hasn't spoken, I'd better wait. One, two. Wants coaxing, he does. Getting a big kick out of this. Thinks he's tantalizing me. Going to give the little woman a scare, I suppose. Lying there, holding back that silly grin on that little mussed up face of his. Makes him feel like a big shot, doesn't it? Holding his eyes closed. Sure he knows just what I'll do next. Ain't he the big-hearted Joe? What a man. Kicked around all day in a two-for-a-nickel job. Taking orders, licking boots, gossiping in whispers. Huh. No wonder by five o'clock his ego's punch drunk. No wonder when he gets home he can't look at me. He's got that fishy glaze over his eyes. Got to get the old ego fixed up first. Yeah, a couple of drinks helps that. Poor little wise guy. Let him have his fun, enjoy his little joke. I'll come across once more. Get up now, Georgie. This has gotten beyond the fooling stage, and you've got to you've got to hop on it. Come on, look at the clock. I don't want to have to tell you again. I don't want to have to tell you again. She said it, and I haven't budged. I haven't budged. Not yet, anyway. And it's late. It'll soon be too late. What if I didn't move at all? What if I just lay here until it was too late? Well, I'd lose my job. Then what? Oh, he doesn't get up. Keeps his eyes closed. He's not asleep, though. I know him. Ah, I know him so well. It's awful to know a man so well that even his reasons for being alive seem like stale memories of something that might have been. Something you don't even want anymore. That's the way I know Georgie. Yet he hasn't gotten up. He knows it's late. Later than it's ever been. Maybe he's suddenly got the guts to say no. Maybe there's something in him that I don't know to death. Maybe he is somebody. Somebody stubborn and alive. Somebody they can't kick around forever. Somebody I could hold on to. Maybe. Later, 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 later. I can hear the clock every tick of it that makes it harder to lie here. Every ticket that brings me closer to the guy inside of me. The guy that can say yes or no. The guy that can look around and watch the sun come up and go down. See all that's going on in the world. The fighting, the living, the dying. And see all that goes on in the world and then say to himself, I'm the guy that this is all about. I can feel that guy inside of me. If I could be him... This guy, if I could be him, I'd just lie here and let the clock tick and don't move and don't say anything and don't think and don't move. Time will go on by itself. The whole thing will go on by itself and I'll be free of it. I can just hold on. It's getting late. Late. Too late to be late, too late to be Georgie, too late to be anybody but me. My job must be gone by now at the office, they'll think of I don't care what they think. Don't. Keep quiet, that's it. Silence in your mind. Room to be yourself. You can hear Margie breathing and she'll be wondering. Just hold on to yourself now. Shut the rest out. Let it pass. Quiet. Quiet, that's it. There's room now in my head for this guy the world is all about. Just a little while now. Quiet. Quiet. Hello. Oh, 
Mr. McGuire. Oh, yes, yes, this is he, yes. Yes, sir, okay, right away, sir. I overslept, sir. Yes, sir, I'm sorry, sir, but yes, sir, yes, sir. You've been listening to the Columbia Workshop presentation of Wake Up and Die by John K. Lagerman, a writer new to radio. The role of Georgie was played by Frank Lovejoy and that of Margie by Elsie May Gordon. Lynn Murray composed and conducted the musical score, and special choric effects were arranged by Norman Corwin, under whose direction the program was produced. Next week, the Columbia Workshop will bring you another new name to its series, Arthur Miller. Mr. Miller has dramatized the story of William Ireland, the notorious Shakespeare forger of the past century. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. of the eerie, weird, blood-chilling tales told by old Nancy, the witch of Salem, and Satan, her wise black cat. They are waiting, waiting for you, now. Two-year-old I be today. Yes, sir. A hundred and twenty-two year old. <laughs> well, Satan, tell everyone to douse their lights. That's it. We want lots of darkness when we tell our bedtime stories. <laughs> now, draw up to the fire and gaze into the embers. Gaze into them deep. And soon by the light of the moon and the stars... You'll see a barren stretch of land where two roads meet in old Massachusetts state. Three policemen stand a-talking there beside their motorcycle mics. And soon you'll hear the story of the haunted crossroads. <laughs> the haunted crossroads. <laughs> Sure you're not scared to have us leave you here alone, Tom? <laughs> of course he's scared, Sergeant. <laughs> Look at his knees shaking. <laughs> I'll probably yell for help the minute you guys get out of his sight. <laughs> <laughs> sure, Gene. I don't think he is properly frightened. <laughs> I guess not. <laughs> well, if he sees any spooks, he can't say we haven't warned him. <laughs> Seriously, boy, you'll keep your eyes peeled for other things than ghosts on this patrol. You bet I will, Uncle Pat. And I hope it's my luck to have the skunk who knocked up Smith and Barclay here start something with me. <laughs> well, I hardly think that'll happen. Those killings weren't done by the same man. They were both stabbed in the back by the same way. Oh, well, that doesn't prove anything. Several fellows were stabbed to death here right after the Civil War. And another about 20 years ago, according to all records. It wasn't the same murderer who got them and two cops of our troop. <laughs> well, unless you believe the crazy stories about this place being haunted. Well, yeah. I must be riding back to troop headquarters for Captain Elton risking in the height of it. And you, Gina Hardy, you better be after getting on your patrol. Well, I'll get the old bike moving. <laughs> oh, uh, when you get home in the morning, Tom, remind your sister she's got a movie date with me tomorrow night. <laughs> Kathleen's not apt to forget any date she has with you. Trooper Hardy, your job at the moment is to keep your eye peeled for speeders and reckless drivers. <laughs> well, I'll try to remember that, Sarge. Well, good night. Good night, Gene. Good night, boy. Kathleen, the morning, the day, 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 day. What the? Tom! I'm coming back, kid! Coming back! I'm coming, Sarge! Sarge! What is it? What has happened? I'm here! What happened? Tom! Yes. He's dead. He can't be dead. We just left him. I started right after you rode away. Then then I heard him yelling, Oh, merciful God, I raised that boy. He, he was like my own son. He's been stabbed in the back. 
people? Just as Smith was stabbed a week ago in Barclay. Here, here at these days, same rotten crossroads. Now pull yourself together, Sarge. Oh, God. You know what I thought of, Tom. But we're cops. Listen, you were back here before I did. You must have seen I who... saw no more than you see now. Whoever did it got away. And take, take it easy. Away. Take it easy. Tom wasn't alone here more than a minute. No one could have gotten to him across these open fields and then away again between the time I left and come back. Yet I saw no one but him and you. <laughs> what was that? A woman's laugh. A woman's laugh. You hear it too? It sounded here, beside me. Right here beside us, at, at my very elbow. Yet no one's here. But we can see. <laughs> Invisible woman. That's the craziest part of your whole crazy story. But we did hear it, Captain Elton. It's true, so help me. But there wasn't any woman, by your own confession. You said you searched and couldn't find her. We looked everywhere around, sir. But there's no place there for anyone to hide. And like the hicks around here, you come to the conclusion those old crossroads are haunted. A female ghost stabbed Tom Fallon with a very ungodly steel knife, I suppose. Which he carried away with her because you couldn't find it either. That's a fine way for two policemen to explain a murder. We're only telling you what really happened. But it couldn't have happened. Just the same it did. Now, look here, sir. Tom Fallon was my closest friend. I'm engaged to marry his sister. And Sergeant McGee here is his uncle. You don't think we'd lie to you when Tom's dead body lies out there in the squad room? He was like me own son. Oh, here, Sergeant Pat. Sit down. I'm sorry I have to pound at you like this. But Tom is the second of the two that has been killed inside a week. At the same place. In the same way. And last year, we found Barkley dead there. Three policemen stabbed to death, and we haven't a single lead to the rat who did it. You think the same person killed them all, sir? Yes, and that person's a man, not a laughing, invisible woman. A man was strength enough to kill with a single blow. Hardy, you say Fallon wasn't out of your sight for more than a few minutes before you heard him scream. Well, I'd only passed the first turn south of the crossroads, sir. A minute and a half at most. And you got back to him in about half that time. How about you, Sergeant McGee? I... I left Tom right after Trooper Halley rode away, sir, and headed north. Mm. And neither of you saw any vehicles approaching from the east or west, nor past any? No, sir. There was no traffic at all. Then, in the 70 or 80 seconds that Fallon was alone, someone ran across that completely open space, drove a knife into Tom Fallon's back, and then ran away again. It's crazy, but that's the way it must have happened. It's the only way it could have happened. It didn't happen! It's impossible! The world's greatest sprinter couldn't have covered the necessary distance in that short time. And a running man must make a little noise... Yet Fallon saw and heard nothing until a knife was in his back. You're lying to me, both of you. By the Lord, if I didn't know how close you were to the boy, I'd say you bumped him off yourself. Captain L. Don't say that. Don't. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I don't mean that, of course. But unless you fellas change your story, the coroner's jury is going to ask some mighty embarrassing questions. You've established yourselves as the only persons in the vicinity who could have come close enough to Fallon. No one's going to think we had anything to do with this when they recollect those other killings at the crossroads. Even if they won't believe we heard that woman laugh. You've forgotten, Captain, that Tom is the third to die out there. By the same man's hand, you say. Last week when Smith was killed, Sergeant McGee and I were on duty with you in this station from the time Smith left here until his body was found. And when Barclay got here a year ago... Then, George, you and I were up in Maine, Torrid, to, to, doing some fishing. To, don't you remember? And Jean here. And I was serving a motorcycle escort for the governor. Now, no one will question that alibi. Yeah, you're right. But if you've told me the truth about tonight, what's the answer? I didn't have to listen to such a nutty yarn about Smith's and Barclay's murders. For no one was near him when it happened. They'd been dead for hours when found. Oh, excuse me, boys. The things I've said... If I don't find someone to pin these stabbings on pretty soon, I'll be believing those damn crossroads are haunted. That's all. Just a minute. Come. Miss Fallon is here, sir. Bring her in. Yes, sir. Does she know her brother is... No. I telephoned her to come down here. That's all. You'd better break the news, Pat. You're her uncle. No. No, not me. I, I can't even see her, now. Let me out this other door before she... Quiet, here she is. Captain Elton, why did you telephone me to come down here? Jean, Uncle Pat, why are you here? What's wrong? Let me out of here, let me out. Uncle Pat, it's Tom. Something happened to Tom. Don't look at me. I don't know anything about it. Kathleen, dear. Miss Fallon. Tom was posted at the crossroads tonight. He's been killed there, like the others. Yes. Your brother is... Tom. 
Oh, Tom. Dearest Kathleen. Let me out of here or let me out. Oh, Pat. I can't bear to hear her cry like that. I can't bear to have her eyes upon me. She has eyes like Tom, and they accuse me. They accuse me. Accuse me? Accuse me? God, I swear I didn't mean to kill him. Sergeant. you? Yes, I killed him. I I didn't tell you the truth. I never left him at his post at all. I killed the boy I loved because something from the blackest hell got into me. I stabbed a knife into his back because I couldn't help myself. I was made to do it, made to do it. No, I'll pay for what I've done. Don't let him get his gun. <laughs> He shot himself. Uncle Pat! He's dead. Tom Fallon's murderer has just killed himself. He stabbed my brother. Oh, no. No, he couldn't. You heard what he said, Miss Fallon. But who killed Smith and Barclay? McGee couldn't have done that. No. Why did he say he couldn't help himself? That he was made to kill his nephew? And what was the meaning of that woman's laugh I heard? You can put away your gun. But I'm glad to know you're being so careful here. Why drive away out here at this hour, honey? Oh, I couldn't sleep knowing you were posted alone at these crossroads tonight. Dear, I told you not to worry. A troop has been posted alone here every night for three weeks now. Ever since poor Tom was killed. And nothing's happened. You think there's no danger here anymore? Now that Uncle Pat's dead? Look, you mustn't stop thinking about him now. Well, it's rather difficult not to think about him. I'll never understand why... He was out of his mind. That's the only explanation. But what drove him out of his mind? What could have made him destroy someone he loved? As we know, he loved Tom. And he said he was made to do it. Uh, I don't know. Jean, you're all I have left. If anything should happen to you now... Oh, well, I... nothing's going to hurt me, dear. Come on, get a hold of yourself, sweetheart. But Uncle Pat had nothing to do with the other deaths here. He was miles away when Smith and Barclay were stabbed. Jean, maybe this place is haunted. Oh, you don't believe that stuff any more than I do. You're just all upset and... Uh, here... I'm going to disobey all standard orders of the state police and join you in this car for a little roadside parking. <laughs> oh, no, don't get in. I'd rather get out and walk a bit. Mm-hmm. I've never been out here before, you know. At night, I mean. Yeah, and you shouldn't be here now. Fine thing, driving this deserted old road at midnight. Have you got that little gun I gave you? Oh, yes, I always carry it when I drive alone. Ah, that's good. Well, come on, then, if you want to walk. Jean, exactly where did you find Tom's body and Uncle Pat kneeling beside us? We're not going to talk any more about that. Oh, all right really wouldn't do me any good to know. It's such a gloomy spot here. No cars passing, no road lamps. Eh, These are just old county roads. No state trooper had to patrol here regularly until the... Until after Frank Barclay was found stabbed here. Oh, Kathleen. I want to talk about it, Jean. I loved Uncle Pat. He was a good man, not a killer or a maniac. And I've got to find out what made him do the thing he did. Find out what made him say he couldn't help himself. Uncle Pat was in Maine when Frank Barclay was killed. Tell me about that. Well, all I know is that Barclay didn't report on schedule. When they found him, he'd been dead for several hours. And then Smith, just a week before Tom. Like Barclay, he'd been dead for a long time when found. But Uncle Pat couldn't have done it. Oh, he wasn't out of my sight, and that of a dozen others at any time that night. Well, after that, Captain Elton made this a fixed post. Oh, I can't understand it. Neither can anyone else. And 70 years ago, the papers say, a town constable was stabbed here, and another constable about the time when we were children. That makes five. All policemen. Ah, it's screwy, all right. But you mustn't think about it anymore, dear. And look, don't worry about me. Look around here. There's nothing but open spaces, sand and grass, and two level hard dirt roads. Why, there isn't a bush or stone big enough for a cat to hide behind, let alone a man with a knife. No one could come close to you here, except someone you knew and trusted. As Uncle Pat was trusted by Tom. As you trust me. (laughs) That's enough nonsense now. Go home, go to bed, and sleep. Yes, and keep that little automatic of yours handy on the way. Night driving's no business for a woman. I wish you'd let me stay. Not a chance. Do you want me to lose my job? That's what happens to cops who entertain ladies during business hours. But it's so gloomy here. So silent and eerie. It it looks like a haunted place. Oh, bunk. (laughs) Here, give me a kiss and say goodnight. Oh, Jean, I can't lose you. You're not going to. I'm safer here than I'd be in a church. (laughs) What was that? A woman laughing. 
That's what I heard the other night. But there... A woman's in the road. She wasn't there a moment ago. How... I'll soon find out. Jean, come back here. Just stay in the car, Kathleen. You in the black dress. I want to talk to you. No, don't follow her, Jean. Come back. Wait, I tell you, whoever you are. Don't walk away from me. I'm an officer don't of the law. Don't go any closer to her. Stop. Don't let her touch you, Jean. Keep away. She disappeared. She vanished as I watched her. Oh, where did she go to? Come back here, Jean. Come back. Come back. I'm coming. What happened to that woman? I'm coming. Jean, what happened to you? I've got to do it. Why do you stare at me like that? Got to do it. Got to do it. Why are you opening that pocket knife? I can't help myself. Can't help oh. myself. You look as though you didn't know me. As though I'm someone you hate. Jean, I'm Kathleen. You love me. Kathleen. Love. Uh, don't come any closer. Keep away. Kathleen. Love. Your gun, Kathleen. Shoot me before I reach you. Shoot me. It's the only way to stop me, but I, I can't help myself. No, no. Yes, shoot me or I'll kill you with this knife. Oh, you're mad. <laughs> shoot. Shoot, I say, before I drive this knife into your back. Oh, may God forgive me. It's the only way. I... Oh. I've shot you, Jean. I've shot you. <laughs> oh, she's here beside me. The woman in black. Oh, keep away. Keep away. Keep away. <laughs> Come on, Miss Fallon. I want to hear more about this woman who laughed. This ghost. Oh, please, please don't ask me any more questions now. I'll go up to that operating room again, Captain Nelson. Make sure that Gene's going to live. I only shot him to stop him. Mm, you stopped him, all right. Oh, here's a doctor at last. Oh, doctor. It's all right, Miss Fallon. We've taken the bullet out of Trooper Hardy's shoulder, and he'll be up and around again in just a few days. Oh, thank God. Thank God. And also, Gene, stop constitution. Now, let's hope your mind. Will you please tell me exactly what happened at the crossroads tonight? I'll answer all your questions now. What I've already heard has been has made me very curious. Sit down, Doc. It's your office and your hospital. Go ahead, Miss Fallon. Let's hear all about that laughing, appearing, and disappearing woman. If I were you, Captain, I'd uh, withhold my judgment a while. The trooper Hardy has been babbling about the phantom woman under the ether. Under ether, people don't uh, lie. He's been repeating over and over that he couldn't help himself. He couldn't. Some way, somehow, she made him want to kill me. But he loved me. That love was stronger than her power. He had time to warn me. So you obligingly shot him? Yes. Then the woman reappeared again. Yes, beside me. And she laughed. She laughed horribly. And then, as I looked at her, she just wasn't there. A woman uh, dressed in black, you say? Yes. A dress all folds. It might have been a, a shroud. And her face was like, like the dead. But with an awful purplish tinge as if she'd been strangled. And around her throat there was a heavy rope that dangled to the ground. Oh, good, I'll see her till the day I die. I don't believe in ghosts. You just shot one of my troopers. I don't care if you were engaged to marry him. I don't... That's enough, Captain. Oh, what? I'm boss inside the walls of this hospital. And this girl is in no physical condition to stand your third degree. Besides, I think she's telling the truth. The truth? Why not? We can't call a thing a lie simply because we don't understand it. And have you any better explanation than we've heard for the tragedy at those old crossroads? You don't think anything supernatural? I think something that has lived beyond the span of ordinary human life is responsible. Remember those almost forgotten cases the newspapers have searched out? The man who was stabbed there in 1865? That other chap in the early 1900s? One of the reporters told me they'd discovered several more crossroads stabbings in the records. A peace officer was killed there in Andy Jackson's time. And a member of the watch was stabbed when Washington was president. Oh, policeman. By Jove. I hadn't thought of it just in that light. Uh, Miss Fallon, you say the phantom woman had a rope round her neck? Yes, a thick rope tied with a heavy knot. A hangman's rope. And at the crossroads in the early days, criminals were hanged and buried. What's that got to do with it? Maybe a lot more than you think. Excuse me, Captain. Move a chair aside so that I can get to that bookcase. What? I want to find something. Something I've read and more than half forgotten. Mm. Policemen, officers of the law. They've been the only ones to die at those crossroads where a gallows tree once stood. Oh, that's a coincidence. Ah, but you must admit a strange coincidence. Ah, here's the book. An old history of this county. History? Mm. Ah, here it is. 
I knew I read it somewhere. Look. What is it, Doctor? I'll read it to you. Listen. On that 13th day of August, 1721, by order of the king's governor, a gibbet of good stout oak had been erected at Berkeley Crossroads. That's the old name of our place, Captain Elton. Go on reading. And there the criminal, Goody Fairfax, was taken, still protesting her innocence of the foul crimes which had juried her peers. <laughs> Hold more tightly on her, Peter, so I can fix this rope round her scrawny neck. Let me go! Let me go! You cannot kill me! Ah, she wriggles like an ear. No, wait, no more time. Hard to the beam. Yeah. Oh, no, I have done no murder. Have mercy. I am innocent, I swear. You. Hey, you've had a fair trial, old dame, and been found guilty. Yeah. Yeah. And soon for your crime, you'll be buried in the soil of infamy, here beneath this gallows tree. Yeah. Hey! So all who pass makes spit upon your grave. I'm not proper dead, I won't. Ah, the rope's fast at last. All is ready, my lord sheriff. When you give the word. Quiet! Quiet! Our lord, the king's high sheriff, speak. Nay, I who am about to die this unjust death will speak. Hear me, ye officers of so-called justice, who have decreed this fate for me. As I die innocent of crime, I vow to return from death the murderer you to hang me for. As ye officers of blind law do visit death on me, so I shall visit death on you with no more sense of right or pity. You mean to bury me beneath this gibbet in unhallowed ground, away from God. Whilst I remain away from God, beware. Beware, I warn ye. For not even death will stay my hate. I shall return to bring ye death, ye officers of law. Bring her up. Pull on the rope. Aye. She goes. I shall return to bring your death. I shall return. And though still screaming her threats of ghostly vengeance, the murderous Goody Fairfax was hanged to death. Then the old account goes on. Her body was cut down from the gallows and buried underneath it at Berkeley Crossroads. The haunted crossroads. Uh, Captain Elton, whether or not you believe in ghosts, it might be a kindly thing if you search for Goody Fairfax's grave. And if you find it, to place her restless bones in hallowed ground. A kindly thing and a wise thing. <laughs> haven't got over it yet. There were human bones, a woman's bones, buried beneath those crossroads. I knew you'd find them if you only persisted in the search. Yeah, he persisted, all right, making us troopers do the digging with me on double shift. Ah, fine way to treat a man only a week out of hospital. And a newly married man. <laughs> oh, I thought that was a good way for you to earn your sergeant stripes. Sergeant stripes? Yeah, here's your warrant. What? Captain Elton. I had to make you two crazy ghosts here some kind of a wedding present. And this didn't cost me anything. Oh, how can we ever thank you? Be happy. Uh, and Kathleen, let that first shot you had at your husband be the last. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the end of that one, Satan. <laughs> you folks come see us again on my birthday. We'll have another cheerful yarn to spin ye. <laughs> Ironized Yeast presents Lights Out, Everybody. It is later than. This is Arch Obler bringing you another in our series of stories of the unusual. And once again, we caution you. These Lights Out stories are definitely not for the timid soul. So we tell you calmly and very sincerely, if you frighten easily, turn off your radio now. But 
If you're fascinated by the mysterious, the fantastic, the unearthly, then anticipate chills in our story of poltergeist. Open sleigh. Hey, <laughs> that was swell. Now let's go to town. St. Louis woman with her diamond ring. Kicking that man oh, around. No. no, stop that, Kay. What's the matter? Am I scaring the horse? Oh, it seems like a sacrilege singing a song like that out here. This beautiful, clean snow and blue sky. Well, what's wrong with a hot song to keep us warm? If you think the St. Louis blues is going to dirty up the snow, you ought to hear Frankie and Johnny the way I sing it. Oh, stop it, Kay. You're not (laughs) funny at all. Why can't you enjoy the fresh air without that cabaret sort of thing? Oh, just an old-fashioned gal, eh, Florence? How about you, Edna? Don't you like my songs either? You haven't said anything for the last five minutes. Well, I, I haven't been listening to you to tell the truth. I love to watch the snow sort of... Flow along under the sleigh. When you say that, gal, smile. Gosh, did you ever see more snow in your life? The man at the hotel said it had been snowing on and off up here for two weeks. I think coming out here to the country is the best thing we three have done since we started rooming together. Hiking in the snow is terribly healthy. Yeah, that's what I'm afraid of. The healthier I get, the worse I feel. (laughs) Crazy idiot. She does say the funniest things, doesn't she? I always say that Kay ought to... Hallelujah, we're here. Is this as far as we go, driver? That's right, miss. Can't go no further down this road account of the drift. Oh, my goodness. The drifts are too deep for a horse. How can we walk through them? I second the motion. Well, you young ladies don't have to worry none so long as you keep going down the valley over there. Snow ain't piled up that way all the way to Ma Jenkins. Oh, well, that's marvelous. Come on, girls. Let's get started. So long. Take care of yourselves, girls. Come on, Edna. Goodbye, Miss so Well, Listen to the snow talking at us. It's very dry snow. Our feet rub particles of it together, and the Ooh. friction makes a sound. It's kind of scary, yeah. isn't it? Why? Well, I don't know. It's just mm. as if the snow was sort of trying to talk to mm. us. I mean, as if it was angry at our trespassing. Hey, don't tell me we're trespassing. I don't want any country squire taking any pot shots at my uh, constitutional amendment with rock salt. No, thank you. Oh, don't talk nonsense, Kay. We're not trespassing. Why, this path through the valley here over to Mrs. Jenkins' house is the favorite hike of everyone who comes up this way during the winter. What's Mrs. Jenkins got anyway that makes people walk their feet off? (laughs) Wait till you taste her cooking. Eat. Oh, boy, let's go. It's awfully quiet out here, isn't it? Oh, that's the glory of it. I've had the roar of the subway in my ears so long. Okay, don't walk so fast. Come on, look what I found. Oh, come on, Edna. Oh, please, let me take your arm. I'm getting out of breath. Well, take it easy. There's no hurry. (sighs) Well, what is it, Kay? Look, through the circle of trees here. Look what I discovered. Well, isn't that interesting? It's a sort of a natural amphitheater. Sure. Say, who was this guy, Daniel Boone? What's an amphitheater? Well, that that means an oval circling place with rising tiers of seats. It's, you know, like that place we went to for the horse show. Oh. Back in the times of the Greeks, they had outdoor theaters. Listen to the professor. They made use of places just like this where the ground sloped up and made a sort of a natural arena or stage below. Theater! That's an idea. Sit down, gals, and I'll give you a special performance of the K Follies. It's awful snowy here, isn't it? I'll trample it down with my spring dance. Welcome, sweet spring. <laughs> Isn't she a nut dancing in the snow? If I had that girl's energy. She's really graceful, isn't she? I'll bet if she went on the stage, she could... Oh, Kay! She fell. Kay! Oh. Kay, did you hurt yourself? Oh, did I land on my dignity. Here, give me a hand. Here, I'll help you. There you are. Oh, did I take a flop. Did you hurt yourself badly? I'll live. What in the world did I trip over? Oh, no wonder... Look at that rock under the snow. No wonder I did a nosedive. Oh, my gee. goodness. There are rocks like that all over. Oh. A person could break their neck if they... Girls. What's the matter? What is it? Kay, the rock you tripped over. It... It's not a rock. What are you talking about? Of course it's a rock. Well, yes, but it's something... Something more than that. It's a tombstone. Oh. 
tombstone. Oh, no, it, it can't Look be. Look for yourself. It says, Here lies buried the remains of one who, restless in life... Stop! Don't read anymore. Stop! And, and all these other stones laying flat on the ground. They're tombstones, too? Yes. Whew, what a place to pick to dance. Oh! What's the matter, Edna? What did you scream for? Kay, you, you danced on the grave. What? You danced on the grave. I saw you. I saw you do it. You danced on the grave. Okay. Edna, stop it. Stop it. Oh, what's come into her? Edna, stop acting like that. Edna, stop for heaven's sake. Control yourself. Okay. Okay, I'm so sorry for you. You danced on a grave. For heaven's sake, stop talking like that. Sure, I danced on a grave. Well, yes, of course she did. It was perfectly accidental. And what if it was? What of it? The poltergeist. The what? Edna Hanson, what are you talking about? What's that word you just used? Poltergeist. Okay, what have you done? You superstitious little fool. If you don't stop talking that way, I'm going to slap your face. What's the matter with you? I didn't do anything. You walked on the grave. You danced on the grave. So Edna, what? be sensible. We all walked on graves, but it was purely accidental. Yeah. We had no intention of desecrating them. It doesn't matter, I tell you. It doesn't matter. The poltergeist. He'll come. I know he will. Oh, what's the use? She's crazy. Edna, what are you talking about? What's the poltergeist? What are you so frightened about? My father, he told me, if you walk on a grave, if you dance on a grave, the poltergeist. Poltergeist what? What is a poltergeist? An evil spirit. It comes out of the grave. It kills. It destroys. It'll kill us. It'll kill us all. Stop it. It throws things oh, out. Oh, please. Yeah. Lay It'll off that way. Yeah, no. But it won't get me. I'll run Edna, away. come back here. Away. She's gone insane. I'll get her. Edna. Okay, catch her. Edna. Edna, don't run away. Nothing will hurt you. Nothing. Oh, Edna, look out. Okay. Okay, what happened? That stone. It hit Edna. Edna. Edna, open your eyes. Blood. Blood all over her face. Okay, who threw that stone? Who threw it? I don't know. It came from the graveyard. Now, girls, take it easy. Take it easy. Oh, Doctor, she won't die. <laughs> Tell me she won't die. No, no, of course not. And you're sure that her skull isn't fractured? Oh, absolutely not. Maybe a little concussion, that's all. Well, it's almost five. Our train. Can we get someone to help us carry her down to the station so we can get her on board? Board? I'm telling you that little friend of yours shouldn't be moved out of bed for a week. If you do... Well, it might be just too bad. Oh, Flo, what'll we do? Uh, you go home, Kay. I'll stay with her. Oh, no, you won't. I'm not leaving you here alone in this godforsaken place. If you stay, I stay too. Kay, please be sensible. Why should we all lose our jobs when you... If can you'll go... excuse me, you ladies, I've got to be on my way. Oh, yes, of course, Doctor. Is there anything more you can do for Edna, Doctor? Any medicine or something? Nope, I've done all I can do. She's sleeping comfortable now. Uh... Miss? Yes, Doctor? The constable's sick, too, you know, and he's sort of depending on me to keep things straight. Now, uh, just how did you say that little friend of yours got hurt? Well, it was just the way we explained, Doctor. That rock came flying and... Yes, yes, I know, but who threw the rock? We... we don't know. What? That's true, Doctor. We don't know. But somebody threw it. You can't change facts. Somebody threw the rock that cracked her head. For heaven's sakes, old man, you don't think we did it. No, okay, miss, I didn't. Excited. Doctor, you've got to believe us. It happened just the way we said. All at once, that rock came flying through the air from the direction of the graveyard. It struck Edna, and, and we just didn't see who threw it. All right, if that's your story. Well, you better stay in your rooms here. I mean, you better not be leaving until the constable's on his feet and has a chance to talk with you. I'll be back in a few hours and see how the girl is. He doesn't believe us. What difference does it make? We know what we saw. But what did we see? She was running. She she fell. Kay. Well, let's not fool ourselves. There was no one there to throw that rock. There must have been. But there wasn't. Stop saying that! Aren't you brave enough to face facts? There wasn't any place for anyone to hide. I saw that stone. 
It seemed to come down out of the air. So slowly. Florence, if you don't stop talking like that... Do you remember what... What Edna said? It throws things. Stop looking at me like that. You're giving me the jitters. She said the poltergeist throws things. Spirit of evil. Florence, Rob, have you gone crazy too? Why should we laugh at things like that? What right have we got to laugh? How do we know there aren't powers we can't see or understand? Powers of evil that revenge and insult just like an evil man. Kay, how do we know? What are you talking like that for? What are you trying to scare me for? You, you're supposed to be the most intelligent one of us all. You with your college degrees. Sure, sure, I danced on the grave. But the dead are dead and they can't revenge a thing. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid of anything. I tell you, it's not... What? It's Edna. Come on. Edna, we're coming to you. Don't be afraid. We're coming. Open the door, Florence. It's not locked. Duck, it won't Here, let me. Edna, what is it? What? Edna, what? On your head. Oh. 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 I run a decent place, and I don't want you... <gasps> oh. The girl on the bed. Her head. It's crushed flat in by a rock. God in heaven. It's not a rock. It's a tombstone. I I wish I could cry But I haven't got any more tears Oh, Edna Edna Florence, darling, please You'll kill yourself if you keep on like that Oh, if this horrible night would only end It was my fault Mine I was the one who got her out here She didn't want to go. She hates the country. But I made her come. I made her. No. No, you're not the one to blame. I am. I danced on the grave. But she was so good. So sweet. Oh, why does it have to be Edna? Why? You're right. It wasn't right for it to be her, was it? I did it, not her. I did it. I danced on the grave. I danced on the grave. You can't deny what you see with your own eyes. But I tell you, Doc, nobody could have carried that tombstone up the steps without me seeing him, could they? But there it is, ain't it? Yeah. There it is. Either somebody's playing a terrible joke, or... or... You don't have to say it, Doc. I know. That's just the trouble. You don't know, and I don't know, and nobody knows. Yeah. And... And that tombstone... Well, what about the tombstone? I... I ain't quite sure, but... That's a tombstone out of the old burying grounds up at the bend. You're crazy. No, I ain't either. Well, that place is a good three miles from here. Yeah, I know. Who could have carted a heavy stone like that for three miles? Yeah, who? Stop looking like that, you flap-eared old fool. Human hands carried that stone in here and killed that girl? Sure. Yeah, the constable will find out who did it the minute he's on his feet again. You wait and see. No, he won't, Doc. You're smarter than me and all that, but this time you're wrong. There ain't nobody that takes in breath and leaves out breath like you and me. Or the constable's going to find out who killed that girl. You know that, Doc. No, stop talking. I wish the constable was here and this night was over. It's been a terrible night. Terrible. Terrible clock. Ticking. 
Kitty. Yeah, I know. I've been sitting here listening to it. I can't stand it anymore. I'll stop it. Why bother with it? Come on to bed, Kay. Please. There's no use sitting there. It won't help her. Yeah. Nothing can help her. But maybe I can help you. Me? It was my fault. Mine. I was the reason it happened. It killed her, and it'll kill you and me, too, unless I stop... No, don't say that. It's true. But why should you be hurt? I'm to blame, not you. Listen, Flo. I'll go out there. There? Out there to the graveyard. What? I'll talk to her. Kay. I'll, I'll tell her I didn't mean to do it. No. That I didn't know where I was dancing. Please. Maybe somehow it'll hear, listen to me, and... And then it won't hurt oh, you. Oh, no, no. I won't let you go out there. It'll kill but you. Florence, It'll kill you, too. Oh, no, no. I'll hold you. You can't go. You can't. All right. Come on to bed, Kay, please. In the morning, in the morning, things will be different. But it won't. Nothing will hurt us. The men, they're right outside the door. They won't let anything get at us. Oh, please, Kay, please come to bed. Yeah. We'll, we'll pray pray. I... I don't exactly know how. Just say anything. Anything. Like this. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Now you. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Kay? Kay, are you asleep? I can't sleep anymore. Kay, tomorrow, I mean, when it gets light and everything, do you think people will believe us? Do you think so, Kay? I'm not quite sure what happened. I always used to be so sure about things. And now I'd... Kay? Kay, where are you? Kay, where... The window. She went out the window. She's gone out there. To the graveyard. To talk to it. Okay, why did you go? Why did you go? I'll go out there, too. Well, she'll be so frightened out there alone. I'll go, too. I'll go, too. Oh, so cold. My hands. Snow so sharp. Cutting my legs. Oh, why did you go out there, Kay? Why did you... I've got to find you. A wind. Oh, why doesn't the wind stop? Blow, blow, thou winter wind. Thou art not so unkind as... <laughs> oh, I've got to find you, kid. I've got to find you. It's snowing. I love snow. Edna didn't like snow. Where are you, Kay? Where are you? I lost my way. I lost the road. Where are you, Kay? Kay, where are... Oh, Kay. I heard you, Kay. I heard you. I'm coming to you, Kay. We'll talk to it. We'll talk to it together. We'll tell her we didn't mean any harm, won't we, Kay? Won't we? Poor Edna. We can't help her, Kay. We can't help Edna. But I'm coming to help you, Kay. I'm coming. I'm coming. Yes, I hear you. I hear you. I'm coming, darling. I'm coming to help. I'm coming to help you. I'm coming. I'm coming. I hear you. I hear you calling my name. I hear you. Yes. Here we are, Florence. This way, 
Yes. Yes, I hear you. I hear you. Where are you? Where are you? No! No! This way, Hooper. They must have come this way. Uh, climbing out the window like that in the middle of the night. They must have gone crazy, the both of them. Well, let's not worry about that now. We've got to find them. Uh, here, give me that lantern. What is it, Doc? What have you found? A shoe. One of the girl's shoes. My gosh, stuck in the snow. We're going the right way. Come on, move fast. We've got to get to them. Doc, look at this. What is it? Over there. Ain't these footprints? Yes. Yes. Yes, that's right. Footprints. Hello, up ahead. Hello. Doc, we're... We're getting pretty close to the old burying grounds. Well? Maybe... Oh, look here, Doc. Let's not be fools. Let's wait till morning. What? Let those frightened girls freeze to death? Get along. But, Doc, I... You come uh, with me or the whole town will know what a yellow-livered no-good you are. All right. All right. You don't have to get so sore, Doc. Hello? Hello? Anybody up there? Hello? Doc. Doc, look. What? There they are. Up ahead. Glory be, they're alive. The both of them. Come on. Doc. Doc, look at them. That's the burying ground up there. And they're dancing. Dancing on the graves. Well, they must be out of their heads. Come on. We've got to stop. Doc. Doc, wait for me. Oh, Doc, it's... It's Doc again. Where are they, Doc? Where are the girls? Have they... Have they stopped dancing? Yes. Huh? They've stopped dancing. Did... Did they ever dance? What are you talking about, Doc? We saw them. We saw them dancing in this place with our own eyes. Did we? The moonlight. Here it comes again. See with your eyes again. <gasps> oh, no. Both of the girls froze stiff to the ground. Each with her head crushed by a tombstone. Would you mind telling us, me, whether there actually are such things as poltergeists? All I can tell you is this. There are authenticated records in existence that, in the city of London on the 27th day of April, 1872, from four in the afternoon on a Thursday until half past eleven at night, a certain room in a certain house was deluged by stones thrown from no apparent source. The London police surrounded the house... But they found no trace of whoever or whatever was throwing those stones with a murderous violence. I, uh, I see. So much for poltergeist. But what about next week? Well, anything can happen, but uh, specifically next week, Mangara. A strange title and a strange story. The power of suggestion. The dictators have shown us to what evil purposes that power can be used. Well, next week, a man who, uh... <laughs> But that, as usual, is next week. Yes. Lights Out, written and directed by Arch Obler, will come to you again next Tuesday at the same time. Be sure to listen for the amazing story of Mangara. It 
is later than you think. ambition, betrayal, and murder. Sound interesting? Philosophers and psychologists have told us that the one desire that remains with us after everything else is burned to ashes is the need for recognition. It is the compulsion to make the world recognize our world. Socrates, Galileo, Einstein have left their imprint on the pages of our history, and the world is better for their having been here. On the negative side of the ledger, in blood red ink, we find the same driving ambition in the names of Attila the Hun, Jack the Ripper, Adolf Hitler. This is a tale of ambition. It is for you to judge on what side of the ledger it is to be recorded. Huh? What's this? Why in your drink? You mind? Hey, look, mister. I came in here for a nice, quiet Blast. afternoon. Harry Blass is my name. Blass. That's right. You know me? Yeah. Hey. Take your free drink and split, mister. Hey, get your grubby paws off me, copper. I only thought you could use a little money. Hey, beat it, punk. You'll be coming to me, Bert, begging for my help. Maybe then I won't want to listen. <laughs> drama, The Blood Red Ink, was written especially for Mystery Theatre by Sidney Sloan and stars Fred Green. It is sponsored in part by Cat's Paw, Heels and Souls. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Bert Gilbert wasn't in a very good mood that evening when he came home to supper. It had been a long and tiring day full of dull police routine. The meeting with Harry Blass upset him. Blass was a small-time racketeer mixed up in a dozen or more dirty deals. Bert thought later that perhaps he should have played along with him, found out what Harry's angle was. But he was too worried to play cop. There was something else in the back of his mind that bothered him. He had recently taken the examination for detective. As yet, he had received no word on it. I'll have the food on the table in a minute, Bert. Don't get impatient. Okay, okay. No hurry, Colin. Want another beer while you're waiting? Uh, no, thanks. Yeah, Mike dropped me off at the pub when we finished our tour. I wondered why you were late. I was only 20 minutes late coming in the door. Uh, I mean, <laughs> haven't I got a right to relax after a day driving around in a squad car? Hmm? Sure, Bert. I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to criticize you. Here's dinner. Beef stew. Your favorite. Yeah, beef stew. Uh, thanks, Helen. That's just what I needed. Here, pass me your plate, huh? Mm-hmm. I'm I'm sorry I yelled at you. Forget it. You'll feel better after dinner. Yeah. I've got to be better. Couldn't be worse. I'm thinking about that exam. Why haven't I heard? Oh. Oh, I just remembered. You have a letter from the board. Came this morning. Wh- what? Where is it? Sit right where you are. I'll get it. Uh, yeah, here it is. Here you are, Bert. So, what does it say? Yeah. You read it. Oh, Bert. Well, don't be discouraged. Discouraged? I ought to jump up and down with joy, huh? Open the windows and tell the whole neighborhood, right? It's always next year. You can take it again. Helen, I'm 35. I've been on the force seven years. I haven't moved one inch up the ladder since I graduated from the academy. 35 isn't old. (laughs) Yeah, it's old when you're not moving ahead. Come on, eat your dinner. It's getting cold. You'll be in a better mood after you've eaten. Yeah, sure, sure. Probably Myrna wants me to play bridge with the girls. Wednesday's our club day. Hello, 
Hello, Myrna. Helen? Oh, I'm sorry, Mike. I yeah, thought you Bert were... Yeah, there. Uh, yeah, he's here. Bert, it's Mike. Okay, okay, I'm coming. Yeah. Hi, Mike. What's up? <laughs> Me, I'm up. I got it. You're talking to Mike Culligan, Detective Third Class. Hey, Mike, congratulations. You deserve it. And congratulations to you, old buddy. Bert Gilbert and Mike Culligan together, defenders of the faith, spoilers of crooks. Mike, I didn't get it. You what? I washed out. Well, you couldn't have. You coached me. You were the one who knew all the answers. You, you should have been on top of the list. I should have been, yeah. I'm still flat foot, Mike. Come on, you can't let it get you down. Look, why don't you and Helen come out with Gretchen and me, and, and we'll celebrate. Yeah, uh, thanks, Mike, but I, I don't think tonight I'd be good company. Hello? Uh, yeah, this is Patrolman 342987, Bert Gilbert. I'm calling Captain Sullivan. Yeah. Right. I'll hold. What? Uh, no, it's a personal matter. No, n no, no. I'd like to tell it to Captain Sullivan himself. He... Okay, okay. I'll uh, put it in writing to him. Thanks. He talked to you? No, Mike. His secretary says for me to put it in writing to him. Yeah, well... Uh, sure, sure, he's a busy man. Yeah, right, busy man, Mike, right. Put it in writing. Yeah, well, why not? I'll tell you why not. Because I want to see him face to face and ask him why I got passed over. Seven years, Mike. Seven years out of my life, and I can't get in to see the boss and ask a simple question. Come on, you're making too much out of this, Bert. <laughs> you're a fine one to talk. In seven, eight days, you'll be out of this dull rat race. No more riding around the squad car for you, no. No more dull routine. You'll be wearing plain clothes, getting detectives mail. Look, come on, get back in the car. You're making a scene out here on the street. So, what do I care? You get back in the car and leave me alone, huh? I can't leave you here. I mean, we haven't completed our tour of duty. A tour of duty. Do I hate that cop lingo? Listen, old buddy. You complete our tour of duty, huh? I need a drink. <laughs> Bert, you asleep? No. Can I get you something? A glass of warm milk? No, 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 Helen, thanks. You keep tossing and turning. You've got to get your rest. What for? You won't be fit for work tomorrow if you don't get some sleep. Helen, I've been suspended. What? Suspended. You know what the word means. How long? Five days. What for? I quit work a little early last Tuesday. You what? I just felt like I couldn't work a minute more, so... How I, early? 30, 35 minutes. I don't understand. Yeah, I do. I'm tired and I'm fed up. But you could have applied for a leave if you weren't feeling well. I'm sure they'd have given you time to get yourself together. Yeah, well, I got the time. <laughs> Five days suspended without pay. Oh, Bert. Helen, don't get upset. It, it got me what I wanted. What? I wanted to see Captain Sullivan. Ask him why I got passed over when the commissions were being handed out. He finally saw me, and I had a chance to tell him what I thought of the whole business. You didn't say anything insulting? No, 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 no. I didn't insult him. But uh, I got a little head up. Well, he listened to everything, and then he sat down at his desk and said he thought I needed a vacation. <laughs> Without pay. Oh, Bert. It's going to be on your record. So what? Up to now, towing the line hasn't got me much, Helen. What have I got to lose? Huh? What's the idea? I, I didn't order another... Find your drink, copper. Listen, I told you the last time what you could do with your drink, mister. Blash is your name, copper. Harry to my friend. Why do I always find you crawling up my back? Look, glass? Copper, I'm not going to... stop calling me Copper. But you are a cop, ain't you? You ashamed of it? Get lost. I know a lot about you. 
I had my eyes on you for a long time. I'm beginning to lose my patience Now, here. wait a minute. I can help you. <laughs> and you want something from me in return? Huh? Listen, you come to the wrong guy. I have just been... Suspended. I know. Uh, how do you know that? I got friends in the right places. I'm getting you back to work, and the suspension wiped off your record. Ah, big-time operator, huh? Yeah. I'd just, uh, like to do you a favor. What? One hand washes the other. Oh. Who writes your material, huh? What? Writes my what? I get it. Look, I'm serious. You want to shake on it? Look, Harry, if I shake hands with you, I count my fingers afterwards. <laughs> you got a sense of humor. I like that. Oh, we're going to get along. I'm going to make you glad I'm your friend. I got great plans for you. Hello? Yeah? Where? I'll be there in ten minutes. Who is that, Bert? Uh, friend. Uh, wants me to come over to the bowling alley for an hour or so. Uh, uh, you don't mind, do you? You never bowl. I, 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 I just took it up. Uh, um, they have a pool there, too. If, if we get tired of bowling, we can shoot a little pool. Bert, this isn't like you. Do you realize this is the third time this week you've had some reason to go out after dinner? Third time, huh? Uh, I uh, really wasn't counting, Helen. Uh, how many weeks have I just sat here reading the paper or looking at the boob tube? Uh, how many times? All right, all right. I don't mean to argue, so Go out. Just don't be too late. Got to be out of here tomorrow morning at 7. You remember? Uh, look, it just occurred to me that you might have something on your mind. Uh, you don't think I'm running around with another woman, do you? Bert. That never entered my mind. Yeah, well, good. I'm, I'm not chasing around, Helen. You're still my girl after eight years. Don't you forget it. I know, darling. I, I know that. Now, who can that be? Hi, stranger. Hey, Mike. Uh, where in the world have you been? Uh, I haven't heard from you or seen you in over two weeks. That's uh, why I came over. Oh, you know how it is. Uh, hey, you big shot detectives don't cross our paths too often. Uh, you're too busy with important assignments. <laughs> come on, old buddy. You're putting me on. Aren't you going to ask me in? Uh, Mike, come in. Please, come in. Bert's only kidding. But I'm not kidding. <laughs> Look, the reason I came over was to ask you guys to go to the movies with us. Gretchen's waiting in the car. And uh, we... Mike, I've got another engagement. Uh, but maybe Helen would like to go. But I've got to run right now. I'm ten minutes late. Can't you break that other engagement? I wanted to see you, talk to you. Can't. Got to go. Bye. See you later, Helen. Mike. Oh, well, that <laughs> was what I'd call kind of abrupt. I'm sorry, Mike. I'm sure Bert didn't mean to be rude. Uh, it was a good imitation. Well, Helen, what about it? You want to go to the movies with us? Uh, no, thank you, Mike. But please forgive Bert. He's upset because he didn't make detective with you. Yeah, yeah, I know. And I'm worried. Well, he'll get over it. <laughs> it isn't what I'm worried about. Helen, I'm going to tell you something I shouldn't. Bert is my best friend, and... Well, look, Helen, he's in trouble. Or he will be if he continues as he's going. I don't understand. He's hanging around being palsy-wowsy with a slimy character by the name of Blass. Mike! I'm sure you're wrong. Hey, I wish I was. This Harry Blass guy is mixed up with a thousand crooked deals, and he manages to slip out and around the law every single time the police catch up with him. And you think Bert is involved with this man? I know he is. Look, as a friend, I'm asking you to get him to stop seeing Blass. Immediately. Oh, good Lord. Please, remember I never said a word to you. He mustn't know that I talked to you. Okay, Mike. You're a friend. A real friend. Bert Gilbert has taken a dangerous step. His association with Harry Blass can only lead to dishonor in prison. 
He seems to believe that he can beat the law by jumping in, getting what he wants, and then quickly getting out. In his frustration and disappointment, he is forgetting the irreparable damage he will be doing to himself and his wife. We will be back shortly with Act Two. When Helen Gilbert heard that her husband was associating with underworld characters, she couldn't believe it. Bert had been an honest, hard-working police officer until he met with a big disappointment. He had flunked his examination for detective, despite the fact that he had worked hard and knew all the answers well enough to coach his friend and fellow officer, Mike Culligan, who passed. He felt cheated, angry, and reckless. I tell you, it's a piece of cake. I got it all laid out. Only one hitch. Wait a minute. Hold on, Bless. Aren't you making a big mistake spilling all this to me? I'm a cop. So what? You wouldn't like to grab off your pension money with one little job? Pension money? Look, you got to wait 13 more years before you begin to collect, right? How do you know how long? I know. So you wait 13 years and you get your dough. They dribble it out to you in crumbs. A little piece of bread each month. Yeah? And your way? Big pieces of bread. Now. Three or four times and you're rich. In six months or less, you retire from the force. You can forget the pension. Yeah? You got more money than you ever thought you would have in your dreams. And you got it nice and safe. Where no one can touch it. In a private Swiss bank account. You make it sound easy. It is. And it pays big. But you said there was a hitch. A little one. Little. How little? Someone has got to walk out with the stuff in his pocket. Stuff? Diamonds, Bert. A bag full. Uncut. Big, expensive diamonds. Impossible to trace. Look, uh, you know 47th Street between 5th and 6th, right? She's the biggest diamond center in the world. Maybe. Amsterdam's the biggest. But here's the layout. You will be in the neighborhood in your squad car. Wait a minute. How can I explain my being there? Well, it's in the general area you patrol, right? It's in the area. Well, you will get a call on your car radio sending you to the scene of the crime. Call? A phony call. It'll be on our own shortwave transmitter right in the neighborhood. No one will be hearing it but you. It'll sound official. We've got it all set up and we've tested it. It can't be heard in the next block. Yeah, but it'll be hard to explain later. That's where your partner comes in. You're not going to include him in the deal? Of course not. But uh, he becomes your alibi, you get it? He'll swear the call came from the official police dispatcher. He will think it's the real thing. So how do I get the loot? You go in, you catch the thief, arrest him. He slips the diamonds into your pocket. You get him outside and push him into the police car and call in and tell him you made an arrest. What about the thief? He's clean as the snow. They've got nothing on him. Can't be identified. Fake wig, eyeglasses. He won't have the loot on him. No evidence. The wig and glasses get dumped into the garbage before you hit the street with him in cuffs. He's got no record. He spends the night in the slammer. Next day, his lawyer springs him, and you turn the diamonds over to me. Oh. There'll be a hot dog stand in front of the precinct station. You slip it to him as you pass. We'll take care of your cut as soon as we dispose of the diamonds. Wait a minute, wait a minute. How, how do I know that I won't be the fall guy? Do all the dirty work and then get the blunt end of the stick. Bert, you got to trust me. We're a big organization. We do business in a legitimate way. We got help in the right place in case of trouble. Okay. But, uh, listen, Blass. Yeah? Don't try to pull a fast one on me. Hello? Uh, Helen... I won't be able to make it home for supper. I'm I'm going to be a little late. Where are you, Bert? Uh, uh don't ask me any questions. I'm I'm with a friend. We're talking business. But do you want me to hold supper till you come? No, no. I I, I said no. Do, uh, don't you understand me? Yes, Bert. So when will you get home? Uh, when you see me come in the front door. Uh, 
Helen, are, are you still on the line? Yes. Uh, you crying? I'm all right. Helen, I'm sorry I'm short with you. I'm, I'm a little tired. It's okay. I understand. Yeah. Okay, I'll see you later. Bert? Yeah? Mike was here about 20 minutes ago. He called twice before to talk to you. He said for you to call him and meet him someplace. He said it was urgent. <laughs> Good old Mike, huh? Uh, so what's he doing, playing Sherlock Holmes? Bert, he's your friend. You've said it yourself, your best friend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. Uh, I'll call him, Helen. Uh, bye. See you, see you later. Hey, Bert, I thought you were just going to call your wife. That's what I did. Took you an awfully long time. You checking up on me? Because if you are, the whole deal's off. Either you trust me... Oh, come on, come on. You got a short fuse. Take it easy. Uh, Well, stop breathing down my back, huh? I said we had a deal, and I meant it. Just naturally careful, Bert. Sit down. You know, uh, you do look a little worried. Maybe I am. My old partner... Mike Culligan? Yeah. He's caught on that you and I are seeing a lot of each other. Yeah? So? Well, he's a new detective. So he wants to look like one. You talk to him? Why not? Oh, uh, nothing about our business. You sure? Because if you did, he wouldn't like it. He? Who is he? Never mind. Look, Blass, if you want me in on this thing, don't hold out on me, huh? I gotta know who's involved. I thought I was working with you. Now you let me know you got a boss. I can't tell you that, Bert. He'll let you know who he is when he feels the time is right. As for your buddy Mike, I'm leaving it up to you to keep him out. He's my friend. You wouldn't spill it if he did know. You're sure of him? Absolutely. Have you uh, settled on a date? Well, there's a big shipment coming in from South Africa on the 20th. We'll give them two days to check it out. The 22nd? Yeah. Definite. So how is your man going to get into the place? Security's pretty tough in that business. We've been in touch from San Francisco. Phony setup from out there with a fancy letterhead. Our man will be arriving in New York on the night of the 21st. The next morning, he will arrive at their door with all his forged credentials and go right in. And so when do I come in? When you answer the call from the police's dispatcher. The one that you've got set up, the, uh, the, the fake. Right. Like I told you the other day. I just want to be sure. Good. <laughs> keep checking and, uh, hey, keep an eye on your old buddy, Mike. Another cup of coffee, Bert? Uh, no, no, Helen, I've had all the coffee I want. I, uh, I gotta run. Uh, what time is it? My watch is slow. About four minutes to seven. Oh, that gives me four minutes to get down the stairs and into the car. My new partner, Pete, will be picking me up. Goodbye, darling. Have a good day and try to come home early. Okay, darling, if, if you say so. Hello, Bert. Huh. Imagine meeting you on the stairs, Mike. What's up, Detective? I don't know what you're up to, Bert, but I can make a good guess. Uh, Mike, you're my friend. My good friend. And I am now going to ask you to butt out of something that is no business of yours. Look, I think it is my business. Number one, I'm a cop. A detective. Look, are you sore at me because I got it and you didn't? Not at all. I'm your friend. Once you said your best friend. Mike. I know you're I... mixed up in some rotten business with Blast. And I swear to you, friend or not, I'll get you. <laughs> you're even getting to talk like a detective. Hey, you're terrific. Good hunting, Sherlock. Bert, I, I told you never to come here. You left a telephone message with my wife. But I didn't want to meet you here. The bowling alley, I told her. Yeah, I know. But I want to see your place. See how the better class lives. Hey. Some joint you got here, Blass. 
Uh, a little flashy, but uh, quite elegant. All in great taste. Okay, okay, you seen it. Now get out. I'll meet you in five minutes. I'll let you out through the cellar door in the back. What's all this cloak and dagger stuff? Hey, you jumpy? Yeah, yeah, I'm jumpy. And you want to know why? Your buddy, Mike Culligan, has got a tap on my phone and yours. A tap? You must be kidding. It's hard to get permission for a tap. How do you, how do you know? Never mind. I know. Oh, that's right. You have connections. Still, it's hard to believe. It's real. I got it from a source I can trust. Who? Don't ask questions, and you'll live a lot longer. Punk, are you threatening me? No, Bert. I ain't threatening you. You're important. The scam won't work without you. But don't ask me to tell you things that I can't give out. I told you that before. When it's the right time, you'll meet the key man. Okay. Is that all you got to say? That you think our phones have been tapped? No, think. It's for sure. Now... There is one other little thing we cover. What? Detective Culligan. Okay. I'll handle it. You sure you want to take care of it? Wait a minute. What does that mean? Well, he's getting too close, Bert. He'll blow the whole thing. I told you. I'll take care of him. How? Talk to him? Cut him in on a small piece? It won't work. He's straight. He won't play. He's my friend. He won't do anything to hurt me. Yeah? He's got a bug on your phone. I tell you, there's no other way but to... Now, listen, Blass. Bert, we don't take chances. I'll get to him. Talk to him. No good. There's only one way to stop him. Okay, that's it. I'm through. You're asking me to be party to a murder. The murder of a man I have known Bert, since... Bert, let me tell... Yeah, that wasn't what I agreed to, and I don't want it. Find somebody else. All right, all right. And look, personally, I ain't so hot about that kind of business either. It could be trouble. The boss wanted it. I didn't. You don't like uh, we should take chances. Uh, look, I respect your feelings, Bert. It's it's something that's, uh, well, kind of hard to live with after. You know what I mean? You talk about murder as though you were planning a little fix on a horse race. I tell you, it's out. Or I am. Okay, okay. It's out, Bert. You sure? My word. I give you my word. <laughs> Your word. I've been on the up and up with you. You know it. Harry, I'm going to take your word. And I'm going to hold you to it. You and your boss both. You know what I mean? Sure. Sure, no problem. All I got to do is tell the boss. Tell him how you feel. He'll go along. <laughs> hey, Bert, he needs you. Despite the fact that everything was working out as he had wanted it to, Bert was nervous. He had never in his life got involved in anything so upsetting. Even though he'd been on the police force for seven years and had faced dangers so regularly that it was almost commonplace, this was different. He was mixed up in a dirty business, something that all his moral values found repugnant. Nevertheless, he seemed determined to see it through. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. It is the night before the day set for the robbery. Bert met Harry Blass on a street corner and he held a cab. Since Harry knew that his phone and Bert's were tapped, he varied his meeting place with Bert to make it impossible to set up any kind of trap. They ride in silence for some minutes and then Harry begins to give Bert his final instructions. Now, Bert, at 18 minutes before 11 tomorrow morning, you will be turning off 5th into 47th Street. I understand. You will get the call on your radio at exactly 16 minutes before 11, the one we're setting up. The uh, phony one? Yeah. It will come in maybe five minutes before the official call will come in. Five minutes? That's not much time. With traffic, uh, before we answer it, get up the elevator, it might might take ten minutes or more. It's got to be five minutes, no more. Or the rest of the police will be right in there with us. Okay, I'll try to move. I want to warn you. You'll have a different partner in your car tomorrow. Wait a minute. What about Pete? He's been Mike's replacement. He's off on another assignment. Uh-huh. I see. You manage that. Uh, what for? 
Oh, I thought it might be better if you got a temporary new partner. Just out of the academy. Just got a badge and a revolver. We could go Friday. Her? Well, you don't mind, do you? Oh, good-looking dame. 27, 28. Uh-huh. And we got her through your friend? Yeah. I told you I have connections in the uh, right places. And she knows what's going on? She ain't in on nothing. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, something else. Your friend, uh, Mike Culligan won't be around when all this happens. What do you mean? Relax. We got a good break. Culligan is in Arizona. Left this afternoon. Extradition business. He was sent to pick up a con out of Arizona State Prison. Won't be back till Monday. Oh, that's good. Yeah, thanks. Hey, don't thank me. Just coincidence. Yeah. Yeah, I'll bet. Okay, uh, give the cabbie your address and then we'll... Uh, No, 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 no. Uh, better drop me at the pub. I'll have a beer, and I'll have an excuse for coming home late. Oh, Bert. Oh, Helen, I, uh, uh, sorry for being so late, dear. That's uh, all right, Bert. I'm getting used to it. Now, Helen, don't take that kind of tone. I waited dinner for you. Then Mike arrived. Mike? He came here? But he couldn't have. He left for Arizona. As a change of plans, Bert. Hey, Mike. I called the warden in Arizona and told him I was delayed. I hope my change of plans hasn't disturbed you too much. Change of plans? Uh, what plans? Drop it, Bert. You knew I was scheduled to go to Arizona, and you know why I was being sent out of town. No. No, why? Uh, look, I didn't invite you into my home... Detective Culligan, but I'm inviting you out right now. Don't say anything you're going to regret. Stay out of this, Helen. You, Culligan, out. Bert, please. Pardon me, Detective. I, uh, I forgot to ask if you had a warrant to enter my house. Have you? Now, Bert, you know I have. No search warrant. No warrant for my arrest. Bert. Then what are you doing here? The door is open, Mr. Culligan. Good night, Helen. Bert, you know, you once said to me, nothing worse than a dirty cop. Well, you were right, friend. Uh, turn into 47th, please. Again, Bert? We just came around the block. Come on, come on, come on. Turn before the light changes. Huh? Okay. That's what you want. Traffic's too heavy. It'll take us ten minutes to get to six again. Uh, you doing piecework, Grace, or do you work by the day? <laughs> I'm working by the day. But this is certainly a dull business. Well, what time have you got, Grace? Uh, 15 minutes to 11. You're fast. I've got 19 minutes. A little too early for lunch, Bert, don't you think? Sector Able 12. Sector Able 12. You have a 1033. Hey, that's Sector a 1033 Able robbery in progress. Sector Able 12. 12 is us. It's you learned your lessons good, Officer McKenzie. 47th Street, 25A West, 10th floor. Hey, hit the lights in the silence. That's just right ahead. Hit the brakes. What units are responding? You stay in the car. Call in and tell them we're responding. Okay, okay, Bert. minutes. You gotta do it. Deputy! You went that way, officer! He's got a gun! Okay, okay, stay where you are. Stay out of the hall. All is. Out of the hall. Hey, 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 cop! Here. Here, right here in the closet. Oh, yeah. yeah. Come on, come on, shut the door. Okay, put the cuffs on me and let's go. Hey, where'd you ditch the wig, wig and the glasses, huh? Garbage can. Garbage will be picked up by the morning. Not to worry. Come on, let's go. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Where's the loot? You're supposed to give it to me, and I'm... Yeah, yeah, look, the signal's changed. The stuff is already mailed in four pre-stamped manila envelopes. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Blast told me... The change was... is mine. He didn't want to put you in any trouble. Look, if you don't have the stuff and I don't have it, we're in the clear. So, so where was it mailed to? Where? I don't know. I didn't look at the address. I just filled the envelopes like I was told to, sealed them, dropped them in the mailbox at the end of the hall. Goes right out down on the first floor. Three o'clock mail pickup. I see. Look, what are we waiting for, copper? Take me out of here. Throw me in the slammer. Come on, I'm your prisoner. 
Come in. Oh, come in, Bert. Yeah, come on in. I'm on uh, long distance to San Francisco. I'll be with you in a minute. Hello. Yeah, yes, I'm still here. You got them? How many? Six, good. Jewels International Limited, huh? <laughs> Fancy name. Now, now, we want you to send us all you've got on them, and we'll send you what we've got. Right. Uh, bye, Inspector. Yeah, sit down. Uh, sit down, Bert. Thank you, Captain. I want to tell you, I think you've done a superb job. Oh, thank you. Best kept secret in all the years I've been on the force. Had to let Lieutenant McInerney in on it at the last minute. Mike Culligan's new boss, you know. To get his cooperation on the Arizona thing. But uh, outside of that, <laughs> well, even your wife didn't know. Thought you were in trouble. <laughs> she was about to divorce me. When I spoke to her just ten minutes ago, she sort of broke down. Well, then she laughed and came immediately to your defense and said she never believed you were anything but good and decent. <laughs> it sounds like her. I, uh, I did give her a bad time, though. Well, I think we have the whole case wrapped up. You heard my conversation with San Francisco. Your thief is going to get the little surprise when his lawyer gets here. We found the wig and glasses, and there'll be no trouble getting absolute identification. Postal authorities cooperated and found the envelopes containing the diamonds, all $750,000 worth. Mm. Well, I hope you're proud of your efforts. Uh, yes, sir, but I, I still have one worry, sir. Mm -hmm. Maybe we jump too quick, and the big shot, uh, Blass's boss, will be warned and take off. No, no, no. Your idea to flush him out worked. Sending out word that... Mike was going to Arizona, trapped him. He immediately got that information back to Blass. What he didn't know is that we had suspicions he might be the leak and put the arm on him right after he got the word out. Who was it? A man by the name of Reach. Works for the company who handles our electronic maintenance here at headquarters. Huh. He had access to all our information, and he yielded to temptation. Then he wasn't the big boss. No, no. I'd say a small but important cog in Blass's operations. Blass is the big man. And we'll have him within the hour. He doesn't know that he's in any trouble? Not an inkling. Everything was done so swiftly and without fuss that Blass couldn't possibly know. Lieutenant McInerney sent Mike Culligan to make the pinch. Mike? Uh, any backup? Mag didn't think he needed any. Blast would be taken by surprise and... No, 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 no. He's dangerous, Captain. He'd just as soon kill someone as, as talk to them. Who's there? Open up, Harry. It's me, Bert. Come on in. Quick. Look, I told you that we had to stay away from each other. Hey, I see you got yourself all packed. Like you're uh, going away. Hmm. Shame to leave this gorgeous apartment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, orders from the boss. What's up? Trouble? Look, uh, don't be worried about your cut, see? Uh, you'll get it as soon as they get the stuff in Frisco and uh, d dispose of it. I'm not worried. It all went off perfect. Look, uh... I know how you feel about the bread. I, I, I can give you a kind of down payment on your share. Yeah, I, uh, I got some cash right here. In, uh... Yeah, don't touch that drawer, Blast. Turn around. Nice and slow with your hands up. What's the matter with you, Bert? Mike Culligan came here. Not more than 10, 15 minutes ago. Came here? Why? Don't give me a performance, Blast. He came here to pick you up. What happened? Look, Bert... You, you, you and me, we're partners. <laughs> Whatever gave you that idea, punk, you walked into a setup. We've got all of you, including your plant, your mole, at headquarters. Now, where's my colleague, Mike Culligan? Uh, how should I know? Uh, a little while ago, somebody came to the door. He banged on it, but I didn't answer. He went away. Yeah, he would have never gone away. He is in this apartment. Oh, yeah? Well, uh, go ahead. Look around. He, he is in here. What's in this other room? Nothing. Take a look. Don't move. I'll open the door. Oh, Bert. 
Bert, Mike. I'm hit. I'm hit. Mike. Blast. He's going to get away. Get him, Bert. Mike, I can't leave you like this. I'll, I'll call for an ambulance. You're a cop, Bert. Get him for me. I'll be all right. Okay, Mike. Blast. I see you. Down the stairwell. Stop or I'll shoot. Stop. Come on in, Bert. Uh, I'm awake. Uh, doctor says I can only stay a few minutes. Oh, boy, I owe you a big apology. Man, was I wrong. Captain Sullivan, well, he was in this morning. He told me you made detective. <laughs> yeah, the slow way. You got a big citation, too. Mayor's going to present it in front of City Hall with everyone watching. <laughs> yeah, that's something I tried to get out of, but uh, Helen said I got to. You know what the mayor's going to say to you? Nothing's worse than a dirty cop. <laughs> no, Bert. He was here today and I talked to him. He's going to say, there's nothing better than a clean cop. Detective third class Bert Gilbert stood on the steps of City Hall with his head slightly bowed while the mayor read the citation. He was embarrassed by all the ceremony. Then he glanced up and caught the look in Helen's eyes as she watched her husband being honored. And he knew then that the look was worth all the embarrassment and discomfort. I'll be back shortly. So ends our tale of the blood red ink. Bert Gilbert and Mike Culligan had the fire and ambition in them to make something of their lives to gain recognition from their fellow men. Their names were not to be found on the negative side, the blood-red side of the ledger. Their names in great block letters could be found on the positive side. They had achieved what most men want, the knowledge that they had received the recognition for a job well done. Our cast included Fred Gwynn, Terry Keane, Lloyd Batista, and Bob Caliban. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Raven House Paperback Mysteries. She was going to paint the king. He was going to set it up. And they were going to split $10,000. How was all this to come about? Find out tomorrow night when the...